I went to serve in the military and came back to find my girlfriend acting very strange. She said I love you unprompted a few evenings ago. I thought this was my go sign and started up a conversation about our relationship. It was a really good talk. She was honest and I could feel it. I thought she cheated, but nothing like that happened. She has made it clear that she didn't cheat in a respectable, clear way and tone. And I am convinced she didn't. I trust this without any doubts now. This being a soft breakup was my other concern. I asked her if she considered breaking up with me and she said the thought came into her mind, but she didn't want to wish she loves me and was sure that she would love the future we will have. She didn't want a life without me. I asked if me moving out will eventually lead to a breakup and she said she doesn't think it will, that she thinks it'll only make us stronger. The problem was, as it turns out, that I went from being a happy person to someone who was worrying and depressed. She only realized this was the case when I was gone and I wasn't around to spread negativity anymore. She said that she fell in love with me because I was happy and eccentric. She mentioned that while I was doing things that a good boyfriend would do, she felt I was doing them out of duty and that I used to be very excited about buying her flowers. But lately, when I came home with flowers, I didn't celebrate this small occasion with her. I just gave them to her and went to bed. I admit, I've been very sulky the past few months. I was always worrying about my career, finances, and not being able to accomplish my future goals. I had already realized this while I was serving, and worked through it myself. I think I am in a better place now and she says she saw that I am. Her solution to this was me moving out. My negative energy wouldn't affect her anymore. Because it did, and she already has a lot to worry about. She needs a positive attitude too. Stay strong and I was making that harder. She also realized that we were too codependent and too much in a routine. She thought me moving out would solve this also. I agree. We both were very independent people at the start but then we got lost in love. I was always waiting for her to come home and she was always waiting for me to do anything. This ordeal made life somehow stale. She realized that because I did so much for her, she became heavily dependent on me to solve her problems, making her feel weak and incapable. Because of this reliance, she even had a hard time paying the bill and this got to her. She missed her old self, the one with confidence and power. I realized that I lost myself too. I was a social person who commonly took the initiative to do something with a lot of flash and crash in my life. I lost that, I lost friends and I lost my active lifestyle. She wants to go out with friends and not include me in everything. She wants to not worry about the things she says while with friends because I might be uncomfortable with it. She wants to sometimes take long walks alone. She doesn't want to ask me every time she wants to buy something. She doesn't want to feel guilty when her day-to-day -day plans don't include me. She admitted that she received flirtatious male attention when doing her internship at school. I wasn't surprised as she is very good-looking and with a very feminine personality to boot. She says she would never cheat on me, and didn't want to respond to anything, never considered anyone else but me in her life, but she liked it. She enjoyed the ego boost and that made her feel guilty. Guilty that she could like such a thing while I was away facing hardship. I said it was normal to like attention from the opposite intimacy, especially when you're lonely. I appreciated that she immediately tried to shut down advances and stayed committed and loyal to me. I don't think this will be a problem and she looked very relieved when I thought it wasn't a big deal. In the end, she said that she missed the old me, the one that was happy and excited about the little things. She said she loves me very much and she is ready to continue the relationship we had before if I could get away from my sulky self finally. She tried to make me happy but I was feeling bad for too long. Me regaining myself meant us regaining the amazing relationship we had. Us shedding away our codependence meant us having a stronger, more stable future where nothing like this happens again. After the talk everything changed for the better. She looked so relieved and I gave her my word that I will try to not fall into this situation again. She hugged and kissed me, and gave me a gift she bought for me while I was away. I took her out to a nice place to drink and celebrate afterwards. I felt happy for the first time in a long time. We had an amazing time and discussed many things. We came back home to have the most intimate and amazing intimacy we had since the beginning of our relationship and stayed up all night cuddling and listening to music. So, things are looking good for us right now. My boyfriend is obsessed with his dead wife and is throwing a birthday party for her. I've been dating Tony a 38-year-old widower with three kids for almost a year. I sensed Tony was still very attached to his late wife Laura and our relationship took a backseat. It became clear after six months but bit my tongue. When Laura's birthday arrived, I decided to speak up. Tony invited me, his family, and former in-laws. I joined, unaware of how awkward it would be. The house was filled with Laura's favorite things, purple decor, her beloved food, snacks and music. An empty chair at the head of the table held a large photo of Laura, making it feel like she was still with us. After dinner, they all gathered around the table to share fond memories of Laura. It went on and on as each person praised her. Worst of all, there were several comments about Laura being one of a kind, second to none, and irreplaceable. They all sang happy birthday to Laura as they gathered around the cake. Then, they went outside to release balloons, sending their birthday wishes to her in heaven. I felt humiliated and small, left and cried all night. All I could think about was how much I cared for Tony and how much love he held for another woman. It stung knowing he'd never loved me as intensely. The next morning, Tony called, saying the party was great and he was glad I could make it. But his words made me feel like just another guest, not the woman he was in a relationship with. He invited me for dinner after work. I agreed but realized it was time to discuss him moving on from Laura and focusing on our relationship. When I arrived at his messy house, 
he apologized for not having food and suggested we clean up the party mess and reheat leftovers later. Inwardly, I was fuming. Once again, I was getting someone's leftovers and I was sick to death of it. I seethed silently as I cleaned up. Finally, when I sat with Tony, he hardly helped, leaving me to do most of the cleaning. After a long day of work, I was exhausted, angry, hungry, and on the verge of exploding. Kath, if you don't mind, why don't you throw some food in the microwave, will you? Let's relax a while. It's been a long day. I lost it and let out all my bottled up frustrations. I went on about how I was sick and tired of being treated like a maid and a servant. I'd helped with his kids, cleaned his house, provided companionship and intimacy, but Laura remained his greatest love. F that ridiculous party. Dead people don't have birthdays. I screamed. Tony stared at me in disbelief and lashed out. How can you be so self-centered? You're making this all about you. I felt overwhelmed. I said I didn't have to clean up the party mess, I could have stayed home. I'm tired of my needs not being met and being second to someone I don't even know or care about. I feel like my feelings are minimized. My boyfriend is being blackmailed for sending explicit photos to a girl behind my back. I have been with my boyfriend for five and a half years. He is my best friend, his family is my family, they took me in when my own parents abandoned me, we have two dogs and a cat together, we have built an entire life together. He sent explicit pics to a girl on Instagram who reached out to him, he said it was about a 30-minute conversation. As soon as he sent the pics she demanded $900 or she would post them everywhere. What's worse is she was 16. My boyfriend was then forced to tell me what he did. I laughed in his face as soon as he told me, I told him that's what he gets for being a disgusting a-hole. I told him we are done and he needs to figure out where to go. I screamed at him while he was packing his stuff, I have never yelled like that in my life. This is something I never thought he would do, this is so unlike him. I forced him to call his mom and tell her everything, he was mortified as he should be. She was in complete shock, she told him he needed to leave the house. He packs up his stuff and takes one of our dogs to go camping for the night and his mom comes over to spend the night and cry with me. His entire family was in complete shock. We have been so close for the last five years, we've built so much together, been through so many things. He was my best friend. He was the only person I had for a long time. I'm devastated. He came back this morning and we talked for a few hours, just trying to figure out logistics. What to do about the living situation? I have no family anywhere near me and can't afford rent on my own. We live in a one bed one bath. Our dogs are so strongly bonded we just can't bear the thought of separating them, for now he will be sleeping on the futon while I get the room until we can figure things out. I know I'm going to sound stupid and naive, but I love him so much, I've never imagined myself with anyone else. I can confirm this is the only time this has happened. Our relationship has been going through a rough patch for about two years now. We both felt it but were too afraid to say it. It just spiraled so badly. We had one of the most open conversations we've ever had in the last five years, we spilled it all. And at the end we both concluded we need time apart to become independent, we will stay friends for our animals. His family is still very much so my family, we both understand that and he wants that. Is it stupid of me to think maybe a year from now we could make it work? He is adamant on working on himself, starting therapy and working on his mental health. I have been begging him to go to therapy for years, we both struggle with severe depression and anxiety. He said if I ever decide to give him another chance he wants to go to couples therapy to work on our communication which is a big struggle we have. I told him it's going to take a long time if I ever decide I can trust him again. He said he understands and will take the time to work on himself independently, and I will be doing the same. We will remain friends for the sake of the family and our dogs but nothing more. I know he's a stupid effing a-hole and I effing hate him. I'm just so in love with him it's hard to not let myself think about maybe a year into the future, we could make it work again. My boyfriend's mom is territorial about her cooking. My boyfriend and I have been together for two years long distance. We met while we were both on vacation. Recently I moved into my own place in the city my boyfriend lives in. I went to look at apartments and then went to meet his family in person for the first time and have dinner. Everything was going well. I met his parents, his brothers and their spouses. His mom was very pleasant until dinner started. His oldest brother's wife had made an appetizer and served it. It was really good but their mom put the appetizer in her mouth, made a noise and then made it seem like she had to force herself to swallow it. She said that's a different taste and made a disgusted face. There was nothing wrong with the appetizer. She then went to the kitchen and came out with the same appetizer and said, it's handy I made the same one just in case. I expected the daughter-in-law to say something but she just kept quiet. No one said a word and the conversations continued like it was normal. The mom, with the daughter-in-law and the other spouses then helped take away our plates that still had the first appetizer on them, served the mothers on new plates and told us all to eat. It was the same appetizer, there was no difference. In fact, I preferred the daughter-in-law because hers had more vanilla. I was astounded that she did this. Dinner continued and it was all made by the mom. She kept asking how the food was and made passive-aggressive comments about certain dishes that were made before by the other daughter-in-laws. I didn't say anything because I was shocked but after we left dinner, 
I asked my boyfriend what happened. He said his mom is really passionate about her cooking and doesn't like anyone to outdo her. I said so this happens at every family dinner, and he said yes, if someone had made a dish before or they make one at dinner, his mom tries to outdo them. He said his brother's wives don't take it personally. Because they know how she is and that it's really coming from a place of love. I'm sorry but what I saw is not from a place of love and the daughter-in-law seemed like she was going to cry. My boyfriend finally said, she's just territorial about her cooking and other than that, she is very normal. I finally asked him, when did this behavior start and he said when his eldest brother first bought a serious girlfriend home. His eldest brother is 8 years older than him so I asked from the time they were dating, up to now, did all your brother's partners go through this and he said yes. I said, do you think your mom's behavior is bad? And he got a little offended and said no, I just think she is passionate about making good food. I've been thinking on it, replaying the dinner and comments over and over in my head and there's no way I can sign myself up for this kind of life. My boyfriend and I are starting to talk about marriage and the future and kids and I am very nervous now. His brother's wives have endured abuse over their cooking since the start of their relationships with their spouse's mother and no one says a thing. Not them, not their husbands, not his dad and not my boyfriend. How the F is this okay? An entitled Karen who I don't know demands I babysit her kid. So Karen moved into the apartment next to mine a couple of weeks ago. Karen has struck up short, polite conversations with me just two times in that period, with the second being yesterday, the day before this whole fiasco unfolded. This morning at about 9 a.m., while I was having breakfast, someone started aggressively banging on my front door. When I answered, Karen was standing there with her daughter, a five-year-old girl, who had a little backpack on. Sounding very flustered, Karen said she was sorry to have to ask this with no notice, but could I please watch her daughter for a few hours, because Karen had somewhere really important to be. Now, something you need to understand about me is that I have no idea how to deal with them. Like, I tense up and get super awkward if a kid so much as waves at me in the supermarket. I am also disabled. She uses a motorized wheelchair sometimes and a walking cane for short distances or when she's just pottering around her own home. I live with my boyfriend, who is also my carer. My chronic illnesses involve fainting spells and a lot of brain fog, so by my own account, I'm absolutely not someone who should be left in charge of a child. Karen has seen me using my wheelchair and my cane, and has seen my boyfriend, who was at work when this all happened, helping me in and out of the car. So I responded with a firm no, explaining that my medical conditions meant that her daughter would not be safe in my care and that I'm not well enough to have any guests in my home, anyway. Karen immediately flipped from pleading and simpering to hand on hip indignation, at this point, accusing me of faking my disabilities and threatened to report me to Centerlink if I didn't watch her daughter for her. Never mind the fact that I am not on welfare. My boyfriend has a high-paying job and I work somewhere between part-time and full-time hours from home most weeks. So I basically said, I'm not on Centerlink and I don't appreciate being blackmailed. Find another babysitter, because I am not IT. And closed my door. Karen kept banging on the door for a bit, but eventually left. About 20 minutes later, I heard a very faint, timid tapping on my front door. If I hadn't been so close to it, I probably wouldn't have heard it. I sighed heavily, having kinda already guessed what was happening. I opened the door and there was her daughter, who had clearly been crying, clutching the shoulder straps of her little backpack. She said, very softly, Mummy said I could stay here today. Now, like I said, I cannot stand kids, but her daughter was an absolute darling throughout this entire fiasco and the most she ever did was cry, because her mother is clearly a goddamn monster. Karen had driven off and sent her daughter to my door, clearly thinking that if she left me with no alternative, I'd just play along and babysit her daughter for her, anyway, especially since I had literally no way of contacting Karen. Wrong. I escaped abusive parents at a young age and this made me furious. I got her daughter settled in front of the TV with a drink and some snacks, and called the police. Yeah, my neighbor just abandoned her five-year-old daughter outside of her apartment and the kid showed up at my door, asking to come in. When the officers arrived, I told them the full story and while they were appalled, they weren't surprised. One said, you'd be shocked at how not rare this kind of thing is. Which is honestly kind of the worst part of all this. The officers took her daughter with them and were really sweet with her, explaining to her that she wasn't in any trouble and had done the right thing, and that they were there to look after her and find out where her mummy had gone. I found out later that they were able to contact her daughter's father, who was currently working on finalizing a divorce from Karen and was also appalled, but not remotely surprised by what she'd done. Here's hoping he gets full custody of the poor kid after all this. An entitled Karen who I don't know demands I babysit her kid. This morning, I had another knock on my door, only it was the dad with Karen's daughter in tow. He went here to apologize for what his ex had done and so he and the daughter could thank me for looking after the daughter and for calling the police. I said he seemed like a good guy who was clearly putting his kid first in all this, which was really reassuring to hear. He told me that, according to his lawyer, me calling the police and handling everything the way I had would basically be a gift-wrapped custody battle win for him, because what kind of court would ever grant Karen custody after the crap she'd pulled? His lawyer was over the moon when the dad called him. I also asked the dad what had been so important that Karen had abandoned her own daughter over it. You guys ready for this? 
It was an appointment at a nail salon. She brought her daughter several times previously and just demanded that the staff babysit her and refused to even acknowledge the kid during her me time. When she'd called yesterday morning to book a last-minute appointment, the staff put their foot down and told her she could no longer bring her kid to her appointments and would be refused service if she did. The dad also said that Karen had shown up so late to the appointment that they'd refused to see her anyway. So she abandoned her daughter because she wanted her me time, getting her nails done. The dad told me that me time is an excuse Karen uses to ignore her kid, basically any time she feels like it. Do not talk to me during my me time. The dad also asked me if I would be okay to help with his custody battle. He said he understood that my health isn't great and that his lawyer had said a written statement would be fine. He said while it probably wasn't essential, since they had the police report, he wanted to have as much evidence on his side as possible, just to be sure. Of course, I agreed. Karen hasn't. Yet shown up at my door to scream at me, so I'm thinking maybe dealing with the police put some actual fear of consequences into her. We shall see. Have you ever accidentally shown someone your camera roll? So the night before my shift I decide to re-download a couple dating apps, and after talking to a couple nice people, named F and M, we exchange numbers and text on WhatsApp, the conversations sort of peter out and die after we sort of exchange pictures and realize it wasn't meant to be. I think nothing of it, delete the apps and move on with my evening, in my mind I assumed that the pictures that weren't my own also disappeared with the apps being deleted. Flash forward to today and I work in a small space with two other co-workers, one of them is a newish starter and asks me some questions about my hair as I'm bald by choice. I have had a significant glow up in the past few years which included shaving my head, so I thought I would grab my old ID and download a couple of my fitness pictures from about 5 years ago just to show her what I used to look like. Whilst we don't speak much on shift, I appreciated the fact she was making an effort, so I was thinking this is finally the shift where we break the ice and maybe I'll learn a bit more about her too. I knew I had my own explicit pics in my gallery and a whole bunch of garbage screenshots so as to avoid any potential mishaps. So I made sure to take about 25 blank screenshots so that there was absolutely no way she could fat finger and accidentally swipe left or right and see them. So I hand her my ID first of all, and she's dumbfounded. Well that's not you. You look like a completely different person. Whilst she has the ID in both hands I go to show her my phone. But she assumes I'm passing it to her so in our sort of awkward fumble she grabs the top left of my iPhone, which just so happens to have the back key in that exact corner. I see my photo gallery zoom out and a moment of clarity happens, where I recognize a set of honkers and a PP framed perfectly along the top of the screen, due to the barrage of screenshots I took earlier and sheer luck. It had framed them perfectly across the top three rows of my gallery. If I had pressed the screenshot button 10 more times or not had my gallery zoomed out, this wouldn't have happened. This gallery was like the middle aisle of Aldi, it had everything, honkers, girls and guys butts asses, guys peepees, womanhoods all on show, and a couple of my own images too. All very small, but framed perfectly like a small set of bathroom tiles arranged to make a small human mosaic. You couldn't quite tell sizes and imperfections but you could very easily see that it was, humans doing NSFW activities. I go to pull my phone away but the damage is already done. She politely tells me to never show her a photo on my phone ever again and goes to the toilet. When she returns I profusely apologize, no one comes to work to see that, I'm so sorry it was an accident. Whilst I don't try to explain that all of these photos aren't me, she has no way to know. This girl has just been blasted by the equivalent of a Pinterest board of adult films. I feel the energy in the room gets awkward. So I leave it, we usually make coffees for each other for free when we finish our shifts. As my shift ends I ask her to make me a coffee before I go. She overcharges me, I don't question it. I pay and sip my flat white in the rain knowing that this event will probably be spoken about in future without my knowledge, if that's in therapy or in a pub. I don't know, but I just hope she doesn't think the honkers are mine. I thought I was alone, so I tried to sleep, but I was wrong. When I was 17 I lived with my mother, who was an addict and couldn't hold down a job. My father had left when I was young, and we rarely had a stable place to live. We moved around a lot, and I often ended up sleeping on the streets. One day, we had to leave our roommate's house, and my mom went to stay with her boyfriend in a trailer. I didn't want to intrude on their relationship, so I decided to spend the night on the streets, which I was used to by then. I got dropped off at a McDonald's, had some burgers, and then ventured into the streets again. As night fell, I looked for a place to sleep. I tried several spots, but none of them worked, it was either too hot, too bright, or I was bothered by mosquitoes. Then I remembered an unfinished house where I used to hang out. The doors were shut, and the windows kept the mosquitoes out. I entered through the back as usual and settled in the bathroom where there was less debris on the floor. I tried to sleep, but I kept hearing noises downstairs. I didn't pay much attention, thinking it might be the door I had entered swinging open and shut. After an hour or so, I couldn't sleep, so I decided to go sit on the back porch. As I sat there, I noticed movement to my left, where I had just exited the house. I looked over and saw a man in the darkness, peeking around the wall. He was completely in shadow, and I couldn't make out any features except for his upper body. I thought he might be a homeless person, so I waited for him to come out and talk. But he remained still, like a statue, not making a sound. After a minute or two, I got up, grabbed my bicycle, and left the property. When I glanced back through a window, I saw him still there, watching me leave. The moonlight revealed he was a tall white man with a jacket. Feeling uneasy, I quickly left and couldn't sleep for the rest of the night. I tried two different spots but had no luck. While I didn't have a dramatic chase or confrontation, I wonder if he would have continued watching me if I had fallen asleep.
I decided never to enter houses like that again after this encounter. My borderline insane mother turns racist when the delivery guy gets the delivery instructions wrong. I have a mother who will call Karen. I also have a half-brother, 26M, who will call Brown Nose because that's what he is. Now, Karen is the definition of a vile person, she's just mean, slathered in bigotry against women, homophobic, transphobic, judgmental of bigger people, she points at children as young as 12 on the road and privately talks about them, even though she herself is overweight, and of course, very white and racist. She sees herself as more important or more special, like I think there is actually something wrong in her head because who does the crap she does. So we have a dog, and we order the food for him online. We live in the UK on street housing. This means we don't have a porch. Now, the instructions for the delivery driver were to knock on the door or leave it on the porch. As you can imagine, neither of those things happened, rather the package was left on the pavement, which was obviously a Richard head move by the driver, but what I heard next honestly lowered my hope in humanity. So I'm upstairs, listening to music with headphones, when I hear Karen downstairs, screaming about stupid effing n-words so of course, I go down to investigate. When I get there, she's still going on a tirade loud enough for our neighbors to hear to brown nose, who sat and listened without calling out this BS, about how some people in the UK clearly can't speak the language and shouldn't be allowed jobs if they aren't going to do it right and she believes that stupid n-words ruined the UK. She then proceeded to send a mildly racist complaint to the company in charge of the delivery, saying how that people who can't read and speak English shouldn't have jobs in delivery and she requested that the man be fired. And she was proud of the email. Now I wish this was the end of the story, but Karen had other ideas. So a few weeks later, she was driving me to college to walk the dog and make me early to give me an opportunity to talk to the guy I have a crush on. Anyway, in the car on the way there, she proudly told me the continuation of this story. As it turns out, the same delivery driver came back again and did the delivery wrong again, so Karen decides to go outside, in her dressing gown to my knowledge, and confront him, yelling about someone like him still has a effing job and that she'll have his job for this. She also told me not to tell her she's being racist because she's not, and it was disgusting he still had a job, but I feel like if she hadn't been racist in her complaint and just talked about the problem, maybe something would have been done about it, but oh well, Karen's will be Karen's at the cost of abandoning common sense and human decency I suppose. Braddy kid tried to send his police officer dad after me. I was working at a Boy Scout summer camp and was the director of the rifle range. Every week we would get a new group of campers, and when they came up to the range for orientation I would go over all the safety rules. I would finish by telling the kids, you all get one warning on this range, and this is the warning, there are only two safe directions to point your rifles, up in the air, or down range. It doesn't matter if your gun is loaded or unloaded, if you break this rule and deliberately point your rifle in any other direction, you will be kicked off this range and will not be allowed to shoot here for the rest of the week. I would go over all of these rules again for the kids on the first day of merit badge classes to satisfy the safety rule requirement for the badge. One day the scouts in my merit badge class were practicing shooting for the test they had to take at the end of the week. One scout, a very bratty one who had already given other workers trouble beforehand, thought it would be funny to point his rifle at another scout and spout off some random action movie line. I ran up and snatched the rifle from his hands and yelled, what the hell are you doing? The entitled scout responds, but the gun wasn't loaded. Me, recite the safety rules now. Also this gun was loaded. Do you have any idea what you just did? The entitled scout recited all the rules, including the part about pointing the gun in a not safe direction. I told him to hand over his shooting ticket, I tore it in half and said he was done on my range for the rest of the week. I told him he was lucky I was not taking further action due to the firearm being loaded. Later that afternoon the range was open for free shooting. Everything was going smoothly, until I noticed the entitled scout walking up the trail towards the range with his father, an assistant scout master who was built like an NFL linebacker. After the round of shooting ended I called a cease fire and told my assistant to keep an eye on the range while I handled the situation that was about to happen. As I approached the entitled scout and his father, he jumped up and down, pointed at me and yelled, that's him. He's the one WHO tore up my ticket and kicked me off the range. He looks at me and yells, you're gonna get it now. My dad's a cop. And you're going to be sorry for what you did. Before I could get a word out, cop dad got in my face and started chewing my butt out drill sergeant style. I also remember the poop eating grin the entitled scout gave me as he watched his father tear me a new one. I just stood there quietly and patiently, waiting for my turn to respond. Finally cop dad said something along the lines of, so what do you have to say for yourself? I responded yes, I did tear up your son's shooting ticket and kicked him off my range. But did your son mention why I did that? Cop dad's face went from angry to inquisitive, he blinked in rapid succession as he said, no, now that you mention it he didn't tell me why. We both turned our attention to the entitled scout, his smile faded and he shrunk in our presence as he realized that his plan had just backfired. I loved returning the same poop-eating grin that he gave me a few moments earlier. To the entitled scout's credit, he did tell the truth, he probably knew better than to lie to cop dad. And if looks could unalive, the look on cop dad's face would have unalived his son several times over. After a moment of silence he finally said, in one of the most intimidating voices I've heard in my life, go back to camp, and wait for me at your tent, I'll deal with you soon. The entitled scout left to the tune of dead man walking. Cop dad turned to me and apologized for getting angry and chewing my butt out before knowing all the facts, to which I accepted his apology. For the rest of the week cop dad would come to the range every day during open shoot. 
shoot my rifles and would hang out and talk with me, it turned out he was actually a pretty cool guy. At the end of the week he told me that when they get home, he will finish his son's rifle shooting merit badge, and he'll make sure that his son will never disrespect a firearm ever again. I'm pretty sure I was always my wife's backup plan. My wife and I have been together for about 20 years, and have been having marital problems for the last few. It reached a boiling point a year and a half ago and we separated but got back together six months later. Part of the condition of getting back together was that we attend therapy every two weeks for an entire year. We only ended up doing therapy for about three months and my wife said she wasn't getting anything out of it and didn't see the point in going so often. We both disliked the therapist so I agreed and we had noticed that things were getting better so we were working on it on our own. The reasons we went to therapy and why we were having problems were, A, she was not attracted to me at all anymore, physically or emotionally. B, she didn't want me touching her, she felt repelled and repulsed by my touch and didn't want any type of physical affection. C, she wanted to explore her interests with other people, men or women. D, she wanted to be alone, she had this feeling that she would be happier by herself. Things were getting better until a few days ago. I found an old confession she had written out from 18 years ago when a mutual friend kissed her. I know of this event and my wife has always told me that he kissed her and she pushed him off, but this letter details how much she liked the attention and she actually pulled him into another room and they did the deed together. I asked her about it and she said it was so long ago that she didn't really remember, but said we're married and she's been faithful for the entire time of our marriage. I said that it would take me a little bit to get over it, but our marriage wasn't in jeopardy. I just needed some time to adjust. Friday night a guy friend of hers cut contact with her, as he was using my wife as an emotional support crutch and his therapist suggested he stop leaning on her so much. I didn't like how much they chatted but never voiced this. I asked her if there was more to this and she confessed that he's been saying I love you for a while and on Monday made a joke about how he liked her butt. All she said was dude really, you're so silly, and he apologized but I was upset that she didn't shut that down or draw a boundary. He was also asking her to hang out, just the two of them. Yesterday was a special anniversary for us and I wasn't in a good mood, we went for a walk and she kept asking me what was wrong so I told her, I said I'm upset about the cheating situation, I'm upset that she didn't set clear boundaries and shut his advances down sooner and I'm upset that I keep planning for activities for anniversaries for years and she couldn't be bothered to plan anything for today. As we were walking I noticed she was starting to cry and so we sat down on a bench. I asked her what was wrong and she basically told me she still wants to explore things in an intimate context with other people, she likes the attention she gets from other men, she still wants to be alone, and she's still repelled and repulsed by my touch and has been pretending for a a year but doesn't want any physical affection from me whatsoever. She says she doesn't want to lose me or the life we've built. We agreed to go back into therapy but after thinking about it last night, I'm not sure if I want to continue. She's lied about so much and I feel like I'm just her safety net. I'm pretty sure I was always my wife's backup plan. Last night I had a conversation with my wife. I started off by saying, I don't know what you thought you were going to accomplish by telling me that you were repelled by my touch, you want to explore your interests with other men and women and want to be alone. I think you thought if you were just being honest it was right and okay, but it showed me just how little respect you have for me. I don't think you realize just how insulting and disrespectful everything you said is. You do not consider my feelings at all, you seek validation from other men and never set any proper boundaries until either I find out or a line has been crossed. I literally cannot remember a time in 20 years where you have said stop, this is inappropriate and I don't think it should go any further. You let a friend tell you he loved you and liked your butt and you weren't even the one to stop communication, he was. His therapist could tell the conversation was unhealthy, I could tell the conversation was unhealthy but you couldn't. You either don't respect me enough to put my feelings ahead of your own need for validation or you simply don't care. I can't fix this, and you don't seem to want to fix this. I have been there for you for 20 years, I have never wavered in my love for you, my affection, my devotion, but you can't say the same. You clearly think you're missing out on something, and think exploring that in the arms of another person will fill that hole inside of you, but it won't. All it will do is leave you completely and entirely alone. Our family will be gone, I will be gone and you will have nothing at all because you think the grass might be greener on the other side. I can't imagine a person who has a loving husband who cares for them, respects them and thinks the world of them, who has three beautiful kids, a great support network, good friends and a loving family that thinks if they abandon their entire life for some fleeting new experience they will be fulfilled. You use me, plain and simple. I am a safety net for you, you can spend all the time in the world trying to figure yourself out and you'll have a safe spot to come home to, not a partner, not someone you treat as a husband, but someone you lie to, lead them on and take advantage of. I am not a fallback, I am not a safety net. I am a person who absolutely deserves love, touch, romance and admiration. I deserve respect and reciprocation. I want to be clear that I absolutely think you're not telling me about these issues and letting an entire year pass while letting me think things were improving and getting better is lying by omission. I will be attending therapy by myself, to find out why I've been such a doormat, to figure out why I've tolerated such abuse and neglect from the person that was supposed to guard and protect me, who was supposed to share my life forever. I am not at this time asking for a divorce, and provided you are not asking for one, things will need to move forward differently. You will need to attend therapy by yourself, after six months of both of us being in therapy we can talk about doing couples therapy. You will stop seeking validation from other men, I do not want to police your conversations but single men should not be people you talk daily with until you go through therapy and can clearly set boundaries and enforce them if they are broken. You have to win me back, you will have to woo me and get me to fall in love with you again. I expect romance, in dates and our daily lives. The fact that I can't be romantic with you because you decided you didn't like it, but also decided that because you don't like romance that I don't deserve it is very selfish. 
I will not under any circumstances accept an open marriage, I don't ever want to hear of it again, I am not okay with you being intimate with any man or woman other than myself, asking for monogamy shouldn't be that big of an ask and if that truly is a deal breaker for you, I understand and we can divorce and you can pursue other people. I acknowledge that some of what I'm saying is demanding but I am standing up for myself and what I want. I deserve better and will not settle for just enough any longer. If anything I've said here makes you want to say you are done, we can separate and file for divorce, we'll sell the house and agree upon a 50 to 50 custody agreement for the kids. I will never use the kids to hurt you and will co-parent with you to the absolute best of my abilities. Despite the harsh tone, I will still reiterate that I love you with all of my heart, and want to spend my entire life with you, watching our children grow up together. But I will not be an afterthought anymore, I won't play second fiddle to an imaginary life you might want to pursue. That was my monologue. One of the things she has always said to me when we have conversations is, I don't know if I'll ever be enough for you. She says this because she doesn't know if she can meet my expectations of what a good loving wife should be. I told her this time that you may think you don't know if you can be enough for me, but I right now know you are not. We talked for a while and she is going to therapy, we are going to work on our relationship, I can't just throw away 20 years without giving it my absolute all. What's the dumbest thing you've ever done when absolutely baked? I smoke a lot. Usually the equivalent of four J's a night and every so often me and my wife will take brownies to start it off before we smoke. A buddy of mine stopped by my work two days ago and we talked for a bit, he's leaving and he asked me if I want a brownie with 500 milligrams. I thought that may or may not be fun, let me find out. I pop the brownie 15 minutes before I leave work and drive the 5 minutes home. I talk to the wife and the kids for a bit and everything is great. I go outside with my wife. We smoke a bowl and marinate nicely on the couch for an hour. Everything is perfect. I mean I'm baked as giraffe nerds, I'm seeing in Swedish and smelling colors, but that was the point right? Kids go to bed, we snack a bit, and decide to smoke another bowl as well as eat a brownie of our own. We come back inside to watch some TV. I take a shower and it is one of the best experiences I've had in my life. I could feel every molecule of water on my body. However looking back I realize I tried to pass out multiple times while I was there. I get out and throw some sleep pants on, returning to the living room with my wife, both still as baked as a fresh out of the oven chocolate chip cookie by grandma. We talk, watch a Vin Diesel movie and decide to go to the bedroom for a little private time. I remember thinking to myself, these brownies ain't all that. This is when the effing bear reached out and tried to take my soul, word to David Goggins, with his sticky little claws. My reality and everyone else's reality at this point do not exist fully together. I'm told this is the first time I will bounce off the floor. I know as I pull myself up and know instantly that the night is about to go bad so I focus on my wife who always means the world to me but right now is my everything, I try to pull myself together and talk to her. Then I turn around and find the source of all the current problems. I never name this. Entity that torments me for the next two hours and have no memory of a visual. But according to my wife he was a huge piece of crap and an a-hole, those everyone, are my words. Apparently I swung at this entity for 10 minutes straight while screaming only to collapse on the floor after and rejoice as I have defeated him. But then he gets back up after being defeated. I see this and scream you're not taking any of us and the fight is on. I start throwing punches and then crumple to the floor. My wife rushes to me and helps me up. I'm able to focus on her and be fine but anytime I turn my head I'm convinced someone right there is going to take me or my family since every time I look away I'm screaming, you won't take me, my kids or especially her. The fight rages a few more times with me fighting this thing in my head, but every time my wife touches me I let her control my actions, placing me on the bed or holding my arms behind my back as I cuss and degrade this entity. Whenever I'm looking at her I'm able to regain my sanity for a bit. Every time I can see her I'm telling her how much she means to me. I start to pull it all together. I remember looking at her saying we should have intimacy, that way I can focus, reboot my brain and I can stop this bullcrap. Pulling from all the past bad experiences from half as much grass, thinking I knew exactly what was going on. My friends, I did not fully understand the level of effed up I was, because now I am fully unclothed and for some reason, oiled myself up, and the fight is on. I am gladiator style fighting this thing, ball swinging in the gentle breeze. I allow my wife to control me again and we lay in bed. I would lay there trying to calm myself only to find myself on the floor over and over. My torso is bruised all over from bouncing off the end table. After this point I knew what was there for me, since he was pulling me off the bed and trying to pull me with him through the floor. I remember pulling myself up. Off the floor trying to escape with the entity pulling heavily on me. Fighting with every bit of my strength screaming that I won't effing go and it wasn't strong enough to take me. I'm sure the wife is beyond sick of me at this point but she is an amazing person and just tried to calm me and be my rock over and over. Then standing unclothed and oiled up at the end of the bed, Bleeding from a self-inflicted cedar trunk wound on my shin, I start talking. This everyone, is the end of my world and I'm not letting it happen. I'm gonna argue my way out of it so I can stay and protect my family. My argument? Indecipherable to any human, including my wife, but I cried and yelled a lot, the entity by the way is still a huge piece of crap. Then realizing I wasn't dying but the universe that revolved around me was crashing like a computer program I accepted my fate and laid holding my loving wife. I laid there, with her consoling me, lying to me that it was just the brownies. I waited for the end of all existence. I felt my racing heart rate calm and stop. I felt her heart stop with mine. I flowed through the cosmos as different feelings in a pitch black out of body experience. This time right here with my wife holding me almost made it worth it. Not really but I did enjoy it. Then I woke up yesterday extremely sore, still kinda baked and went to work. I came to grips it was just the brownie and for the first time in about two years did not smoke last night. 
I found video evidence of my husband cheating, with one video in particular making me throw up. Yesterday my husband asked me to use his phone to open his bank app. I do this all the time but this time while scrolling to the app I saw a new app downloaded on his phone that I didn't recall seeing before. It was a calculator app which I found strange considering he has an iPhone and iPhones automatically come with a built-in calculator. I didn't know what to make of this so I just pretended like I didn't see it and made a mental note of the app's default picture so I could look it up myself later. After we went to bed last night I found the app on my phone. It turned out to be an app that's made to look like a calculator but in reality it was a hidden photo and video app where you enter a passcode and you can store all your private videos and photos. I felt sick to my stomach and although I'm not proud of it, when I was sure he was 100% asleep I took his phone to the bathroom and I went through it. I started with his messages and socials and found nothing. The last thing I decided to check was this app. His passcode wasn't hard to figure out and it turns out he's been cheating on me with a woman who I assume is his co-worker for about 7 or so months as far as I could tell. There were screenshot conversations, pics of her, and worst of all there were photos and videos of them together. Not out and about or anything, just all intimate in nature. I wanted to throw up but I forced myself to look through them, and one video of them in particular made my skin crawl. He works the night shift at his job and it is starting to get chilly where we live, especially at night. In this particular video he was being the slimy dirty cheater he is with her in the car we share. They were in the passenger seat and she was on top. In the video she mentioned being cold and this effing slime ball paused, reached into the back seat and grabbed our toddler son's blanket and wrapped it. Around her. The video ended a few minutes later and he used the same blanket to wipe himself and clean up the mess. I was shaking at this point and could not watch any further as this crossed a line in my brain that almost made me snap. But somehow I remained calm, put his phone back, and went to sleep in our son's room for the rest of the night, stopping in the bathroom to puke first. It's the next morning and it's taking everything in me not to blow up on him, but I want to hit him where it hurts the most. I have contacted a divorce lawyer and plan to get evidence of this the next time I get the chance, and will leave them all plus divorce papers waiting for him once he gets off work. All while me and our son's stuff is packed up and gone to my mother's house. My boyfriend says things that make me scared and uncomfortable, he becomes angry when I point them out. I have been dating my boyfriend for two months. He is 32 and I'm 19. We've been having a great time hanging out, I like him a lot. The only thing that's been bugging me a bit is that when he references any woman, a celebrity, co-worker, or even his cousin on one occasion, he'll say something intimate and borderline creepy. Something usually along the lines of how hot they are, and how he would turn into Joe Goldberg for them. The other night, I went to bed and he joked that he worried he wouldn't sleep if he couldn't his pee-pee down because of Margot Robbie from a show we just watched. I thought I should be honest and say something, hey, can I be honest with you about something? I get uncomfortable sometimes because it seems like every time you bring up any woman, you see them in a weird light. It makes me worry that you see me as an object or that I'm just a notch on your belt, which is fine if that's your prerogative, but I need to know that. I offered to sleep on the couch if he was uncomfortable with me saying that. He was quiet and got up and I found him sleeping on the couch, in his own house. I tried to tell him to sleep in his own bed, but he asked me to please just let him sleep. In the morning, he was short-tempered and offended. We've talked over text since then, he sees this as me accusing him when he hasn't done anything to warrant that, he says I'm projecting from relationships with people 10 years younger than him, and said that this clearly wasn't going to work out if I was going to try and police his language. He thinks it's concerning that we've been seeing each other for such a short amount of time and that I unloaded on him at 1 a.m., and that it triggered his fight or flight. He said he's uncomfortable being alone with me now. I've apologized for hurting him by bringing our relationship into it, and explained that I thought I was being transparent and honest, but he said it was seriously insulting and said that no other woman he's dated has brought it up as an issue, which I didn't find to be a solid argument, because everyone has different preferences or levels of comfort with this subject matter. For context, he really is very sweet and caring. That night he'd stayed up watching an entire season of a show with me because it was important to me, I loved it and I thought he'd love it. I think he's taken it slow physically because he's respected a potential power difference, we didn't even kiss the first few times, we just slept next to each other and were affectionate and cuddly. He's admitted that he likes me and likes being around me even at work, which felt big because I know he's not great at being emotionally vulnerable. I've tried to reciprocate whenever he is to show him that I value how hard that can be. I asked a few friends co-workers for their thoughts yesterday because I was with them, and they each thought it was a valid concern. One said it's like when you tell someone what they said was racist and they're defensive instead of receptive to change, and the other said that he thinks he's been having a bit of struggles with self-esteem and vulnerability. They also brought up that he might see himself as having more life experience and thus being right, even though there isn't really a right or wrong here. My boyfriend says things that make me scared and uncomfortable, he becomes angry when I point them out. I ended up dumping that mother ever. Everyone in my life who thought this is a major red flag and this guy seems like a creep was 100% right. I was lonely and stressed at the time, had standards that were way too low and was a people pleaser and a pushover. I'd been in an abusive relationship when I was a young teenager, which does not necessarily teach you the signs, if anything, you're more prone to similar relationships in the future. This dude was definitely beginning the emotional cycle, and I am so lucky that my time with him was brief and casual. 
If I had to pick, one of the most disturbing things he did after this was repeatedly playfully saying that if I got pregnant, we'd have to get a shotgun marriage, with a prenup to protect mommy and daddy's money of course. Same dude who insisted on raw dog or no dog thank god for IUDs. Anyway, we briefly saw each other some more after, but pulled away because I was heading back to college soon and simultaneously realizing that being thirsty didn't mean I should drink poison. I spent my last few weeks in town smoking grass and playing Mario Party with my awesome work friends. I had one last lame hookup when I visited a couple weekends after classes started and it just reminded me how much he sucked. He would still try to text me for a little while after that, and I wish I could say I was a badass and reamed him out but I just gradually ghosted him. I came back to work around the holidays and I got looped in that he was pursuing a relatively new hire, a 17-year-old girl, and when I talked to her I found out he made up some bullcrap that painted me as a crazy ex-figure, so I showed her receipts of me ghosting him and his general douchebaggery. He did a whole boo who I feel so guilty so, she struggled to pull away at first too, but thankfully succeeded. She didn't make the mistake of dating him, but still ended up getting the baby joke threats. My boyfriend passed away six months ago. Two months ago I was the victim of rope and lost the child we were supposed to have together. I now need to testify in court. Six months ago I lost the love of my life unexpectedly to liver failure. I was three months pregnant at the time but didn't find out until he was already in total failure. He never knew. Two months later when I was five months pregnant, I was walking home one night when I was attacked in an alley by my house. It was a brutal act, it was rope. My bump was visible at this point. This event was what led to the loss of my child. Thankfully, the police caught him three days later. He's been charged with a mosaic of effed up crimes. He is facing up to 60 years I think. And since then I've been navigating the criminal justice system in a sort of days for months now hoping it would never make it to this point. The trial. The trial is now exactly one month away and I start trial prep with the DA's office tomorrow. This man is claiming we had rough intimacy that was okay with both parties. I guess this is a common defense in cases where there's DNA. I'm so terribly worried about the trial. Mostly because I break down in tears anytime someone even says my boyfriend's name. Let alone anytime we actually talk about him. I'm terrified I'm going to come across as a crazy and grief-stricken crazy crying woman and make the jury think I was desperate and would actually agree to rough intimacy in a disgusting alley in the middle of Wisconsin winter with a man I've never met before. Because I just know that I won't be able to stop crying during my testimony. I cry even thinking about it let alone talking about it. I'm thinking about dropping out of the case as a witness. Rather than risk not being believed by a jury. My boyfriend passed away six months ago. Two months ago I was the victim of rope and lost the child we were supposed to have together. I now need to testify in court. When it finally came time to write my victim impact statement, I couldn't seem to put pen to paper. I spent weeks working on it. Then after a lot of soul searching, I realized that mercy, empathy and healing were more important to me than any anger I had left. After I realized that, I wrote my entire statement in one night. When I looked up after reading it in court, I saw tears coming down the judge's face. When I looked over at the man who did it, he was crying too. So was his family. And so was mine. The judge approved the only request I had, to allow for restorative justice programming if and when we would ever want to pursue that. After the hearing, the victim's advocate gave me a hug and thanked me for having the courage to say something so powerful. I told her I meant every word. This was my statement, thank you your honor, for allowing me this opportunity to address the court today. This crime that the defendant committed against me has affected every facet of my life. Before all this happened, I knew who I was and I liked who I was. I was certain that the groundwork provided by my education, my military service, and flourishing professional career would stand me in good stead whatever challenges may lay ahead. I was proud, I was independent and optimistic about my future. But unfortunately, the actions of the defendant on one horrible night irreversibly changed me in the course of my life in so many ways. After this, it felt like my life wasn't mine anymore. In one night, he shattered me into a thousand pieces, and I have spent the last 13 and a half months cleaning up the mess he made. For a long time, I was not a functioning person. After this happened, I couldn't sleep for months. I stayed up, rocking back and forth with the lights on, my bedroom door barricaded because I was so afraid. You see your honor, when you don't know where your attacker is, then he is everywhere. He is every sound in the night. Every noise outside your window. Always coming to get you. I spent endless nights unable to sleep, plagued by nightmares replaying what had happened to me. There were many days I couldn't even get out of bed, let alone leave my house. When I did manage to get out, I was in a constant state of hypervigilance, jumping at every little sound or movement behind me. I missed countless hours at work and my performance suffered as a result. I fell behind on my bills, even my mortgage at one point, and am still working on picking up the pieces in the many other areas of my life. For weeks, I cried every time I went to the bathroom because of the pain from the injuries, a constant reminder of the worst night of my life. I am often riddled with anxiety and every time I feel frozen with panic, I am reminded of the sheer terror I felt while he did what he did to the point that I could barely move. I still wish I would've fought back harder but in hindsight, my body was frozen in both fear and pain. 
The moment he put it in my back door, an act that I had never experienced before that moment, it felt like my body had been split into two. The kind of pain where you're frozen in place. A kind of pain I will surely never forget. It consumes you and there is nothing you can do. When it was over, I remember running away in fear, thinking that he would surely come after me. Another feeling that still sticks with me to this day. The flashbacks did not begin for several months but once they did, they came with a fury. On a good day, they would last for only a few seconds, leading me into a panic attack with a lingering aftermath lasting a day or two. On a bad day, they went on for what seemed like hours and were every bit as physically and emotionally painful as the real event often resulting in several days of missed work to recover. On the worst day, I was hospitalized. For the first time in my life, I am taking medications for things like anxiety, sleep, mood and nightmares. Over the past year, I've attended over 30 appointments with my medical providers, most of them for psychiatric services or mental health therapy, but several were also for mental health urgent care and even one hospitalization. I am very fortunate to receive low-cost health care because without it, I'm not sure I would be in the place I am today. In total, my medical bills amounted to only hundreds of dollars, as reflected in the restitution form, but more so I think they truly represent the significant impact this has had on me. For a long time, my faith in others was destroyed. I silently condemned every man I didn't know, since I automatically assumed that their only intention was to hurt me. I felt unreasonable revulsion for any individuals who looked like the defendant, making it nearly impossible at times to interact with fellow colleagues, my healthcare professionals, and even some friends, all at no fault of their own, but all because they simply resembled the defendant. I think it's worth mentioning that I do not know the defendant, he is a complete stranger to me. I am not out to get him because I don't even know him. I still remember the officer asking me if I knew the name of the man who had done that to me, and I realized I had no idea who he was, a feeling I fear may stay with me for a very long time to come. In fact, I did not even learn his name until several days after he was arrested when someone at the DA's office casually brought it up in conversation without the slightest idea that I was hearing his name for the first time. I'll never forget that moment. It took my breath away. Even now, over a year later, there's a sort of empty hole inside of me because of this and there's not a single day that goes by where I don't think about what the defendant did to me. Probably the most unpleasant feeling is that of the lasting guilt. Not for the rope that was on the defendant, but for the consequences of doing the right thing and reporting to the authorities, putting a man behind bars and causing his loved ones to suffer immensely. I think about this often. The punishment he receives today will no doubt be difficult for him, but I am someone who generally looks for the best in people and I have to believe that you, Mr. Defendant, are strong enough to overcome this, and that somewhere in the process you will seize the opportunities for healing and growth. The most important thing is to ensure events like these don't happen, ever. In reality, I do not believe people should be defined by the worst moment of their life and what I seek more than anything else is peace of mind. Having in a sense been served with my own sentence, I must find a way to live out my life in peace. If it were up to me, the only resolution I would seek is that of restorative justice. I want nothing more than for the defendant to take responsibility for his actions, understand the significant impact that this has had on not only me, but many others in both of our lives, and to learn from this, so that all parties involved can move on with their lives. Which leads me to the only request I have for you today, your honor. I ask that you consider amending the no contact order to allow for an exception for the case of restorative justice programming. I understand that this is not the time or place to facilitate restorative justice practices and that the purpose of the judicial court is to hold individuals criminally responsible for their actions so, I will only say this further. I hope one day, Mr. Defendant, you can find the courage from knowing that your participation in this type of programming will not result in punitive punishment. You know what happened on the night of January. You know and I know. And you can't erase that. Most importantly, remember that you are paying the price of your own choices, while I have to pay the price of a choice that you did not give me. This request I ask of the judge today is about giving you the opportunity to take accountability for your actions and a chance to make things right, not only for you and me, but for all of our loved ones who have been affected by this as well. I sincerely hope that you find strength, companionship, and moments of peace to reflect in these difficult days. I wish safety, health, and continued support from your loved ones while in incarceration. I know that I would not have made it here today without the incredible support network that I have found in my family, colleagues, and friends since this happened. After finishing your punishment, I sincerely hope you reintegrate quickly into society and go on to live a happy life. Most importantly, I hope you are able to find the inner courage within to accept accountability for your actions. And with that being said, I leave here today your honor, with a sense of peace, confident in knowing that whatever you decide for sentencing today will be appropriate and just. After all, justice is not justice, if it is not just for all. Thank you. He ended up getting 25 years. I catfished my stalker and ruined her life. Years ago my boyfriend and I were in a rocky relationship. We argued a lot, drank excessively, and treated each other poorly. We both decided to join a dating site in an attempt to find happiness elsewhere. However, we sat down and had a heart-to-heart -heart conversation about what was wrong in our relationship and decided to try and fix it. On the dating site my partner was chatting with another woman. 
he was open about it, and I trusted him completely. But this woman started texting him in an obsessive manner every single day, becoming overly pushy and intrusive, cracking many jokes about me and becoming borderline threatening towards me specifically. My partner felt uncomfortable, so he told me he wanted to stop talking to her. I supported his decision. Despite his decision, she continued texting him the following week. She even sent him tickets for a concert he loved, along with a message that set off alarm bells for me. I decided to message her and tell her that her actions were inappropriate. I tried to be understanding of her feelings, but she didn't take kindly to my message. Instead of continuing to message my partner, she began sending me abusive messages, threats, and insults every weekend. She claimed that my partner loved her and that he was cheating on me with her. She even said she was watching me and commented on my appearance. No matter how many accounts I blocked, she created new ones. I stayed resilient and didn't let her hurtful words get to me. This pattern of harassment continued for literal years, even after my boyfriend and I had a baby and were leading a happy, normal life, except for the constant intrusion by this stranger every weekend. It escalated to the point where she mentioned our child and threatened to come to our house, stating our address. We finally decided to involve the police. We provided them with all the messages, her name and her contact details, hoping they would put an end to this. When the police returned, they informed us that she lived with her fiancé and two teenage boys. Her behavior was highly unusual for someone with her seemingly stable life. So I did some investigating and discovered that she had been harassing me while being engaged for 15 years and having two kids of her own. We thought that the harassment would stop after involving the police, but it didn't. We only had about three weeks of peace before she messaged me directly, insulting my life and boasting about hers. At this point I had enough. I decided to message her and told her to leave us alone and focus on her own fiancé. She had no idea that we knew about her personal life, and that sent her into a frenzy. She began copying everything we did, especially on social media where I'm an Instagram blogger with a successful page. She contacted my friends, family, work and endorsement companies, spreading lies about my partner cheating with her. This pushed my partner to the edge, and he decided to call her. She didn't answer the call, but she messaged him, expressing her love and desire to be with him. My partner told her that he would file another police report, blocked her number again, and we hoped that would be the end of it. However the very next night, the police showed up at our door. An anonymous report had been filed, claiming that I was on the receiving end of domestic abuse. I was beyond furious and showed the police all the messages she had sent. They believed us and said they would issue her a second warning. I was exhausted after enduring this torment for nearly four years. I just wanted it all to stop. So I decided to do something completely out of character. With a friend's permission, I used his photos to create a fake account, pretending to be him. I spent a week making the account look genuine and then added her as a friend. I began interacting with her, being friendly, and she started opening up about her life. She confided in me about her unhappiness in her relationship, feeling insecure, and not truly in love with her fiancé. It became clear that she was projecting her own issues onto me. She sent inappropriate photos and messages, which I saved. Eventually, I revealed my true identity and advised her to work on herself. She responded with insults, but then she disappeared. For a while, things seemed quiet. But one day, she reappeared in my personal messages, berating me, and claiming that my partner didn't love me and that I was ugly. She even sent explicit photos and messages, completely inappropriate for an engaged woman. She told this man she was attracted to him and wanted to have an affair. After a few more disturbing messages, I decided to shut down the fake account, saving the entire conversation. A day later, after I had returned to being myself on social media, I faced a barrage of verbal abuse, all directed at me and my kids. At that point, I had had enough. I decided to take drastic action. I sent her all the evidence of everything I had uncovered and done. I told her that I felt sorry for her and that she needed to address her issues and be a better person, fiancé, and mother. I warned her that if she didn't change, I would expose everything to her partner. I expected her to lose control, but instead, she sent me a single message, calling me a loser, claiming she was better than me, expressing pity for me, and asserting that my partner loved me. Then she vanished. She deleted all her fake and real social media accounts. It's been a while now, and it's been peaceful without her. My daughter is treating my son terribly and I can't understand why. My husband has a 17-year-old daughter Christina and I have a 16-year-old son Jacob. They have never been overly close siblings, but weren't sworn enemies either. When Christina was 10 she was the victim of rope by a family member that saw them convicted and go to jail. She was in intensive therapy for years and we are so proud of the strong, confident and intelligent young woman she is today. She has always been very private about it. Besides our family, her lifelong best friend knew, and that was it. My son however, knew about the abuse too. He told some friends about it two months ago nonchalantly, in a joking manner, and before you know it, the whole school knew. Christina was devastated to say the least. She's been back in counseling since and has been coping as well as possible. 
Christina blew up at Jacob when this first happened and he saw the fallout of her coping with this firsthand. But since that night when she found out he told people and word was going around, she hasn't spoken a word to him. She doesn't look at him when he enters a room, or react when he speaks directly to her, or about her, or anything else of the sort. For example at dinner, she'll speak to us and he'll chime in and she continues the conversation as though he hadn't said anything. I find it super disrespectful and have confronted her about this, but she refuses to explain herself. Jacob has tried daily to talk to her and apologized, begged, pleaded and cried and it's always the same, she'll usually crack a book open, look at her phone, put some airpods in and ignore him completely. I'm at a complete loss. Jacob is on total lockdown, he's lost his phone, video games, any sort of privilege or ability to do things with friends, he essentially goes to school, comes home, does his homework and goes to bed and he knows we are devastated and beyond disappointed. I believe he's sincerely sorry and contrite, he's broken. Down crying and apologizing to us more times than I can count, but I'm unsure of how to proceed. I believe Christina is treating Jacob unfairly, and will try to push her to forgive Jacob as I believe that is the right thing to do. Am I wrong for not agreeing to become a stay-at-home wife when I retire? I'm retiring in about three months and my husband and I disagree on how the division of labor should be once that happens. Since meeting my husband, I have been very vocal about my plans to retire when I turn 40, and gave up things to meet this goal. My husband on the other hand won't be able to retire until at least 62. I've said in the past that I'm not going to be doing all of the cooking, cleaning, and finances once I retire because I don't want to replace one job with another. I currently do all of the cooking, most of the finances, and probably 25% of the cleaning. He recently made a casual comment about how he's going to start working more overtime once I retire because he'll have less household stuff to do. I asked him what he meant by that since my retirement doesn't really change anything for him, and that I preferred he didn't work more overtime so that we could spend time together. He said that most husbands with stay-at-home wives don't clean the house. I didn't know what to say because I thought we had already discussed this, so I tried my best to change the subject, but we had an argument about it yesterday at dinner and he's now giving me the silent treatment. I slept in the guest room last night as he locked our bedroom door and wouldn't let me in. I just don't know how to get through to him. Even though I'll no longer be working, I won't be a stay-at-home wife. To me, a stay-at-home partner is the manager of the home and doesn't bring in much, if any income. Their job is to take care of the home. I'm not trading one job for another, I'm retiring. I'm still bringing in income, I've just planned my life so I no longer have to work 9 to 5 to do so. I have multiple hobbies that I have been super excited about devoting more time to. I love rock hounding, crocheting and hiking. I'm an unpublished writer and have always dreamed of becoming published. I have a lifestyle blog and a pretty active Pinterest following, I thought I communicated my expectations, but he's saying that he doesn't ever remember talking about it and that he's not okay with me retiring if I'm just going to be lazy. I don't see it that way, am I wrong? Am I wrong for not agreeing to become a stay-at-home wife when I retire? I tried to talk to him the next day about it and tried to remain calm, but he was so defensive and accusatory that I was getting very frustrated. We weren't very productive and we ended our talk with him denying that I pay 70% of the expenses even though we planned this out and budget together based on it. I told him I'd go through our expenses to prove it. And being the person that I am, I did so the next day. This is where the problem starts. When I was going through our expenses, I found a charge on my husband's credit card from two weeks ago that I did not recognize. It was not an insignificant amount so I originally looked into it just to see if it was a household or personal expense to use in my calculations. It turned out to be a bill paid to a law office. For very obvious reasons I wanted to know more information on why he was being billed by a law office. I looked up the office and it was a divorce attorney specializing in property division. I logged into his email and found his conversations with said lawyer. He was trying to find a way to overturn our prenup so he gets half instead of what is agreed upon in our prenup and wanted to try and get alimony as well. I had no idea he wasn't happy until we started arguing on Saturday. That morning, he woke me up with breakfast in bed, a total surprise since it wasn't a special day and he almost never cooks. Two weeks ago, we had a Star Wars movie marathon and ran around the house in a lightsaber battle. Last month, he communicated that he felt like we weren't spending as much time together as we normally do, so I planned more date nights. He's gotten me flowers at least once a week for months now. I just didn't understand why he wanted to divorce, without even trying to express what he was feeling to me first. When I went all the way back to the very first emails, a woman named Ashley was brought up. I tried to think of a way to confirm my suspicions without him suspecting that I know what he's been up to. On Saturdays, we sometimes get takeout, so I purposely left my phone upstairs and asked him if I could use his to order the food, and I was taking too long to figure out what I wanted so he went downstairs to finish what he was doing, giving me more time. It was hard to wait that long without letting on what I knew, but from Thursday to Saturday I began to get a plan in place. I spoke with a divorce attorney and scheduled my consultation, and made sure I had any legal and financial documents I may need. On Saturday when I went through his phone, I found Instagram messages between him and Ashley. By going through the messages and looking at her account, I figured out a lot about her. Ashley seems to be a nice girl he met on Tinder back in May. 
She is 27 and married to her high school sweetheart who can't bring in enough income for her to be a stay-at-home wife. Considering my husband works in tech, he is obviously the better option. He's lied to her about wanting to have kids and has told her that it's the reason he is unhappy in our marriage. I don't know what he's thinking she's going to do when she finds out he had a vasectomy. Ashley is apparently willing to be a proper woman and do wifely duties. From cross-checking dates, when he's supposed to be hanging out with friends or at a work thing, he's actually with her. She has a weird work schedule so she sometimes comes over to our house on the days he works from home and I'm in the office. She is convinced that after they both go through their respective divorces, that they'll live in the house together, get married and have kids. He has just gone along with everything she says. He's told her that I'm lazy and hardly make any money, and that I wanted to quit my job and not do any work which is why he's finally gotten the courage to leave me. He said that he's taking extra care in the divorce because he doesn't want to. Leave me with nothing. He also told her I changed my mind about having kids and that I'm denying him his masculine desire to continue his lineage. I reached out to Ashley's husband so they're probably heading towards divorce as well. He seems like a nice enough guy, also totally blindsided by the affair. I told my husband I was divorcing him last night and told him he could either sleep in one of the guest rooms or get a hotel room. He chose the latter. My boyfriend of 8 years wants to open our relationship. I met my boyfriend 9 years ago through some friends. We instantly took a liking to each other and started dating. In the first year of our relationship, it was long distance. We both agreed after I finished my schooling, I would go live with him. I had to leave behind everything. Friends and family, a perfect job offering with an amazing salary with this company I had interned in previous years. I thought he was worth it. So I moved to where he lives, everything was good. We talked about our future, both agreed we would get married at 30. We focus on our jobs and ourselves. We fought but could never be mad at each other for longer than a few hours. We bought a house together with a nice yard the perfect home for our future together. Last night while we were eating dinner, he told me he wanted to talk about something. He started off by saying he loved me and that I'm perfect to him. I thought he was going to propose to me. Instead he told me that he is polyamorous. That he had just realized that and that he wanted to open our relationship. I asked if I did anything wrong for him wanting to open the relationship, wondering if I didn't satisfy him enough emotionally and intimately. He said no and that is just who he is. I told him that I only believed in monogamy. I can't personally see myself with anyone but him. He told me that I was being ignorant when I told him I only wanted him. I backtracked into what I was saying, so I asked him if he already thought of another woman. That he wants instead of me. He tried to deny it but he said there was a woman he met. That she is also Polly. That they never did anything and that I shouldn't worry about it. I couldn't believe it, I didn't know what to say, so I finished dinner in silence. That night I chose to sleep in the guest room. I couldn't bear to look at him. I started thinking of all the things and opportunities I had missed. Like my dream job, my friends. Missing life achievements of my nieces and nephews, and not spending enough time with my mother before she passed away. All of the eight years I had just went away, left a sour taste in my mouth. I regret the life I had in the past eight years. Keep thinking of who would have been, what I would be doing. This morning, he didn't go to work because he said felt like crap because I slept separately. So we talked about everything, I told him that I cannot be with someone like him. That I didn't want to enter an open relationship. I told him I wanted to leave. He started crying and said he couldn't change who he is why I would say that I regret our time together. I told him because he wasted my time and our future together just disappeared. I told him it would take me time to learn to not love him anymore. I thanked him for the past eight years together. He said he takes it all back and that he'll stop talking to her, that he doesn't want our relationship to end. But I can't do that to someone I love, I cannot hold someone back from becoming who they are. If he is Polly I don't care. But it's just not who I am. Doctors, what's your thank God they came in for a second opinion moment? As an eye doctor, I have seen a lot. The dumbest case was when a patient came in and just wanted to get her specs updated before getting some new glasses. We decided to just run the regular gamut tests anyway just because we might as well while she was there, as she had come in complaining beforehand. She was a 50-year-old woman, fairly normal exam, perfect vision, retina showed healthy, but something about her pupils really bothered me before I dilated. We chatted about it and I asked her if she banged her head or anything weird and she said no, but suddenly revealed this crazy history of an old tumor she had removed a few years ago. She had decided to omit this from her history with us as she didn't feel it was important, but we went and put it into the charts anyway. Turns out she got a CT done two weeks prior to her exam with me which she says turns up completely normal. I tell her she should tell her doctor about this anyway just to cover our bases. Fast forward, she shows up in my office ecstatic to tell me that my examination revealed that her tumor had returned with an incredible vengeance. She had no idea, was totally asymptomatic and the CT she had prior to me showed what was very literally the size of a speck of dust which the radiologist dismissed as artifact. On her return to her doctor, they decided to rerun the CT to cover their bases, and they found a quarter-sized tumor. Within two weeks the tumor went from the size of a dust particle to a quarter. She was rushed into emergency surgery as the tumor was growing super fast and was close to a blood vessel which could cause a massive stroke. She had it removed that day and returned to me after recovery to tell me of what got discovered as a result of my testing. 
She is now a long-time regular patient I have been seeing for about 10 years. My boyfriend convinced me to try cuckolding and it destroyed our relationship. I met my boyfriend Jake three years ago when I worked as a cam girl. He started out as one of my regular customers but I became very attracted to him. I quit cam girling for him and he actually lived kind of close to me, so I moved. Jake and I had pretty much the same down bad interest in the bedroom, and we also had great chemistry on a personal level and we really loved each other. For the most part we had a femme-dominated dynamic in the bedroom, with his nickname for me being Mommy. It worked great for us. We also would watch adult films together and share fantasies with each other. About two years and he shared something I did not expect. While we were messing around, watching adult films he said I want to show you something and put on a cuckolding video and ask what do you think. I was surprised and asked if he's into that, to which he replied he's never tried it, but has strong and vivid dreams about doing it. Then he made a suggestion that we should try. I refused. He kept bringing it up for about a month, but I was kind of hesitant to entertain the idea. My gut feeling told me that it's a bad idea to bring it into our relationship. But Jake did seem genuinely excited and kept persisting, so in the end I decided to ignore my intuition and give it a try. We created a Tinder profile, wrote in the description that we are a cuckolding couple looking for a stud and it took about 30 minutes to find a good candidate. The same day we went on a coffee date just to see if we have a good vibe together, which we did, and we invited him into our bedroom after that. It actually went amazing. I feel kind of guilty but he was better than Jake, a lot better. Jake watched the whole time too, but seemed indifferent about it all. I think he noticed I actually enjoyed it more than I usually did with him. After the deed was done and the guy left, I immediately saw that something was off with Jake, there was an extremely awkward tension in the room, which I had never experienced with him before. I tried to break it up by saying well what do you think? And Jake did not reply. Since that moment, our relationship started going downhill. Jake suddenly became very cold and distant, passive-aggressive and sometimes just aggressive. He would get quite abusive when drunk, which was also something completely new. He did not want to be intimate with me anymore and was avoiding it like the plague. After almost a year of this self-destruction, I finally mustered up the courage to say the truth out loud, that the whole cuckolding experiment ruined our relationship, that the other dude was better in bed, and that Jake bruffed this one upon himself. In that moment Jake lost his temper on a biblical level, with broken furniture, glass shards on the floor, and a kicked-in TV screen, calling me names I didn't even know existed. I was terrified and that night I left to sleep in a hotel. We officially broke up the next day. I hit that guy up again and rented a hotel with him. What is the greatest song lyric you have ever heard? Dead in the middle of Little Italy Little did we know that we riddled some middleman who didn't do diddly, big pun. And you'll see how I flip, like exclamation points, J. Cole. I'm looking nothing like your papa, I wouldn't give a chick 10 cent to put cheese on a whopper, they wanna know why I'm so fly, a girl asked me for a ring and I put one around her whole eye, big L. I'm doing drive beats in tinted Corvettes on Vietnam War vets, I'm more or less sick in the head, maybe more cuz I smoked dope today yesterday and the day before, Eminem. And nothing I could ever write would help you understand this life there's so much beauty when your eyes lay lost in all the city lights, the wax will drip as so as blood romance is dead and all is lust you are the water in my lungs, we've lost it all, motionless in white. All of dance with the devil by immortal technique. I'm applying pressure to your shooters like Kawhi the Claw, Conway the Machine. We used to fuss when the landlord dissed us no heat, wonder why Christmas missed us, Biggie. The square root of 69 is 8 something, Drake. Will Smith don't got a cuss in his raps to sell records. Well I do. So F him, and F you too. You think I give a damn about a Grammy. Half of you critics can't even stomach me, let alone stand me. But Slim what if you win wouldn't it be weird? Why so you guys could just lie and get me here, sit me there next to Britney Spears, crap Christina Aguilera better switch me chairs so I old, sit next to Carson Daly and Fred Durst, and hear M argue over who she gave brain to first. Eminem. Broke my best friend's little sister? Enjoy the same in prison but multiplied by 10. Growing up I always seemed to float between two worlds. In school I was a mysterious and quiet nerd that was left alone, but at home I ran with a rough crowd and was always getting into trouble with the law. Between the drinking, the fighting, the substances and other dumb stuff, I always tried to keep those two worlds separate. I got moved to a different school due to being autistic, so keeping the two separate was pretty easy for the most part. At times, the two sides of me would overlap, and I would expose my true colors at school. Once in woodwork class a kid was seriously messing with me and told me he would bang my sister, so I sent him to the hospital. I sent the message and it was heard loud and clear. I pretty much had the reputation of don't F with him, when he snaps he is dangerous. As I cleaned up my drinking and substance use I figured I would leave the violence behind as well. But it did not, I used it to fend the darkness within, the feeling of it was better than any substance. Fast forward some years and I am attending a local community college and while I am no longer running with the same violent crowd, I still see them every now and then. I am taking some classes with my friend's little sister and have seen her go from a bratty little girl, to a woman who was now another younger sister to me. She had started dating a guy who I knew to be a real piece of crap from high school. This guy was a year younger than me and the rumors floating around was that the school did nothing about how he would do horrible things to women. He was on the football team and got away with it of course due to this. He did lose his scholarship to the state college due to his grades but the rumor was that he had a rope allegation that was swept under the rug. I informed my friend's sister of what I know about the guy but she did not listen to me. 
After class, I approach the football guy to inform him. That his new girlfriend is someone I think of as a little sister and to tread lightly. Everything was fine for a few months. But then she went to a party with him and did not attend any of her classes next week. Using some people I knew, I found out he had given her a drink, decided to rope her and left her under the bleachers to be found. To make matters even worse he gave her a disease. I needed to get back at him. I knew where he parked his car every day and used this. I skipped class and waited for him to go back to his car to beat him down. Due to him driving an SUV I knew he kept a broom in there for cleaning off his car for snow. I had taken a pair of brass knuckles and I went to town on him. I grabbed the broom and carried him into the woods to stick that broom where the sun don't shine. I left him with the broom sticking out his butt like I just planted a flag. I stroll into the local pharmacy to pick up some hydrogen peroxide to clean up and I go visit the friend's older brother at the prison to give him a heads up. I tell him what happened, what I did and to keep an eye out for him on the inside. I made a few inquiries into where this piece of crap was going to be sent once he got out of the hospital. Turns out he was going into one of the camps at the same prison the older brother was at. Even though it was a different unit it was still close enough in the sphere of influence that he could be gotten to. I was given a few names to make contact with and drop off some cash for the commissary to grease a few wheels to get at the piece of crap. I figured that he would have been wounded and it would have been done with him. Turns out he was roped by 10 guys. They videoed it and gave me the video a few weeks later. He died in prison a few weeks after that too. My girlfriend never told me she has kids and I'm super angry about it. I have been dating my girlfriend Kat for two years. Our relationship has been awesome sauce and stable, but yesterday I was helping Kat move to her new house and it hit the fan. Everything was normal until the bottom of the box that I was carrying up to her room fell through and it all ended up on the floor. A photo had slid out of the box and I opened the lid so that I could put the photo back in. I wasn't trying to snoop at all but I decided to look at some of the photos, it was a lot of family and pets and friends from different places and life stages. Then I came across a few photos of cat in a hospital bed holding two newborn babies followed by more pictures of the babies. I kind of froze and my stomach twisted. Cat walked into the room and saw me sitting on the floor with the baby pictures and she looked horrified. We didn't say anything for a few moments and then she sat on the floor in front of me and asked if I had any questions about what I had just found. I asked her if these are her babies and she started crying while nodding yes. I felt myself getting angry and yelled at her, asked her why she would hide them from me, we've been together for over two years and we were starting to plan our future, I told her that I don't want to be a stepdad and she had told me that she didn't want to have children. At this point I was yelling super loud and raised my hand, but then put it back down when I saw her flinch. She was just crying, not saying anything until she blurted out they're dead. I didn't have anything to say and I couldn't stand to look at her so I left. I decided to call my parents and I told them everything. My dad says that I need to talk to her and that I was rude and unempathetic in the way that I handled things and my mom totally reamed me out for walking out on a good woman who has clearly gone through something traumatic enough that she never wanted to talk about it because I couldn't handle myself for 10 minutes to let her explain. My girl best friend thinks that I'm justified though. I don't know what to do. My girlfriend never told me she has kids and I'm super angry about it. Long story short, I really effed up, or so everyone tells me. I decided to call my girlfriend Kat and asked her if we could talk about everything. She said yes but that it's an in-person talk so we made plans for me to go over to hers in the evening. It was a difficult conversation. She told me about how she ended up in an abusive relationship when she was just under 18. She talked about how this man had so much control over her that she could hardly even breathe and the vile things he would say and do to her. Eventually he got her pregnant by rope and she wanted to terminate. In response, he basically locked her in the basement until she was too far along to do anything about it. The twins were born and she knew that she needed to escape with both of them. She played happy family and did her best while she made arrangements and healed physically, having twins gave her an excuse to have her mom come around to help with everything, including documenting and escaping. Everything was ready to go when the twins were one year old and Kat was 20. Basically, he figured it out at the very last second. Her children passed at the hands of their father and he tried to unalive her too. She told me about the guilt she felt in so many ways from wanting to abort them to begin with, having kids with the wrong person, not being able to get them out safely, and why she deserved to live when her babies didn't. She went through a ton of therapy and was eventually able to get to a good place and start living again, thriving honestly. She said that she didn't think she could love again and she fell in love with me unexpectedly so she never thought about how she would share this part of her past with a new partner. She felt it easier and safer to just never bring it up but apologized for not telling me sooner. I told her I appreciate her telling me, but I also told her I do not appreciate how she never shared such crucial information with me about her life. I told her that I believe her story and don't think she is lying, but I told her that lying to me by omission by never telling me about her children was a very disrespectful thing to do in my opinion. She looked stunned and started to tear up. I took these as crocodile tears and kept my stance firm. She told me to get out and told me she is rethinking our entire relationship after how I handled this situation. I'm currently staying at my girl best friend's house as she is the only one who agreed with me. My parents tell me I am being a huge a-hole, but I just don't see their point. My best friend has been making me super uncomfortable ever since he got a boyfriend. I live with my best friend John. John met his boyfriend Max six months ago and ever since, John has become really weird when it comes to intimacy. From making unsolicited and inappropriate comments about my sex life, joking about my trauma regarding rope, even going as far as deliberately sabotaging a date of mine. About two months ago, I asked to have a hit of his vape and he said sure. He said I could keep it because he was trying to quit. This becomes relevant later. Then a few weeks ago, he asked if I wanted to try a drink he got which I said yes. His boyfriend, who was there at the time, 
made a face and I asked what's up. John then tells me he drank out that straw with Max's load in his mouth to make it taste better so I was basically drinking Max's nut. He made a point to bring up how the straw was definitely contaminated. John then tells me that he rubbed his vape all over Max's PP and took hits while giving neck. The same vape he gave to me. I was unnerved but tried to laugh it off as John and Max were laughing. It hadn't hit me about how gross it was until I told a friend about it who said it was disgusting. It's made me feel super violated because who does that? That's not even something that could happen as a mistake. And if it did, somehow, slipped my mind, I would be mortified. Not laughing and joking. I brought it up to John because it was making me feel gross and he tried to backtrack and say it was just a joke and he didn't really do those things. He hasn't apologized and refuses to see how he is in the wrong. I'm sick and tired of my boyfriend's entitled girl best friend. I have been dating my boyfriend for five years now. His girl best friend Sarah and him are super close, too close for my liking. She has always been very vocal about how much she loves him, has had a crush on him in the past, slept with him in high school once, how she knows him so well, how she is like his sister and so on. They only see each other about three times a week, so she has been to our house a good bit. Once, Sarah was at my house. I started bawling about the fact I had been roped in my life. The trauma that it put me through, the fact that I never got justice for it, and on top of the fact that the man who did it still lives in our small town and I run into him from time to time gives me panic attacks sometimes. I decided to trust her and open up, big mistake. I told her everything. She knew the guy and she acted so compassionate and kind in front of me. Then one day we were having some dinner as a group. It was my boyfriend, Sarah and other people I didn't know. Sarah asked my boyfriend what he was planning to do after uni. He said he wasn't sure. I asked him why not a master's degree? This is where Sarah chimed in, God stop pressuring him. He's worked so hard all his life, give him a goddamn break and let him decide what to do, she said it in such an aggressive tone. Mind you I was just suggesting. I've never told my boyfriend he had to do something. He grabbed my hand and squeezed it telling me it was all right and that he didn't think I was forcing him to do something. Then Sarah asked what his future plans were for housing. I mentioned my family has a house in the southern part of the country and that we were planning on moving there in the future. I kid you not these were her exact words. Hell no. He isn't moving to the south. He's staying here. And he better not go farther away than the closest city. I was a bit annoyed. Why was it when I recommended doing a master's I was? Forcing him to do something, yet she was prohibiting him from moving? Yet I was the controlling one? Sarah then started talking about ex-boyfriends, and said she didn't mind if any of her friends got with her exes. I mentioned something to her like, I'd warn the girl first. I don't want anyone to suffer what I suffered. Sarah blew up. She was red in the face. These were her words, how effing dare you throw yourself in the middle of a relationship? Are you that possessive that you can't let your little ex be happy? So what, many girls get taken advantage of, stop playing the victim card. You're not over your ex and I can tell. You cried about him the other day. You're hurting your boyfriend by not telling him the truth. She was accusing me of all these things. And then the cherry on top. Your boyfriend hasn't been the same since you two are together. He's so quiet. He hasn't talked to me all day. You two keep showing affection in front of us all the effing time. I've effed him and I know him so well. You're no good for him. She was annoyed at us holding hands and hugging each other in front of her. I started crying over her tone and her accusations. And then she said something that made me bawl even harder. I'm so sure you lied about your rope. If it were actually true, you would have gone to the police. What did he do to you exactly? I blew up and told her in detail what he did to me in front of others. I was so embarrassed when I realized I told a bunch of strangers something so personal. Her response, you're such a effing manipulator. Remember when I met you you were crying over your weight? Sarah kept throwing things that made no sense, anything she could she was throwing it into my face. She has an ed, and she threw my own self-esteem issues into my face. Throughout the whole conversation, my boyfriend didn't say a single thing. I verbally abused my wife, and now she refuses to talk to me. My wife Ali and I have been together for six years and married for three. We met in college, and at first, my mom did not think that Ali would make a good wife. However my mother bonded with Ali and those issues were put in the past. However, this past Monday I was just having a terrible day. Those where everything goes wrong. I got a flat tire on my way to work, was late to work, my boss yelled at me, I dropped my lunch and left my wallet at home. My sleeve also got caught on the door handle on the way out of work and my sleeve ripped, forcing me to buy a new suit. It was just an awful day. I got home and was starving and Ali was cooking dinner. She seemed to have been anxious because when she is she starts talking a lot and really fast, which I normally find sweet and endearing but not that day. So she starts going on and on about her day. I just wanted her to get done with dinner. So, out of nowhere I just yelled, do you ever just effing shut up? Holy crap man. Effing stop talking will you? Boy was mom ever right. She asks right about what? Instead of keeping my mouth shut, I told her about my mom's concerns about her not making a good wife, and told her that I now see where my mom was coming from. Her eyes welled up with tears, and she stopped talking, finished cooking dinner, and went straight to the shower and then bed. 
nowadays she wakes up before me and leaves breakfast and lunch ready, comes home and leaves dinner ready, and goes straight to shower in bed. She doesn't want to talk or watch TV or anything. If I ask or say anything, she gives me one or two word responses. She doesn't even look angry at me, just defeated. I don't know how to fix this. Did I do something wrong? I verbally abused my wife, and now she refuses to talk to me. I decided I was wrong and wrote a heartfelt letter explaining myself and sincerely apologizing and begging her to speak to me whenever she felt comfortable. My wife said she would go to the guest room, and I said no that I would go there because this fight was entirely my fault and would only return if she felt comfortable. I called my mom and let her know what I did. She rightfully tore me a new one. Then came by the next day with some gifts for Ali. She apologized for ever feeling that way and assured her that she didn't feel that way now. That she truly loves her like a daughter. They spoke more, but I wasn't privy to that conversation. I made an appointment with a counselor so I can learn how to properly deal with my anger and not lash out at innocent people. I printed out a list of marriage counselors in the area who accept our health insurance. I gave her the list and said that if she's willing to go with me, all she has to do is choose a name, and I'll do all the leg work. She said she's willing to go, and she chose a name. She works in the mental health field and chose someone who is reputable in our area. She already sees her own therapist and is working through this with her I assume. I was able to talk to her, and she said she was really hurt by what I said. That she was questioning what my family and what I thought of her as a wife and a person. Like all the memories with my family are tainted now. She also said that she was already anxious about a hard day at work and I yelled out of nowhere. She told me that if I had just communicated to her that I had a bad day and was hungry she would have just made me a snack and told me to chill while dinner was ready, but instead I just lashed out. Or if I had texted her earlier, she would have ordered me lunch or given me her card number so I could order something for myself. Also said it was about teaching me a lesson about what a quiet housewife looks like and that it's obviously not something I want. And that if it is, she's obviously not someone I'm going to get it from. So, to make a choice about what I want. I told her I just want to be with her. I don't want a housewife, I want her as my partner for the rest of our lives. I just felt like a complete buttface because I just had to communicate, and she would have been there for me. I had no right to hurt her. She was a partner, and I was a jerk. I have been taking over her chores and spoiling her with her favorite things and foods. I'm spoiling her even more than she spoils me since she loves giving little gifts and doing sweet things to make my life easier. I've also been doing things like drawing baths, serving her favorite juice, lighting candles and playing her favorite crime podcast so she can relax when she comes home from work. She even asked me to join her in the last bath. She said she was glad we were working on things. No promises, but we'll keep working together and see what happens. My ex cheated on me with my childhood best friend. I met the love of my life Jess in fifth grade and I developed a huge crush on her. I never gained the courage to ask her out due to being introverted and not having many friends, except my best friend Jay. Jay and I did everything kids could do together, go camping, play video games and so on, he was a brother I never had. It was Jay who had the courage to add Jess to our tiny friend group. We grew closer as we got older. It was only in 9th grade that me and Jess were starting to get closer as friends. In 10th grade I finally gained the courage to ask Jess out and to my surprise, she said yes. Our first date was amazing as I took her out to her favorite restaurant. Then we went skating as she has always loved that and that was one of the best memories I've ever had. Over the next 4 years, we had the best relationship. She was my first everything and I shared everything with Jay. He claimed he was so happy for me and encouraged me to keep seeing her. He told me over and over that she was the one for me. I was elated with happiness, but around this time the SATs were coming up and I was very nervous about them. I ended up scraping a pass and I went to visit Jess house in order to tell her the good news. She helped me study for them and I was sure she was going to be ecstatic for me. I entered the elevator to go to her floor and walked to her door. I noticed the door was open slightly, and so in a panic, I opened the door myself, not thinking straight and thinking she was in trouble, but found nothing. I walked around the apartment, but eventually I noticed the trail of clothes leading up to her bedroom door. If those weren't obvious, then the screams of intimacy were. My heart instantly shattered, and then I noticed a jacket on the ground, the very same one I gave Jay on his 18th birthday. I saw Red and barged into her room, where they were both shocked at my interruption. Jess soon screamed in terror as I pulled Jay off of her and started wailing on him. At that moment, I was prime Iron Mike, and Jay was Iron Mike's wife. I was never a violent person growing up, but this, this rage and betrayal turned me into someone I hope I could never be again. It's been two weeks since I caught Jay and Jess together and I have been ignoring every message they sent me, every call and voicemail they made, and have even ignored their family's attempts at getting me to speak to them. I couldn't stand to be in the same room with them anymore. I need advice on how to proceed. My ex cheated on me with my childhood best friend. I decided I had to get the truth about our breakup before the two of them vilified me. To my surprise, they didn't say anything about me, but they also didn't out themselves. The two of them kept quiet about the whole thing and I couldn't stand that. Watching as if nothing happened between the three of us. So I contacted as many of our mutual friends as I could to tell them. Some believed me, others thought I was in the wrong, and a few were indifferent but all looked at Jay and Jess differently after that day as I had many details of what they did while those piece of crap effed. After I outed the two of them, I realized I needed to get away from the city. I lived here my whole life, but I had to get away, I just couldn't stand being close to them anymore. I was simply getting boxes of my stuff ready to move when I could, and I heard a knock at the door, and wouldn't you know, Jess was standing right outside. Her eyes bloodshot and she looked like she hadn't slept in days. I barely opened it for her anyways, I just rudely asked what are you doing here? I'm not about to be gracious towards her, and never will again. 
She asked to be let in, to talk for a minute and I decided to do so, but not to take her back, to just hear the excuses I know she'll come up with. She started to cry, asking for forgiveness, and wanted to explain why she did what she did. I kept a straight face and didn't say a word while she was speaking. She told me how she felt neglected by me. She told me that with the recent passing of my father, my demeanor changed, I was less happy and less joyful. She was not getting what she needed from me emotionally. She went on to say that Jay comforted her about this and took her side. Slowly she began to fall for Jay as the days went on and one thing led to another. They had intimacy over ten times before I caught them. After she was done, I told her that if she fell for Jay, all she had to tell me was that she wanted to break up, and I would have accepted them getting together afterwards, but they didn't do so, instead I saw my first love in bed with my best friend. I told her I was moving away after this, that I couldn't stand being in the city anymore with them. I saw the tears flowing even faster as she heard that. Guess she thought that we could reconcile after what happened. After that I just held onto her hand, she gained a hopeful look in her eyes and I led her to the door, before pushing her out forcefully. She turned towards me, pure sadness in her eyes. I'll never love you again. Go back to Jay I'm sure he'll be happy to accept you fully, after all he already did so. I slammed the door in her face after that, and heard her crying outside but didn't care and just continued to relax and pack my stuff. Jay also showed up at my door, but we got into a fist fight. My three-year-old daughter insisted I was having a baby and described what she would look like. She turned out to be 100% correct. When my daughter turned three I decided to go back to school and become a nurse. My husband and I were in no way trying for a baby whatsoever, I was on birth control and we were very careful. I walked into her preschool one day to find the director and her teachers telling me congratulations with big smiles on their faces. I used to work as a preschool teacher here so a lot of these people were close friends of mine. I ask them what they're congratulating me for and they tell me that my daughter announced to everyone that mommy has a little sister in her tummy. I laughed it off and told them all I was sorry to disappoint them but that just wasn't true. My daughter and I went home and talked about it. I told her mommy didn't have a baby in her tummy and she just kept pointing at my belly and saying yes you do. No matter what I said, she never let up, kept rubbing my belly and convincing me I was pregnant. A few days later I woke up to someone touching my belly. My daughter has the bottom of my shirt pulled up with her head resting on my belly while she rubs it gently and says baby sister what are you doing, hiding in there? It was a mix of sweet but also a little creepy, as her smile was just a tad off. We had the talk again and she got upset with me and told me she has seen her before and she is in there. She told me that her sister looks different than us and has blonde hair and blue eyes with little holes in her cheeks, referring to dimples. My daughter, husband and I all have very dark hair, chocolate brown eyes and no dimples. I talk to her about wanting a sibling and tell her that when I finish school we will try to give her a little brother or sister. Again, she's frustrated and yelling I already have a sister I was expecting my period to start within the next week like clockwork. It didn't. I took a pregnancy test and just stared. At that faint positive result for what felt like forever. I was completely in shock. I was on birth control, so I immediately called my doctor and he saw me the next day. It was estimated that I was 3 weeks pregnant. I gave birth to a blonde hair, blue-eyed little girl with the sweetest dimples. What's the dumbest thing you've ever said on a date? I recently started seeing a girl who was cute, young and fresh. I thought things were going well until the last couple of weeks when we hadn't seen or spoken to each other much. We finally got on the phone last night and apparently a few weeks ago I had dove too deep into my previous relationship during dinner conversation. That didn't sit well with her and she thought I still had feelings for my ex, but stated that she felt uneasy about the fact that I used to lay hands on my ex, and apparently some of the things I did in my previous relationship were toxic. Well, her feelings about my treatment of my ex had been marinating too long to come back from and she wanted to break things off entirely thinking I wasn't ready for the next step. After explaining my side of the story I managed to convince her that the reason I was doing all those things was because of the fact I used to have alcohol and substance issues when I was with my ex, and now that I am fully sober, she does not have anything to worry about. She seemed to half agree with me but still reiterated not being sure about continuing to see me. I was pretty disappointed in this I have to say as I thought I had found a new potential mate. As the call was winding down and in the spirit of open communication, I suggested we say anything we wished we had said earlier. In the heat of the moment, realizing that this thing was probably going nowhere, I made a comment about her weight. She had just started going to the gym again and I said I had been looking forward to her transformation and to how she would look when she lost 15 to 20 pounds. In hindsight I realized this was a mistake. She got very upset and ended the call, holding back sobs. I texted her right after apologizing profusely and sincerely. She has not replied to me, but I'm holding out hope. I'm running away from home because my mother just asked me to sleep with my stepdad. My mom had me at 18 right out of high school. My bio dad stuck around, but he died a year later. My mom remarried at 21 and had my four sisters. My stepdad Scott was the only father I've known, he's been a great father, nothing out of the ordinary. I remember Scott was becoming a little more touchy than normal and a little too personal. He would offer me wine and would ask me about my intimacy life after one too many glasses. I brushed it off because I thought maybe he was being a nosy father and just wanted to make sure his daughter wasn't having intimacy. Then this kind of stuff continued, to the point where he tried to kiss me last year. I told my mom and she just laughed and told me, that's how he gets after too many drinks. I knew then I had to make plans to leave, so I started saving up. After that incident things died down a bit until my mom got pregnant at 39. It's a higher risk pregnancy so she's on a lot of bed rest, and taking extra care of herself for her doctor. A couple weeks ago, 
my mom and Scott sat me down and told me her doctor said she should avoid intimacy during her pregnancy due to various health reasons. They asked me if I could have intimacy with Scott just until she was able to have it again. Of course I said no. I was livid and was crying. She told me she'd be okay with it, but she'd have to be in the room. I told her that was even worse. Like what are they thinking? I have enough money now for an apartment, I got approved, I'm signing my lease next week. My parents are ignoring me and the whole house is full of tension. My younger sisters don't understand what's going on and my mom told me not to say anything. But my sisters are smart, they know something is really up, and won't stop asking me about it, especially the oldest. She came to me crying today and told me I better tell her what's going on right now. I didn't say anything. What do I do? I'm running away from home because my mother just asked me to sleep with my stepdad. When I told my aunt about my mom and stepdad's suggestion for me to sleep with them, she called CPS. A day or so later, she barged in with three other people, one of them a social worker friend of hers and my uncle. None of them are allowed at the house so as soon as Scott found out they were there, he called the police. Before the police even showed up, I told my 16-year-old sister and the 14-year-olds what happened. The 16-year-old got angry at her dad. She was walking around the house ranting at her dad and crying. Eventually she decided to come with my aunt and I and then we would figure out where she could go from then on. However the two 14-year-olds did not believe me, they actually started laughing. Then they got angry and told me I was trying to destroy our family and how could you make up a sick lie. It got to the point where they threw mine and my 16-year sister's stuff out the window. By that time the cops came and told my aunt, uncle and the social worker that they had to leave the property. The social worker friend let the cops know everything that's been going on. The cops didn't care, they just cared about the noise and the trespassers. So I, my 16-year-old sister, my aunt and uncle and their friend left. Very soon after my grandparents came and got the other three girls, after the 14-year-olds called them and came to their senses. I found out from my grandma that one of the 14-year-olds confronted her dad and he didn't deny anything. In fact he called me named and said I should not have had any problems doing what he asked. That's when they packed a bag and called my grandparents. My grandparents explained everything separately to the little one. She told my grandpa she prefers him to our dad because grandpa doesn't yell at her. As much as that pained me, I hope it's enough to keep the girls at my grandparents for good. My 16-year-old sister is going to emancipate herself and stay with either our grandparents or our aunt. CPS was called but it was my grandparents this time. I have multiple screenshots on my and my aunt's phone of my mother incriminating herself, so we will be able to file charges and hopefully get Scott on the offender registry. That way the girls can stay at their grandparents permanently. Edit, Scott just came to the house and tried to plead his way in from outside the door. We of course did not let him in and he got aggressive. He tried to bang the door down after and we called the cops. That got him to back off but now we have video evidence of Scott also being dangerous, as the house we are staying has surveillance. My greedy and entitled aunt stole the vehicles my uncle left for me in his will. My aunt has always had a greedy streak ever since I was a kid. When my grandmother was on her deathbed my aunt had talked her way into getting my grandmother to sign her on as an executor of the will and ended up taking everything and anything that had the most value. My uncle was my best friend and he was a truck driver. A few years ago he was struck with cancer. While he was in the hospital my aunt tried to get him to assign her as an executor of his will, but since he was quick to pick up on what happened when my grandmother passed away, he hired a professional estate lawyer that would take care of everything. My aunt was about as happy as the state of Cleveland when LeBron took his talents to South Beach, and was quick to throw out a sob story of how offended she was that her brother couldn't entrust her with an important task, this went on for two weeks, even on his last day in hospice, she still brought it up, ND was asked to leave by nurses. My uncle passed away shortly after. We were all asked to gather at my mom's home where the estate lawyer came to tell us who was getting what. Finally my time came on the list and my uncle left me his rig and car of course. My uncle's rig is a 2008 Lone Star International which was fully loaded. My uncle's car is a 1966 Chevelle SS. My first thought was what in the hell am I going to do with a big rig? My aunt's first thought. While she didn't have a first thought, she just screamed and cussed at the lawyer saying that I was too sick to have those things and didn't deserve them because I was his nephew and not his sister, the lawyer asked her to sit down and he would get to her. When my aunt sat down she looked at me and said you're giving me the title to both of those. To which I laughed and said in your dreams maybe. The lawyer kept going down the list and because my uncle was a legend, he put my aunt at the bottom of the list and said. To my sister I am leaving her my luckiest most important dollar, because all present at this meeting will know she needs it most, and then was handed the dirtiest looking Canadian one dollar coin which was sealed in a block of acrylic. Myself, my dad and my other uncles nearly wet ourselves laughing. My aunt however didn't find it that funny and instead went into another tirade on how this was unfair and saying she didn't have anything to hold on that was his. The day passed and then the nightmare began, my aunt would call over and over and over asking about the truck, wanting to buy the car, if I was going to sell the truck, if I was going to sell the car, all to which I said no. Things got worse when my aunt started saying that she wanted her car and she had someone that wanted to buy our truck. At this point I got extremely irritated and said it's not your car it's my car and my car is staying with me and it's not our truck it's my truck and no one is buying it. A week later I woke up and heard something so I went to investigate. Lo and behold, there was a tow truck in the driveway. 
I quickly told the tow truck driver, who was a friend of my aunt, that if he so much as put a hand on that Chevelle I would have him arrested for trespassing and grand theft and then proceeded to call the police. Cops showed up and I told the police officer my side of the story. Then he went to my aunt and the conversation went like this, Ma'am can you tell me, is this your car? Yes it is. He just won't give it to me. Ma'am do you have the title of the vehicle? No I do not, he won't give that to me. Well ma'am I looked at the registration and title of the vehicle and he is listed as the owner of the vehicle. That vehicle is legally not yours and having it towed could land you and your friend prison time for auto theft. Well I think I am the one who should get the car because he can't even take care of himself. Ma'am it doesn't matter what you think, what matters is legal ownership which you do not have. A week later my aunt had attempted to take me to court for the car. The case wasn't even put before a judge, my aunt refiled the claim again, it went to court and once I provided a copy of the will, title, and registration, the judgment went in my favor and my aunt was forced to pay my court costs after dismissing my aunt's claims with prejudice. Then tragedy struck again, this time a great uncle passed away. I was on the will again. Can you guess what was left to me? A new car. My great uncle's 1967 Chevrolet Impala SS which he restored himself. My great aunt was thrilled that I got it but the mood was quickly soured when she realized that my entitled aunt was not thrilled that I got it. This time she stepped it up a notch and skipped the screaming and complaining and instead went to scheming. Three days after I took possession of the Impala, she rented not just one flatbed, but two flatbeds. She managed to get the Impala onto the flatbed and sped off leaving her boyfriend behind attempting to get the Chevelle on his flatbed as quickly as he could while I stood by on the phone with police. Police quickly caught up with my aunt and arrested her. Her boyfriend was arrested in my driveway and literally peed himself in the process. Her and her boyfriend both were hit for two counts of motor vehicle theft. Both were charged and found guilty and sentenced to two years and two days in jail. My sister's creepy fiancé tries to boss me around. I, 17, live with my sister, 27, and her fiancé, 26, because my parents kicked me out for smoking grass in the house too many times. Since then, my sister has worked on getting me to go back with my parents part-time but it's been a rocky road. I love my sister but her fiancé really likes bossing me around and telling me to do things. The way he goes about it can be creepy. A week ago I asked my sister for these shoes I really wanted. She originally said no but eventually caved after I kept asking her. A few days later I couldn't find the shoes anywhere and I asked her fiancé where they were. He says he took them back. I asked my sister and she said it was because I didn't do the dishes as she had asked and that I had pressured her into it in the first place and she's tired of me not doing chores. Her fiancé came into my room later and said that my sister is having a hard time right now and I need to stop pressuring her into getting me things and that I need to pull my weight or I'll stop getting allowances too. A few days later my sister and I were arguing while I was driving us home from my parents' house and she kept on asking me to pull over because she really needed to pee. This was stressing me out and I ended up totaling her car. When her fiancé found out he was only concerned about her and whether or not she was okay. She wasn't hurt that badly, just a mild concussion, a dislocated shoulder, a broken rib and some stitches on her jaw. I sprained my wrist and got a total of three stitches. He took a week off to take care of her while he made me go back to school the next day. Got her a bunch of get well soon gifts, new pajamas, a nice blanket and a stuffed animal. The next day her boyfriend asked me to help with dishes since the dishwasher was broken. I had not used any dishes so I told him no. He looked kind of baffled but then asked me to scoop the cat litter, which again I refused. I went up to the bedroom to tell my sister what was going on and he was telling me to leave her alone, but he's bossing me around and so I wake my sister up and tell her what's going on and she starts sobbing. I was happy at first because I thought she was mad at her fiancé, but then she called her fiancé upstairs and in front of me said Jack I can't do this anymore. I tried so hard to be there for her. She was talking about me and not being able to handle me anymore. And her boyfriend is comforting her and telling me that I need to leave her be for a while. I didn't see her for a few days since she had locked herself away in her room and then saw her in the kitchen yesterday after school. I told her that her boyfriend hates me and is trying to taint her opinion against me to get rid of me and she said that she loves me and her fiancé loves me and that I need to grow up because she can't take this attitude anymore. I told my husband I would never choose him as the father of my child. My husband Liam and I have two children and I'm currently pregnant with our third. Liam has so far been a wonderful husband and a fantastic father. I was out at brunch with a few friends of mine. I was telling them a funny story about my cravings and how Liam had made a cake from scratch for it. A friend of a friend named Paige said that I chose so well, and that she should have put as much thought as I did in choosing the one for her. I have a reputation for being really thorough and thinking things out before doing anything, the responsible one. I told her that I never would have chosen Liam to be the father of our first child, but I am so grateful he was. I was very lucky. Our pre-marriage life was messy. I was with another man, Dave. Dave was a steady, reliable man and we had been together for years. Dave made a new friend who was Liam. And I could not help but absolutely hate him. According to him, Liam made Dave feel young again and he was desperate to reclaim the sense of youth he lost by being responsible since he was young. He spent all of his time with Liam and other guys. Dave would spend every night out partying until 3 a.m. He spent his entire paycheck and some of my paychecks on wrestling videos and online gambling. He bought a motorcycle. He used our savings to buy crypto. He shaved his head bald. 
The last straw was him spending $20,000 of my savings to travel. Throughout this Liam was incredibly disrespectful to me. Dave broke up with me when I asked him to stop hanging out with Liam and his other friends. He immediately moved in with a girl I had concerns about. I felt deeply hurt and for the first time in my life I felt like hurting someone in return. I was miserable, out of my mind, and called Liam over. I wanted to ruin their friendship like he ruined my relationship. He was annoyed at Dave for something else and was down for anything. I woke up the next morning realizing that I made a huge mistake but Liam had also pounded me till kingdom come in a way Dave never could. Unfortunately my bad decision caught up to me and I got pregnant. Ironic since I had always wanted children but I was told I was infertile. Both Liam and I were against children out of wedlock and we had a small wedding. I was ready to grit my teeth and make the best of our marriage but surprisingly Liam turned out to be an incredible partner and father. If it was a mistake, it was the best mistake of my life. Paige was very offended that I said Liam wouldn't have been my choice initially. She messaged Liam to tell him what I said. I was a nervous wreck about this, and was worried about how Liam would react. Fortunately, a few hours later Paige apologized for overstepping and reached out to me. She was having a rough time in her own relationship and felt I was being ungrateful, as my boyfriend, unlike hers, never put something into my drinks or laid hands on me. I also checked up on Liam. I asked him if he felt hurt by what I said. He said he was deeply offended and I should make up for it with a thousand kisses plus interest starting right now. I helped my husband transition. Now he is calling me slurs and is filing for divorce. I never imagined I would end up married to a woman. I met the person who is now my wife, who was a man named Paul, 10 years ago. Two years after we were married, Paul came out as trans and chose the name Paula for herself. Paula's transition was easy for her or me. But I tried goddammit. I am trying. I went to couples therapy with her, I went to her own therapy sessions when she asked and I got a therapist of my own. I read books and reached out to other people with similar experiences. I stood by her when her family and friends pushed back, spoke out against my friends and family's transphobic comments when they came up. I stared dumbly as three different therapists heard my story, tut-tutted, and called me bigoted to my face and said I needed to either get on board or get divorced. So I got on board. We burned our wedding album because she couldn't bear to look at her past self in a tux. And I did so much more. And I did it because, while the person I loved was no longer a man, she was still the person I loved. And I did all of it while strangers and people I loved attacked me for being the transphobic one if I ever expressed a moment of shock a moment of hesitation or uncertainty, or a moment of oh my god, this is a lot of change all at once, can I please sit down for even one minute so I literally don't collapse from the panic attack I am literally having literally right now? And then this week, at 10.45 a.m. on a Tuesday, there's a man in a suit and a Hitler haircut at my cubicle, handing me a stack of papers that say separation agreement on the top. He's whisper shouting at me that I need to sign right now or there will be consequences, and he will not agree to take this to a private conference room away from the looky loose. I tell him to wait while I call my wife, and she lets out a long, exasperated sigh when she picks up. I tell her about Hitler man and she says he's legit and, with one sentence, does her level best to tear my heart out and throw it into a fire. I just can't stay married to some fkin lesbian n-word. And when I came home, all of my things were packed in suitcases by the front door. I think it's easier this way she said, standing there with her two new poly partners. She works from home you see. So she gets my support, our house and our friends, and I get called some effing lesbian n-word and thrown out on the street by a gang of people champing at the bit to dogpile on me if I am anything less than 1000% supportive of the person harassing me at work and kicking me out of my own home. I helped my husband transition. Now he is calling me slurs and is filing for divorce. Eight months ago, my male-to-female wife sent one of the men she'd been cheating on me with to my job with an illegal divorce decree to sign. That same night, the rest of her friends threw me out of my house and moved themselves in. Five months ago, my wife took her life, and the two idiots that moved in who'd made themselves home in my house refused to leave, claiming the house was theirs. At the advice of my lawyer, I put on a magic hat that said I was a landlord and they were month-to-month -month tenants who wouldn't pay rent and did the song and dance routine of evicting people from my house. This was right around the time my state implemented a moratorium on evictions. So now in addition to being the kind of a-hole who would evict someone, I was the kind of a-hole who had to have laws passed to keep me from doing harm. And the idiots in my house reveled in that. They were living for free in my house, that I was still paying the mortgage for, sending me regular death and rope threats, while they hadn't even finished moving in all of their stuff from their old apartment and I was living in an unfurnished room and sleeping on a pile of laundry. And it wasn't just them saying that or making the threats either. It was their friends and family, people who I thought had been my friends, random looky loos who saw their social media posts about it, and every now and then a garden variety a-hole who was passing by. I cannot begin to describe how much it effed me up to have an eviction under my belt, during 2020, as the evictor. I cannot begin to describe how much it effed me up knowing the only way I could enforce the eviction order would be through calling the cops, as a black woman. Or seeing the damage those two idiots had done to my home. Or the other crap show that actually getting them physically out of the house turned into. The crap show ended with me in hospital. With broken ribs and a bruised cheek. 
the idiot who did that was arrested, so there is that. On a final note, F Paul or Paula or whatever the F. Husband's affair partner's perspective, I helped my husband transition. Now he is calling me slurs and is filing for divorce. My girlfriend and I are Polly, and we met Paula almost a year ago. At the time she had just started working again, was just coming off of her probationary period, and was still shackled to her spouse, a joyless cis female. The three of us proceeded carefully and discreetly with our courtship, because for the first months Paula was still wholly dependent on her spouse's insurance to cover prescriptions and procedures, but once Paula was secure and recovered from surgery, as well as cleared to work full-time we started seriously considering our futures together. Paula ultimately agreed that the honest thing to do would be to divorce her spouse, so with the help of some of Paula's friends, my girlfriend and I broke the news to her spouse, served her with papers, packed up her things in the nicest suitcases she had, and moved the spouse out and moved into Palace's house ourselves. Sadly, Paula's spouse refused to agree to our terms, refused to even sign the papers I hand-delivered to her. I am grateful we had so many people with us when she came to our house, because I fear she would have turned violent without them. She hired a lawyer to fight the divorce, a no-fault divorce at that, and demanded Paula buy her own house if she wants us to move in. Paula's spouse refused to budge, refused to settle, refused to negotiate, barely restrained her contempt in talking to us, and I'm sure it was no coincidence that whenever her lawyer dead named Paula, she very begrudgingly corrected him, as if to claim she was some woke princess of power rather than the frigid soul who had hired the troglodyte to begin with. Her virtue signaling didn't end there either, as the months wore on she held every mortgage payment she made above us, as though it were some kind of moral victory or virtue signaling rather than her paying for the house she supposedly wanted us to buy from her so desperately. Paula did not handle the stress well. I suspect that this is what her spouse had intended all along. On Friday May 1st Paula passed by S aside. Before she was even scarcely cold, her spouse had swooped in, claimed it, and had her cremated. A week later, she snuck to our house and taped a notice to quit to our door claiming that she was suddenly our landlord now and that we owed her rent. My girlfriend and I find ourselves in a terrifying limbo. Paula truly despised her hateful spouse and absolutely intended to divorce her, but nothing was ever finalized because her spouse dragged her feet. Paula clearly intended to change her will to provide for my girlfriend and me, but never lived to do it. When we did get evicted by Paula's hateful spouse, I could not control my anger further. I lunged at her, and I wailed on her. Something that I think she deserves in my opinion for all the years of misery she put Paula through. I was arrested and taken to jail, but, thankfully my girlfriend bailed me out. We are now on the brink of homelessness but don't know what to do. My bratty stepdaughter ran away from home because we are horrible parents. I met my husband Chris a few years ago. I met his stepdaughter Katie a year later when we got married and moved in. Obviously it was an adjustment. His family suddenly tripled in size due to my four teenage kids, and I was happy as my kids suddenly had a father figure again. However, I never really liked Kate and made that obvious, refusing to cook for her sometimes or not giving her an allowance. I did this because in my eyes she was spoiled and her dad gave her too much. He disagreed with me initially but eventually gave in to my demands. Yesterday, Kate ran away. She told us where she was before we even knew that she was missing. She is with family and safe. Nonetheless both my husband and I are beyond ticked off at this stunt. Chris wants to drive up and bring her home immediately. I completely disagree. I think we ought to take a beat and reflect on the email she sent before taking any action that will cause further damage. The email was basically a list of complaints Kate had about our style of parenting towards her. The email stated that she lacks privacy as she now has to share a room with my daughter while my son gets his own room. Apparently my kids are always touching her stuff and have zero respect for her space. She can't think in this house because my kids are too extroverted and noisy. The lack of privacy and my daughter having her best friends there all the time are affecting her ability to code in silence how she liked to. My kids are bullies and lay hands on her. Her father doesn't spend time with her anymore. We keep forcing her to participate in things she doesn't want to because my kids want to do it. She doesn't have a voice in our home anymore. She's angry that I don't cook for her when I cook for everyone else. I guess I see where she is coming from, but I disagree with some things. She is 16 and can cook for herself for example, and as far as the noise goes, I think boys will be boys, as mine can be quite rowdy. My husband has learned to accept this, why can't she? There are some things that we just can't change. Do we go into debt and sell this house so we can buy a bigger house when the kids start going off to college in two years? My kids live here too, are they not supposed to run and play? Is my daughter not supposed to have friends over? I also want to point out that I believe that she ran away to make a point, rather than with the intent to stay gone. Kate could have gone to her maternal grandparents' house. They're closer, and she knows that they would fight tooth and nail to keep her. Instead she went to Chris's family. I believe this is an indication that she wants to come home, she just wants things fixed. My bratty stepdaughter ran away from home because we are horrible parents. After my husband and I talked for a bit, we decided that we would restore the basement a little bit and offer that as the bedroom for my stepdaughter Kate. We haven't told the kids who will be in it or what we're doing, we plan to have a discussion with everyone and let them know. As for Kate herself, after some discussion with his parents, my husband Chris decided to let Kate spend the summer with her grandparents. It's not a reward for her behavior but an acknowledgement that she's hurting and needs some space. I did not agree with this at all, but I suppose it's up to her. My husband has gone up twice now to spend the weekend with her and see her, 
so they have the time to repair their relationship. There is an understanding that when she gets back she will likely be grounded for some time for running away the way she did, but we're working on the situation as a whole. She's apparently even started a job helping a professor friend of her grandparents do research, so she gets something shiny for her college applications too from the summer. Chris was a bit depressed when he came back from seeing her the first time because he felt like a neglectful parent. I reminded him that running away was her choice and he needs not to feel guilty. He disagreed however, and said that he hadn't realized how sad and quiet she had gotten until he saw her at his parents' place. It was like a light had been switched on and she was so happy. So it would seem that time apart from us is doing her good, which is kind of a blow to him, I don't care too much. I want her to be happy and healthy at home, but she needs to take responsibility for her happiness and not rely on us. Also, Chris and I are now talking about getting him and daughter into therapy in addition to just increased time together. She's missing her father and he needs to take care of his daughter, I can't disagree with this. The jury's still out on whether I will go with him at any point in the summer to see her, I don't really want to, but for the sake of my husband I may have to. Update 2, my bratty stepdaughter ran away from home because we are horrible parents. My stepdaughter Kate seems to be withdrawing from our family. She has since moved back to ours and mine and her relationship is quite strained. She spends a lot of time in her room reading or writing or coding or doing some other solitary activity. She prefers to be left alone at least when it comes to us, which is creating a considerable gap in our family. I am really annoyed at this as this is pulling my husband away from me as he desperately tried reconciling with her. But Kate doesn't come to us. Getting her to talk to me is like pulling teeth and she doesn't share with her father anymore because she says that he just repeats everything to me and if she wanted me to know she would tell me. I don't see this as an issue, married couples share everything with each other. We know that she's sharing things with her best friend's mom because one time the mom asked us if an issue had been resolved and we had no idea what she was talking about. She's locked us out of her life. We have engaged a therapist for her. I try asking her about her therapy sessions or getting her to share about her therapy sessions, but she refuses to do so. Right now it feels like it's me and my kids with Chris on one side and Kate on the other. She is as disengaged as a sibling could be with my kids and I don't get why. She seems okay with a new living structure and my kids aren't as disruptive anymore. When she initially left she said that my kids were bullies. Chris spoke to her about that and she told him that she felt like my kids controlled everything that we did and were pretty selfish about everything from deciding what we ate on family night to just taking anything of hers that they felt like. I admit that as extroverts they tended to dominate the house, and I know that siblings touching one another's stuff is a problem, but my kids were just being teenage boys, I think even after all of this. Kate was just overreacting. We've worked hard at making her feel heard but it's at the point where our teens seem like they can't stand one another. Lately Kate had been making a case to attend boarding school. She has also asked to go live with her mother's parents for the rest of high school. Because of her apparent depression, and the fact that her grades are sliding, my husband is considering it. He and I disagree on this a lot. I don't think that the lesson we should be teaching her is that when things get hard, you run away. Which is something I said when she left the first time. He believes that giving her space is what she needs at least until she finishes high school. Right now we're at an impasse while Kate spends every moment she can at her best friend's house or hold up in her room. My ex-wife cheated on me and got pregnant. She now wants me to raise the baby. My ex-wife and I were together for 10 years. After having our second child, my ex and mother-in-law, a woman who always hated me, convinced me to get the snip. I didn't want to get snipped but my ex-wife was having a hard time with birth control and was convinced we were done having kids. She also threatened divorce and to take me to the cleaners as my mother-in-law was friends with a good lawyer. I caved and got the snip. Five years later my ex cheated on me and got pregnant. I decided to divorce her. My mother-in-law went crazy when I filed for divorce and contacted her lawyer friend. They pulled every dirty string possible, bringing up my early teenage years, relationship with parents and so on. All of this caused me to lose the house that I brought into the marriage. My grandmother left me the house when she passed away as I was homeless at the time. The guy my wife cheated with refuses to be in the child's life and decided to stay with his wife, who for some reason forgave him. So that left my ex's child fatherless and my ex decided to give the child my last name. Due to the laws in our state I'm the child's father regardless of DNA because he was conceived during our marriage. Even with the DNA test X tells everyone I'm a pos and the child is mine and I refuse to be in his life. Everyone around me is constantly telling me I need to man up and take care of the child. When we went to court for custody I was told I can have custody of all three children or no custody at all. The judge was a total Richard head and didn't care what the situation was just that I have a legal duty to be that child's father. I took custody but my wife never forced me to be in the child's life. After a few years of co-parenting, aside from all the extra child support she's getting from me, things have been great between my ex and I. My mother-in-law died and I actually celebrated in secrecy. I finally got my life back on track and met someone. We're currently engaged and happy. Ex-wife isn't happy about me being happy so now she's trying to force custody onto me. She's constantly saying I should take her son with our other children on the weekends and demanding that I make him a part of my life. My ex even went as far to make a Facebook post blasting me about how I've never done anything for our son. She's even telling our children that I neglect their brother and hate him. My fiancé says I should let it go and just take on the responsibility because it's not fair he doesn't have a dad but my other kids do. She says we can handle it and I should try it out because I'm paying support for him anyways. 
I just said no and have been avoiding the subject. My husband went insane and pooped our bed so I left him with a broken nose. I have been married to my husband Gail for six years. He has just contracted the virus and is not taking it seriously at all. He considers me a germ freak, as I take it seriously and follow CDC guidelines and then some, whereas he is way more careless, a conspiracy theorist and tends to laugh at me about it. When he tested positive at work after being prompted by his employee and instead of leaving the facility right away, the first thing he did was go into his boss's office, interrupt her meeting, to inform her face to face that he has the vid. According to Gail everyone in the meeting backed up quickly and scrambled for masks. He told me this story while laughing at the people for being idiots. I was fuming while listening and told him such behavior is disrespectful. We talked at a distance and decided that he will stay in the master bedroom and I will be staying downstairs and sleeping on the couch for the time being. First two days were okay, but on the third day of his illness, he full-on pooped the bed. I walked out of the washroom and was startled to see my completely unclothed husband standing three feet from me, shoving our brand new sheets into the washer, all while not wearing a mask or gloves. As karma would have it, the night before he tested positive we took possession of a new bed along with new, white cotton sheets. The expensive kind you save up for. Now they were both covered in green, sludgy diarrhea. We got into a huge argument where he once again threw conspiracies in my face and called me dumb for wanting to isolate. Our conversation ended with him cutting me off mid-sentence, and slamming the bedroom door in my face. I admit I saw red. How dare he come out of the room, jeopardizing my health, and then have the audacity to yell at me. I grabbed the door handle and flung it open as hard as I could. Little did I know he was standing right behind the door and it whacked into him pretty hard. He started bleeding and I apologized, I meant to fling the door, but did not mean to strike him with it. The door strike left him with a nasty bruise to the face, one that is still very visible three days later. His nose is also now very crooked. Also, this is not the first time that he has pooped himself. A few months ago we came home from a night out and midway through having intimacy, his bowels gave out on him while I was on top. It took me a while to forgive him. Anyway, fast forward to three hours ago, he was losing his sanity in the bedroom and went for a drive. While he was gone, I grabbed gloves and a mask and went to tidy up his room. I opened the window, turned on the fan, and cleaned his washroom. I found a bath towel covered in poop that has been sitting on the floor for three days. Prior to this, I have found poop in his pants on two occasions, and once he wiped himself after pooping with a bath towel. One time I found that he rubbed one out into my work blouse after I put it in the laundry. When confronted, he denies all these accusations and gets really upset. He is still out driving. I don't know what to do. My terminally ill friend wants to see other men after asking me out. Did I overreact by making her cry? I have been best friends with Ivy for over 20 years. When she was a sophomore and I was a senior she asked me out, but I found her quite unattractive and told her I wasn't interested, however we stayed friends. When the virus hit, she was diagnosed with a disease, and was told that she has less than 5 years left to live. She often talks about this, and although she is a lively person, it can get annoying. In the last few months, despite her condition, she has started to look gorgeous, and would it not be for her illness, it is making me regret not saying yes to her all those years prior. I guess I just never saw the potential in her back then. Thankfully, I talked to her about this and mentioned regretting saying no in high school, and she told me she does still harbor feelings for me. I was so happy, but I needed some time to think, as I had just gotten out of a relationship and was still healing from my ex leaving me. Anyway, yesterday, I saw her Instagram story of a plushie from some game she likes, with a caption that read that it was a gift from a male that had paid attention to her tastes and got it for her. I was hurt and went over to her house to talk about it and to tell her I felt slightly disrespected. First thing I saw when entering was the damned plushie sitting on her desktop. It made me so mad, so I asked why she was accepting gifts from other males when she recently told me I'm the one she is interested in. She gave me a weird look and told me she can't waste her time waiting for me to make up my mind and losing potential partners that could love her. I snapped and told her those guys are not actually interested in her, they just pity her because she talks so much about her sickness that she must be fishing for some empathy, and I'm the only one who likes her not out of sympathy. The minute I said it she started crying and told me to leave, so I left, hoping that today she would have cooled off and we could talk about it. Only to find myself blocked everywhere. After some thinking I realized I might have overstepped, but I still believe my words had some truth to them. My fiancé's ex died and he has fallen in love with her again. What do I do? My fiancé and I have been together for nearly three years. I had a hard boundary against exes in the relationship and we both agreed that, though he broke this rule several times and broke down in front of me over losing his ex. Prior to meeting me, he was in a serious relationship with this girl. However she one day told him she no longer loves him and they broke up. He was heartbroken. Recently, his ex's mom contacted my fiancé and told him that his ex had cancer and wanted to meet him one last time as it was terminal. I supported my fiancé's decision to see her as I knew this was a hard time for both of them, but on the condition I'll be in the same room as them. Once we got to the room it was very emotional. The ex told us she had developed skin cancer and that the doctor had drawn up a prognosis for her a few months before they broke up. The ex told both of us that she wanted him to lead a happy life with a woman who could share a life with him, and wished us well. That's why she lied about not loving him anymore, and that she always loved him all this time. 
She died three weeks ago and my fiancé is a mess. I can't unsee the way they both held each other's hands and the look of nostalgia and love in his eyes for her. It's so hurtful to see him cry about another woman who he once loved. I can't unhear things he said to his mom in the kitchen one day, I wonder what life could have been like with her, we could have been a happy family of our own. She wanted kids with me and we could have named her Rose like she wanted. He has been reaching out to me for support and I lent a listening ear and he has been telling me so many stories from his time with her. Two days ago he received a package in the mail and it was from the ex's sister. It was a photo album from their old times that the ex wanted him to have. My fiancé held it so gently and teared up a little. And I literally broke down on the floor crying, having a panic attack. I unloaded all of what I've been feeling. I told him that we need to pause our wedding plans for now and wanted a week or two off to think about our relationship. I am at my sister's place and haven't been able to sleep or eat properly ever since and he has been calling me and texting me nonstop. I feel so guilty right now. He had self-deletion thoughts years ago and I'm not sure if this will trigger that. My fiancé's ex died and he has fallen in love with her again. What do I do? I decided enough was enough and I couldn't tolerate the emotional cruelty anymore, so I broke up with my fiancé. It was not pretty at all. After calling me for the hundredth time, I finally agreed to speak with him as I had the time to think about things. I had been feeling pretty inadequate compared to the ex, a second fiddle and an emotional dump and it has wrecked my sense of self. I went to our home and gave him the ring he proposed to me with. I told him I don't see him in my future anymore as seeing him grieve a future life with an ex made me lose all feelings for him. He started hysterically crying and literally dropped to his knees and started crying into the dress that I was wearing. He began incoherently mumbling something about me staying, then cleared his voice a little, still on his knees, and begged me to stay because now I was breaking up with him the same way his ex once did. I was already crying at this point and this made me cry even harder as he still couldn't see beyond his grief. He screamed at me, calling me names and demanded to find out why I was breaking up with him. Before I could say anything he interjected, and started comparing me to his ex and telling me I wasn't ever as good as she was. He then started ripping into my past as I was bawling. He also said he isn't letting me leave and wants us to fix things. That's when I knew I wasn't safe where I was standing. I had to call out for my sister and his mother at his place to help ease him so that I could leave the house as quickly as possible. As his mom and my sister looked on, we kept talking. I doubt you ever had a heart, you'll never be like her. Oh what do you know about my heart, when you know nothing other than your own suffering and grief about your ex? Someday, I hope you'll have the decency to admit how much you regret hurting me, just like she did. And maybe life will serve you cancer in the next three years to teach you a lesson. We all looked in shock and horror and his mother gave him a well-deserved slap across his face. To say that he instantly regretted that would be an understatement. He cried right after. My sister turned to me and muttered I hope you are ashamed of yourself and grabbed my arm and took me out of the house. Afterward she gave out to me for handling things the way I did and I really have no idea why. She told me I needed to give him a second chance which is a complete 180 to her stance previously. My girlfriend's family hate me because she took the morning after pill. My girlfriend of about three years has a way higher intimacy drive than me, I am suffering from success essentially. A little into a year of our relationship she started asking if I wanted to do the devil's dance without rubbers and just yeet out last second. Being a warrior I agreed. Resisting the urge to leave it in as those glorious cheeks were bouncing like bobbleheads was hard but I managed. However, the anxiety of potential pregnancy consumed every fiber of my being constantly, so I asked her if it's okay if I use rubbers again. She didn't exactly say no, but she started telling me that I'm too anxious all the time, she knows her body better than me and got very upset at me. Whenever I would try to bring in a rubber before the deed, she would always repeat the same stuff to push me away from using it. I was obviously very reluctant, but agreed because she told me she would get plan B in the case of an accident. Also, tapping it raw was way more fine. Shoddy was a waterall side, so on one hand doing it raw had its upsides. She seemed to really like it and she would often verbally talk about how hot it would be to be pregnant while doing the deed, telling me to nut in her. It was hard to resist doing so, especially when she whispered it in my ear, but I kept my composure like Shaq at the free throw line. What I'm trying to say is I nut in her. As post nut consumes me and eats away at my soul, and as the consequences of my actions dawned on me, I immediately took her to get plan B. A few days later her parents discover the wrapper by going through her garbage and flip out, telling her the pill is dangerous and she should have known better. They started citing these anecdotes and non-reputable websites that state that my girlfriend would be infertile. She tells them the reason why she took it is because she felt pressured by me to take it, as I took her to the store and paid for it. She calls me after two. Tell me that she should have ended our relationship long ago and she can't believe I would have given her this pill. She yells at me saying her parents have told her all about the dangers of that pill and breaks down about the possibility of being infertile. Later that night she texts me wanting to talk and apologizing, saying that the hormones made her that way. At the same time, she tells me we can't see each other in person for a while because her parents will kick her out if we do. One month passes, and just yesterday, I saw her for the first time. Her location is tracked by her parents so I basically just have to walk around her neighborhood with her. Within five minutes of seeing me, she looks at her phone, sees her mom approaching our location and without explaining starts running away, leaving me there. I text her later, saying I really don't think getting you the pill was wrong and nothing was communicated to me about you not wanting to take it. I don't feel comfortable being treated by your family in this way as well. 
She then tells me that her parents have been having her test different therapists so they can find one appropriate for her to let go of me. She also states that it was my fault she had to take the pill anyway so I don't have a right to play victim. I love her but I have no clue what to do. My girlfriend's family hate me because she took the morning after pill. A few days to go, I broke up with her on the phone after a 40 minute call where I was told I was yelling, while simply expressing how it made me feel uncomfortable to be manipulated and gaslit. The following day, her father called me and told me he knows what I did and that there were two cases of intimate assault that I committed. One when we did the deed, and another when I bought her plan B. He told me he doesn't care if both parties agreed to have intimacy, it is still assault. He told me he is going to press charges if I ever contact her again in any way. I also have a situation where her mother is in the same office as me. She is my manager and I report directly to her. I'm not only scared but heartbroken. I want to tell my ex what the father told me to prove to her that her parents are not acting in the best way, but at the same time I am terrified that she may tell them and make up a lie about me roping her. I have a small Instagram account with like 5 followers, I am considering getting the message to her through a story post but I'm scared of even that spiraling into something else. Edit, I have chosen to cut contact. In terms of work, I have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with her mother tomorrow, I plan on recording audio with my phone in case. If she tries anything unprofessional I will immediately go to HR, otherwise, I feel it is probably best to let sleeping dogs lie. In terms of the contact with her father, this was told to me on a phone call that I unfortunately did not record. That being said, I have messages with my ex going back the past few months where she explicitly says her parents are abusive and says what do you want me to do? When I tell her that it is not okay for a father to lay hands on his daughter until her thighs are blue. Edit 2, the mother just tried to fire me out of nowhere at the meeting, luckily I recorded it and I am reporting it to HR. What's the most embarrassing thing you've ever done in front of your spouse? I farted blood through my PP and sprayed my wife with it. My wife and I had been married for about 5 years, and there was always one thing I was very self-conscious about, my weak pee stream. I would routinely be standing at the toilet for over 2 minutes just peeing. My personal record is 5. The longer we were married, the more curious my wife became about it and this sticking point evolved from it's weird that you won't let me see you pee to please let me see you pee. I always told her that when I was comfortable enough I would let her watch. A few weeks ago I had to see a urologist about it. The first step to attempt to treat me is to dilate the PP hole at the affected area. This is accomplished by stuffing a long metal rod into the manhood and then sliding a series of larger and larger rings in to expand the area. This procedure is a simple outpatient procedure, so the rods are stuffed in while you are awake, although a numbing agent is used. From experience I will say that the numbing agent doesn't numb enough. My wife attended this appointment with me as moral support, and also to give me a hand to squeeze in a manner much like a reverse delivery. I couldn't bring myself to watch the procedure, but she did and judging by her face I would rate the horrifying Ness as somewhere between watching the slow motion video of Sean Livingston's injury and watching TikTok boys bite their lips slowly and hit a vape trying to be seductive. After the procedure was over, the doctor wanted me to pee into a portable bucket to make sure everything was flowing correctly. He warned us that there might be some blood, but my wife still eagerly asked me if I was finally going to let her watch me do it. I figured after what she just witnessed, she had seen the worst of it so I might as well grant her strange wish. It started quickly and the stream was flowing like 2002 M&M, it was amazing. The joy was short-lived however. As part of the preparation for the procedure, they inflate the bladder with air for some reason I don't remember, and they didn't mention and I didn't think about the fact that the air had to come back out. As I reached the end of my stream, my bladder was still full of air, and it was time for that air to evacuate as well. My manhood started too. For lack of a better word, fart, and along with the air came some of the lingering blood. It wasn't just a little one either, imagine a balloon the size of a human bladder deflating, launching specks of pee and blood in every direction. My wife got the brunt end of it, as the stream decided to aim its way towards her, and more specifically, her chin. Lost everything to AI. It took my job and my family is starving because of it. I have been drawing for as long as I can remember, drawing was a way for me to connect with other people and a solitary activity I spent a lot of time on. I could never connect with people socially, so I connected with myself through art. I decided to take art seriously a decade ago and have been studying from various books and courses. I made many sacrifices and many investments I could not really afford throughout these years to develop my skills and hone my craft. I had no doubt about it. Art was what I loved to do. Even if I had an obscene amount of money and had my life all sorted out financially, I wouldn't stop doing it. I held common occupations before becoming a full-time artist on the internet. Worked for two years in a warehouse, then another year in sales. I'm not very bright, so my low attention span, anxiety and lack of social skills made these experiences miserable for the most part. Then the vid happened, I was out of a job and had the idea to use my art skills and sell art on the internet. In a few months I grew a following and became a well-established NSFW artist on Twitter. As a Brazilian being paid in foreign currency, I was making a good living out of that, enough to pay my bills and help out my family who at the time were also stricken by unemployment. At first I felt guilty for using my skills to draw adult films, but then I came to accept it. If I could choose I'd pick other more meaningful subjects for my art, but humongous badongous white girls were what kept food on the table. In the end of the day it was work like any other else, except I was good at it and my skills were appreciated then artificial intelligence generated art happened. Suddenly I couldn't trust my future and of the ones I love and the generosity of people who enjoyed NSFW art, as this technology evolves so will the tastes of the public. There simply was no use trying to compete with the output of the machine, even more so when it can replicate and plagiarize you without effort. At this point getting back into the job market in Brazil would be really difficult. The bills kept coming and my family still needed my help, so I took an extreme measure. 
I sold all I had, gathered all the money I made through the years and emigrated to Europe in search of work. My thinking was that since I am fluent in the English language, I could likely find a minimum wage job in a more developed country that pays enough for me to provide for myself and send some back home. After some time I got all my documentation and managed to secure a retail job. I have been at it for about a year now. All the problems I had in my previous jobs returned, but now at an even worse level. My low attention span and anxiety make it so it takes me extremely long to adapt to the simplest tasks. I keep making mistakes and forgetting the simplest things. Add that to the stress of being alone in a foreign country and this job being my only means of survival and you can imagine how my life has been going. I just want to draw again. I plan to propose to my girlfriend but she just admitted to getting drunk and cheating. What should I do? I've known my girlfriend since we were in kindergarten and I genuinely considered her my hero as she has helped me through so much. About a month ago I told her parents that I wanted to marry her and we agreed to rent out our favorite amusement for me to propose to her. It was all so perfect until yesterday, my girlfriend said that she's going to a karaoke event with her female friends. At 2 a.m. today she returned as hammered as a hammer and collapsed in bed. This morning she woke up in tears and apologized profusely. After she'd calmed down she explained that she was drunk and had intimacy with another man at the party after the karaoke and regretted it afterwards a lot. When I asked why she'd do this, she said that she was so out of it that she blacked out, but remembers coming back to consciousness after the intimacy. I asked her if she was unhappy in the relationship, but she reassured me that that's not the case and couldn't ask for anything more from me and regrets everything she did. I had more questions that I wanted to ask, but my heart completely broke and I began crying. She hugged me and said that she would do anything to get my trust back and constantly asked me not to break up over this. I said that I needed some time to think and went into a separate room. I have now been sitting in this room heartbroken for many hours now and don't know what to do. Is there any way to not break up and still have trust again that she will never cheat on me again? If I do break up though, I don't think I can ever love anyone like her again. I plan to propose to my girlfriend but she just admitted to getting drunk and cheating. What should I do? I decided to ask for clarification as to what exactly happened up until she blacked out and had intimacy with the man. She told me that before the karaoke, the boyfriend of one of her friends, Richard, decided to join last minute. During the karaoke, her female friends kept daring her to chug beers. She says that she remembers drinking seven beers in about an hour and doesn't remember anything after that. The night she returned, her female friends were carrying her by her shoulders and I had to also carry her to her bed. Her legs were barely moving, her body was not holding upright, and she wasn't able to form coherent sentences. When she woke up, she had ten missed calls from her friends. When she called back, her friends explained what happened while she was blackout drunk. During the karaoke, Richard said that he needed to talk to my girlfriend for a moment to strategize on how they'd sing as partners. The friends decided to continue the karaoke while Richard and my girlfriend strategized. After half an hour, neither Richard nor my girlfriend were back, so they started checking for where they were. After an unknown amount of time, Richard's girlfriend saw Richard having intimacy with my girlfriend. Of course, Richard and his girlfriend broke up, and then all of the females brought my girlfriend home. My girlfriend was on the phone to her friends while they explained this the morning after, and they also told her that she was a willing participant in the S, although she claims to me that she was blacked out until after. My girlfriend didn't know that legally, if a person is drunk, you cannot have intimacy with them where I live. I started feeling really bad for my girlfriend. I explained to her that this is rope. I hugged her and tried to comfort her and asked if she needed anything and how she was feeling. She said that because she doesn't even remember anything. After the drinks, she doesn't feel any of the responses normally felt after rope, like trauma. She said that she's mainly disgusted by Richard but also mad at herself for losing control. We went to the police station to report this. Also I was still a little suspicious that the story could have been made up or misconstrued, so I went to the karaoke place that they went to and explained the situation and asked if I could see the camera's footage. They agreed, and there was footage of the exact situation that I was told playing out. I have of course also provided this footage to the police. Although the police's investigation has not concluded, the evidence I saw is in my opinion enough for me to believe her. My girlfriend volunteered to explain the situation to her parents because she wants to take accountability for her actions. Her parents were very apologetic and sweet about the situation which I appreciated a lot. Unfortunately, it was too late to go back on the theme park that we rented that day, so we agreed to proceed with it but without the proposal and invited a bunch more people. I told both her parents that I would decide when the time is right to tell her that we initially rented that amusement park to propose. I told her about a week ago when things were more back to normal and her feelings seemed very complicated as one would expect, but I think her summary of her emotions being devastated but understanding is pretty good. A retired FBI agent just told me a confession that sent chills down my spine. I used to work in a medical procedures unit in a hospital. Patients would undergo endoscopic exams which they were heavily sedated for. Most of the time before fully going under, the patients would mumble some nonsense before falling asleep. We had an elderly gentleman patient in this case and while we waited for the doctor to arrive we engaged in friendly chit chat, nothing out of the ordinary so far. When the doctor came in, he immediately asked us if the patient told us his history. I started rattling off the medical reasons why he was having the procedure and the doctor cut me off saying, know his past work history as an undercover FBI mob agent. Naturally my reaction was to turn to the gentleman ready to undergo the procedure and say to him, oh no. That must have been interesting, dealing with those mob guys. Do you mind if I ask you what that was like sir? The patient's response has haunted me to this day. His exact words. Those guys weren't as bad as those mother effing politicians. They're the real scum of the earth you know that, not the mob. He then went on to tell a story about how he was head of security for a congressional event in the 80s. 
He said another agent handed him the phone saying congressman wants to speak with you. The conversation went as follows, congressman, will there be women there? Agent, not sure what you mean. But yes women are here. Congressman, when I arrive I want one sent to my room. No older than 13. Right after he said that the CRNA pushed the meds and he passed out. We all just stood there in silence while he underwent the procedure. What the fuck did he just tell us? People who have had stalkers, what was it like? Two years ago I met a girl through some mutual friends. She seemed so kind and eager to be friends with me. However, once we started getting loser she started joking about kidnapping me and keeping me for herself in her house. I thought she was joking at the time. After a while she asked me if we could make love and made many unwanted advances, asking if she could feel me up when we met because she didn't know what another girl's honkers felt like, or telling me that her truck bed was perfect for intimacy under the stars in a field. She was two years older than me at the time, 19. I eventually moved house to live closer to my friend group, unaware that she also lived here. Once I moved here, she'd try and come see me every day. She even bought me three pairs of booty shorts for Christmas with a note, I can't wait to see you in these, I picked the perfect colors. I had been uncomfortable with her advances from the start and had even told her on multiple occasions that I was uncomfortable, but it didn't stop her. She went as far as trying to manipulatively convince me to leave my partner at the time, by fabricating evidence of him cheating. Once I started to pull away emotionally from her, she had a breakdown, threatening to end herself or click-clack her school if I didn't want to be friends with her. Once New Year's rolled around, I couldn't handle the constant harassment I was getting from her. I finally told my friends what was happening with her. They told me she was creeping on me. The gifts, the compliments, the unwavering obsession with me. It made me sick, so me and my roommate finally decided to cut ties with her, blocking her on everything and having one of my parents tell her she was not welcome near me or the house again. She was angrier than the plants vs zombies squash nut. She started to drive by my house or near my street almost every day after she got out of school. She would ask my friends about me and ask. If I was done ignoring her. Once she found out I was told I was creeped on by her, everything switched. She hated me, said I ruined her life, led her on, forced her to smoke grass, she even started saying I sent her explicit pics and started to flirt with her first, all of those not true in any way. She was telling these and so many other things about me to complete strangers at her school too. She was so mad at me, even on my 17th birthday tweeting that she wished I'd just pass away already. All her anger, or anything she had said about me would come back to me obviously, as she was actively talking to or engaging with my friends. Last I heard she took her life and left a note dedicated to me. I just caught my boyfriend with another girl and now he wants to break up. How do I win him back? My boyfriend and I are both 21, we dated in high school before we broke up at the end of senior year due to some personal reasons. In the beginning of sophomore year of college, I transferred to the college my boyfriend goes to because I wanted to try to convince him to give our relationship another shot and to ask for forgiveness for my previous actions. After many months and a lot of pestering, he agreed to start dating again. Last weekend we had a bad fight which resulted in my boyfriend leaving in the middle of a party we both attended. We didn't speak a lot since then because we needed time to cool off. Yesterday I was driving around town and I saw my boyfriend's car in the parking lot of a restaurant. I walked in and saw my boyfriend with another girl. They were sitting in a booth just talking to each other. I have no idea who the girl is and have no idea where they might know each other. I chewed him out in the restaurant and tore into him due to the emotional stress of the situation. The girl looked kind of scared and quickly left. My boyfriend tried to go after her but I told him we needed to talk. He told me that he drove her to the restaurant and needed to make sure she left okay. I almost started to cry as it seemed he cared more for her than for me. She ended up getting an Uber and I asked my boyfriend to meet me at my apartment so we could talk. The talk did not go well, he was angry at me and said he wanted to break up. I felt blindsided and said that he was the one cheating yet he wants to break up with me? He was the one with another girl without telling me and he gets to end it? He called me delusional and said we were over and he would have some friends pick up his stuff from my place. I want him however, I really do, how do I win him back? Boyfriend's perspective, I just caught my boyfriend with another girl and now he wants to break up. How do I win him back? Hi, this is the cheating boyfriend. My girlfriend Becca and I dated all throughout high school. At the end of our senior year she decided to break up with me so she can explore her options and live a college lifestyle. I obviously was upset with this because I thought what we had was enough but apparently, she wanted to go into college without a burden. So freshman year I made a lot of new friends and discovered new hobbies of mine. When sophomore year came around, I felt like a new person. I had no idea she planned on transferring until the day she showed up. Within the first week she had already made plans of getting back together. I told her I needed time and she respected that. After a while I was getting lonely and I guess the familiarity of her brought back memories and we decided to make it work. She always hated feeling left out and I guess her reasoning for being like this was that she missed out on a whole year and wanted to catch up to me. She got attention from guys and reveled in this fact, bringing it up any chance she got but ending it with, but don't worry, I wouldn't do anything. I started to understand that the breakup in high school was so she could hook up with other people without feeling guilty. She went to a small school and I believe that by the time the fun wore off, she wanted to go back to a stable relationship. I admit, I shouldn't have stayed away but I guess I got used to the stability as well. One of my new hobbies was working at an animal shelter. I usually go once or twice a week in the mornings to help out for a couple of hours. One of the other volunteers, Audrey, is the girl at the restaurant. I do not know this girl other than working with her once a week. I know she's 19 and know that she likes cats and that's about it. 
On the day of the whole restaurant scene, I found Audrey crying in the break room having a breakdown. When she could finally talk, she mentioned that her ex-boyfriend showed and demanded to speak to her. From what she said, he was not a good person and partner and often laid hands on her. She told him to not come near her, and he showed up at work so she would freak out in public. I offered to distract him so she could leave but she said she cannot drive and her brother dropped her off but he was at work. I offered to drop her off somewhere and she said yes. Another thing Becca did not mention, I also work at the restaurant where we went. It was a pretty slow time there so we sat at a booth so she could compose herself. She was very apologetic and obviously very upset. My manager said we could stay as long as we wanted until Audrey was okay. Around this time Becca stormed in. She claims she does not remember what she said but I do. There were a lot of gross accusations thrown at me and the things she said to Audrey were straight up evil, calling her a lot of names as well as making fun of the bruises on Audrey's wrists and chin. She went on for a while despite me telling her to stop and only did when Audrey got up to leave. She was still distraught from before and on top of Becca, she looked terrified. What should have been a way for her to calm down and receive support turned into a screaming attack from someone she doesn't even know. The second Audrey was gone, Becca became very calm and started saying stuff like, babe we need to talk. I didn't like this. I agreed to speak somewhere else only because I thought I was going to get fired and I was so embarrassed. On the way there, I felt like I had a midlife crisis. I realized that this was just the breaking point. For the whole time we were together she would obsess with cheating. She was always nervous I would cheat or if a guy spoke to her, she assumed he was cheating on his girlfriend by talking to her. I don't know if it was projecting or some type of disillusionment but, I realized I could not keep doing this with her. On top of that I was upset with what happened with Audrey. I don't know where she went after that and I have no way of contacting her. At her apartment I told her I couldn't do this anymore. I was done with the relationship and did not want her in my life anymore. I went into detail saying that what she is doing is not healthy and for a while now everything she does has been wearing me down. Still, she accused me of cheating and everything else she wrote. This is where I called her delusional and left. My wife had an affair with her co-worker and gaslit me about it. Is it hopeless to keep trying? My wife and I got married three years ago. Shortly after our wedding, my wife started talking to a guy, an 18-year-old co-worker. I didn't think anything of it but they began talking every single day. Our intimacy life began to deteriorate as well but I didn't think it was related. She became more distant and one day, while we were looking at memes on her phone, she immediately hid the notification from him when he messaged her. I began to have doubts so I went through her phone while she was asleep. They had been talking every single day for essentially the whole time we have been married, three full years. She completely neglected my messages and made no effort with me, but would banter with this guy endlessly. She had sent pictures of herself unclothed as well as in swimwear and some of the conversations ended abruptly and made no sense. I think she had been deleting messages. I freaked out and accused her of having an affair, she denied that anything had happened, told me our intimacy life sucked because of me and demanded we start therapy. She said I was overreacting and that they were friends. When I pointed out to her that friends don't send explicit pictures and swimwear photos to each other, she accused me of violating her privacy. We started therapy and I began to believe her as she blamed me for all the problems in our marriage, I felt awful about how I acted and I even told her it was fine with me if she wanted to be friends with that guy again. I started to work on what she wanted me to do during intimacy and how to initiate and I believed that our relationship was getting better. Then I got an anonymous email from someone claiming to be her coworker. they said they saw my wife kiss that guy and outlined how intimate their interactions at work were. The email had contact information for the affair partner, who was now 21, but I couldn't bring myself to confront him. I confronted. My wife and she said all they did was kiss a couple times and that they never had intimacy. She once again blamed me, accused me of spying on her, but when I showed her the email she refused to elaborate on it. I kept pressing her and she said that she lied to me when I confronted her about the texts because she didn't want to lose me but went on to kiss and talk to him afterwards? This essentially confirmed she was gaslighting me. She keeps denying that they had intimacy but admits they spent time together alone outside of work. Is there any way salvage our marriage? My wife had an affair with her co-worker and gaslit me about it. Is it hopeless to keep trying? I met up with my older brother and his wife and I asked for their advice. They advised me to break up, but I was still reluctant to do so. I called my best friend while at my brother's and he had the exact same reaction. It was at that point I decided I was done and getting divorced. I texted my wife that I wouldn't be coming home, she started lighting up my phone with messages and phone calls but I ignored them, the voicemails she left ranged from begging to angry to threatening. I wanted the whole truth of the story but knew my wife would never give it to me. In the middle of the day I called the number for the affair partner that was in the email. I knew he would lie but I told him, she came clean and said you guys only had intimacy once and that it was a mistake, and all I wanted was to hear his version and that I would leave him alone. He was clearly panicked and immediately agreed, confirmed it was only once and a mistake, but wouldn't give me a day or event when I pressed. He said he was blocking my number. My brother was curious how one of her co-workers had my email and that it didn't make sense, this wasn't a publicly listed work email, it was a personal one. So I mindlessly started going through my inbox and found old emails from a rec league sports team I organized a couple years ago for my friends and my wife had invited one of her really close female co-worker friends and their partner to join. She had my email and could have sent it to me? My brother was telling me to stop because this was bordering on crazy but my blessed sister-in-law was egging me on. I called into their work and asked for a different co-worker cell, identifying myself as wife's husband and it was for a social reason. They gave it to me, once work hours were over I gave this other co-worker a call. I told her that the affair partner had come clean and that I think she emailed me. She immediately admitted to it, 
said she hated not approaching me in person but was terrified to do so and thought I might snap at her. She didn't care if anyone at work or if my wife found out, she was just grateful that I wanted to hear the truth. I thanked her for reaching out and said I couldn't talk to the affair partner again and just wanted to hear her side of the story to tell my lawyer. She said she had gone no contact with my wife and confirmed that my wife had an affair in extensive detail. They had intimacy any time I was out of town or any time I was working overnight, both of which happened multiple times a month, and that it started weeks after our wedding. My wife had essentially been bragging about it to this co-worker friend in very graphic detail, when asked why she wouldn't leave me, my wife talked about how comfortable her life was, how much money I made and that other people thought I was good looking. This caused the co-worker to snap and cut off ties, the co-worker desperately wanted me to find out and was horrified by the situation because she had been cheated on before and that my wife was aware of that. She said other friends also knew. This felt like a betrayal because two of the other friends had known me for so long that I considered them my own friends, they were at our house multiple times a month. I wanted to call them but my sister-in-law stopped me, she thought they would give my wife a heads up and said I might enjoy catching her in another lie. I slept at my brother's for a second night and sent a text that I'd be home at 10am tomorrow to my wife. I went home, she was waiting, asked me what was going on and that she had been worried sick and was anxious and was furious. I told her the affair partner came clean, you guys had intimacy once. She broke down, said it was just the once, she loved me, couldn't admit to it because I would leave her and that I was better than the other guy in every way. Then I asked her to promise it was. Just the once and she did. She said she was desperate to move on from this, have kids, continue with our comfortable life, I should let it go. Things got quiet and I kind of just started laughing, I saw her for who she really was. I told her I knew the whole truth, told her about some of what I had heard and was only here to grab my things and take our pet dog. She was in disbelief, screamed at me and locked herself in the washroom. I packed a bag and have been at my brother's since. Although ever since at my brother's my sister-in-law has been making some suggestive advances. I'm considering my options here, not gonna lie. I think my girlfriend is too obsessed with me. Is her behavior normal? I have been dating my girlfriend for two months now. She seemed very sweet when we started talking but as soon as we made it official, her behavior changed. As soon as the relationship started, I experienced love bombing. She wanted to spend every single second of the day with me. At first I thought this was sweet, but it became a problem when I realized she couldn't go a single day without seeing me. When we were apart, she insisted on being on call all the time. She would call me while I was having dinner with my parents, and would give out to me if I took too long to have said dinner when I called her back. It has now gotten to the point where I can't even work in peace. She insists on calling me every lunch break I get, and expects me to reply instantly even if I am at work, something I literally cannot do in my workplace. If I am ever out with my friends, which is very rare, she will call me crying, begging me to come over and comfort her as she is having my breakdown. The last time I went out was the worst. She called me crying, accusing me of cheating even though she had no basis for these claims, when I asked her why she would think this she responded it's because I went out to her. I hung up the phone and told her to calm down and call me again when she has thought it through. She then tried calling me a minute later, once again yelling. I hung up and stopped answering th phone. Within the hour I had over 30 missed calls and about 5 voice messages. All of her crying, all of her accusing me of being a terrible boyfriend and planning to leave her. It made me not enjoy my night and to shut her up I decided to go over to hers. When I told her I would come over her whole demeanor changed, she went from demanding that I come over to saying things like. You really don't have to. Only come over if you want to, I want you to enjoy spending your time with your friends, don't worry about me I'm fine. I went over anyway, but with the idea of having a conversation about her behavior. We talked and it got very ugly on her side, she got very emotional, cried, and somehow flipped it in a way to blame me. She said she had been cheated in the past and is fearful it can happen again. Although I understand this, it cannot be normal. Is it? I think my girlfriend is too obsessed with me. Is her behavior normal? Time went on and my girlfriend's behavior started to become more normal. I managed to talk to her again and she opened up about her previous relationship. Her last boyfriend would lay hands on her constantly, cheat on her and was a diagnosed narcissist, she took him back a total of six times. The way he treated her left her with a sense of insecurity so large that it prompted her to act in this crazy obsessive way to make sure I never cheat nor stepped out of line, as when she acted like a good girlfriend in her last relationship she got burned. I reassured her this is not something she has to worry about. It took about a month of her acting normal for her to slip back into her craziness. Once again it was very similar, she would call me crying if I told her I could not come over today, or she would demand I text her back consistently while at work, call her during every single break I have, and this time she went even further. She practically demanded I cut contact with my friends, as they are a bad influence on me and I spent too much time with them, according to her. I realized I knew I needed to break up with her when I told her I needed some space from her. I put it very bluntly, telling her that either she gives me some space for the next week and think things through, or I am breaking up with her. I cannot make this up, the next effing day she shows up to my workplace and starts asking where I am. I work in retail and when she finds me she storms over to me and starts causing a huge scene. Throwing out allegations that I am being super unfair, I am a bad boyfriend, and loudly exclaims I am no better than her ex who laid hands on her and cheated on her. This caught a lot of people's attention but, thankfully she was escorted out. I had to talk to my boss right after and he informed me that this is a warning and if it happens again he will have to fire me as he cannot risk a situation like this happening again. I decided to end it that day. I called her after work and informed her not to contact me again, that we are over and that as much as I am sorry for her about what she has gone through, I simply cannot overlook all the emotional abuse she is putting me through. Update 2, 
I think my girlfriend is too obsessed with me. Is her behavior normal? I should have known better than to trust that she was going to leave me alone after I broke up with her. The first few days after the breakup were quiet, but then I found my tires slashed. I had to call in sick to work, and I used the day to buy cameras to have surveillance footage outside my house as I was 100% sure it was her. The very same her call started coming in again, this time from a different number. I ignored them all. All 134 times she called in that one day, I ignored them all. All the voice messages were ignored by me too. I blocked this new number too. Then out of nowhere, this all happened in the same day by the way, two new accounts on Instagram started following me. I looked through them and they were clearly recently made, and one of them messaged me, so I blocked them too. A week or so passed with no contact and I thought she had given up. Then on a day that I was off work, I heard the doorbell ring. I opened it and there she was, standing there looking god-awful. It looked like this woman had been living off vapes and monster energy drinks for a few weeks straight, getting less than an hour of sleep per night. I cannot fully describe how much her appearance had changed within the two or so weeks. She looked so much skinnier, she was always thin, now she looked anorexic. To my surprise she calmly asked me if she could come in. I felt bad, and although she had put me through a lot, as a man of faith I believe in always offering a helping hand, so I let her in. She remained quite calm and detailed to me the last two weeks. She apologized and owned up slashing my tires, she apologized for the bombardment of calls and the fake Instagram accounts. She also opened up about how she realizes she was way out of line during our entire relationship and that her actions were unforgivable. Then she opened up about the fact she has not been eating at all as she lost her. Appetite. She said she realizes that I treated her very fairly and her actions and insecurity pushed me away. I had no idea what to say, I just told her I understood. She took my hands and asked for another chance and promised to change. I know everyone will rip me apart for this, but I agreed. I agreed because I believe her, I see the good in her, and if she can be the girl she was before we became official, I see myself going the distance with her. My nightmare mother-in-law is ruining my marriage and my health. My husband and I have been together for five years and are expecting our first child. The only problem is my mother-in-law, who keeps ruining everything we have and is constantly making my mental health worse. The problem started during the virus. My husband lived with mother-in-law and I lived with my family, including my 90-year-old grandfather with late-stage Parkinson's so we quarantined away from each other for the sake of my grandfather. At one point, when the vid had subsided a bit, we had planned for my husband to stay with my family for a few weeks so we could see each other. The plan was that he would quarantine for a week before coming to my family's place. Mother-in-law knew of this plan. While he was quarantining, she decided to take an impromptu trip to Florida with eight of her friends, this was during the travel ban, and came back with the vid. My husband and I could not see each other, and he had to miss work for two weeks without pay. When we confronted her to tell her how we felt, she flew off the handle and said a slew of hurtful things, insulting me personally and attacking my past for no reason. She accused me of being controlling too. She accused me of forcing her son to be mad at her. Apparently, if I wasn't in the picture, there's no way her son would be upset or treating her this way. From there things continued escalating especially while planning our wedding. We were having a small wedding so I told mother-in-law that she was welcome to invite up to 10 people of her choosing. She called me and asked if she could invite a few more, insisting that she would pay for the additional friends since she knew we were on a tight budget and couldn't afford to expand the guest list too much. She ended up inviting an additional 45 people whom neither my husband nor I know. When we asked her how she was going to pay for the additional friends, she insisted that she never made such an offer. We were stuck with a wedding bill that had increased by almost 60% and no way to pay for it. Mother-in-law had also been a nightmare about other wedding-related things and had generally been acting as though the party was about her and she was the bride, insisting on showing up wearing white. At this point, my mother-in-law offered us $25,000 to cancel the entire wedding. She said that, since we clearly weren't enjoying ourselves, the money would be better spent on something like a house as opposed to a wedding. Because we were so miserable planning the wedding, and also could not afford the additional people my mother-in-law had invited, we went through with it and cancelled our wedding. We ended up eloping with a few close family members. When we asked for the $25,000, mother-in-law insisted it was a misunderstanding and that she never offered us the money. We are both lawyers and had multiple conversations with mother-in-law about the logistics of the $25,000, there was absolutely no misunderstanding. We never received the money. We ended up sending her a letter about how upset we were about the wedding and asking for an apology or some form of accountability. Again, we were gaslit and were attacked. I was accused of being the mastermind puppeteering my husband to be mad at her and we were accused of having no consideration for how any of this makes her feel. Husband and I started therapy and learned about the importance of boundaries. We tried implementing boundaries and asked for some space while we worked through how upset we are over the wedding and the lack of accountability. My husband's biggest boundary was to stop her accusing me of puppeteering him to be mad at her. The talk about boundaries did not go over well. We were asked why we thought we could unilaterally make decisions, and that we were intentionally trying to hurt her as punishment, despite her doing everything she could to make the situation right. Over the next few months we had a distant relationship but were able to see her on occasion. When we did see her, snarky comments would always be made. Husband and I eventually found out we were pregnant and were very happy. A few weeks after finding out we were pregnant, my husband made a horrible mistake. 
He went to a intimacy club at a bachelor party and had a private lap dance. This was a very dark time for us. After intense therapy and many long and difficult conversations, my husband and I are in a much better place now and are committed to the marriage. When I first found out about the club, I kicked him out of the house so that I had some time to calm down. I was in my first trimester and was struggling with severe morning sickness. He went to mother-in-law's house. I spoke with her about the situation and told her I needed some time, and to please keep this information private. Almost immediately after that phone call, my mother-in-law called my sister-in-law and told her everything. Mother-in-law then fabricated a story about how my sister-in-law found out and told my sister-in-law to repeat the same lie to me. My mother-in-law eventually came clean about the lie, but insisted she was not sorry for telling my sister-in-law. For me this was the last straw. I called my husband and said that if our marriage was going to work out, he needed to be willing to walk away from mother-in-law and focus on repairing the damage to our relationship. Husband said he needed to think about it and I hung up in a fury. After I hung up with husband, I realized almost immediately that I had given him an unfair ultimatum. I called him back less than five minutes later, apologized, and told him that he could handle mother-in-law however he wanted and that I would support him. Unfortunately, husband had already told mother-in-law that I asked him to cut her out of his life. This caused mother-in-law to completely lose her mind. She sent a slew of abusive texts and emails, all directed at me. She accused me of breaking my marriage vows and the Ten Commandments by asking husband to cut her out of his life. She told husband that I was on a path to unhappiness and that my ultimatums would leave him isolated and alone. She told him that I was akin to the false mother from the Solomon parable, because if I really loved him, I would never ask him to give up his family. She questioned my ability to be a mother as I didn't hesitate to cut her out of my child's life. It got so bad that I was on the verge of a mental break. I stopped being able to work eat or sleep. We decided to explain to mother-in-law that because she couldn't respect our request for time and space, that we would be temporarily blocking her on everything and would reach out when we were ready. That's when she started involving other people. She told husband's grandfather that I was forcing husband to not speak to her. This prompted the grandfather to get on a plane and insist on meeting us for lunch. Husband told him that we could meet for lunch, but that we were not open to discussing mother-in-law because at that time we needed space. He agreed. We had a lovely lunch where the grandfather wished me and the baby well. At the end of lunch, he handed husband an envelope. Inside was a four-page letter about how horrible I was, handwritten by him and mother-in-law. Mother-in-law also started contacting my family, and reached out to my husband's friend's parents, and eventually began texting my husband's friends directly asking them to meet up with them. At that point, my husband felt he had no choice but to reinitiate contact to ask her to stop involving other people. He wanted to give her one last chance to show remorse for the things said about me and understand that, in order to have a relationship, they needed to respect husband as an adult capable of making his own decisions, and respect us as parents. The conversation was gray. Husband basically had to force an apology out of her, which was always qualified with things like I'm sorry, but someone should never make another person stop talking to their family, she agreed to respect our marriage but didn't see a problem with her past behavior. I mentioned that I am worried about having her around our baby, and she accused me of being bizarre for being worried about that, because she is a good person. We hung up more confused than ever. Now, because she is unblocked, she is asking to meet up with husband for lunch. Everyone keeps telling me to not give her any of my mental energy, but I just can't get over the things that have been said, and I have no faith that she will act differently in the future. My 15-year-old daughter is pregnant. When is it the right time to tell her that her older sister is her biological mother? My wife Rose and I had our first daughter Sarah when we were 17. We were young and broke but managed and now we raised Sarah the best we could. She got pregnant at 13. It was a very depressing time for her she and never told us anything about the father, other than the fact that he was 18 and a part-time substance dealer. I was mad, but tried my best to support her. She told us she wanted to give the baby up for adoption. After having no luck finding a couple who wanted to adopt, Sarah asked us if we wanted to adopt. Me and Rose had both been discussing having another child, so we ended up adopting our daughter Ellie when Sarah had her at 14. Two years after Ellie, me and my wife had our son Logan. Growing up we always planned on telling Ellie she was adopted, but we knew by telling her that, we had to tell her Sarah was her bio mother. Sarah never became close with Ellie, not even as sisters. She moved out after the birth and lived with Rose's sister. She has always shown sisterly love to Logan, but never towards Ellie. There have always been conflicting feelings with Sarah. I have seen posts on Sarah's Instagram where she posted a picture of what was supposed to be the five of us, but Ellie was cut out. I confronted her about this and she says it's too painful. However, a couple years ago she showed up drunk begging us to let us see her daughter. We talked to her and let her stay but did not let her near Ellie since she was drunk. We found out from her husband she had suffered several miscarriages and was told to consider a surrogate. She ended up doing that four years ago and has since had twins Jack and Jill, who are biologically hers, and no they did not go up the hill. Ellie has loved being an aunt of the twins and Sarah has encouraged this with Ellie, and has been inviting Ellie over to her house for family time with Logan, who loves being an uncle. We have asked Sarah that in light of the twins, and Ellie being close to them, wouldn't it be time to tell Ellie the truth, but Sarah keeps claiming she is not ready. Recently, our 14-year-old Ellie came to us and has told us she is pregnant. Just like Sarah, the father is older, but at least this time he isn't a part-time substance dealer. Either way, Ellie is insistent on keeping the baby. 
She is three months along, we have not told Sarah yet, we do not know how to approach the situation. My husband is a pathological liar. Help me please. When I first met my husband three years ago he was charming and love bombed me from the beginning. One of the first things he told me was that he had a master's degree and that he was currently working on a second one online. When we moved he told me that he never wrote his final paper and never finished the degree. I of course encouraged him to finish it but we stopped talking about it. A month ago he randomly told me that he had finished the degree and that it was hanging in his office. I was instantly suspicious. The next day I asked him to send me a picture of his new diploma and he never responded, completely airing my message. He later told me the cell tower was out near work. I dropped the topic and knew that I would get the chance to see his office eventually. Last week the chance arose and lo and behold, there was no diploma hanging in his office. I asked him about it and he said I never told you I had it hanging, it's probably buried under some paperwork. I grabbed his binder of documents off the shelf and started flipping through it. There was only one diploma and it was for a Bachelor of Arts. He immediately told me that that was a mistake and was actually a BS and that his dad had his master's diploma. And that that paper was outdated and that it was incredibly difficult to update things like that through HR. When we got home I asked for any proof of his most recent degree, anything, even an email would suffice. He couldn't give me any proof. I asked for his advisor's name and he immediately gave a name. I looked it up and there's no one by that name associated with the university. I asked him what he submitted his coursework through and he said that his university uses Moodle. At this point I knew he was obviously lying and assumed he was lying about the other as well. He kept telling me he would get his transcript to show me though. I called the university registrar's office for the most recent degree. And they had no record of him, he was never enrolled there. That evening I sat him down and told him we needed to talk about the lying. He confessed that he had not completed the degree but had enrolled there and that he did in fact have a master's from his first university. I told him I knew he was lying and that I had called the university and begged him to stop lying. I asked him again if he was telling the truth about the other masters and that if he was lying I would leave. He swore up and down he was telling the truth. I even told him I was going to call that university to check. I called the university and was able to get a degree verification that he only had the Bachelor of Arts. That evening I told him I knew that he had lied to my face again and that I had contacted the school. He didn't skip a beat. The first words out of his mouth were it's actually two bachelor's degrees. I was baffled. I had just told him I had proof of his degree and he tried to lie again. He doesn't seem phased when presented with the truth and just tries to tell more lies. He then tried to tell me the university was wrong and it was supposed to be a Bachelor of Science. Never admitting to the lie, just a constant spew of more lies. He doesn't seem remorseful. I asked him today if he actually believed his lies. He said no that he knew they were lies and that he just wanted me to be proud of him. When we first started dating he tried to tell me that he was adopted. A few months later on his birthday I saw a text from his mom come through that red happy birthday I remember when you were born and they laid you on my chest 8 pounds 3 ounces. I confronted him about it and he tried to say that she had given him up and then gotten him back. He then said he remembered a lady calling him by a different name and some nonsense about his brother telling him he's adopted. He also said his dad's name wasn't on his birth certificate. I found his birth certificate and his dad's name is on it. We got in a big fight over it and it eventually just came down to him saying I dunno that's just what I thought though. This summer I got pregnant with him but ended up having a miscarriage at 5 weeks. It was really early and I knew that these things happen and there was likely something wrong with the embryo. However I was feeling sad about it and hoping for some comfort for my husband. He ended up yelling at me and telling me he had 4 other miscarriages to deal with at work and that this is just like when we argue about the dishes. I was beyond hurt and couldn't believe he could say such things to me. I was crying at that point and asking what was wrong with him. He backpedaled a bit and claimed he'd misread the situation. I cheated on my mentally unstable ex-girlfriend and she took her life. Is it morally wrong to go to her funeral? I dated my ex-girlfriend Sienna for 6 years and we were engaged for 6 months before our relationship ended due to me sleeping with my girl best friend. My reasoning for this was justified in my opinion. Around 2 years before Sienna's passing she sunk into a major depression. She was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and she was medicated for the next year and a half. Her episodes were awful, often ending with me with bruises or her having total breakdowns. However, when she started her medication she was better. Sadly it led to numerous side effects including a complete drop in her intimacy drive, something I could not deal with due to my very high one. Sienna was repulsed by any form of physical intimacy, and no matter how much I initiated or tried to disregard her lack of intimacy drive, she always pushed me off. Sometimes we made efforts to work through this and I tried my best to go without intimacy but I could not. I made a decision to sleep with my girl best friend. My girl best friend has always found me attractive and I knew this, and so I did it. However, my girl best friend kept wanting to have intimacy, but I felt too guilty to keep doing it, so I told her no. Due to this, she was the one who told Sienna. This broke Sienna's heart. The shock of this event destroyed her so much that she quit her medication and fell to the lowest point I had ever seen her. We postponed our wedding in an attempt to work this out, but we could not. Our relationship ended just over a month ago. Last week she was found by her sister, having taken her life. She wrote multiple notes to different family members and one specifically for me. In it she cited that the reason she took her own life was the end of our relationship due to my infidelity.
She claimed I was the only light in her life, and she saw no other point in living. I want to go to her funeral. I want to see her one last time. I know it's selfish but I'm also struggling so much with this and with losing her. I need to apologize to her one more time. Her dad threatened me and told me that I can't come around or he'd hurt me so I know the family doesn't want me there. I don't know what I can do. What's the smallest amount of power you've seen go to someone's head? When I left the substance smuggling ring I decided to take on a job as a security guard on a cruise ship. The perks of this job were great, and one of the perks was that every night the crew could get together at the bar and have a huge discount on the drinks. We would all get hammered and do stupid stuff, such as go spar in the boxing gym on the ship or convince someone that we're throwing them overboard. The problem with drinking at said bar, was that it was technically against the rules as the bar had closed for the customers. Well, my friend group at the time was about five people. One of these guys, Richard, was an avid consumer of alcohol at said bar and joined us basically every single night. Richard got a promotion while I was working there and he went around flaunting it. He was now some fancy assistant and was adamant on following the rules. The day of his promotion, the crew are at the bar after hours drinking and he comes in. We all raise a toast for him and congratulate him on the promotion. He looks at us and tells us to stop drinking as this is against the rules and with his new position he must inform the higher-ups of the cruise ship company of what we are all doing. We all looked at him and laughed, promusing it was a joke and that he was effing with us. Richard was indeed not effing with us. He perked his nose up like a corrupt mayor and left, leaving us all stunned. He came back next night, heated, once again giving out to us for drinking giving us a final warning or else he would rat on us. Richard ended up getting thrown into a freezing cold shower unclothed until he agreed to let us keep drinking. I'm going to visit my ex-boyfriend but my current boyfriend seems to have a problem with it. My ex and I were together for four years, but we separated six years ago as we grew apart, typical of young love. Since I spent two of those four years living at his parents' house, I grew close to his family and friends, some of whom I still stay in daily contact with, including my ex, as we update each other on our lives and have a Snapchat streak. I visit his town 100 kilometers away every year for the annual town festival which lasts a weekend, to see old faces, share stories and have fun. I've been dating my current boyfriend for nine months. I've never hidden the fact that I'm still friends with my ex, nor that nothing has happened between us since the breakup. A few days ago, we discussed our weekend plans for the next few weeks, and I mentioned my upcoming visit to my ex's home in two weeks. He didn't take it well, even though he had never had an issue with our friendship before. He finds it weird and odd that I'm visiting my ex while being in a new relationship, and I agree with him. I'm aware that it's not the norm. However I've never given him a reason not to trust me. I have cheated in the, asked, but I am a changed woman. He says he trusts me, or rather, he says he has to trust me because he has no other choice. He doesn't forbid me from visiting my ex, but his tone and behavior indicate that it bothers him. When I asked him how he feels about it, he simply said, I can't change it, so it doesn't matter what I think. It's been five days since we first talked about it, and there's no improvement in sight. I'll definitely still visit my ex because my main goal is to see him and catch up in real life. But I don't know how long I can tolerate my boyfriend's lack of communication. It's just a tiny part of our relationship. Most of the time, he communicates openly. It's just in this case, he's not, and it's bothering me immensely. I'm going to visit my ex-boyfriend but my current boyfriend seems to have a problem with it. I had planned on going to visit my ex regardless of my boyfriend's opinion. After the weekend I initiated another conversation with my boyfriend. First and foremost I apologized and basically explained to him that my freedom over the past few years had apparently made me selfish and uncompromising, and that I definitely need to work on myself and how I communicate things. I then tried to explain to him in more detail why visiting my ex was so important to me. His family took me in when my parents kicked me out back then. They loved me as if I were their own child, just when I needed it most. Not just once did they pull me out of a depressive pit, and I will be forever grateful for that. I'm still in regular contact with my ex's friends and meet up with someone from the group about every two months. I told him how sorry I was but that the visit had been arranged for almost 10 months, and they were also counting on my help with the festival, and I would feel guilty. I had been looking forward to the festival for so long that not being able to go would break my heart a little. But despite all of this, none of these things were the end of the world, and they could somehow be straightened out. If he really wanted me to, I could cancel it. His reaction surprised me. He communicated that, thanks to the detailed explanation, he now understood and was happy for me to see those people again. He said that what had originally bothered him was how I had communicated it. He told me to go and have fun. However, he couldn't come along due to other commitments. The following two weeks were quite uneventful. Whenever the visit was mentioned, he genuinely seemed happy for me. Fast forward to the Friday I was supposed to leave. I came home from work at noon, packed the last of my things, and was ready to drive off. Except I couldn't find my car keys. I was sure they were on the hook. That morning but they weren't there. I searched the entire house. I then messaged my boyfriend who was still at work, asking if he had seen them. After half an hour he replied that he didn't know, but he could check his pockets to see if they were there. I thanked him and waited. Another half hour passed, and he messaged that they were indeed in his pocket but that I didn't need to come to get them because he'd be home in an hour anyway. I thought I'll wait for that hour and then leave. 
that way I'll see him again before I go. After an hour and a half of waiting, I called him. He was still out with a colleague having a drink. At that moment I had already given up on leaving that day without being overly tired. I told him not to rush and that I'd wait. So I laid down on the couch and watched some TV series. Shortly before 11 at night, my boyfriend came home slightly tipsy and acted like everything was normal. I asked him if he could give me the car key so that I could leave early in the morning. After a few minutes of hesitation, he said that he had left it at work. Up until that point, I had remained calm because mistakes can happen. But then I got angry. I asked if he was serious. Yes he said, he was sorry, but there was nothing he could do now. The office was closed until Monday. But we could have a nice weekend at home. At that moment, I still didn't want to believe that he had orchestrated all of this, although the thought had briefly crossed my mind. I also couldn't talk about it anymore and started crying. To calm myself down, I decided to take my luggage and stay with a friend. In response, he left the room without saying a word and returned a minute later with the car key, which he had suddenly found and asked me to stay until the next morning. After another 15 minutes of crying, I drove to my friend's place anyway, and the next morning, I went to my ex-boyfriend's. Because I was there to help with the festival, I didn't have time to think about the situation or talk to him. But during the car ride home, I spent a long time trying to find a logical explanation for his behavior. I failed miserably. It's not even his car. He hardly ever drives my car and when he does, he usually asks beforehand. So I was pretty sure that all of this was planned. When I got home he acted as if everything was okay, but he still seemed passive-aggressive. After unpacking, I confronted him during dinner about whether the whole thing was really an accident. After repeatedly asking him because things seemed illogical to me, he suddenly got very angry. He said he never said or meant it that way. Was I too stupid to understand his words? Both he and I exchanged insults and shouted at each other. Then a plate flew in my direction and smashed into the wall above me, and I left and spent the rest of the day with friends. I knew the relationship was over, but he may not have realized it yet. The next day while he was at work, two friends and I packed all of his things, and then we waited for him to come home. He probably thought he could talk his way out of it again, but I told him it was over. He didn't want to accept it until he saw his packed things. He became loud and aggressive again, but after a 10-minute tirade, he finally returned my house key with the words you damn beach, you'll regret this when you die alone. But at least you can screw your ex without a guilty conscience. That was surely your plan, that's what you wanted right? And then he left. Since then I've blocked him everywhere and haven't seen him, and I hope it stays that way. I told my girlfriend to choose between me or her best friend. My girlfriend and I have been together for four years. She's been best friends with her friend since middle school. Before I came into the picture they were attached at the hip and then the BFF got jealous of how often my girlfriend and I were together. For our entire relationship she's been manipulative of my girlfriend and not at all understanding, especially when my girlfriend cancels plans with the BFF to hang out with me. She has also said repeatedly that I'm abusive and controlling even though she exclusively dates guys who are a-holes. Her last boyfriend put her in the hospital for context, but she knows who is toxic and controlling and who isn't right? It all came to a head tonight when we were all out together. The BFF was going on and on about her new job and my girlfriend finally interrupted her to talk about our vacation instead. The BFF got upset and asked if my girlfriend even knew where she worked because my girlfriend was never around anymore. My girlfriend replied no and the BFF started crying in the middle of a bar about how her feelings get hurt when my girlfriend cancels on their plans or doesn't reply to texts. I had enough and asked why she was so obsessed with my girlfriend and our relationship and always needed to lie about me being controlling to get attention. Then her blowhard boyfriend got involved and threatened me with physical violence. Everyone split up after that, and the BFF texted my girlfriend to try to manipulate her some more by saying sorry she started the fight and saying she wanted some space for a while. My girlfriend started crying about how much it all upsets her and after four years I was just kind of tired of it and told her that she needed to choose between me and the BFF. She got upset with me and told me that she couldn't choose between us and it wasn't fair to ask her to, even though the BFF is always starting drama. Friend of best friend's perspective, I told my girlfriend to choose between me or her best friend. Uda Jake, nobody likes you. You left out so many details, which I will fill in. During the get-together, we all asked about the job of the best friend of your girlfriend, because it is her dream job and she is so excited about it. That girl worked her butt off to get it, so she gets to talk as much as she wants about it. You two don't like hearing about anything that isn't about yourselves, especially you Jake. Second, your girlfriend has never known how to balance a boyfriend with healthy friend relationships. I've known them both since college. She's insecure, immature and self-centered. That's how you're able to control her. The only reason you two get invited anywhere anymore is because her BFF and her boyfriend insist it would be rude not to invite her. Because you're a package deal, we're stuck with you two. Third, you were never threatened with physical violence. You're a six foot four fat dude who got in a crying girl's face to scream at her and her boyfriend told you to back up and put himself in between the both of you. Fourth, she was only crying because you were calling her names. You literally called her a beach, attention seeker, and a cow, even though you're the medically obese one. Fifth, you make your girlfriend cancel on this poor girl at least twice a month. I've seen the text from your girlfriend canceling because you came up with some bullcrap about how you don't get enough time with her. 
Sixth, she only calls you a controlling a-hole because you are one. You convinced your girlfriend to stop talking to her for a period of time when she was very depressed and had thoughts of self-deletion because you said her having these thoughts was also manipulation. Seventh, if anyone is manipulated in that friendship it's your girlfriend. I've also seen the text where she told her BFF not to text her while she's with you, not to expect a response from her ever. Because she doesn't deserve one, and not to get upset when she cancels because she isn't owed any time. The girl apologizes so much because your girlfriend has her convinced she's a bad person and clingy. What was the craziest rumor in high school and was it true? One of my friends was accused of hacking into the gradebook program and changing his grades and attendance. They dragged him out of class and held him in the office in a little room for the remainder of the day, trying to sweat him out to get him to confess, as they had no actual evidence at all that he had done anything. They wouldn't even let him go to the bathroom. All they had was that one of his teachers takes attendance and does grades on paper, then enters them into the gradebook at the end of the day or week, and he noticed that some of his stuff had changed. Aside from that, they had no proof at all that he had actually done anything. He pleaded innocent on the whole deal, claiming that maybe it was a database error. After they couldn't get anything out of him the first day, they started holding him in the office all day in the same fashion until the third day when someone called his parents and warned them of what was happening. Within an hour his dad showed up, tore the principal a new a-hole, threatened to arrest him for abuse, and took his son home. They actually ended up suing the school, over the mistreatment of the kid, as they literally spent days accusing him and threatening him with various punishments if he didn't come clean and such, refusing to let him use the restroom, not letting him have lunch, and basically trying to make him break and admit to a crime they had no evidence he committed. Settled for a pretty large chunk of money, if I remember correctly. He did do it though. He totally did hack his grades and attendance. He was just good enough to not leave any evidence behind. What was the craziest thing you ever did in school? I grew up in an orphanage in the Soviet Union with about 700 kids in the school and only 20 teachers to take care of us. After 9 p.m. all the teachers would leave, leaving us alone. Of course there were the classics incidents, someone getting wailed on, belongings getting stolen, or in one case a mattress being set on fire while someone was sleeping. Bear in mind we were like 13 at this point. However my group of friends and I decided to take after dark hours to a whole never level. We convinced our entire grade, about 60 kids, to make butter socks. Freeze some butter and stuff in it a sock. After dark, my grade's plan was to run into all of the bedrooms with these butter socks and lay the smack down on everybody. The premises was to wail on them until they cracked and gave us their money, or their food, or whatever else their bags had to offer. The teachers left and there we were, ready to annihilate everyone. The night went just as expected. The butter socks were no match for anyone as the 60-odd of us ended up laying the smack down on a few hundred others and stealing their belongings. Sadly this was not the end. The teachers noticed that the next day basically half the school had very visible injuries and they were very suspicious as to why none of my grade was injured. One of my classmates cracked and blamed my friend group for orchestrating the whole thing. Four of us were expelled including me. There I was, 13 years old and homeless. I spent the next few years taking trains to farms to steal potatoes and other vegetables for food and couch surfed. I ended up meeting a man who offered me a job as a hitman to make some money. But that is a story for another day. What's the greatest thing you've ever done that turned out to be a colossal mistake in hindsight? I was partying at a club in Marbella when I noticed an adult film star in the same club, one of my favorites. I made my way over to him and told him I am a big fan of his work, and we got to talking and dancing together. While dancing, I told him I was jealous of the actresses he films with. I then proceeded to say that I wish that one day whipped cream wouldn't be restricted solely for kitchen uses. This actor has done many films involving whipped cream, so he picked my hint up very quickly. By the end of the night I had given him brain in the bathroom. After we finished, he asked for my name and I gave it to him. As the club closed, he invited me over to his mansion and told me I was more than welcome to stay the night. I jumped at this opportunity, and we got an Uber over. We got to the mansion, and I realized this house had even more adult film stars. Most I recognized, but some I did not. I even met some 6 foot 10 tatted black dude, and was kind of excited for what he could do to me. He had a massive member as I have seen in the films. There were maybe 6 of us there. We started off tame enough, doing blow and playing card games. I was having a great night. By 6 am, everyone was in bed except me and the guy who brought me here. By this point, there had been a lot of tension between us, and although I managed to get a quickie in with the 6 foot 10 guy upstairs a few hours ago, my main goal was to F the star I came with. Now that it was just me and him, I knew we were about to get freaky. We started playing truth or dare and he kept daring me to do more and more provocative things. I had a whole waterfall going on down there after about 20 minutes. We played this game until the tension was too high, and then he brought me out a drink. I thought nothing of it as I had drank a lot before, and even had drinks at this mansion. However, after I drank this, the world went black. I don't remember anything after, except waking up with whipped cream on my legs and feet. I was super confused and felt very sick. I failed to connect the dots, and the guy who brought me here got me dressed and helped me shower. He ordered some food for us and I left around evening time to go back to the hotel room with my friends. It was only after I told my friends what happened that the realization of what had happened dawned on me, and I panicked. I left the holiday early and went to get tested. I contracted the clap. However, I'm not sure if that was the adult film star, or from one of the three other guys I let hit raw during the holiday. What's the stupidest way you've ever gotten laid?
I approached an absolutely stunning girl while she was working at Tesco and managed to secure her number. This girl was absolutely stunning, and me still having my V card, I could not stop fantasizing about her. I texted her and got a reply, so I struck up a conversation. We vibed really well and the next day, I went onto the hub to find actresses that looked like her. I then proceeded to develop an addiction to jacking it, and did it four times a day to the actress who looked like her. I even started developing cheese down there, it was a nightmare to clean. We texted for about a week and I managed to secure a date at her house. Throughout the whole time, she kept being super flirty with me and I felt like we had some actual connection going on. Finally, I went bold and risked it all. I asked her if she was free anytime soon or had a free house to which I could come over. She then told me she lived alone. The stage was set, and I invited myself over to hers, and she seemed very willing to accept. The day I went over I cleared all my plans. Hell, I even called in sick to work to make sure I could go over to hers. That day, I shaved my bush down there for the first ever time, washed away all of the cheese that had built up as a result of the previous mentioned jacking, even sprayed deodorant on my PP, put on my cologne and headed out the door. The drive wasn't too bad, it was about 40 minutes and I could manage it. I arrived at her house and was welcomed. Her house was clean, she looked beautiful and she welcomed me in. We got to conversing and the whole time she kept being flirty, touching my leg, and making suggestive comments. I was ready to bone, and was working up the nerve to just go and kiss her already. As I was planning out the smoothest way to do this, her doorbell rang. My heart froze, but she remained calm. She stood up and walked over to the door. I invited my friend over, hope you don't mind. The hell. Would I mind, I'm about to lose my V card in a three way. The pretty girl came back, and behind her came the duff. The designated ugly fat friend. I mean, I'm not one to comment on weight, but this girl looked inflated, she had a 1 to 2 shoulder to waist ratio. I mean, this girl was big in all capital letters. Then before I could comprehend my dire situation, the pretty girl states, hey this is my best friend Lauren, she saw a picture of you and figured you were super cute. She's recently single by the way. I set you two up on a surprise date. I'll leave you two alone. With each sentence my heart sank deeper, and before I could respond the cute girl bolted upstairs. So here I was, me and Lauren, an absolute weapon of mass destruction. My heart actually sank when I saw what she was wearing. She wore a pucoli necklace, the exact one I had told the cute girl I liked the look of. They pre-meditated this, and even wore clothes which I like. On top of that, this girl, this consequence of the industrial revolution, was wearing a short crop top and short shorts. I tried to make small conversation but really struggled. Lauren, about five minutes into small talk whipped out a phone and offered to order us some pizza. I mean look, I'm not going to say no. I'll entertain this whale for some pizza. She orders it and out comes another surprise, a whole liter of vodka. Screw it, I've made it this far, maybe the alcohol will make me forget this night. I have some, she has some, and I have more. The pizza arrives and to my utter dismay, this woman ordered it in cash, then when it arrived claimed to have forgotten her wallet, making me pay for the pizza. I sat there, intoxicated and ticked off. However, whilst I was eating pizza, trying to be as silent as possible, this beluga decides to grab the pizza out of my hand and start making out with me. Before I could process it, I was deep within her belly rolls. 20 minutes of heaven or hell later, I truly do not remember, we were finished. As I was done, I was disgusted with myself, post-nut clarity had hit me like a truck. I remember needing to get out of there, so I told her I was heading to the bathroom, and proceeded to head out the door. I was intoxicated, and had a 40-minute drive home. I decided to risk it, as I was not spending another second in that house with that wildebeest. Thankfully, I got home okay, the only hiccup during the car ride was me getting sick out the window of the car. My fiancé crossed the one boundary I had by exposing my past trauma to her family. I recently proposed to my girlfriend less than a month ago. My girlfriend is notorious for blabbering everything to her mother, if I confide in her I know it will get around to her mother, however that never bothered me much until now. I have one boundary that I was very clear about, and it's been crossed. To preface, my father roped me and three of my siblings for years. He did the same to a number of his own siblings as well. It has torn my extended family apart, and left us and our mother to pick up the pieces. Of all the things our father did, cheating, lying, stealing, having an affair, running off with another woman who was 17 after getting exposed for his deeds, this was the worst. He has fled the country and left the mess he made behind. Nobody knows the truth besides our immediate and extended family. However, because I was going to marry the love of my life, I explained it to her. I was explicit in saying that you cannot tell anyone, and specified her mother and she said she understood. I came to find out that she told her mother. Not only did she vaguely say it, she explained the whole situation in detail. Why? I have no idea. Her mother kept pressuring her over and over again, and my best guess is she wanted to please her mom, as usual, and this time not only at my expense, but the expense of my family. I was devastated by the blatant lack of respect for me as her future partner and my family. That one action broke my heart and destroyed the trust I have in her. Her response? But it's my mom, I know it was wrong, but I promise she won't talk. She just kept asking me what we talked about, you know that I have a hard time saying no to her don't be mad. I tried explaining that's not the point. She responds finally with. It was weighing heavy on my chest and I just confided in my mom okay that's the truth. Am I crazy or does she just not understand the gravity of the situation? Her response is always the same. I can't change what happened, but it was just my mom I took the ring back and I've moved out. I have nowhere to go now so I went back to my mom's house. I'm embarrassed, I'm hurt, and I feel betrayed. 
I still even gave her a chance and offered to go to a couple's therapist and see if this can be fixed, yet she told me I think it's best we go our separate ways because. You're saying I broke the trust, so what's the point? I called my mother-in-law to protect me from my fiancé. My fiancé was injured over two months ago and had surgery to correct things literally two days after the accident. I have more or less become his caregiver. In the last month I have taken over the role of keeping our house together. I cook all the meals and take care of the pets. I stay up all night to tend to his endless needs. I haven't left the house for more than an hour since the accident. My problem is his attitude. He was given very strong painkillers for the first two weeks after surgery. He had to extend his time on them but stopped taking them since. When he was taking them, he thanked me, told me how much he loved me, apologized at every step though he didn't need to. Without the meds he doesn't seem to see that I am helping him. Every dish I bring him is the wrong one, he will yell for me and when I come he will tell me to F off, if he's in pain he expects me to fix it. After a few days of what turned into verbal abuse, I called my mother-in-law. I told her everything as soon as I saw he was asleep. I cried for about 15 minutes. She was very supportive on the phone. After hearing everything she was furious and ended our call to talk to her son. She tore him a new a-hole. I heard him trying to defend himself through the door but it was mostly just stammering. She flew up the next day and put me up in a nice hotel. She then took him back to their hometown and I did not contact my fiancé for a few days. My mother called about a venue she found in my hometown and I told her what's going on, she doesn't want to spend a bunch of money on a pending divorce so we are stepping back from wedding planning. Two days after being checked into the hotel I went home. I met my fiancé and cruel and nasty things were sad. My mother-in-law had clean but the energy in the house was a bummer. The first thing he said to me when I got back was I'm glad you're back, can you make me a snack? There was no apology, no accountability, just a task. He only talked to me when he needed something. The weekend following my trash bag fiancé told me he had friends coming to stay for the weekend. Two hour heads up and didn't ask. I sighed and made up the guest room. His friend and his friend's girlfriend came to stay. During the stay my fiancé bought me flowers, got out of bed daily, took me out, and let me call my parents unsupervised. The day they left he was back to bed with a crappy attitude. I'm scared to leave but I have decided that I have to. My mother hasn't spoken to me since I told her I was returning the ring because that's not what we do, we clean our messes but I have my father's unwavering support. I'll miss my mother-in-law but I deserve that kindness and understanding from my partner, not his mother. I have stopped forcing myself to find joy in his presence and it's helping to fuel my drive to get out of here. I called my mother-in-law to protect me from my fiancé. My fiancé went on a spontaneous trip away and I took that opportunity to get everything I needed and leave. He told me he took this trip as an opportunity to reflect on his behavior within our relationship, specifically the last year. He is pretty disappointed in himself. It seems that the company he was on vacation with helped to hold a pretty clear mirror to his face and he was really unhappy with what he saw. I let him know of my decision to leave and he took it well. The day he came back he invited me over and told me he wishes for me to spend one more night. Well, I came over, we shared drinks and slept together. We decided to do it with no protection. Long story short, I got pregnant by him. I told my ex a couple days after I found out. I assured him that this changes nothing about our relationship as a couple, but as he is the father he has the right to be involved in the conversation. He declared he is moving to my hometown and he will be the best goddamn father you've ever seen. I am encouraged to see my ex making big boy steps to be a part of our kid's life. But I'm also cautious he's doing all this to get back in my good graces. I can't be a mom to my ex and my future child. I can't fall back into the same dynamic that made me leave. I am doing what I can to stay strong and hold my ground, but now he is back to being the man I fell in love with. He sends flowers, or massage certificates, or even a bunk box. Every gift, every check and text, and every mention of our baby gets me closer to going back to him. I still have not spoken to my mother. She is old and religious and believes that what I am doing by leaving him is turning my back on my Christian values, even though I was never really religious in the first place. Update 2, I called my mother-in-law to protect me from my fiancé. It has been a while but I started a new job several months ago. It was up my alley in amazing pay. I was living with my mother in order to save up during my pregnancy, but once I started my job I immediately moved out as I could not stand how much she berated me for leaving my ex every day. Besides the pay and the career boost, I have found very meaningful relationships within the company. I met a group of co-workers on my first day that I was immediately attracted to. They are adventurous and kind, outgoing people. I started building my relationships with them and eventually they became some of the closest people to me. As far as my ex and I, we were doing well. I have found it in myself to not be drawn to him in any romantic way, but accepted that it seems like he will try his best to be a good father. However, that's when life knocked me down again. I miscarried in my second trimester. It was hell. I have never been more upset with my body. I felt I had failed my child. There was nothing I could do to take that pain away. It still breaks my heart on a daily basis but I have been getting through it and a little stronger every day. My ex lost his mind when he found out. He said I took his family from him and he would never forgive me. He threatened to sue for emotional distress I had caused him. It was unbelievable. 
Then he became creepy and obsessive, bombarding my phone with creepy messages and names. He turned the whole story in a way where my mother started texting me and blaming me every day. He told her I started drinking when I moved out and she believed him. I had to block my ex and wish him well. The month after my miscarriage, I started seeing one of my new work friends. He's a bit older than me, and is everything I have ever wanted. He is quite literally the opposite of my ex. He cooks and cleans, he makes me feel beautiful and smart and all the things my ex would say I wasn't. I have. Found a new version of myself this year. I have made good friends who support me every day. I have found things I love to do and have been able to restart hobbies I gave up in favor of my ex. I found a person who makes me want to do better every day. Edit, my ex showed up to my house begging for me to take him back. I said no and shut the door. He has since started stalking me, showing up at the restaurant my date and I are at, showing up at work and leaving letters on my doorstep. I'm thinking of getting a restraining order. My nine-year-old brother nearly unalived my dad over money. My older brother Dave had gotten heavily into substances and street life as early as 12 years old and my parents were beginning their divorce around this time. One night when I was 10 I had decided to take a nap in my bed when I woke up to the sound of things being smashed and yelling. I ran to the top of the steps and hid behind the rail to see five people, some with masks on, holding various weapons. They were smashing furniture and looking through things. I saw one of them pushing my dad and I heard someone yell where's the money and I immediately went back to my room and called my mom. I did however recognize one of the voices of my brother Dave. My brother was 12 and he had a mask on, but the other four people looked in their late teens. My mom answered the phone and I immediately asked her where she was. She told me she had run to the store and asked me why I was whispering. I told her I was hiding in the closet because people had broken in and they were hurting dad, I told her through tears I heard my brother too. My mom knew how much my dad enabled his actions, so her worry immediately turned to annoyance as she knew this was my brother's doing. She told me to stay in the closet and that she was on her way home. I kept hearing yelling and the sound of more things being smashed. Suddenly I just heard my brother scream my dad's name. His voice sounded so fearful. Then silence. I wait a bit then slowly creep downstairs and see my dad on the couch dripping sweat, surrounded by my brother and his people. They were on the phone with 911 asking for an ambulance and my dad looked like he was in a lot of pain. I screamed and ran out of the house passing all the broken furniture and even our smashed car on the way out. I called my mom back and told her my dad was hurt and she told me to go to the neighbors. My brother broke in that day because he was demanding money from my dad and he had told him no. He felt entitled to it. So he broke in to get it. My dad had a stroke that day from stress. From that point forward I have never been able to look at my brother the same. My dad never pressed charges and gave my brother the money afterwards. What is the worst thing your mother-in-law has ever done? My crazy religious mother-in-law gets very passionate about aliens being created by Satan to destroy the earth. The first time I met my in-laws, we met at a restaurant for my boyfriend's birthday dinner. While we were waiting to be seated, my mother-in-law spotted a new tattoo, a small rose to commemorate his best friend that had recently passed, on my 27-year-old boyfriend forearm and was angrier than an alcoholic dad. She started yelling in the restaurant really loudly. She screamed that he was desecrating her body. The body God had made. She ranted about how he came from her, and therefore his body was her body. How could he do this to her body? It was unhinged. I stood there in silence while everyone else in the front of the restaurant stared at us. She then asked my boyfriend how he could even afford a new tattoo. This is where my boyfriend promptly threw me under the effing bus, she paid for it. It's my birthday gift. She then launched into me. How dare you? And I have to pay his car insurance? If you have money to waste on tattoos, well then you can pay his insurance. You can pay for his phone too. This was my very first conversation with her. The father-in-law tried to shush her, and she ran off and locked herself in the restroom. The hostess seated us, and father-in-law apologized to me and left to attempt to coax mother-in-law out of the bathroom. When she eventually joined us, it was like nothing had happened. No apologies. Just chit-chat about appetizers and work. All was normal, until the in-laws started talking about aliens. Aliens are apparently very real. But they're actually demons. They're sent in ships, designed by Satan, wearing disguises made by Satan, to trick humanity into believing in a life form not created by God. There's no mention of aliens in the Bible, therefore God couldn't have created them. And the US government is aware of all of this, but the US government is in a league with the devil. So they want Americans to believe that aliens come from outer space, when in fact, aliens come from the center of Earth, where hell is obviously located. At this point in the conversation, I was struggling to keep my facial expressions neutral. I reached out and placed my hand on my boyfriend's arm. Mother-in-law noticed and loudly, and in an accusatory tone, asked, Are you shushing him? Was he talking too loud? It looks like you're trying to shush him. My boyfriend, who has been showing me a new and very weird side of him this entire evening chimes in, Yeah are you? Are you shushing me? It was bananas. My sister flirts with my girlfriend and makes us all uncomfortable. My sister Haley is a very open and flirty person. She's never put a label on her interests but she has said she's attracted to everyone, man woman smurf or child. Ever since we were in high school, she'd often flirt with girls I was interested in. She'd also flirt with my friends when they'd come over to hang out, sometimes Haley would even come into my room without knocking just to talk to them. I once caught her and one of my high school friends with autism having intimacy in our bathroom. 
She took his V-card. Our relationship was strained and some of my friends even stopped coming over to my house because of it. This made me really angry and I told our parents about what happened, even mentioning what I discovered in the bathroom, but they'd always say I'm being homophobic to her because she is, whatever the F she is, and to leave her alone. So she'd always get away with it. A few months after she graduated, she moved out of the house and I haven't had to deal with her flirting with my friends anymore. Seven months ago I met my now girlfriend Layla and we really hit it off. One thing to note about Layla is that she's really shy, so she never voices any concerns until after the fact. Well I really wanted her to meet my parents so we set up a quick dinner at a nice restaurant a few days ago. Without even telling me, my parents invited Haley, who was almost 30 minutes late. For the better part of the dinner, she would constantly flirt with my girlfriend. She'd give Layla compliments about her clothing, body, facial features, and even offer her number multiple times. Haley went on an extensive rant about how attractive she finds French tips on girls as Layla was wearing those. She also made a comment about how smooth Layla's skin looks and told her that I'm a lucky man because I get to enjoy that while looking at her chest. My parents would just laugh along with her antics saying it's just how. She normally is. But I could clearly see Layla was uncomfortable so I paid my side of the bill and took her home. When we got to her house, I asked if I could spend the night and she said yes. And that's where I've been for the past few days. My parents and Haley have been blowing up my phone calling me all sorts of names. Layla said she felt uncomfortable when I talked to her about it. Am I in the wrong? My sister flirts with my girlfriend and makes us all uncomfortable. A few days after the dinner where my sister borderline actually harassed my girlfriend, I messaged my mom and dad to let them know I wouldn't be conversing with them unless Layla was given an apology. Up to this point, that message still hasn't been received and I don't think it ever will. I also let them know I'd be stopping by on Saturday to pick up my things from the house. Well Saturday morning I went over to the house and brought my girlfriend's dad Carl to help me. Sitting on the porch is my sister who tells me immediately she wants to talk. We go inside and sit down which is when she says she has to tell me something without me freaking out. My sister goes on to tell me in detail, that she has had feelings for me since high school. My eyeballs pop like I was starring in Tom and Jerry, and she takes this opportunity to go into detail about how big of a crush she has had. She admits the reason she effed my autistic friend in our bathroom while he was over was because he had the same color hair and eyes as me. Then tells me about the nights she stayed awake going to town on herself to the thought of me. I am struggling to process what I'm hearing. Without missing a beat, she states she started developing this crush when I started going to the gym and slimming out a lot more. She said the main reason she flirted with all my friends is because she wanted to divert her attraction somewhere else. According to her this is also the reason she moved out so quickly, because she couldn't stand being around me and knowing she couldn't have me as she knew it was wrong. I did not respond, instead I just left. I didn't get any of my stuff and honestly I don't know if I'll go back to get it. I blocked my sister on everything as soon as I got back to my girlfriend's house and my mom kept messaging me telling me to apologize for walking out again. I asked my mother if she knew why I walked out and. She said yes, but still stated there is no need for me to turn my back on my sister, regardless of how she feels. I blocked my mom too. I think my best friend has an inappropriate relationship with his mother. My best friend who I grew up with used to get teased a lot about being a mama's boy. Honestly now that I look back on it he's always had a very weird relationship with his mother. As we got older and started getting into girls more he would say weird stuff, such as calling his mom hot, and normally I'd laugh it off and call him a weirdo or when we got older I'd tell him he needs to get out the house more. When we were checking out chicks he'd say stuff like my mom has a way better body than she could ever have or my mom's honkers are way bigger. As far as I can tell it's always been him and his mom. Growing up I had never seen him get a girlfriend, I mean he talked to girls and stuff, but I never physically saw him have a relationship with any girl until the one he got married to. Fast forward to this last weekend that just passed and his wife who I'm really cool with says to me, I hate it when he goes on his family trips cause whenever he comes back home to me he's always cold and acts like a jerk to me. So then we started talking about his family trips. I remember when he started taking family trips when he got married. I always thought that because he was old enough and mature now that he'd go and spend time with his father or something, I don't really know, but when his wife said it was just him and his mom and they do this family trip every month or so. We started talking. He takes family trips over the weekend with just him and his mom every other month? Started to become more frequent the longer his marriage went on. I spoke to him today and just joked around about stuff pertaining to his situation and he got kinda agitated towards me. He said what, you think I'm banging my mom? What kind of freak does that? And I just rolled with it. Kinda laughed it off and said I was just effing with him, but his reaction was not genuine at all. I think my best friend has an inappropriate relationship with his mother. On Saturday, my wife, I and my best friend's wife confronted my best friend about the possibility of him sleeping with his mom. I'm sitting with my wife on one couch and him and his wife are sitting on the other couch watching TV and talking. His wife grabs the remote, turns the TV off and says we need to have a talk, all of us. For some reason she chose to completely ignore everything we went over, how we were going to try and break the ice and lightly touch on the situation and try to be welcoming, warm and understanding. She just went straight in for the throat with what's going on with you and your mother? And you need to be honest with me. Everything we planned went right out the window within the very first few seconds. It was like she was attacking him, backing him into a corner instead of trying to be there for him. I was angry I won't lie, but it's his wife so I couldn't say anything. She bombarded him with all these questions and accusations and when she finally let up I was able to quickly get in and try and bring the volume of the room down a bit. I brought up stuff from our past when we were kids and in school and some of the things he said that seemed off in his behavior that was awkward. I laughed a little and threw in a few jokes and thank goodness my wife was there to laugh and try to help make light of some of what was going on, but his face. He had this look of disgust and defeat. He never commented back on anything, not a single peep, 
just sat there quietly in what seemed like he was festering in his own misery. As soon as I was done his wife immediately went back to full-on attack mode with you just gonna sit there while we ask you these questions? And your quietness speaks volumes. After about 30 minutes of us asking him questions and stuff he stood up and balled his fists and finally responded. He was angry that we would suggest these things and asked us if we were all sick people and tried to turn the tables on us. That's when his wife stood up and started crying and accusing him of lying because whenever he lies he touches his face a lot and looks at the floor, which is totally true. She started crying more and screaming asking him very personal questions about their marriage. To that day I was always kinda of jealous of their marriage. They always seemed happier than us, never really argued, very passionate towards each other and they never ever really complained ever, but when she started talking. Why was I wrong? She said stuff like is that why we never have intimacy because you're out there effing your mother and you are effing sick in the head, you need help, you therapy and a psychiatrist. She brought up all these things about them never having intimacy, never spending time together, he never gives her compliments, treats her like shit, ignores her when she's talking to him, holds grudges against her for months at a time and the list goes on and on, then she stopped and started dry heaving and put her hand over her mouth and saying she's gonna throw up. My wife got up and held her. She continued to dry heave and call him a sicko. Then he just said F all of you and stormed out of the house and started walking down the street in the neighborhood. I ran up and caught up to him and asked him to come back and calm down and he ignored me entirely. He called his mom and she came and picked him up a few blocks down the road where he was just standing while I tried talking to him. When he got in the car he slammed the door, rolled down the window and said never ever talk to me again I'm deleting you out of my life for good. Then rolled the window up and that was the last I spoke with him. I went back to his house and tried to console his wife with the help of my wife. She told me all the issues they were having and how deep down she knew what was going on, but he was happy and she didn't know how to handle it. On Monday I went over to his mother's house and she refused to open the door and even threatened to call the police on me if I didn't leave. His wife hasn't seen or spoken to him since that Saturday, but we all know exactly where he is. I'm going to give everything some time to cool down a bit and call over there on Friday and hopefully talk to him or his mother. His wife went to file for divorce. She asked me not to come over anymore. My best friend has blocked me on everything. Update 2, I think my best friend has an inappropriate relationship with his mother. After not talking to my best friend for over a year and thinking that I lost him forever, I received a very interesting call two weeks ago. It was him and he wanted to talk. He asked to meet at our normal hangout spot. When we met up he looked like crap. His face was pale, bags under his eyes and he looked miserable. I ran over to him and gave him a big hug. I started crying and said how sorry I was for accusing him of that type of stuff and how he's my brother no matter what and all this other stuff, mostly just spilling my guts and blabbering away to him. He hugged me back and we both cried and apologized. Two grown men crying like babies. After the initial waterworks we sat down and he told me how his wife had divorced him and how she spread all these lies about him and stuff on her Facebook. How he had gotten fired from his job because of those lies and all of this other stuff that all came from that messed up half-baked attempt at an intervention. I just sat there feeling like complete trash knowing that I caused all of this. Just as I was about to apologize he cut me off and said, wait, there is something I need to tell you man. Remember when I was younger and my parents got that divorce and I told you that mom got really crazy afterwards? Yeah I remember. The divorce was bad and ugly, his dad cheated on his mom with some super young chick at a fast food place. He told me that after the divorce she started drinking a lot, sometimes she wouldn't even be able to take him to school or go to work the next day because she'd be so sick. The drinking got worse and one day when he was 15 and sleeping in his bed, his mom came home super late and came into his room completely hammered and roped him and then had the audacity to snuggle up in bed with him and pass out. After that night, she'd drink, get drunk and then rope him and when she was sober she'd act like nothing happened. She even started telling him that he was the man of the house and that he had certain responsibilities now that he's the man of the house. This continued all the way up until January the 1st of this year. He finally had enough and put a stop it. He said he hasn't seen or talked to his mom since March of this year. I just started crying man, like seriously crying. Here I was thinking I was his best friend and I didn't even know what was going on all these years. I kinda expected something, but I wasn't 100% sure and I didn't have any type of proof at all. He even said how he thought about ending himself up until he met his wife and she took him out of that house, but his mother would still call him over or plan getaways just to get him away from her. His mother hated his wife with a passion. I never knew he was suffering alone all of these years, how could I even begin to call him my best friend or my brother and I was never ever there one time for him out of all these years he was going through stuff. He asked me to not say anything to my partner and if I could keep this between me and him, of course I agreed without hesitation. We spoke about him getting help and he made me promise not to say anything about this to anyone. He said he doesn't want his mom to get into any trouble and he doesn't want her to suffer because she's already suffered enough by his dad. I cannot for the life of me believe that all these years she's abused him and he's still willing to sit here and protect her. Even made me promise not to do anything. I caught my wife cheating two years ago but I haven't stopped her. A few years ago, I was on my lunch break and was out on a drive. I popped by my house and my garage door was open and my wife's car and another car were there. I parked across the street and went in through the garage, which is in our basement, essentially under the bedrooms of our split-level house. Literally the second I was in the garage, I could hear the bed in our spare bedroom above me bouncing and muffled sounds that were clearly intimacy. I stood there, basically in disbelief of what I was hearing, but I wasn't overcome with anger or anything. I very very quietly opened the door into the house and crept up the steps. I could see down the hall from the top of the steps and I could see the shadows of effing on the wall outside the first bedroom in the hallway. Tons of groaning, lots of dirty talk from her, and I snuck back down the steps, through the garage, out to my car, 
and backed it to a side street and I observed them leave about 15 minutes later. They just walked out in broad daylight. The thing is, our marriage is effing awesome. Like, totally spot on amazing. We have intimacy almost every night and we're completely in love. We have three kids together and life is damn good. Over the past couple of years, I sporadically pop past the house in the middle of the day and that car is there about three times a month and I am 100% aware of what is happening, and I'm kinda okay with it. Oh, and I know who the guy is, too. I had a police pal run the plate and it's one of her college boyfriends. He's also married. My plan for now is if she ever finds out I know, I'm just going to tell her I'm fine with it because our marriage is pretty much bang on perfect. If this is what she needs to do to keep the marriage perfect, I'm fine with it and I won't cause any drama to her friends with benefits. I caught my wife cheating two years ago but I haven't stopped her. I decided to confront my wife about her cheating, thanks to my friends mocking me about it. I also found myself obsessing over clues of their routine. They met up a couple of times on either a Tuesday or a Thursday, always at my house, and always for only about 40 minutes. Each time, she sent me a late morning hey, how's your day? Text to check that I was firmly ensconced at work. Each time, I ran to my car and drove up a side street to view my house from afar. After watching them go inside, I then would pop over to the house, hear the telltale sounds from the guest bedroom. Once, after they had gone, I snuck into the house to find the laundry machine running and the guest bed remade with a fresh sheet. I took one of my kids to dance lesson later that day, came home, and that sheet had been put back away in the hall closet. I also found myself watching her phone habits. She's very anti-phone during family time, but I noticed her on her phone between sets when she weight lifts on Sunday nights in our basement. I found this behavior of mine weighing on me. I didn't really care for my voyeuristic behavior. But this past Thursday, a seemingly meant to be series of events occurred for a now or never opportunity for me to act. I got the text at 10.30 or so in the morning. I ran to the car, arrived at my house at 10.45. Most of the time, they get there at 11 o'clock, he arrived at 11 o'clock, but she didn't arrive until 11.05. They went in through the garage as normal. I went into the house and came close to getting caught. But they were later than normal and apparently in a huge hurry, and, upon re-entering the house after they'd gone, discovered she had not replaced the sheets on the spare bedroom bed and had not started the laundry. In the laundry were the sheet, a pair of undies, and a pair of scrubs, lab pants and shirt. Almost as if I had no control over the situation, I started the laundry. Machine, sat down, had coffee, and moved the laundry over to the dryer half an hour later, and then went back to work. I took one of my kids to their dance class that day, got home at like 6.30, and walked into an absolutely frantic wife. She grabbed hold of my arms, looked at me, was shaking, and said did something happen today? I looked her in the eye, said yes, I love you, everything is fine, we will talk about it all a lot, I love you, it's okay, I promise it's okay. I kissed her and we fooled around in the bathroom for a few minutes, then I made dinner, and we helped the kids with homework and bedtime. When the kids got to bed, we got down to business and talked for about 5 hours Thursday night. It basically started off by her asking me how much do you know? I told her a lot, but not even remotely everything, and also that I wasn't mad at all. She said she had spent every waking moment from getting home and discovering the laundry to the time I walked in feeling almost certain I would walk in and announce I was divorcing her. I assured her that was not going to happen. Of course she was rattled. She admitted everything straight away, was very upset obviously, but I got her calmed down and we had some fantastic conversation. We agreed we'd likely need a weekend of privacy and my mother-in-law agreed to take the kids all weekend, which is perfect because the kids just go there and eat Papa John's and Snickers ice cream bars for two days so they love it of course. So the gist of what I found out is this, it's been going on since 2005, predating me knowing her by five years. They dated in 1996 and didn't have a great relationship but the intimacy was great. They reconnected after he'd been married four years and began cheating. She was a single affair partner but he was married. She told me she would have been content to do that for years, and did. She dated casually with other people, hooked up with him, became a doctor, did her residency, traveled, had a good life. When she met me 10 years ago, I complicated her equation because of how intensely she fell in love with me. She gave me her full self, but continued with him because of what described as magic hex she couldn't break regarding their intimate chemistry. My kids are 100% mine and they never had piv intimacy while we were trying to conceive. He and his wife have a great marriage, have intimacy, and my wife is not saving him from a dead bedroom. His wife does not know. Their relationship essentially consists of hey, how's it going? How's life? How are the kids? F me now, okay see you next time. It's not an overly emotional thing. She explained several times that if they were going to have a real relationship, they would have done it long before she and I even met. I clearly told her I am okay with it if she and he continue, I love her, she has had this thing going for much longer than I've been married to her, it makes her happy, and I love it when she's happy. She was, of course, gobsmacked. I also told her she is free to not tell him I know or to tell him I know and that telling him or not was 100% in her court. She mulled it over, considered it for a day, and decided to tell him. I told her if she wanted to tell him, she could invite him over this past Sunday morning, I would go for a long run, they could talk, then I would go pick up the kids and when returning with the kids, he would be gone. And that's what happened. I told my aunt she caused her daughter's ed. My aunt recently visited my parents when my kids and I were visiting. It was an unannounced visit for her part. My mom, knowing we were visiting, had a feast spread out for her grandkids and when I say feast I mean feast. It was everything that my kids liked. My aunt's first comment to my eldest don't you think you've put on a little weight? 
She's 16 and the last time my aunt saw her was when she was 12. To my second child fruits are better than chocolate, and proceeded to remove the cake from my daughter's plate and replace it with a banana. To my youngest sweets would rot out your teeth. I told her they can eat whatever they wanted especially since my mom made the food emphasizing specifically for them. She went on a rant about kids needing to learn to eat healthy. I told her off and said if I wanted an opinion of someone regarding nutrition it wouldn't be from someone that caused their child's ed and ultimately their death. She started hysterically crying. That's when I took my kids home and thanked her for ruining our visit. Please know this woman is extremely overweight but wanted to raise daughters that were very health conscious. No sweets, no artificial drinks, no fried foods, nothing that has too much salt. My cousin who I grew up with and at one point or another sleep in each other's house saw the difference in lifestyle. My parents let me choose what I wanted whenever she would come to my house. She would eat anything, try anything and sometimes it felt like even if she was so full she would throw up she'd still try to nibble at things. When I slept over at my aunt's house I once got yelled at for bringing MNMS. She weighed our food and only gave us one quarter cup of rice, and fruits for desserts. She had me hand over money so I wouldn't be able to buy food at the store if I wanted something different. I got scolded severely for not finishing my plate. After a couple of visits I pretty much never wanted to go back. After a couple of years my cousin developed Ed and dropped to 80 pounds. She was 5 foot 4. She was literally skin and bones. During family holidays she would compliment her daughter to anyone on how great her daughter looks. She never sought therapy as she didn't see an issue. She passed of a heart attack at 17. My aunt said it runs in the family and the heart attack was undiagnosed. Things have gone nuclear and everyone sending me messages how disrespectful I was. I told every adult that messaged me that they were as responsible for my cousin's death as her mom was as they turned a blind eye to what was happening. I told them if they won't stop messaging me I'll upload the conversation so everyone knows how disgusting this family is. My brother-in-law's gay husband makes me uncomfortable. If I speak up about it they call me homophobic. My husband's brother has known me since I started dating my husband a few years ago. He was always weird but never went overboard. But lately he's been treating me like I'm the new girlfriend who's been dating his brother for a week, if you know what I mean. I gave birth 10 weeks ago and I still feel tired and every time I say that out loud when he's around he tells me I'm overreacting, that it's been two months and that I have to stop taking advantage of the situation to use my husband. The other day was my husband's birthday and I decided to bake a cake and prepare a special dinner to receive his family, and of course he had something to say about that. He started making fun of me saying that it was about time for me to get my butt off the couch to do something productive. And he doesn't say those things when my husband is around, he says them when we are alone, and I try to ignore him because I don't want problems but I can't do that anymore. Yesterday he sent me an article about intimacy after giving birth and how many times husbands cheat on their wives because they are tired and don't want to have intimacy, and said something like I should pay attention and not let my marriage be ruined by my laziness. And the truth is that my husband and I had intimacy again a few days ago but that's not something that I want to tell everyone, but he assumed that because I'm too tired to do certain things or because my husband decided to take care of me and do everything I don't satisfy him. I swear I can't stand him anymore, I don't know why he changed or why he suddenly treats me like trash but I've had enough and I want to tell my husband but I don't know how. I know I sound like a fool for not knowing how to communicate with my husband but in the past this man has had problems with my other brother-in-law's wife because he accused her of being homophobic, and since then everyone took his side and hated her since then and I don't want that. I honestly don't care if he's gay or whatever he wants to be, I just want him to leave me alone, because I have been struggling a lot with guilt for letting my husband do everything and listening to the things he says hurt me because they make me feel like I'm being a burden on my husband and that he will soon get tired of me. My brother-in-law's gay husband makes me uncomfortable. If I speak up about it they call me homophobic. I left my phone near my husband with the chat with his brother open for him to see. He saw the chat and asked me since when did I let his brother send me those dirty messages, I told him that I never let him and he simply started giving me advice without me asking for it, and I told him everything and fortunately he believed me and said that he would talk to him. That same day he called his brother and they had a long talk and of course he was hysterical and told him a bunch of lies about me. According to him, ever since my daughter was born, I haven't stopped bragging about motherhood because I know that he can't have children, that I always try to make him feel less for being a man and things like that are not true. Of course the majority of the family believed him because they know that I come from a very religious family and they believe that that's why I'm capable of doing those things that he accused me of. They always believe everything he says because he has been with the same boyfriend since high school and suffered a lot of homophobia, and they are constantly trying to protect them from it, even if you are not homophobic. I would like to say that he hates me and thus justify him but he was always like that. A while ago he had a fight with his other brother's wife and also accused her of being homophobic. They had a fight because he told her children that they should like boys because girls aren't as fun, and things like that. Then she told him not to tell them that, that everyone will decide if they like girls or boys in the future and he got offended and he accused her of being homophobic because according to him she would not have said that if he had told her children that they should like girls. When he accused her of that, the whole family turned their backs on her and no one talks to her. And now they're doing the same thing to me. And as much as I try not to care I just can't. I have known his family since I was a teenager and I considered them family. I don't understand why they do this to me when I need them most. 
And the worst part is that my husband has been acting weird since then and treats me differently like he is avoiding me. And it terrifies me to think that maybe he will end up believing him. I caught my boyfriend laying hands on my daughter. I have a five-year-old daughter from a hookup in college. I struggled a while in the first couple of years, then two years ago I met my boyfriend Dylan. We hit it off instantly, and he was respectful of me and my daughter. I never imagined him doing something like this. Two nights ago I came home from a long shift around eight. My daughter was getting ready for bed. I hugged and kissed her, then I noticed a bruise on her upper arm. I asked what happened, and my boyfriend said she fell. I found that suspicious cause she's fallen before, and it's never bruised before. I tucked my daughter in, and went to bed. The next day, I picked her up from Sunday school and my boyfriend went off to work. And I noticed that she had bruises around her wrists like somebody had grabbed her. I asked her what happened yesterday and that morning. She was hesitant at first then started crying and said that she didn't mean to make Dylan mad. I comforted her then made her lunch, trying to hide my anger. I checked the cameras to see what happened, on the day of the first brew she dropped her cup and spilled her juice on the floor. He laid hands on her and made her clean it up. Then the morning of the second bruise he grabbed her wrist and screamed at her that he wasn't going to be late because of her. I was mad before, but now I was seething. I wanted to sock him, I wanted to end him. After my daughter finished lunch I told her to pack essentials and some stuffed animals. I texted a family member and asked if I could stay and explain the situation. He agreed and I started packing my bags. I know I should have only taken essentials, but after seeing how he reacted to my daughter dropping something, I didn't want him destroying anything sentimental to me. I left my now ex a very angry note and left. Edit, I paid my cousin to go lay the smack down on Dylan. He's now in the hospital. I slept with my best friend's wife hours after his funeral. My best friend has always been manic depressive since I met him. He had eight kids with his wife and struggled to provide for them. I had just gotten divorced when he ended himself in their shed, with their five-year-old finding him. His wife took their kids and was staying at her mom's. At the funeral, I asked if I could help in any way and she asked if I would go tear the shed down, she never wanted to see it again. I took my truck and trailer the same day, and not wanting anyone else to have to see whatever it was I was about to see, proceeded by myself to tear down the small wooden shed. The inside was what you would expect. He had used a firearm and clacked himself in the head. I donned plastic gloves, took everything valuable out and put it in my truck, planning to clean it, go buy her a little plastic shed, and put it all in there on a different spot on their property. I knocked the shed down and dragged it up onto my trailer. Just as I was tying it down, she showed up. She was by herself and went straight inside. I was actually just going to leave, when she shouted at me from the door. I went in, she thanked me and gave me a drink. When I was done she wrapped her arms around me and buried her head into my chest. We held each other and cried for a long time. Then she started kissing me. We kissed passionately and her hands went to my belt. Soon clothes were off and we went wild. We did everything, for hours. I cooked some dinner, we ate unclothed, and then we did it all again. She left for her mom's and I went to the friend's house where I was staying. I took the shed to work with me and with some help threw it in a dumpster on my lunch break. Her and I kept hooking up for close to a year. I took one of his remains from the shed back to mine to make sure he will always be by my side in some way shape or form. I despise my sister-in-law and I hope she dies. I have a seven-year-old son who's autistic. I also divorced when we found out that my son Greg was autistic, because my husband was ashamed of having a freak as a son and demanded that we give him up for adoption. I simply denied, he got mad and left. My sister-in-law Mary literally hates my son. Since the day we found out he's autistic, she was constantly saying that I need to get rid of him because I will soon feel embarrassed. She was also telling us that my ex-husband did the right thing and that I should have listened to him. I tried to never cause drama by getting into arguments with her, but today it happened. Even though Greg is autistic, he's the smartest human I've ever seen. Today is my mom's birthday, so I had the displeasure of meeting Mary again. As she was talking, she was sometimes making small mistakes and Greg was the one correcting her. At some point her face turned red, she stood up and started yelling at my son. She was calling him problematic, weird, a freak, an autistic F said that she now knows why Greg has no friends and that his dad was right about leaving him. My son cried. For the first time. He has never cried about a situation before. At least not in front of me. He usually gets a little moody when something happens to him, but we talk for a bit and then he's smiling again. I was too shocked to say anything. I just stood up, took Greg's hand and left. But then I realized that by leaving, I wouldn't make things any better. So I told Greg to wait in the car. I went back and everyone looked at me in shock. My parents were trying to stop me because they knew that Mary had effed up but I didn't really care. She hurt my son so she should pay for it. I watched her as she was standing up and walking towards my direction having this annoying smile on her face. I grabbed her by her chubby little neck. I just told her, if you ever make my son sad, I will make sure you spend the rest of your life more miserable than ever. And left. Later I called my mom. The moment she answered she started yelling. She said that I should be ashamed of ruining her birthday and that she doesn't want me to go to any family gatherings again, as I've made my sister-in-law upset. I told her I couldn't care less about how Mary felt. The only thing I cared about was Greg. 
I also asked her if she agreed with Mary. If she is ashamed of my son. Her answer was hanging up the phone. I made my transgender niece cry by ripping her a new one due to her clothing. Was I in the wrong? My 14-year-old niece Sam claims to be transgender and her coming out caused an uproar in our family. Our mother was the most distraught about the whole thing. Sam was the first grandchild and my mother loved and spoiled them. She never approved of them being transgender, mostly because she didn't want to lose her little girl. I don't approve of them either, mostly because it seems like they're going through something and need actual help, not a gender change. Besides, she's way too young for that. Either way, Sam came out about four months ago. It's like they're a whole new person. They've had a massive personality shift. Suddenly they don't want to wear makeup, anything too feminine, and now wear a binder because otherwise they feel uncomfortable, despite never being uncomfortable with it before. They don't answer when their real name is called anymore, they'll flat out ignore you unless you call them by their new name. She even walked out of her own birthday party because most of the people there used her real name. I've voiced my concerns about her, but my brother-in-law dismissed it. However, my mother's funeral was the last straw. The funeral was two days ago and I'm still seething over it. When we arrived everything was going smoothly until my brother and Sam arrived. Sam wore a suit and a binder with it. At that point I saw red. Sam is well aware that my mother didn't approve and you'd think they'd put this stuff aside for one day, their grandmother's funeral, but apparently not. I went over to the two of them and told them that if Sam couldn't be respectful then they'd have to leave, and that they were only welcomed back if Sam dressed properly. Sam immediately started running her mouth and we exchanged some choice words, which resulted in Sam starting to cry, before their father took them and they left. A letter to my stepdad's old band buddy. I hope you burn. I remember meeting you for the first time. I had just moved in with my mom and step family at seven years old. It was amazing for a kid used to growing up with nothing. I was sitting in my room playing with my toys while my stepdad's band rehearsed in the pool room. Then you drunkenly stumbled down the hallway. Your slurred speech and tangled feet found themselves at my door. My door was open and you took this chance to stop and stare for a while. When I looked at you, you suddenly exclaimed, Oh I'm sorry sweetie I didn't know Jeff had a younger daughter. Could you be a good little girl and tell me where the bathroom is? I told you I just moved in and that the bathroom was across the hall. Years later my mom would tell me that she made sure all the band members and stage crew knew that I had moved in, and that you had been to the house almost every weekend for years, you knew where the bathroom was. You kept on the charade for months. Walking up to my door drunk, staring, whether I was changing, playing with toys, or even trying to nap, when caught you would ask where the bathroom was, until suddenly you were gone. I asked my parents where you went, they came up with different reasons why you weren't around. I felt relieved. A few years later my sister told me you went to jail for wailing on your mother until she nearly died. The doctor saved her life by a miracle. A few years later you were back. You showed up to my house acting like nothing had happened and you talked to my dad, he didn't let you in the house. I walked out into the garage, you stared me up and down, literally licking your lips, exclaiming how much I had grown, I was in middle school. My dad asked you to leave. The next weekend my parents were at my aunt's house for dinner. I was home alone. You pulled up in the driveway when I was alone and asked to talk to my dad. I told you where my parents were and you asked if you could come in too. Use the phone. I refused. You told me it would just be a minute while I reminded you that my aunt lived only a block away. Again you insisted, seeming to grow frustrated. I said that I needed to use the bathroom, so I locked the door behind me. By the time I was out of the bathroom you were gone, I didn't tell my parents. You repeated this the next weekend. But next weekend you broke in when I tried to lock the door. You roped me. After that I told my parents. We put you in jail for what you did to me. You were unalived in jail after Wad got around of what you did. You deserved everything. My girlfriend wants me to get into legal trouble to cover for her. My girlfriend is always late. And usually by at least 20 or so minutes. She isn't on the autism spectrum, she doesn't have ADHD or time blindness. She just dawdles all the time. She snoozes her alarm at least three times every morning, then lays there going through her social media. Eventually she gets up and takes a long ah shower, dresses, then lingers over her coffee. Nine times out of ten she's running late for work, and ends up speeding to make it on time. Naturally, she's gotten a number of speeding tickets. I've tried to help her by putting her phone where she can't reach it from bed so she has to get up to snooze it, but she literally just grabs it and goes back to bed. I try to get her to move and she just digs in her heels and takes even longer. 
her response to people calling out her lateness is, better late than dead on time. Anyway, again this morning, she was running even later than normal for work, and really had to speed to make it. A week goes by and sure enough, massive speeding fine in the mail. She now has to hand in her driver's license because she's got so many demerit points, she'll be without one for six months. Instead of just dealing with it, she demands me, I'll need you to cop this one and say you were driving so I don't lose my license, and of course I refused, telling her she needs to live with the consequences of her actions and maybe she should stop speeding, and wake up earlier. This argument went on for a few days until she finally conceded, then proceeded to tell me well, you'll have to drive me to and from work until I get my license back, and I tell her I won't be doing that, her work is literally in another direction than my work is from home, and doing so would add another two hours of driving per day. She says it shouldn't matter as my work has flexible hours, but I stood my ground and refused, and said she can take public transport, there's literally a bus. Stop two minute walk from our house and the bus stops a five minute walk from her work. She says she hates public transport and refuses to ride it, so I said then it's Uber for her, or organize a carpool, but bottom line, it's not my responsibility. She called me an a-hole and is giving me the silent treatment, said a decent boyfriend would go to those lengths for her and that it's only six months. My golden child sister-in-law demands we invite her other husband to my wedding. He disgusts me. My fiancé and I are getting married at the end of next month. We've agreed to keep it incredibly small and intimate and we're only inviting 25 of our closest friends and family due to a tight budget and wanting to keep things simple. My fiancé's sister is a miracle child used to being the center of attention, and it's been a real issue for my fiancé his entire life. She's the golden child and his parents spend most of their time, money and energy catering to her, from driving her to doctor's appointments, to cooking and delivering home-cooked meals, to paying her bills and rent regularly. His parents even used to ask him to go clean her apartment for free for her when he was in college. The current issue with her revolves around her romantic relationships. She's married to a nice man, but also has another, very intimate partner on the side named Alex. Alex is a woman in her early 70s who is married to sister-in-law's cousin. Everyone in the family is aware of the relationship and it's been going on for several years. I met Alex for the first and only time this past Thanksgiving. Before we arrived, we were told Alex was now identifying as he and we were all to address him as masculine. Okay no big deal, especially when I'd never met him before. When we arrived, I was introduced to Alex, and I was surprised to see him wearing a very revealing dress. Alex is very heavy set and older, and this dress had his honkers spilling out and was short enough to make it obvious he wasn't wearing undies. This is the way he chose to dress to a family Thanksgiving. On top of that, it was obvious both by smell and appearance that he had personal hygiene issues. We then had to spend the rest of the afternoon watching sister-in-law indulge in PDA with Alex that was really uncomfortable, while she gushed about having two husbands. The whole situation was off-putting and impossible to ignore, ensuring sister-in-law was the focus of the day. It was an awkward experience I have no desire to repeat. As stated at the beginning, when we sat down to do our wedding invites, we were focused on keeping the list incredibly short, which left out several people we would have really liked to include. When we gave an invite to sister-in-law, we addressed it to her and her husband. Future mother-in-law told us we needed to invite Alex as well because of their relationship with sister-in-law. My fiancé told her that sister-in-law only got A plus one, like everyone else, and neither my fiancé or I had any kind of relationship with Alex. Aside from the fact we both find Alex incredibly off-putting, and can't trust he'll dress or bathe appropriately for a wedding, we know that sister-in-law bringing Alex will just ensure the focus will be on her and her relationships. My fiancé doesn't deserve that on his wedding day, and neither do I. We thought the matter was settled, but my fiancé had a family holiday yesterday at his parents' house that I wasn't there for. Alex was there, once again wearing a very short dress and in obvious need of a shower. My fiancé made it through the entire evening without the wedding coming up, right until he had one foot out the door. As he was walking out, sister-in-law told him, I have two husbands, and they'll both be at your wedding. Fiancé was taken aback, but really had to leave. He plans on sending an email to his sister-in-law and parents explaining that Alex is not invited to the wedding and they need to respect our decision on that. If it comes down to it, we believe that may mean sister-in-law won't be coming to the wedding, and could cause a bit of a rift in the family. My golden child's sister-in-law demands we invite her other husband to my wedding. He disgusts me. My fiancé and I were still adamant about not inviting my sister-in-law's creepy, unhygienic and crude partner to our wedding. While my fiancé was trying to figure out what to say to his family about the whole situation, his mother emailed us to make sure we were going to sister-in-law's birthday and to ask if we were getting excited about the wedding. I told my fiancé he clearly couldn't wait any longer to address the situation with his family directly. So he emailed them, clarifying sister-in-law only got A plus one to the wedding, and we needed to make sure that was being respected. He also said we didn't appreciate being told by sister-in-law she would be bringing both of her partners to the wedding without even talking it over or asking us if that was okay. The ensuing meltdown has been ugly to say the least. Mother-in-law began spamming my fiancé with angry and unhinged emails, accusing him of being homophobic, anti-poly, and somehow, anti-Semitic. Sister-in-law has said she won't speak to us. Father-in-law advised my fiancé not to respond to mother-in-law until she calmed down. Over the past few days, she's now emailing him about random garbage, 
acting like nothing ever happened. Father-in-law asked to talk to fiancé face-to-face today. I thought it was an odd request as they usually just talk on the phone and we live three hours away from them. Fiancé had to be in the area for work today so it was convenient. My theory was he planned to offer to help pay for the wedding so our budget would be a non-issue. Not the case. He actually told my fiancé that they all thought the budget was a big excuse since we hadn't asked them for any financial help with the wedding. He told his dad the whole reason we didn't ask for help was because we wanted to keep this small and simple and have control over the guests and not feel obligated to invite people we didn't want. There. I didn't even invite one of my brothers I don't get along with. Father-in-law agrees that Alex presents a lot of issues, and asked if they could convince him to be more appropriate for the wedding, if that would help. My feeling is at this point it's become such a huge issue, that sister-in-law will go out of her way to make everyone uncomfortable no matter what to prove a point. This is a hill it appears everyone is willing to die on. Sister-in-law still won't talk to us for fear of going nuclear. Father-in-law told my fiancé we all have to figure this out, or it's going to cause a huge rift in their family. I think the damage is already done. No constructive advice was offered. At this point I just want to email them all myself and say it's a non-issue as sister-in-law is no longer invited. Fiancé isn't ready to take that step yet. Edit, my fiancé and I decided to uninvite sister-in-law. We sent the email and we are now getting bombarded. Mother-in-law is stating they plan to just show up anyway so we plan on getting security at the wedding to make sure the sister-in-law doesn't show up either. What's the grossest disaster in the bedroom that has ever happened to you? My current boyfriend Connor and I have been together for four years. For the past few months he has been begging me to let him put it into my back door in the bedroom. His birthday came up recently and I decided to surprise him by surprising him with numbing cream and telling him I was willing to try it. It is important to mention I have IBS and the day of his birthday, I was having a bad IBS day. Anyways, we went out bar hopping and eating at different places for his birthday and we had a great day. We get back to his house and I excuse myself to go to the bathroom. It was show time. I slip on my new outfit, get out the toys and walk out to surprise him. Of course he loved it, and we started having some fun. I stopped him after a little bit and showed him the numbing cream. His eyes lit up and he got so excited, he was about to be a kid in a chocolate factory. He asked me if I was sure I wanted to do this and I told him yes. He applied the numbing cream and started going to town on my back door entrance. Due to his quite small sword, I didn't feel a thing and was actually enjoying it. It had been maybe three minutes in and I smelt something so bad. It didn't take long for the smell to hit Connor. We both looked up and there was poop everywhere. The liquid kind. Connor immediately started throwing up. I ran into the bathroom in my outfit and started bawling my eyes out while still pooping everywhere. I got to the toilet and Connor ran in after me and started throwing up in the sink the same time I was pooping my brains out. If I could have snapped my fingers and died, this would have been the moment. The thing is we used so much cream that I did not feel myself emptying my bowels. I got myself cleaned up and awkwardly went back in the room. The room smelled horrible which just made me cry even harder. Connor helped me clean up the mess. He hugged me and told me it was okay, even though I knew I just traumatized this man. I wanted this to be a birthday he would remember. Just not like this. After we cleaned up we had did the deed regularly though, it was amazing. My ex-mother-in-law is helping me hide my child from my ex. Four years ago I dated who I thought was the love of my life. We broke up after a nasty fight my sophomore year of college that was fueled from our frustrations of being long distance. His mother detested me because her husband had died a few years back and he was her only son, and she thought I wasn't good enough. She always made this very clear, and one of the issues my ex and I had was him not noticing or defending me. A couple of years ago, my ex came to our hometown and all my old friends met up. We were mutually surprised to see each other, and it was very clearly an odd intense situation. Everyone got drunk, ex started talking to me, then we were laughing. Then we started making out and we did the deed in our friend's guest room. Super drunk, no rubber, and he lasted literally 40 odd seconds. I barely remembered when I woke up and just dipped out of there. A month later I realized I still loved him, and I also realize I'm late on my period. I took a test and it was positive. I knew we wouldn't work out as a couple, no matter how much I still loved him. I wanted the best for him, I wanted him to find a girl to be happy with and finish school and be successful, and not have to move back home to be with his kid. I loved him so much I just wanted the best couldn't bring myself to get a termination. So after three months when it really hit me that I probably wasn't going to lose it, I did what I thought was the best thing to do. I went to his mom. His mom was very wary when opening the door. Faked a smile all that, tried to politely ask what I was doing there. I told her I was pregnant with her son's kid, and that we wanted the same thing for him. I told her I wouldn't get a termination, but X didn't have to know. She was really quiet, asked why I was willing to do this. I said I couldn't tell him because I didn't want to get back in a relationship knowing he wasn't happy with his life, and I didn't want to F it up. So I told her I wanted to move away to Detroit, where some of my extended family was, and cut everyone except immediate family from back home off. That I wanted to basically drop off the grid, delete everything, disappear and raise my kid. So we made a deal. 
She would pay child support and rent and I would continue to go to school. I remember the last thing she told me was, thank you for doing what's best for my son. I never knew you loved him this much. Really messes to think about now. I went home and cried, then eventually broke the news to my parents and my plan. They were absolutely against it, so I promised to stay long enough for the birth, but I had to leave after. I think part of the reason my dad allowed it was because I would be living off campus and they wouldn't have to pay rent, and it would be a lot less money for them. My mom only allowed because she visited her family in Detroit often and she always thought my ex didn't treat me right. Flash forward and I have left school, I'm at home, social media accounts deleted, number changed. My mom keeps getting calls from my friends and tells them I have decided to start life over and I couldn't ever answer the door because sometimes my friends would try to see me. My parents always said I wasn't at home or had moved away. After the birth of my daughter I stayed for a month then moved to Detroit. Started working part-time, took classes online, and raised my kid alone. It sucked but I made friends who didn't know me before and life was okay. That leads to yesterday. At around 3 p.m. I got a knock on my door, and saw six of my old friends including my ex. I was supposed to a company over so I had actual clothes on and the apartment clean, thank God. I tried shutting the door but boy one stopped it and they forced themselves in. Said girl one had been going to my parents' mailbox for weeks to try and find where I was. They found a letter I had sent my parents with pictures I had developed. Of my daughter, and they came. They thought I was part of a cult. Boy 2 mentions a rumor that I had a kid. Standing there and seeing my old best friends and the shock and knowing I was F just ended me and I started tearing up. Cue my daughter waddling into view behind me. I wouldn't tell them who the father was, but my ex had the strangest look like he knew. They all sat down and I brought them beers and then played with my daughter. They all seem so young now, or maybe I feel old. My daughter went up to my ex at one point, and held her hands up to be held. She hugged his neck tightly and wouldn't let go, then sat down facing him and fell asleep against his chest. My ex looked at me and I had to turn around. I thought I would lose it. Later we all caught up. X became exactly what he wanted, so maybe this was worth it. I explained I had wanted a new life for me and her, and I missed them all so much. It was late so I had X carry her to her crib to sleep. While it was him and I in there he finally asked if she was his. I burst into tears and he knew. He was so angry, and I tried my best to explain but obviously it wasn't enough. I told him I thought it was best for him, and his mom agreed, and he started crying. I think from his yells the others knew too. They all slept over and are still here. My ex wants to work something out. I still love him but I won't get back with him just so he can see his daughter. I told him he can visit whenever he wants, but he wants me to move to his school's area. I don't know what to do. My ex-mother-in-law is helping me hide my child from my ex. My ex went back to his mom's place and had a talk with her. He apologized to me for not being the most supportive when we had our pregnancy scare early on in the relationship and was still upset with me, however understood because he has seen how much he has grown. He was livid with his mom and if she didn't have a stake in where my daughter and I currently live he said he would cut her off immediately. I am done with cutting people off so I wouldn't have let that happen regardless. I got to go home last week, and met up with a bunch of people. A lot of tears, didn't expect that, and my friends threw me a surprise coming home party. It was very overwhelming but mostly because I never knew I was so loved. My daughter seems so happy with her father and I'm in love with their relationship. My ex and I went out to dinner a few days ago, just us two, and although we didn't call it a date, it kinda of felt like the ones we would go on as kids. That same connection is there, my goodness it's crazy. Like I breathe differently with him or something. He's so much more mature now it's insane, and I feel different too. It's all been so refreshing. He even walked me to my parents' door at the end of the night and kissed me on my forehead for a moment before going to his car, which is exactly what he did on our first date as teenagers. Sent my stomach into flutters and everything. I'm not saying we will end up together as a couple, but it feels like that's a possibility. Even if we don't he has been a fantastic father so far and definitely will be kept in my daughter's life no matter what. We've met up with his mom and my parents and talked everything through. I finished out my fall semester at school and now I'm going to be spending a few months in my ex's city and weekends at home while I apply to other places closer to him. This was agreed upon because I feel it's only right for me to move closer to him after. Depriving him of the beginning of our daughter's life. Me, my ex, my parents, and his mother are splitting financials until I finish school. Everything is kinda unstable and feels weird right now, but at the same time everything feels very right. Edit, he asked me out. We are giving this relationship another shot. My wife's mother wants our house as a reward for letting me marry her daughter. My wife's mother has been a malignant narcissist her entire life, to the point where she ended up not going to our wedding because she didn't want to go to the city we both live in, and she decided to surprise us with a wedding. That she threw. On the same day as our wedding. Without telling us ahead of time. She was incredibly mad at us for not showing up. After almost a year of not speaking, she and my wife are trying to have a relationship. A little over six months ago, my parents decided to give us their house and we've been remodeling it. We moved in earlier this month, and my wife invited her parents to stay over for a week so they could see their grandkids and see the city we live in. Everything went fine until breakfast this morning, when over coffee, my mother-in-law drops a bombshell on me. So, 
when I had my children, I wanted to have them so someone could take care of me when I get old. That's one of the only real reasons I had them. So since you took her away from me, I think you should be responsible for me too. So starting tomorrow, I'm going to live in your guest room. I need you to drive us back to our state so we can pack up our things. I don't follow. Since you married my daughter, I only have one son to take care of me. It's only fair that since you took her, you now have the responsibility to care for me. I think you should pack up right now and leave. No. My daughter married you, some random n-word, I should at least get some benefits. Okay, that's enough. We invited you to stay the week so you could meet your grandkids, but now I'm starting to see that this might have been a mistake. I think we need to go. I'll take you back to your province, but you are not going to live here. So here's the current situation. Mother-in-law is locked in the guest room packing, but we suspect that she's planning to squat in the room. Whenever we knock, she starts crying hysterically about how she is going to die old and alone, how my wife is a bad daughter for not supporting her mom, how I'm a bad son-in-law because despite having money and a nice house. I'm on the phone with my cousin whose dad is a judge in the Supreme Court and we're working out a response. I was so relieved when my mother finally died. I was seven when my stepdad began to rope me daily for two years. I tried to tell my mom and she believed me, but refused to take action. Half a year later I talked with the school nurse and told her. The school took action and my mother just acted like she didn't know anything at all. The school told her, if you take her home, make sure your husband isn't there. Guess what? He was there and the both of them tried to talk me into telling everyone I was lying. They tried to bribe me with gifts and dolls but I never went back on my word. I knew that I could not live like that, with the pain of being roped. Not having a real mom that cared for me or even loved me. My stepdad was never convicted due to lack of evidence. I later heard that if I had the chance to testify against him he would have been convicted. It was my mom that said I could not attend court and would not testify, without consulting me of course. She kept his last name after the ordeal too. It felt like she chose him, the man who roped her daughter instead of her own flesh and blood and her little girl who was hurt, had PTSD, who peed in her bed due to all mental stress, her daughter who had severe anxiety every day. I have tried to end myself several times. Our stepdad laid hands on my brother all the time, leading to him taking his life. When my brother died I could never grieve him because she would call me and cry, using me as a therapist. She even blamed me for being sad because she felt that she had more right to be sad because it was her son. She was never a mother to him either. When I got married she came when the ceremony was over and she was drunk. I had enough when she was drunk in front of my kids and betrayed their trust and made them cry. I never let her babysit them or even be alone with them because I never trusted her. I was about to give birth to my daughter and a nurse came and told me that I had to call the ICU because my mother was very sick. I called and because of her drinking she was now dying. And I was happy. I was happy to finally get rid of her, get rid of all the hurt and pain she put me through. I did say goodbye to her and planned her funeral but I never ever cried. I also found out after she died that she still was seeing my stepdad. My in-laws treat me like a slave and I need to escape. My husband and I live with his parents. We've discussed moving out but my in-laws are very resistant to the idea, stating that there's plenty of room here and they don't know what they do without us. We pay over half of the rent, groceries for everyone and most of the household bills. I also do all the household cleaning and cooking. I cook for everyone, then clean for everyone too. My mother and father-in-law expect breakfast in bed from me every single day. I arrange and take all their pets to their veterinary appointments too. We also pay for any house modifications and upgrades as it'll be your house one day recently I have begun to feel resentful of the fact that once they are all done with work they can come home and relax, whereas I finish work and have to cook and clean and have no help. On the weekends I spend half of the day cleaning the house while they do what they want. This all came to a head last week. I was really unwell due to having morning sickness. I felt the worst I've ever felt and wanted nothing more than to sleep, however once it got around to dinner time I was woken by my mother-in-law to ask when I was getting up to make dinner. I didn't want to cause an argument so I just got up and made dinner for them, but as I was in the kitchen struggling not to pass out, the three of them sat watching a movie, waiting for me to bring in their food. I didn't say anything at first. I waited until my husband and I were alone to bring up my concerns with the lack of help. My husband apologized and offered to help more, which I accepted, but the next day was an exact repeat, I had to drag myself out of bed to cook and once I'd brought in their food my mother-in-law said, oh you look truly awful. Poor you. Oh by the way later would you mind giving everywhere an extra clean? At which point I accused them of treating me like a live-in maid and not caring about me outside of the services I provide for them. I pointed out that I wouldn't be in the communal areas if I hadn't been dragged out to cook and that they could have handled one meal themselves. My husband sat there in silence. He thinks I should have brought it up more carefully, at a time when I wasn't so emotional. I need to talk to them about this. My in-laws treat me like a slave and I need to escape. I decided I needed to get out and potentially leave my husband. I started putting my wages into my own bank account. I removed all of my savings from our joint savings account and transferred everything from my own safety account. I was struggling with morning sickness recently and I had suspected being pregnant but was not sure yet. Well I got the test done and indeed I was pregnant. I told my in-laws about this and it turned out to be a mistake. 
Immediately names were being thrown around and my mother-in-law started talking about reducing her hours to part-time so she could be around to raise the baby. This rubbed me completely the wrong way, I didn't want anyone else raising my baby? Colors for the nursery and themes were all being discussed constantly but never with me or my opinions being taken into consideration and within a week I felt as though I was just an incubator. The final straw happened when myself, my husband's cousin and mother-in-law went shopping. I had been looking at different kinds of pumps before being told that I would be bottle feeding so the mother-in-law could try to produce her own milk to give to the baby. She also chimed in saying that if I did not want to use a bottle we could take turns breastfeeding. I didn't want to cause a scene in the middle of the shop so I moved on to outfits, but everything I picked up or looked at was either the wrong color or style or something. I picked out one outfit, which would be my first baby purchase, and mother-in-law snatched it out of my hands before I could pay telling me that it was the wrong sort of outfit. I tried talking to my husband on three separate occasions and he either made excuses or blew me off entirely. I couldn't handle it anymore. I packed my bags against their will and went to stay with my sister for a week. My mother-in-law tried to physically block me from getting out of the door and I had to shove past her. She slapped my belly on the way out but thankfully she did not make good contact. My husband called once and asked me to go home. Once. I made it clear I wouldn't be returning to live in that house, that I would raise the baby on my own if I had to, and I would not allow my child to be raised in such a toxic environment. As a big surprise to no one, he stayed put. After that I got spammed with texts in the family group chat, but I left and deleted them all. I've started the divorce process and hopefully, as I've saved all the disgusting messages from either my ex or his family about both myself and my baby they won't get any form of custody. Although, since I announced it's a girl they've all gone quite silent. I told my girlfriend my darkest secret and it did not go as I expected. I have been dating my girlfriend for almost a year now. I love her with all my heart and wouldn't want to hurt her in any way shape or form. A while ago, she said she was a victim of rope by her cousin years ago and it hurt me to hear that from her. I tried to track him down and wanted to contact my best friend to get in touch with some people to have her cousin unalived, but my girlfriend forbade me from doing so. I did it either way and her cousin is now dead, she does not know this though. However, this whole debacle reminded me of an incident that happened 5 years ago. During a drunk night out with some people I really did not know, I was peer pressured into roping my sister and recording it, then distributing it to the people who peer pressured me into doing so. I went to juvie for what I did and it messed me up pretty badly. My family have also turned their backs on me and will not listen to any of my justifications for what I did. I am getting help now but the damage has been done. I opened up to my girlfriend about what I did as it was weighing on me. I went into detail about what I did to her as I recounted the story. I was expecting her to hate me, berate me for what I did and eventually break up with me. But it didn't happen. I was shocked and she said that happened in the past and that she's glad I'm getting the help I need. To this day I still get teary eyed from thinking about her sticking by my side. She had shown me kindness when I was expecting hate. It made me appreciate her more because she's shown me nothing but love. I kid you not everyone, she's a keeper. She encouraged me to reach out to my family and ask to reconcile again. I gave up hope but after her belief in me I am heavily considering it. My husband spends money on internet intimacy while I have to use the food pantry to feed our baby. My husband and I have a baby who is one years old. When I gave birth to my son, the insurance company refused to cover my baby and we were responsible for nearly $20,000 worth of medical bills which put us in a great amount of financial struggle. After the traumatic birth I had no income. I had preeclampsia and had to stay at home for the last month of my pregnancy and had gotten my job when I was a few months pregnant. I wasn't there long enough to make FMLA, so I was let go since I didn't have any paid time off to be leaving before the baby was born. About two months before I gave birth, our childcare option fell through and we couldn't afford traditional daycare. I have a chronic illness that caused some piling up of medical debt I was paying on monthly and it ate up every spare penny we had. After giving birth and receiving the large medical bill, I had no choice but to find someone to watch the baby so I could go to work. My mother decided to retire and take care of the baby. I was working three jobs and was still responsible for the baby, cleaning the house and making sure meals were made for everyone, including packing my husband's lunch. There was absolutely no money left for groceries or personal products. I had to use the only food pantry with food stamps I could get to and it only offers food once a month. I would make it last the entire month. I would go so long without eating, I could no longer breastfeed and had to ask for partial cans of formula from moms in the community whose babies wouldn't take it or they had switched to milk and had some leftover. It was so embarrassing. But, while sorting mail on a Friday night, I came across what I assumed to be a duplicate medical bill and was going to throw it away when I decided to open it. It was a check in my name for $1,000 and change. It was a refund for some medical bills that the insurance decided to pay. I ran upstairs and woke my husband up with joy that for the very first time, we'd be able to pay our mortgage without having to choose to have electricity or gas for the car. It was amazing. The following Sunday, I was sorting more mail and made a promise to myself to never ever throw away mail without opening it. I picked up a bank statement and put it in the throwaway pile, but thought to myself about my promise. I decided to open it just in case. That's when I found it. Hundreds of dollars being sent to people I've never heard of. I thought someone stole my husband's debit card information. But then I looked up at him, sitting in his armchair, and realized, no one stole his card, 
he's been throwing away money on other women. I asked him if he needed to tell me anything and he said no? And I said I'm looking at the bank statement and can see everything you've spent money on. Are you sure there's nothing you'd like to tell me? And he assured me there wasn't. I folded it back up and walked upstairs. He looked at the statement and came up and stood in front of me. Now, I'd like to take this time to share that for four years I had begged him for intimacy, but rarely got it. It's a miracle that our baby was made. I was completely available and begged him for it, but was rejected. He had been paying women from the internet for video intimacy with money that could have been used for groceries, soap, baby supplies and other needs. Instead, he had been throwing it away on other women, far better looking than me. We went to therapy a few times. He has no idea how much I hate myself. I smashed the bathroom mirror when I found out because I couldn't bear to look at myself. I am so hideous that he can't touch me. And now, after what I know, I can't be unclothed longer than a quick shower. Even that is awful. I hate myself. He has destroyed me. My parents are on his side. I called my mom to ask if I could stay with her for a while and she said no. She went as far as to drive me in. Her car a few weeks after I told her what happened and told me it was my fault and if I were a better wife, it wouldn't have happened. My whole family think I'm favoring my nephew. In reality I'm the only one not neglecting him. My nephew's parents are divorcing and in a fit of rage, his father blamed him for the divorce. He has been neglected for a lot of his life by his parents but up until now, has actually been okay at dealing with it. He isn't admitting it because he's in the I'm too cool for emotions phase, but he genuinely believes that their divorce is his fault. His father told him he regrets having him as they had him in their teenage years. He makes a lot of self-deprecating comments and went from an extroverted kid to someone who doesn't even speak when spoken to. I also have a niece and while I'm sure it's hard for her as well, her father isn't blaming her for the divorce and her mother isn't using her as emotional support and burdening her with the details of their problems like they are with my nephew. Well I guess I just got tired of everything and wanted to cheer my nephew up. Coincidentally, my friend gave me exactly two tickets to the Blue Jays game for me and my boyfriend but something came up for my boyfriend and so I decided to take my nephew instead. I told my sister beforehand and when she asked me about my niece I told her that I'd take her out shopping or to see this movie she desperately wants to watch during the weekend and she said it was fine. So I picked up my nephew, went to the game and when we came home he was much happier than he's been recently. We had loads of fun even though I don't really know anything about baseball. He called me the best aunt ever and he has like four other aunts. I went in to say hi to my niece and sister and I do not know what happened but my sister started yelling at me, saying that my niece has been crying the whole time because I'm making my favoritism very clear. I asked her what she was going on about but she just told me to go talk to my niece. I did and she told me that she's just jealous of how close we are and that it's okay if I like her brother more but she's allowed to be sad. I told her that I love them both equally. And that I'm going to take her out with me during the weekend but she insisted that it wasn't the same because it's not as expensive. My sister backed her up and they told my parents and my mom is threatening to not invite me and my nephew to her wedding because there is nothing she despises more than favoritism. My whole family think I'm favoring my nephew. In reality I'm the only one not neglecting him. I took my niece out on Friday like I promised her. The day with her went very well. After our time alone, I picked up my nephew so that I could take them both for the weekend while my sister got some alone time. My nephew was not in a good mood the entire time. He tried really hard to hide it but the poor kid looked so done. He has since dyed his hair black and started listening to metal music. My niece complained to me many times about how emo her brother is but I tried explaining to her that he's having a really hard time and people have different ways of coping. She seemingly got it. At the end of the weekend I got an official message from my mom saying that I'm disowned until further notice. She told me that favoritism and supporting my nephew's f-word actions are the reason for me being disowned. I went over to my sister's a few times and my nephew was just getting more distant as the days passed. My sister brushed it off cause he's a big boy and my niece needs more attention right now anyways. I'd leave their house every night frustrated because she wouldn't listen no matter what I or my brother said. A few days ago, I was over again and my niece and nephew got into a huge fight. She recorded him crying in his room and sent it to a few people including a girl he likes. She also said some horrible things. I was horrified but my sister rolled her eyes and said that they'd been fighting for days. I was completely over it though. I asked my sister if my nephew could stay with me for a bit so that she can relax and only have to take care of one kid. She agreed instantly. I told my nephew who was happy about it. I still talk to my niece but all she does is say things about her brother which she's clearly repeating from her parents. Edit, after months of dealing with this bullcrap I just got a text from my sister saying that she's not divorcing her. Husband. I'm so mad. How do I proceed? Update 2, my whole family think I'm favoring my nephew. In reality I'm the only one not neglecting him. After I eventually told my nephew about his parents not divorcing, he completely checked out. He was blank and just stopped talking entirely. I was extremely concerned and would check on him every hour or so during the day because I was terrified that he would try something. This went on for a while with me or my boyfriend constantly checking on him. We'd also try to spend as much time with him as possible. He didn't say a word throughout this time. He just became mute. One of these days, my worst fear came true. 
my nephew attempted taking his life. Thankfully, my boyfriend found him right on time and was able to stop him. It's a miracle and it is genuinely the worst thing I've ever experienced in my life. I immediately called my sister and told her what happened. I don't know what went through her mind but she told me she was coming over right away. The second she saw her son she looked blank, no expression. My nephew looked so lifeless and his mother just stood there. It was hard to watch. Her husband showed up a few hours later demanding that I let him in. When my nephew went to sleep, my sister and brother-in-law asked me what was wrong with him. I basically told them that he hasn't said a single word in a long time and that it's because of them. No sugar coating. I told them that they failed as parents the second they decided to blame and burden him for their wrongdoings. They bullied him into silence. He's afraid of speaking and saying the wrong thing. I told them that I tried putting him in therapy and the therapist told me this. He'll sit there for an hour fidgeting with some crayons but won't talk because of them and they should feel guilty. I might have also told them that I hope the guilt is eating them alive. I then said that he needs serious and more professional help that I cannot give him as someone who isn't his parent and that they need to step up. They showed no emotion and tried blaming him, saying he was old enough to bear responsibility for his actions and claimed that what they did had nothing to do with what my nephew attempted. They then tried bringing my niece into it saying she was the one struggling harder as she was the younger one. I kicked them out of the house there and then. As of right now, my nephew is still staying with me with no visits from his parents. His room door is always open and we still check on him and spend time with him consistently. I found a therapist that specializes in my nephew's case and he's already had a couple appointments. He's a bit more expressive but I'm not expecting any big changes for a while. Edit, my nephew just attempted to take his life again and is in hospital right now. His chances seem low. I accidentally broke my daughter's heart. I don't know if she will ever forgive me. I found out when I was young that I can't have any kids, and so I slept around a lot. One of the girls I slept with 10 years ago was married and had a child. We were seeing each other regularly but I broke it off as soon as I found out. About a year ago she contacted me and told me I have a child. I reminded her that I can't have any kids but she insisted that the kid has to be mine and kept calling until I agreed to a DNA test just to get rid of her. Turned out that she was cheating on her husband again and he found out. He took DNA tests from both kids and found out that the 13-year-old daughter isn't his. I took the test and she is mine. I can't explain how happy I was to know that I have a daughter and how sad I was to know that I missed everything. The husband started to act like a jerk and gave her an ultimatum. He would stay with her for their child but he didn't want her a fair child. I saw my daughter begging her mom to let her stay and it broke my heart. I got into a fight with the husband and asked him to have some effing sympathy for a child that he raised but he didn't change his mind so I took my daughter with me. My daughter has been living with me for a year now. The first few months were hard but then things got better. Before I took her in, I asked her mom and her teachers about her and they all told me that she is perfect. She is quiet, polite and smart, but that is not how she acted with me. I kept thinking what am I doing wrong? Why is the girl that everyone describes as an angel behaving this way? But I couldn't find out why. Then I did. It was about a month ago that I really messed up. It was a very bad day generally. First, my daughter couldn't wake up to go to school because she slept at 4 a.m. I was so mad at her because she knows she is not allowed to stay up so late. I took her to school and went to work. I had a very bad day at work and then received a call from her school asking me to pick her up. She had been suspended for two days for bullying a boy. I know the boy. He was no victim. He has been saying racist things to my little girl since day one. I had to take the rest of the day off and get her. When I got her I found out that she also got a D in her exam. She never got anything other than A when she was with her mom and when I got angry about it she told me to go F myself. I was fuming and it wasn't the end of it. We had another fight that night because she refused to clean her bedroom, and another one after that when she wouldn't eat her food because she doesn't like salad, and another one because it was her turn to wash the dishes. I was so tired and if it wasn't enough I got a call from my best friend and co-worker to let me know that I screwed up at work by leaving early and my boss is mad at me. I was so angry I couldn't help venting to him. I told him taking my daughter in was the worst mistake of my life and if only I could send her back to her mom. I turn around and she is standing right behind me with her eyes full of tears. I apologized 1000 times but she was crying so much I don't think she heard me. That's when everything changed. She started to do everything I told her to do. She got A's in all her exams. She was polite and quiet and I hated it. She didn't tell me about her day anymore. She didn't laugh or talk to me much. I put her in therapy. I kept trying to talk to her and cheer her up and get her to behave like she used to until one day she started crying and said, what do you want from me? I'm a good girl now. I hate myself. I miss her. I miss her waking me up in the morning on my days off to spend time with me. I miss her stealing my fries because apparently she loves fries more than I do. I miss her watching horror movies when I told her she is not allowed to and then coming to my room at night because she thinks Annabelle is coming after her and she wants me to hug her. I miss her telling me she loves me every day. I asked her teacher how she is doing at school and she told me she has been perfect lately and that was when it hit me. She was never perfect when she was with her mom, she was depressed. My family hates me and none of them wants to talk to me anymore. My sister is coming to stay with us for a week to cheer her up. I made my misogynistic and useless teacher get fired. I went to a ghetto high school in a poor community, but my parents raised me to work my butt off so I could get out of there. I maintained a 4.0 until the year in question in high school, taking five advanced courses a year. So in one of my upperclassmen years, I signed up for an advanced chemistry course. 
I knew it would be hard but assumed like the rest of my courses that if the class was minimally structured and Google came through per usual, I would be fine. Other students warned me not to take the course, but since I wanted to go to college for chemistry I knew I had to go through with it. The teacher was horrible. He was old and didn't offer after-class support, but also didn't even offer in-class support. His answer to even basic questions was you should understand that, talk to me about it later, but later never came. He didn't offer lunch hours, didn't offer after-school hours, and in class would just put up the answers. My family didn't have fancy tutor money and none were readily available in my community anyways. I studied my butt off, but when the first test came back I had a D, with no notes to even understand what I had done wrong. When I went to speak with him about it right after class ended, he simply told me to look more closely at the textbook for help, and that he didn't have time for me. He was two weeks behind the explanations that he did give, because he was constantly distracted. All of this is bad, but didn't deserve him being fired yet. What did was when he got dangerous. In an experiment working with hydrochloric acid, a plug held the concentrated stuff in a tube with some magnesium, and reacted to form hydrogen bubbles. Well, one of the other students in my group didn't plug the thing properly, and the plug fell out. So I asked him how to get the tube back, expecting him to tell us to discard the solution, rinse with water, and start over. I'd read the safety section in my textbook, which had this approach to working with this specific thing. His response? He insisted that I stick my ungloved hand in the solution and just grab the plug, and then still in the solution plug it back in. He wouldn't even put his own hand in to do it, so my high school self thought this was an inherently bad idea. I took some more magnesium from the workbench, and kept adding it to the solution until it stopped reacting, eating up all the HCl to just leave water. And it kept getting worse. One day he brought what he claimed were illegal fireworks into the classroom, and started setting them off. He thought it was funny to point them at us, wearing no safety equipment or goggles, and hoodies that could have easily caught the fiery things. He frequently would leave the room while a group of high school kids were playing with Bunsen burners and caustic chemicals. So in combination with the total lack of education I was getting, I didn't feel safe. Did I mention he was misogynistic too? All of the boys got A's on tests with no explanations. He even lost one of the other boys' tests, and straight up said in front of me and the rest of the class that we would just give him an A, assuming that he had done well. Later on I had asked the other student for help understanding something, and even he didn't know what was going on in the course, so I knew it was just bullcrap. Every other girl I asked was getting the same inexplicable grades as I was. This wasn't unusual on its own either, as I lived in a very conservative area and had several misogynistic teachers. Just usually they'd at least still grade fairly. Last contextual thing, my high school teachers union had negotiated for tenure. After coming to college, I've learned that this is a very unusual thing, and in retrospect it's an idiotic thing. This chemistry teacher was tenured, which meant that there was basically no way to fire him. Honestly, I felt bad for the bitter old man, because after a botched surgery, he was constantly in pain. He was still teaching because he refused to retire, and he had a son going through college that he needed to pay for. But at a certain point, this was affecting my chances of getting into college. I wasn't about to let one man's issues affect prospects for the rest of my life. So I looked up recording laws for my state, and found that it was a one-party consent state, meaning that I could legally record my teacher audio ally as long as the campus didn't say anything against it, and I was one of the parties consenting. So for a month, with my grade tanking despite hours of studying and three study books on the course, I recorded him. I recorded his fireworks, his lambasting female students, his crying in the back chemical storage room leaving us unsupervised. I recorded the three times he had left campus inexplicably, leaving the front office to send a last-minute substitute to open the door and let us in. And then, I made a throwaway email to make a throwaway Dropbox account. I uploaded everything, and emailed it to my superintendent with the ultimatum that if something wasn't done I would email the recordings to the local news, and that I really didn't want to do that. Within a day I heard back, with her assuring me that I wouldn't be punished for ratting him out. My parents, her and myself met. We went over my grades, my unmarked tests and homework and the videos. They asked me first to talk over my concerns with the teacher, and I said I was uncomfortable with that given his treatment of female students. The superintendent said she wouldn't tell the teacher who had submitted the evidence, but that they needed to speak with him about the concerns to hear his side of the story. My parents and I said that was completely reasonable, as long as my name was never mentioned. The next day, the teacher said he needed to speak with me after class alone. I told him I couldn't as I had another course after that, and he said that it was important. I turned my phone's recorder again right before the class ended, and as I was packing up he approached me. Due to the shape of the classroom, I was literally backed into a corner, and would have had to push this man to the side to get out. He then started saying that one of the students in the course had brought unfounded concerns and lies to the administration about what was going on in the course, and that he knew we hadn't always gotten along well but that he hoped I wouldn't have done that to him. I lied through my teeth and said that I didn't know what he was talking about, that he was making me uncomfortable by blocking my access to the door, and that I was late for my next class. He didn't even deny what I was saying, just said that since I clearly had a problem with him, he'd be willing to stay after class to help me specifically, since it seemed like I was struggling so much. 
After that I told him I really needed to get to my next course, but he would not move, forcing me to try to squeeze and push past him. I emailed the superintendent that recording during my next course, and cc'd my parents. My parents were furious, the superintendent was mad too because while my parents were poor they dressed up nicely. My mom was an expert in bluffing about getting a lawyer that we totally couldn't afford, so a liability lawsuit was probably ringing through the lady's mind. Since the district couldn't fire him, he was put on immediate permanent medical leave. While the district was still paying his full pay, they gave us one unqualified substitute after another. Two months before the national exam for the course, they gave us a female teacher that they had pulled out of retirement, but that had actually taught the advanced chemistry course for years. She was a godsend, and even held eight-hour Saturday classes so that we could catch up with the curriculum at least enough to pass the class. In those two months, we covered just enough of the test material that our class had a 50% pass rate, according to my upperclassmen friends, this was a lot higher than it had been for their years, with less than 10% of the class passing. The superintendent also wrote me a thank you college recommendation letter, partially to keep me quiet and partially because they had been trying to get rid of this guy for years. My little sister took this course a couple of years after me, and said that the new teacher was competent, and they were still at that 50% pass rate. I'm thinking of divorcing my wife due to her drinking habits. I've only been married to my wife about a month now, it's been a great time and we've really connected, and we enjoy having a night out. She's always been a heavy drinker, which wouldn't be too much of a problem if she didn't get drunk so easily. But recently it's gotten a whole lot worse. We went out recently and she got so drunk she could hardly walk and threw up onto me. I kept telling her to stop drinking and we should leave, but she kept going and her friends egged her on. She threw up on me again. It wasn't weak stuff she was drinking, she was at a table with two other people and they drank a whole bottle of vodka and did 15 shots of fireball between them two. I was at a different table with a few of my mates and we weren't drinking too much, just some cider. I didn't notice what she was doing until I looked over at a half-empty vodka bottle. I walked over and that was when she threw up the first time. She was saying some very awful things about me after puking and I'm not sure if it was just the vodka taking over or she was revealing how she felt. She started getting racial, I'm Jamaican living in the UK, and it really hurt me. I suggested we leave and she pushed me away and told me how the fun was just starting. She needed to be carried to the toilet and would sit in there for up to an hour not doing anything. I checked the toilet and she was in the same spot I had left her. I pleaded for her to leave but she went back into the garden and kept drinking. Eventually the bottle was done and there were so many shot glasses there too. I was sitting at their table now trying to try to stop her drinking, but my efforts were futile as she threw up on me again. She told her friends very personal details of my life that I really didn't want anyone to know. I told her we were leaving and picked her up, she wanted to stay but I didn't let her. On the walk home she kept falling into bushes and pushing me away. And told people that she was scared of me. I have never done anything remotely abusive yet she wanted to tell lies to other people. All my work friends think I am abusive and have stopped talking to me. She really ruined my social life and I am contemplating divorce. I've caught her cheating once in the past but did not break up with her. This time I might. Men who have laid hands on their wife, what was the reason for it? My first wife was perfect in every single way except one. She had a very weird obsession with popping pimples, and damn near every morning I would wake up to her long acrylics prodding away at my back trying to pop a pimple. At first I thought it was a cute thing of her to do, but the more time went on the more I realized this woman was crazy about popping pimples. Apparently, she popped the pimples of every single one of her friends. I told her repeatedly that I hate having my pimples popped, and that she should stop, but the woman never ever listened to me. It was getting frustrating and most mornings we would have serious arguments about it. The morning I snapped was the morning I pleaded with her not to pop my pimples. I had worked a night shift and came home around 7am. I told her I wanted 5 hours of sleep and she could wake me up normally around noon. I asked her not to pop my pimples just this one time. Yet, I woke up to the feeling of her digging her nails into my back trying to pop a pimple. This one hurt like hell, and as I woke up I asked her what she was doing. Popping your pimples obviously, she replied. I grabbed the phone beside me and checked the time. 9.30. I got mad on the inside but calmly told her to stop, and to let me sleep in peace until 12. We had to argue about it for her to leave me alone. I went back asleep, and was once again awoken by the feeling of someone popping pimples on my back. I shot up and screamed at her. I checked the time and it was a little past 11. She tried defending herself saying she has to pop my pimples and I told her to get out of the room and to let me sleep. I lay down and I kid you not. I feel her sit down onto my back and start again. I lost it. I flipped over and flipped her onto her back and started wailing. I caught myself a few swings in but it was too late, the damage was done. Her nose was broken and her jaw was fractured. We divorced. Shortly after and I did six months in jail. My psychopathic mother-in-law tried to steal my farm. I live in a very rural area on a small ranch that has been with my family since my grandfather. I met my wife six years ago when she started working on my farm. She was very open with me but there was one topic she always avoided. Her mother. The professor, as she called her worked in a college teaching a class I most likely would never attend. Her father was, as wife described, a weak man that does what the professor demands. Some of the things the wife described the professor in doing sounded absurd and borderline insane. It included her trying to get my wife a girlfriend in middle school, insisting my wife was a lesbian. There was a period where the professor wanted to live a natural lifestyle, and she asked her husband's brother to let them live on his farm. Within a week, the professor hated the farm and dragged them both back to the city. 
My wife on the other hand felt like she finally found something she liked and really connected with her uncle who she admired greatly. My wife left home when she was 16 and lived with uncle until she was 18. All while she was with uncle, the professor kept threatening to drag her back. She never did. After wife turned 18, she went to school and received a four-year degree and tried to work an office job, but found it unfulfilling. She started to take the bus and work odd jobs in rural areas, looking for something that fit what she was looking for. That was when our paths crossed. Last year, around March, we started getting mail addressed to the professor and father-in-law. I found this strange, and my wife wanted to trash it. I started marking them return to sender and no such occupant and dropped them right back into the mailbox. This came to a head in October when I was cleaning up the yard and a bright white SUV drove up with a U-Haul attached to it. Wife looked up and turned pale. Oh God, it's them she said. Out stepped a rotund beluga and a thin man that only. Had a passing resemblance to uncle. The professor immediately walked up to wife. Professor, well, let me have a look at you. It's been years. Wife, mom what are you doing here? Professor, the university is doing virtual classes, we figured we can self-isolate at our ranch. The R had a weird emphasis. Me, excuse me but this isn't your ranch. Professor, oh I'm sure we can have the ownership all cleared up. Well aren't you going to invite us in? Me, ma'am, you may be my wife's mother, but you are a stranger to me. I would rather not. The professor turned to father-in-law and told him to make a phone call of sorts. Father-in-law instantly got on the phone with the police and started spinning a tale about us not letting them into the house that they equally own with us. I couldn't believe what I was hearing and how insane it was being spun. Luckily I live in a small town. The sheriff pulled up, and it was someone I knew for most of my life. The sheriff really embodies the mindset of a small town constable. He tries to be a peacemaker and a peacekeeper first and foremost. He also knew that this land was in my family's name for three generations. Sheriff, what's this I hear about you selling half your ranch duke? Me, I didn't. These are my wife's parents and they think they have a legal stake on my land. Professor, not think, no. We've lived here since February with tenant laws, that means. Sheriff, funny, I don't remember you in town. That shut the professor right up for a second, but then she reached in her bag and pulled out a stack of letters. A lot of them are the bills and bank statements, with the ranch's address. Professor, then how do you explain these? Sheriff took the letters and looked at them. Sheriff, ma'am, these are all marked return to sender. The professor turned desperate. Professor, please. I haven't seen my daughter in years. I just want to make sure she's okay. Surely you can see that he is controlling her every move. Sheriff rolled. His eyes and walked over to talk to wife and I again, the sheriff likes to solve problems between people. And he hasn't encountered this level of crazy before. Sheriff, you might just want to invite them in for coffee. Talk for a few minutes. Wife, they are your parents. Wife, if you leave them here, you will just have to come back in five minutes to handle an assault. Sheriff, wife, you can't mean that. They're your family. Look, I'm just going to head up the road. Invite them in, talk to them. Wife got a bit of an angry glint in her eye. Wife, does this mean you're going to invite your cousin Aaron to Thanksgiving? Sheriff's cousin Aaron was currently serving eight years for a multitude of felonies. Sheriff's entire family consider him the family shame. With that statement the look in the sheriff's eyes changed. He gave wife a look like that bad huh? And wife merely nodded. Sheriff turned back to the professor and father-in-law. Sheriff, all right they don't want you here. Best you two not come back. The two protested briefly, but then piled back into the SUV and drove off, with the sheriff trailing right behind to make sure they were completely off the property. This was the first time I met the professor and father-in-law, but it definitely stuck with me. My psychopathic mother-in-law tried to steal my farm. In December, my mother-in-law's efforts got crazier. I stopped into town to get some supplies and by the time I was done packing up the truck, my mother-in-law, or rather the professor, tapped me on the shoulder. This time she actually acted cordial. I chose to be curt. She basically begged me to at least listen to her for five minutes in the local cafe. I didn't want her to create a scene on Main Street, so I agreed. We sat and the professor talked. She claimed my wife was always confused about who she was, and that the professor and father-in-law had only her best interests in mind. I didn't want to yell, shout accuse or throw anything back in her face. I was just waiting out the clock. She said my wife saw you coming and wedged herself into my life. At that I did push back at. I said that I felt I was blessed to have her in my life. Who boy, those were the wrong words to use with this woman. Professor, what do you mean blessed? I put my head in my hands and just wished this was over, everyone in the cafe looking at the two of us. The professor really projected her voice with this sentence. Me, ma'am if you're trying to win me over, I suggest you stop using vinegar. She sort of humped at that statement. But she did become cordial again. She dug into her purse and pulled out a flash drive. She placed it on the table in between us. Professor, fine this is all the proof you need. Take a look and I promise you will know the truth. I was dying on the inside from embarrassment from how my mother-in-law acted, with people I do business with regularly all watching. They will want to know what happened and why. I took the flash drive and left. I got back to the ranch where my wife was waiting and she could instantly tell something happened in town from the ticked off look on my face. I explained what happened in town and held up the flash drive. Wife looked confused by it. We plugged the flash drive in and. There were stacks and stacks of PDFs. The whole thing was a thesis of sorts with my wife as the subject. I'm not even sure what the point of it was, or what the professor was testing on her own flesh and blood. 
It detailed her first playing with toy dump trucks when she was a child to dressing in overalls during the brief time they lived with her uncle together. All of it was cold, detached, and as my wife put it, clinical. My wife was referred to as subject throughout. It was bizarre. And I'm still not sure what the point of it was. My wife looked disgusted at the PDFs and insisted we burn the drive. Which we did in the fire pit. That was the last time we heard from the professor. My wife thinks more is coming. Date 2, my psychopathic mother-in-law tried to steal my farm. We FaceTimed my wife's uncle to get some more insight on the mother-in-law, or rather the professor. At first, her uncle gave very short answers. But when I told him about the weird play for the ranch, he finally was willing to give a bit more information. Turns out she tried the same thing with his farm. He said the professor was a big reason why him and his brother don't talk anymore. Wife's uncle's sheep farm was part of a much larger piece of land owned by my wife's grandfather. The grandfather had three kids, two sons and a daughter. The daughter went off to the East Coast and works a high-paying executive job of some type. The grandfather split his property into three slices when he died. His daughter sold her part to uncle for almost nothing, she didn't want rural property nor had she made a claim for it, and knew uncle wanted to keep the farm going. The other son, my father-in-law, sort of kept ownership but gave permission for uncle to keep using it. That was until he wanted to go to an expensive university. He sold his part of the land to uncle for a good chunk of change. Uncle got to keep all of grandfather's land in one piece. In college, father-in-law dated the professor, and then married. Uncle heard bits and pieces, but father-in-law just only called during Thanksgiving and his birthday and that was about it for many years. A few years later professor was in, as the uncle called it, a hipster phase and heard about the farm. She didn't just show up. Father-in-law asked first and my uncle agreed, letting the professor and my future wife come over and work for a bit. Father-in-law knew what rural life was like, but the professor didn't. Uncle described it as the professor had a vision of waking up to a kale smoothie, digging up beets for lunch and enjoying the sun the rest of the day. If you live on a farm or a ranch, you're spoiled for choice when it comes to daily chores. Uncle's farm was primarily a sheep farm, but they had a vegetable garden and a small orchard. This meant work. Uncle was easy on the professor. She was only given a few chores, such as clipping dead vines in the garden and airing the compost. She apparently treated this like an ordeal. She nearly destroyed the tomatoes uncle was growing that year, and he had to redo the compost every evening. But the way she complained, you'd think she was tending the orchard and the sheep. She did not like manual labor. But she was also oddly in love with the idea of a farm? My wife on the other hand took to it like a duck to water. She loved to check the fences, check the flock, dole out the feed, and tend to the small vegetable garden. Uncle said that they had a local butcher that came once in a while for a few lambs, depending on price and demand. Butcher visited once during the professor's time on the farm. Butcher was a black man, which uncle didn't mind or care. Professor cared. She made a big show of greeting him, shaking his hand, and talking to him in a very sing-songy, high-pitched way. Uncle found this very strange. At least strange enough to mention to us. Professor wanted the farm, but didn't want to work it. She wanted to own it on paper and have the uncle and her husband work it. She went as far as to push her husband to contest the sale he had with uncle a few years back to gain a partial ownership. This went nowhere of course. Uncle did have to hire a lawyer, but it didn't even make it to court. Him and the rest of the family refused to talk to father-in-law after that. I was curious so I had to know why the professor blew up at me when I said I was blessed to have a wife. He chuckled a bit. Really kicked the hornet's nest huh? He said. First night the professor was staying with uncle, uncle and his wife prepared dinner. They got to the table and uncle was about to say grace. My wife blushed when he brought this up, apparently this is a very embarrassing memory for her. Professor blew up. She said something about how this family doesn't say grace. Uncle shrugged, he wanted to be accommodating and responded that she didn't have to join if she didn't want to. She tried to push it further. As long as she was in that house, there would be no saying grace, uncle said this was the first time he was rude to the professor. He told her that there was no way a guest was telling him what he could and couldn't do in his own home. After hearing about the sheep farm, I will get in touch with a lawyer. We'll see how that goes. Date 3, my psychopathic mother-in-law tried to steal my farm. Well it finally happened. The mother-in-law, also known as the professor, and father-in-law are in jail. Two nights ago the sheriff called us in the middle of the day. My wife picked up and after a few minutes of chatting she started laughing. She told me what the sheriff told her. It seems the professor and the father-in-law decided they wanted to try to sneak onto our land. The professor decided that instead of trying to get onto the ranch from the farm road, which we have a clear view of from the house, that her and father-in-law decided to park a little ways away, and try to get onto our land via a neighbor's property. My neighbor to the east has a small orchard and is a hobby beekeeper. He doesn't get a lot of honey a year and what he does he shares or sells at the farmer's market. Field chickweed just started to flow here, so the bees were out, the professor apparently stumbled onto his bee boxes, and I mean literally bumped into one. The bees started swarming her and either her or father-in-law got mad and kicked one of the boxes over. My neighbor keeps a sensor perimeter around his bee boxes in case of bears, so that went off and he ran to his bee boxes to see two middle-aged people running around, swatting at bees and yelling. Neighbor called the sheriff, and after about 20 minutes of the neighbor trying to smoke the bees and hosing them off, promptly pressed charges for the destruction of his bee box and trespassing. Apparently there are additional charges for disrupting and destroying a farm's agricultural capability, and since his bees are pollinators for his orchard, away the two went. Both were apparently covered in stings and are in county lockup now. What is the most down bad thing you have ever done for money? 
I was contacted by an old man through Instagram asking me to be a live and house pet in exchange for a nice amount of money. I had recently graduated high school and got kicked out of my parents, so I really needed it. I agreed to be his live and pet. I thought it was going to be a sugar baby and sugar daddy situation when I went over to live with him, but I was completely wrong. This old man paid me 20k a month as long as I spent every waking second dressed as a cat. I had to walk on all four and eat from a bowl. I was not allowed to talk to him, and had to meow when I was signaling that I wanted something. It was only after he went to sleep that I could take my very realistic cat suit he had bought for me off and relax. He was an early sleeper and would crash around 9pm every day, meaning I had a few hours to myself. He never even wanted intimacy, we did not do it once. He simply wanted me to act like a cat and wear cat's clothing, including paws on my feet and hands. He would kiss and snuggle these paws however which I found very strange. I stayed at this house for close to a year racking up money. I never had to pay for a single thing, and for the most part, he was not a weird guy. He never made unwanted advances and he gave me every single Sunday off, where I would not have to pretend to be a cat. During Sundays, he would take me to go shopping or order a very fancy dinner for us to have delivered. I literally racked up over $200,000 in one year by pretending to be a cat. I would have planned to stay longer but he had a heart attack and told me he could no longer keep me around as he wanted his family to come over and stay with him in the aftermath. I had met his brother before who approved of the cat thing, and I actually banged his brother. It was more so his mother and father he was worried about disapproving. What is the dumbest way you have ever gotten fired? When I was 22 I had an internship for the Buffalo Wild Wings marketing department. I was also jogging a lot at this time. Every time I would go and leave for a run I would text my girlfriend that I'm leaving for a run just so someone knows where I am. Once in the middle of a run, I got a text from asking for a special picture when I get back. The special picture was always the same. My girlfriend had an attraction to Darth Vader, and the picture would be me wearing the Darth Vader mask, while being completely unclothed. I would then cover up the private parts with a small sticker of Luke Skywalker. I agreed to send this picture. Then a minute later I got a text from my female boss making sure I sent out some paperwork. I got home and got unclothed. I put my Darth Vader mask on and took the picture. I even made sure to perfectly align the Luke Skywalker emoji with my manhood. I sent her a picture and added the text just for you 20. An hour later I get a text from my girlfriend that says did you forget my special picture? And I'm thinking no what the f I sent that so I go into my texts and. Oh no. Oh f me into oblivion with the Darth Vader mask. I sent the explicit picture to my boss. My heart sank straight into hell. I immediately try to do damage control and say it was not meant for her and that I'm so sorry. I even screenshotted the convo from my girlfriend to show it was a mistake, but I don't think it explained the Darth Vader mask and Luke Skywalker sticker. No response from the boss. Went into the office the next day and was called into HR where I was fired. It effing sucked. I had a great gig going. At least I did lay the pipe on the boss when my girlfriend and I broke up a month later. My ex cheated on me and impregnated his affair partner. I feel guilty because of the aftermath. I was with my husband for about six years. During this time, we were trying for a baby but had no success. About four years into our marriage, our marriage had a rough patch. He had stress at work and slept with his 16-year-old co-worker to relieve it. He confessed to me rather quickly and a week later, they sat me down and told me they were expecting a child. I was an idiot back then and so I felt like I should forgive this creep because I truly believed he loved me and I thought I had no one but him. My husband's supposed daughter was the apple of my husband's eye. As a result of that, his co-worker was a frequent presence in our lives. My husband's parents saw nothing wrong with the fact that she was 16. They felt like they had to include the mom of their grandchild for everything too and she made her way in every family picture and memory, standing side by side next to me. People thought that she was my husband's wife constantly as she looked old for her age. I finally had enough when during the baby girl's first birthday party I was told to take a picture of my husband, his now 17-year-old mistress, his daughter, and his parents. They didn't want to didn't include me. It hit me that I was now treated as the other woman and I realized that I deserved more than this bullcrap. I filed for divorce a few months later and left. It was the hardest time of my life but I ended up getting a promotion at work and met this sweet, wonderful guy. Fast forward to now, me and my boyfriend are madly in love and I gave birth to an adorable baby girl that I considered a miracle baby. I got pregnant with my boyfriend like three months after dating him and I thought that it was strange that this could happen since my previous failed attempts with X and had thought that I was the infertile one. It crossed my mind then that maybe he was the infertile one and he only believed the mistress was pregnant with his child because they were having an affair. I didn't say anything though because it was not my place anymore. However, my boyfriend was so happy about my daughter's birth and posted it on Facebook and tagged me in the post. I was still friends with my ex-sister-in-law on Facebook and she saw the post. She called me up and said that she was hurt that I didn't let her know that I could actually get pregnant and the lack of a child during my first marriage could be my ex's fault. He took a paternity test. The poor baby girl was never my ex's. The co-worker apparently was dating this terrible guy during the time she slept with my ex and didn't know who the child's father was so she just strung my ex along cause she had feelings for him and thought he'd be the best father for her child. Now my ex blames me for not telling him that I was pregnant way before and him having to father this girl. He's doing pretty bad now and I can't help but feel guilty like I should've told him.
X's perspective, my ex cheated on me and impregnated his affair partner. I feel guilty because of the aftermath. About four years into our marriage, my beautiful ex-wife and I started really struggling. My boss was being a jerk at work and I was struggling heavily. During this time my wife tried her best being supportive, but she went through a patch of rough mental health and lost all her libido. One thing led to another and I slept with a younger co-worker of mine. I confessed to my wife right away, but a week later I found out that me and the affair partner were having a child. I always wanted to be a father, so to me, I was ready to raise the child despite the circumstances. I told my parents what had happened and told them I do not want the child growing up without one of the parents, so my affair partner and I would co-parent and would hang out often, I convinced my wife this was the right thing to do as the time I truly believed it was. It wasn't long until my affair partner gave birth to who I thought was my child and I formed a connection with this girl. I started isolating my wife, including my affair partner and all of the family gatherings even with my wife present, as I truly did not think she minded very much. Whenever she did voice her complaints, I was able to argue back and convince her that this was the right thing to do. Sadly, my wife had enough after the little girl turned one and divorced me. This hit me like a freight train as I really loved her, however I knew she needed to move on from me. I tried to talk her into staying but was unsuccessful. Then a little while later I found out my wife had a baby through Facebook. I made a post and tagged her in it. I was super happy for her as she had finally conceived her miracle child. At the time my previous affair partner and I were now starting to develop serious feelings for each other and were going on nights out, having intimacy and talking about potentially seeing where a relationship goes. That's when my sister-in-law suggested that possibly I was the infertile one due to my wife's birth. I thought it was bullcrap but brought it up to my now girlfriend to see what she had to say. She looked hesitant when I said it so I inquired more. Turns out at the time I was having an affair with her, she was having an affair with her boyfriend. He was a substance dealer who abused her. I took a paternity test and found out my child is not mine. This broke me mentally. I called up my ex and let out all of my frustration onto her, telling her that it was evil of her not to let me know of her pregnancy when she first found out. That could have saved me from harboring feelings for my previous affair partner. I'm now stuck raising a girl that is not mine. My dad despises spending money on me. My parents split when I was 9 years old, they were teenagers when they had me and I remember their relationship was terrible when they were together. When they split, I stayed with my mother in the house they had bought together, whilst my dad moved away to live with a friend of his, Mike. That was a lie, Mike was actually Emma, his girl best friend, whom he'd been seeing whilst he was still with my mom. Dad eventually married Emma but then they divorced a few years later, he's now with another woman, Jane. After my parents split, my dad didn't bother to see me for months, and paid nothing towards my mom to help take care of me, he later tried to have us kicked from the house so he could redecorate it and sell it despite me and mom having nowhere to stay. Eventually, mom found us a rented place nearby to live in. We lived there for nearly 10 years, during which time my dad finally started to visit me and also paid child support, though very reluctantly. He was unwilling to help my mom in other ways, once, my school shoes were ruined when the weather had been consistently bad for weeks and my mom couldn't afford a new pair, so my dad gave her the money then skimmed it off the next child support payment. I should note here that my dad is an engineer and has always earned way more than my mom. Even though he earned more, my dad begrudged having to pay for me. Whilst he was with his ex-wife, I was rarely invited to any outings. When I was 13, he stopped putting my name on Christmas and birthday presents to family members and insisted I now had to get my own, since I obviously didn't have a job or an allowance, this usually fell on my mom or other family members to pay for. For my 18th, he promised to take me to Glasgow for a comic con there, but he no-showed at the airport. I never got a present from him for my 18th. A similar thing happened for my 21st, he booked to take me to the Warner's Brothers studio tour in London, but then convinced me to cancel a couple of weeks before we were due to go due to the bad weather for driving down, but the weather turned out to be fine in the end. Once again I got nothing for my birthday from him. He has also recently stopped paying for me if we go for something to eat, I wasn't too bothered by this until recently, when I realized he had only stopped paying for me once I decided to attend uni. I only started attending when I was 21. I get a small student grant to help me out financially. My dad thinks I am rich due to this and asked me to pay for him occasionally. A few times he has convinced me to pay for him and his girlfriend too. Recently, I have been very short on money, I have started my master's degree and the grant is a lot less, not to mention I work in a pub that's rather quiet so I only have one or two shifts a week, and that money typically pays for my commute or my lunches that week. When he asked if I wanted to go for something to eat one weekend last month, I knew I wouldn't be able to afford it so I turned it down, and he didn't offer in any way to spot me one time, where we were going, it would have cost around $15 max to help me out one time, and I would have offered to pay him back once I had the money. The boiling point this year was last week, when his girlfriend admitted to me that they hadn't bought me anything I had asked for for Christmas. This wouldn't bother me, except I had asked for three books that I desperately want to read. Her excuse was that they were budgeting so they had to buy presents early on, but I sent them my list in October, and one of the books was $7. If he had gotten me that and only that, I would have been happy. It's especially frustrating this year as I have gone out of my way to pay extra for postage to get their Christmas presents on time, and I got them things that they ask for, yet they can't even return the favor for me. My dad has a brand new car, a made-to-order BMW, that he got just a couple of months. Back, and a four-bedroom house. 
At my undergrad graduation, he was bragging about all this to my mum, the same woman he couldn't be bothered to help to raise me for years. I can't even bring this up to my dad if I wanted to, he always turns things around on me as if it's my fault. When I was 16, I was upset that every time I saw him, we would just go into town and wander around bored for ages, whilst he ignored a lot of what I was saying. When I told him about this, he said it was my fault because I never gave any ideas for alternative plans. Another time, he berated me until I was crying when I had mentioned we rarely talk because it was my responsibility to get in touch with him, ignoring how he rarely got in touch with me. It's just incredibly frustrating, especially as he plays the doting father of the year in front of others. My dad despises spending money on me. My dad kept being a cheapskate throughout winter and spring, but the real problems arose this summer. I was asked to dog sit for him over two weekends in August, the second time was for a cruise he and his girlfriend Jane were going on, Jane won the cruise through her job so they didn't pay for it. At the time, I was only working one shift a week, and had to take that shift off in order to be free to dog sit for them, my job is cash in hand, so I wasn't paid at all that week. When my dad and his girlfriend returned, they didn't offer me any payment, or even bring back something small. I'm not even really bothered about the payment, but some acknowledgement of the fact that I took time off work, missed out on wages, and looked after their dog in their house for a weekend would have been nice, even if it had just been a curing or a magnet. When my nan pointed out that it was wrong of him to not offer me payment, my dad said they'd bought food in for me. Wow, good job feeding your daughter whilst she dog sits for you, father of the year. Things came to a head in mid-September. Jane texted me to say that since no one in the family had invited them to any Christmas parties, they would be staying home, they added that they wouldn't see me until my birthday, so I wouldn't see my dad or my grandparents at all unless I made arrangements. When I spoke to my grandparents, they said they hadn't invited them to anything because it was only September and they weren't even thinking about Christmas, which is completely understandable. It annoyed me more that my dad got Jane to message me instead of doing it himself, he's a coward. I ended up getting annoyed enough that I sent a long text detailing a lot of these problems to him. I will admit that I got snippy with him and did swear a bit, and I called him pathetic after his response, where he said, I'm sorry you feel that way and, you're entitled to your own opinion, instead of a proper response. I blocked him and Jane on Facebook and WhatsApp, but I didn't block their numbers. Jane later sent me a very long response message, during which she tried to guilt trip me over wanting to be paid for dog sitting, as she thought it was just something nice family does for each other. She contradicted herself later by claiming she and my dad were planning on doing something for me this month to say thank you, which I don't believe for a second. Jane also said that she and my dad were in such dire straits with their finances last year that they almost lost their house. My reaction to that was to wonder then why does my dad have his brand new, made-to-order BMW? Why does Jane have a BMW? Why do they need a four-bedroom house that they can't afford when there's only two of them living there? I got very angry with Jane though, as she was the one to send me the message. She claimed my dad tried to send it on WhatsApp but he was blocked, but I haven't blocked his number, so he could have texted me. Instead, he let his girlfriend do it after I had a go at him for letting his girlfriend do his dirty work for him in my initial text. I called him out on this, and did call both of them pathetic. Her response was that he was at work, so I didn't bother replying again. I'd had enough and knew I would say something awful. I think I just need to cut contact with them both. My baby daddy's mom is a danger to my baby. I'm not letting her see him. My baby daddy's mom is an absolute head case, diagnosed with BPD, ADHD, and a diagnosed narcissist, she has the infinity stones essentially. She has always been a pain in the backside and I did not want her at the birth of my baby. The day my daughter was born my mother-in-law came over to the house and saw her in the evening despite my reluctance. I gave in and let her hold my daughter. She was holding my daughter and my daughter started to fuss so my mother-in-law thought she had pooped. I told her she hadn't, and that I just changed her and she's okay. She proceeded to tell me I'm wrong and undressed her in a very aggressive manner, making my daughter scream like I had never heard. She then checked her diaper, told me I was, and picked her back up, once again aggressively, and said oh I know I just ticked you off didn't I? Here let me console you my baby. She was still screaming, so my baby daddy grabbed her and calmed her. He said here, wanna go see mama? And mother-in-law yells, no she wants to see grandma. And snatched the baby. She then was like oh I just wanna kiss you, but we can't kiss new babies. To which my baby daddy said yeah, don't kiss my baby. We were very strict on people not kissing her. She started fussing again so I took her and said she was hungry so she couldn't argue it with me. Then she decided to leave. The next time we saw her was about a week later on Christmas. She was making breakfast for us and said it'd be ready when we got there. We got there and it was half done and she told my baby daddy to finish it so that she could go blow dry her hair and hold the baby. He ended up helping and she came out and I was feeding my daughter. She threw a fit about it and was like really? You have to eat now? I then changed her diaper and she stood over me the whole time watching and finally walked away. We sat down to eat and she snatched my daughter and asked how. We feel about people holding the baby when she cries. I said if she's fussing then she's fine, but if she's crying then she needs to come back to me. She goes well I don't mind her crying so I'll just keep her. The next time she came over my daughter was congested so we weren't letting people hold her. 
I explained the concerns we were having with her congestion when she got there and then she proceeded to go oh that's a bummer, anyway can I hold her? I said no she's congested. She then said she was gonna leave since she couldn't hold the baby. My baby daddy went outside and my daughter started fussing and she asked have you even fed her today? Is she hungry? You need to feed her. She then asked if she could take a picture of herself holding the baby because people at her work wanted to see her. I said no and she stormed out. The next time we saw her, I let her hold her and she proceeded to take her into a different room while I was playing a card game with everyone. She then started kissing all over her so I asked my baby daddy if we could leave. We left and she said thanks for letting me finally hold her. At that point I was done and told my baby daddy no more and I'm done with the disrespect. She had disrespected me and my boundaries every time she had seen us since the baby was born. My baby daddy and I ended up splitting up when she was about three months old. He kicked us out so I moved home with the baby and he moved back with his mom. His sister was pregnant so he and I went to the baby shower at his mom's house. My baby was about four months old at this time so she hadn't seen her for about two months. This is where the poisoning came in. I'm deathly allergic to bananas. My throat closes, I get hives, can't breathe and lose consciousness. She knows this very well. They had a slushy there that was pure banana. My baby daddy didn't know what it was and got it for me and my ex-mother-in-law handed it to him after he had asked for something to drink for me. She watched me drink it and I looked at him and said does this taste like there's banana in it? And he started freaking out looking for an EpiPen. She walked up to me and goes, oh no I forgot. How are you feeling? With a poop eating grin on her face. Then she said you'll probably be fine and walked away. I was thankfully fine. Baby daddy has had many conversations with her about talking with me and what she's done. I've told him she's not allowed to see our daughter unless I'm there and she'll never be allowed to be alone with her. He respects it and understands why I feel that way. I just went on a date with a guy that tried to rob me. Two years ago, I returned home from my father's funeral. As soon as I opened the door to my apartment, a guy holding a crowbar came out from my kitchen holding my TV. I live in the city so robberies are common. The guy began shouting at me and he clumsily dropped my TV and began holding the crowbar like it was a baseball bat. I was so stunned at what was happening that I didn't move. The guy screamed at me to empty my pockets. From the stress of the last few days with my father passing away, I simply started crying. Not out of fear at what was happening, but because this was literally the worst time of my life. The worst moment. The worst minute and second. While crying hysterically, I gave the guy my wallet. I just sat on my floor and hugged my knees and told him, through my tears, to take whatever you want. He hesitated, looked down at me. He dropped my wallet and sat down beside me. Immediately, he began to comfort me. He began to apologize. He put my TV back on the table and told me it wasn't damaged. He told me that he lost his job and that his mom needed medicine that he couldn't afford and that they were homeless. He told me all of this while I just wailed. I cried for my father who was lost, I cried for my future, for it was uncertain, and I cried because my home had been intruded on in the most violent way. For a good 10 minutes I sat on the floor with a guy who had every intent to rob me, telling me that it would be okay and that he was sorry. He begged me not to call the police. I just started screaming at him to get out. He ran away so fast that he left the crowbar. I threw it after him as he ran down the street. Two days later, I came home from work and he was sitting in front of my door. I was so terrified that I pulled out my phone, but he had this look on his face of regret. He told me that he told his mom what he did, and his mom made me some soup. He handed me this tiny bowl wrapped in tin. Foil. Again, I was stunned and overwhelmed and angry that I slapped the bowl out of his hands and it shattered on the floor. I told him to leave or I was calling the police. He left. I remember he looked upset. I left the soup and shattered bowl outside my door almost as a warning for him to not come back. About three months after that, I got a note in my mail slot from the guy. He told me his mother had passed away and that he was no longer homeless and that he had a job. He wanted to repay me for breaking into my apartment. He wrote down his address and told me that I was welcome to break into his place if I wanted, but he didn't have much stuff. This all overwhelmed me. I threw away the letter, but I remembered his address. I remember walking by there one day out of curiosity. It was a ratty apartment building across the city. He was walking up to his room and he saw me. He waved. I turned away and left. He ran after me and apologized again. Told me that he never meant to do what he did. He showed me the program from his mother's funeral that he kept in his wallet. He wasn't lying, she was real. He was real. He was a real person. I don't know what it was, but I believed him. We slowly began to grow together as people? I can't describe it. After a year of maintaining communication and learning about who he was, he enrolled in a local community college and began taking courses to earn credits before applying to university. I helped him study for his history class a lot. He's great at math and science though. I never invited him over to my apartment, however. No matter how much I got to know him, I was still afraid of him. And he knew that. He knew that I couldn't trust him. But tonight, we went out for coffee because he said he had an exam. When I got there, he said he forgot his book. We just talked for a bit, we laughed, and then he told me he wanted to cook for me. On a whim, I decided to invite him to my apartment. After picking up some things from the 
grocery store, he came over. I was so nervous that I was shaking. He noticed, he squeezed my hand, and then he made dinner. It was amazing. We talked, we laughed, we sat on the floor and watched a movie on the TV he tried to steal. We made jokes about it. And then he told me that he missed his mom. I gave him a hug. Then he left. What do I do? I just went on a date with a guy that tried to rob me. Over the course of the next few months we started developing strong feelings for each other. However in January I got a phone call at half past two in the morning from him. He was in jail, he and two of his friends were arrested for public intoxication and possession of substances. He wanted me to bail him out and I said no, I couldn't. This is when things fell apart. Before then, he and I had been incredibly close. We spent Christmas together. He came over, we cooked and watched movies. We made love but I noticed I started doing things I didn't normally do. He would come over in the middle of the night, visibly panicked, and ask if he could stay with me. I let him, no questions asked. I stopped asking questions because I wanted to believe that he was good and everything was fine. He started asking me that if others asked about him if I would lie and say I didn't know him. This scared me, but I assumed it was about work stuff. I wanted it to be his work stuff. He was released from jail about a week later. He didn't talk to me. I called his apartment and nothing. I came home from work one day and a woman was waiting outside my door. She appeared disheveled. She was wearing a tank top and flip-flops in mid-January in the northeast. When I tried to key into my apartment, she started verbally attacking me. She told me to stay away from him. Like she owned him. She told me that she knew what I did to him. And that I would get what's coming. She left and I was scared out of my mind. Before calling the police, I decided to call his apartment one last time. He answered. I told him about the woman. He apologized and said that he was seeing her. He didn't intend for her to come over and interfere. But that led me to another question, how did she know where I live? And how many others had he told where I lived? He hesitated before answering and just said he was sorry. I immediately packed an overnight bag. Grabbed my most valuable items and went to stay in a hotel because I no longer felt safe, because of him. I came back to my apartment the next day. Everything was fine. He came over to apologize. I told him to get out and I started crying. He tried to hug me but I remember picking up a piece of wood to protect myself. I demanded to know what he was doing. He told me he was selling substances, he told me that he had to do it because he knew people that would hurt him. I told him to get out and that I never want to see him again. He got angry, threatened to come back with his friends. I was racked with guilt for trusting him. He apologized again and said he was sorry. I was questioning everything about him. I pushed him out and locked the door. The teaching program I'm a part of rotates teachers in and out of schools across the country. Last year I put in a request to move across the country to be closer to home. Two weeks after this encounter with him, I found out that my request was accepted and I was set to leave in March. My apartment was broken into and vandalized in early February. At night, he would come and knock on my door. I would call the police but he would always leave before they got there. His guys started harassing me. Nothing was ever stolen, just broken. They broke a glass bottle my dad made for me when I was six. He knew how much that meant to me. It was shattered. The week before I left, I saw him outside my building. I called the police. He was walking over to me, and I remember having this fiery rage in me. It was this impassioned, red, angry heat that washed over me and I took my keys and I just started hitting him. I ended up connecting with his eye socket. When the police questioned him, they realized he was the one that was harassing me. He was wanted for a myriad of other charges. After he fell down, I started kicking him. I moved out a week later. I have not heard of him since. People who have made teachers quit their job, how did you do it? When I was in elementary school, there was one teacher, Mrs. Wilson, who was a few years away from retirement. Every day she would sit out on the concrete bricks outside with really long pieces of grass, dipping one into a hole, and pulling it out real quick. Then repeat and repeat until the bell. This went on every day for years and years prior to me noticing her doing that and likely before my existence. One day I just watched her and it fascinated me, so I went over and joined her. She told me that at the bottom of those holes were little creatures and that if you did it just right, you could yank them out of the holes. She had never caught one, but was certain this was true. I can't tell you what that did to my brain other than make me ridiculously determined to yank one of those creatures out of the holes. Over the long hot summer, week after week, month after month, I'd sit in the dirt with my grass, trying to catch whatever it was I was trying to catch. And then one day, I caught it. It was white and wriggly, and I know now it was larvae. I'm not sure what kind of larvae it was, might have been roly-poly bugs, but I got really good at yanking them out over the summer and I could not wait to go to school and tell Mrs. Wilson. On the first day of school, I ran to show her during recess, and I got one the first try, and showed her how I learned to do it. She seemed excited about it, and she was able to finally get one herself. I was so proud of myself. That was Mrs. Wilson's last year of teaching as she announced she was retiring not long after, for all I knew she went off into her retirement happily. Probably 20 years later, I ran into my former first grade teacher, and we started talking about all the teachers and different people we knew and Mrs. Wilson got brought up and I asked about Mrs. Wilson because I heard she died at some point and I was told this, she retired early because some student beat her at her bug catching game and stole her only joy, I swear, 
she loved trying to catch that whatever she was trying to catch and that kid just ruined it for her. She was such a great teacher too. I didn't confess. My dad is replacing my deceased mom with a 16-year-old co-worker. I lost my mom four months ago. She had stage 4 cancer and passed away from almost total organ failure. We were too late to do anything. My dad started talking to other women the night she passed. I caught him texting one of her best friends asking to hook up. He's had three relationships with different women in the time since her passing. He's been dating his current girlfriend, a 16-year-old co-worker for about a month now. It's lethal in our state but the morality of it leaves a very sour taste in my mouth. I have talked to him about it and in his eyes if it's legal under the law he sees nothing wrong with what he is doing. He spends all his free time with her. And I mean all. Even time he doesn't technically have free. He was supposed to pick me up at work after his therapy appointment on Tuesday, but he went to her house and lied that he was at therapy. I guess he forgot I have him on Life 360. He's already introduced her to all of our family and friends, and most of them do not support him. But he's ready to settle down with her. Now, just a month into their relationship, he's moved her and her four-month-old son into our house. They were in a bad living situation, and I understand that, but he just showed up with them and told me they were gonna live here now. I've never even formally met or talked to them. He asked my maternal grandma if he could bring her with us to visit my mom's family this Thanksgiving, which is doubling as another memorial for her as most of her family lives two states away and couldn't make it to her funeral. He told my grandma he's bringing everything of my mom's with us and dropping it at her place. He wants to start fresh, with no memories of her in the house at all. His parents have talked to him about how fast he's taking this, and how the girl he has chosen is only 16 but he refuses to see the point. He just got into screaming matches with them and told them no one gets to choose how fast he goes. He just acts like this is totally okay. Edit, my dad just got arrested for laying hands on his girlfriend. Apparently they were drinking together and he got too rowdy due to the baby not sleeping and crying. He's facing a lot of charges and asked me to bail him out. That would cost me all my money. I don't know if I should do it. Have you ever made your teacher cry? My ninth grade French class was a war zone to say the least. Ms. Riley was our teacher, and she was notorious in the school for being the most senile, clueless, angry hag in school. What we did in her class was enough for a petition to be signed I swear. The two sides of the classroom were in constant battle with each other, and the middle of the classroom was no man's land. As soon as Ms. Riley turned her head towards the board, with no exaggeration, about 20 crumpled up sheets of paper were sent flying to the other side. The only one to ever get caught was me. You see, I was 6 foot 6 in 6th grade, and by the time I had fully retracted my long ah arm after throwing said sheet, Ms. Riley would turn around and see me in motion. The reason we made her cry was the single most absurd event in the classroom I had ever seen. In one day, this woman had a dictionary lobbed at her head, I flung a chair across the classroom into enemy territory, the 20 students in her class all set alarms on their phones at different times throughout the class, an orange was thrown at her head, someone yelled out F you Ms. Riley, and maybe 60 to 70 pieces of paper thrown across the classroom. Someone also played the Nokia ringtone, which she confused as her own Nokia ringtone and rooted through her bag, only to find her Nokia not ringing and found out that someone had played a prank on her. It was near the end of the class when she broke down when one of the alarms went off. We all felt bad at the moment, there is no denying that, but the next day we went back to throwing stuff in her class. That year the ongoing rumor of her and another senile teacher hooking up was found to be true as well. I cut contact with my best friend because he refused to help his girlfriend after her suicide attempt. I now see why he did it. My best friend's girlfriend has always been a bit of a head case, but she really did love him more than anyone in the entire world. She had BPD and he was her person. One fateful night I was over at hers and we were waiting for him to come over so the three of us could hang. He cancelled at the last minute and she spiraled. She was having very bad mental health already, but on the surface seemed okay in the moment and we agreed to just watch a movie. She went into the bathroom and I did not hear from her for a few minutes but I heard the bath running. I walked over to check on her and I swear I smelled blood. I called out for her but did not get an answer. I called again and again, the smell of blood filling my nostrils. In a state of panic I barged in through the door and saw her in the bathtub attempting to take her life. I called the paramedics immediately and they got there ASAP. I remember holding her hand the whole time, seeing the life in her eyes disappear as I begged for her to stay with us. The paramedics did arrive and I came in the ambulance with her. She was losing consciousness fast. I held her hand and asked her if there was anyone she wanted to contact, and she told me she wanted to speak to her boyfriend. I called him and told him what had happened and where I was at. His response, word for word, not my effing problem. What the f do you expect me to do about it? He hung up the phone. I sat there shell-shocked and tried calling again, only for him not to answer. Breaking this to his girlfriend was hard, and she sobbed, while on the verge of death. Somehow she made it through and lived. Due to this whole experience, I was now her person. She somehow let go of her boyfriend's memory very fast and hyper-focused on me. I was there for her in every way I could, but soon her needs became overwhelming and she became consumed with paranoia. She believed at one point that her mother had hired a hitman to unalive her. She went as far as accusing me of being the hitman her mother had hired. She never had any basis for these claims other than a gut feeling. I moved to a different state for college and she followed me. Babysitting her everywhere became exhausting. Then she tried to take her life again. I caught her on time once again. I let her come stay in my dorm for a little while until she got better, but she never did. We managed to find her an apartment and a roommate and she moved out three months after her second attempt. 
She would call me every night telling her about another crazy theory she had come up with, telling me how she thinks her new roommate is secretly plotting to burn the house down and so on. Eventually I got tired of this and blocked her. However, she knew where I lived and so she started harassing me, showing up at my place randomly, leaving notes at my door and so on. It wasn't until I got a restraining order that she stopped. Six weeks after the restraining order was out in place, she took her life, this time, she finally successfully beat my dad for accusing me of rope. When I was 18 my cousin accused me of roping her. I had moved away to live on my own by this point and had not seen her in about a year. My father called me one day asking to meet up while I was living alone. I went out to meet him at his house and he received me with a slap in the face. My father has never laid hands on me before, this was the first time. I was stunned and asked him why he slapped me, he slapped me again and told me to get out of the house. He told me that his brother had told him that my cousin said that I roped her. My cousin was going through a depressive period in her life and was hurting herself. Her dad found out what she was doing, and she just blamed me for everything. My cousin didn't press charges due to lack of proof but my uncle wanted to lay the smack down on me. My dad was disappointed in me, he laid hands on me again, called me an abuser, insulted me and told me to get out of his house. My mom was always a submissive person with him so she didn't say anything to him. With my lip bleeding, I grabbed my most valuable things and left. I had a rough time for the next few years, and was jumping from job to job to survive. When I was 20 years old, my girlfriend at that time told me that I could work at the KFC where she worked as a delivery order receptionist. The part-time job paid well and with the bonuses you could even earn double or triple my current salary, so I worked there doing the best I could while studying a technical degree in administration. Years passed and I ended up becoming a supervisor and then manager of that store thanks to my technical degree in business administration. At the age of 27 my girlfriend and I got married, it was a small wedding because both she and I are modest with expenses and because I had no family to invite. We currently have a one-year-old son whom I love with all my soul. It was after this that everything went to hell, today in the middle of the afternoon. There was a knock at my door, it was my parents. It had been more than a decade since I had seen them, I was frozen but not with fear, but with anger. My dad asked me if he could come in and I told him no. However he pressured me into talking with him. We went to a nearby park to talk. He told me that my cousin had taken her life and that in her letter she confessed the whole truth, that the person who actually abused her was her uncle and that everything was orchestrated by him. I had no feelings towards what my dad had told me. I didn't feel sorry for her, I told them kindly to go away and never contact me again, that they were dead to me and that I did not care for my cousin. When I stood up from the bench to go home my dad grabbed me by the shoulder, he told me that we have to keep talking, I told him no, he insisted, I told him no, he insisted again, so I turned around and instinctively socked him. I don't know when my dad became so weak, but one first full was enough to break his nose. He stood stunned looking at me with his eyes open and his nose bleeding and my mom was covering her mouth. My next reaction was to throw myself at him, it wasn't difficult to knock him to the ground and I continued wailing on him, when he started to cover his face I started wailing his forehead. It felt liberating, I felt like I was crying while I did it and I continued until my right hand was hurting. My mother stood still, for some reason she didn't do anything. She just stood there watching and crying. When I finally stopped giving my dad the Randy Orton treatment, my mom helped my dad and they took a taxi. She didn't say anything to me, she didn't scream, she just cried and as soon as she grabbed my dad she ran away. If she had tried to intervene maybe she would have gotten the John Cena treatment too. I came home to talk to my wife about it and she stuck up for my dad, saying there was no need to do what I did. I lost it on her too and hospitalized her. Am I wrong for not approving of my Asian mother-in-law walking my daughter to school? Hear me out, I'm not racist but I do have serious doubts about this current situation. I have a rambunctious, out of control but adorable six-year-old daughter Jane. I am white and raised in the south of the, the land of the free, but my wife is Japanese-Canadian. My wife and I have experienced cultural clashes before, such as the time my wife made sushi for us all when my parents were over, and my parents did not appreciate her pushing her culture onto us, we got into an argument about it after they left but I made sure to make them apologize to her. Either way, we have never had an argument like this. Last month, my wife's parents flew to Toronto to visit us. They were overjoyed to see my daughter Jane, and they played with her and spent as much time with her as possible, buying her cool little gifts and creating memories. My parents-in-law spent two weeks in Canada, and we all had a good time. They brought her some Japanese toys and I was okay with this. For context, we live literally right next to Jane's school. So every now and then during her stay, my mother-in-law would walk Jane to school. And each time, my daughter and my mother-in-law would speak to each other in Japanese, and they would bond with each other over this. Which was nice, but to be honest, we live in a somewhat white neighborhood, and I figured that the other children would get weirded out by this old foreign woman speaking some language they don't understand. So one day, I suggested to my mother-in-law that rather than walking my daughter to school, she would assist my wife in doing the morning household chores, and that I'll walk Jane to school each morning. I explained my reasonings for this and we ended up having an argument. Eventually I was able to tell them I was doing this for Jane's sake as I wanted to make sure she does not get picked on in school for this. This convinced them, but they did not. Seemed to be happy about it either way. I walked Jane to school for the rest of their visit and heard no complaints. Anyway, my wife's parents are now back in Korea once again. A few nights ago, I was lying in bed with my wife casually chatting with her, and we started talking about her parents' visit to Toronto and how sweet it was. While we were talking about this, I mentioned that I didn't want to embarrass Jane by having my wife's mother drop her off at school every morning. My wife just froze, and she turned the light on and she asked me if I knew how insulting I sounded. We didn't get into a fight or anything, because Jane was fast asleep, but we had a bitter argument, and my wife grabbed her pillow and went downstairs to sleep. 
Am I wrong for this? I think my boyfriend uses his autism as an excuse to be very creepy towards me. This is my first relationship as I am also autistic but I just cannot comprehend how his behavior is normal. Help me please. My boyfriend and I met five months ago at Comic Con and he caught my eye. We got each other's social media contacts and started talking. We lived very close to each other and bonded over our experience with autism. I fell for him hard and he seemed really sweet at first, sending me flowers all the time, and he even said I love you after two weeks. That's how sweet he was. However, he has started to give me the creeps lately. He found a picture of me on social media from when I used to be goth and has been pressuring me constantly to dye my hair blue again like in the picture. For context, I had my hair blue at the Comic Con we went to as part of my outfit. My boyfriend screenshotted all my pictures and told me he looks at these when he rubs one out during the night. He also wants me to get tattoos and dress like a goth again. He got me to bring all my old goth clothes to his apartment and try them on for him, essentially giving him a fashion show. He kept these clothes and they usually have dry stains when I visit. They're also in different places every time I come over, which tells me he's obviously doing something with them. He shows me offensive provocative pictures of tattooed and alternative women e-girls and only bands creators with tattoos in public asking me what I think of their look and if I change myself to look like them. He has some religious trauma which I am non-judgmental towards but he is always trying to do rope and butt stuff with me, and thinks I'd be into that because I used to be goth. He gets me to show him my old goth pictures and has tried to trick me into syncing my Google photos onto his computer so he can access my pictures. I would never give him any pictures because I already caught him taking a pic of me without my permission and sending them to multiple people, including his family. He also tries to track my location and internet usage and get money from me, but never directly talks to me about anything yet he is always trying to trick me. He used to love bomb me but now treats me like garbage. He's narcissistic, entitled and overall disrespectful. Yet he can be very sweet sometimes too and I truly do see the good side in him. However, I've told him that I don't want tattoos and won't dye my hair and that goth is a music subculture, but he disregards this all the time. He shames my body, my finances, my clothes, where I live, the list goes on. Lately he has been trying to control and shame me for what I eat and also body shamed me for being fat and hairy, I am 5 foot 8 plus 120 pounds. He is classist and calls me poor for being upper middle class and inflates how wealthy he and his family are, yet never pays and expects me to pay for him whenever we go out to dinner, even if he is the one who invited me. His brother shamed me when I met him and made me feel awful. We have problems in our intimacy life as well, he has a hard time crossing the finish line and checks out other women all the time. I tried to end it twice and he started sobbing and telling me how much he needs me, loves me, cares about me, thinks I'm brilliant, etc. practically begging me to stay. Is his behavior normal? I think my boyfriend uses his autism as an excuse to be very creepy towards me. I had a long sit-down talk with myself and went over all of the reasons I should stay and all of the reasons I should leave. His cons outweighed his pros, so I did it. I went ahead and left him. I went to his apartment yesterday and told him in the most adult, respectful way I could possibly manage that I cannot be in a relationship with him. I told him I wasn't being respected and that he was crossing my boundaries, that he was trying to change me, pick on me, and was generally cruel to me. I pretty much told him everything he was doing wrong and by the end of our two and a half hour conversation I was heading into shutdown territory so I had to leave. I'm pretty sure he filmed the interaction, he has a camera in his room and I thought I saw it turn on. Really nothing to see other than me gently informing him I will not tolerate such disrespect, and that I thought he was trying to change me and didn't desire me. Of course, he denied all negative allegations and cried the entire time and was trying to guilt me into staying. I expected this and was prepared. Of course he still thought I was useful to him, but I shut down his claims calmly before leaving. I am still concerned for my safety and privacy. I am worried he will dox me or commit some kind of cybercrime. Highly unlikely as he works for the government and his father, whom he is afraid of, controls him and pays his rent. Additionally worth noting his family name is already stained with sociopathy as his uncle was a low-time serial killer, and there are mainstream news articles covering the crime, so it is highly unlikely he will do anything to me if he wants to get anywhere in life. Especially because he wants to seek further education and advance his career. When I broke up with him, I could see clearly that he has severe communication deficits. I believe this is caused by a combination of the double empathy problem, distractibility and focus issues from ADHD, as well as strong narcissistic traits. I don't think he understood half of what I was saying and the impact of his actions. He apologized profusely and told me he wanted to work on our issues together and that he doesn't want to break up. He then performed a bunch of future faking and false promises to sell me on staying. I refused. I told him I crossed a line and that there is no going back, especially after body shaming. I explained to him that by body shaming someone, it will make them self-conscious and uncomfortable and therefore not want to sleep with someone. That got his attention. I suspect he had an adult film's addiction, that he consumed at a lot of goth adult films and got the wrong idea about me because I fall into some stereotypes targeting nerdy men, think Belle Delphine type stuff. Towards the end of our time together he was focusing solely on my image as well as his and we no longer discussed anything intellectual as we did when we first began seeing each other. 
Our relationship had dissipated into something vapid and meaningless. This was not what I had signed up for. Upon further reflection, I think he really did confuse fantasy for reality and got the wrong idea about me completely, because he never listened to me when I tried to tell him what goth is about. It was startling how very little he knew about me. He told me that doesn't sound like you when I stood up for myself. He asked me did you hear that somewhere? When I told him we were having too many issues very early in the relationship and it just wasn't going to work. It's as if he didn't think I was capable of thinking for myself and had actual thoughts. Or I wasn't going to script, which is a narcissist tendency. I feel so stupid for allowing this to go on for as long as it did, but a weird part of me still feels something for him. Ben, have you ever been abused in a relationship? As a man who is six foot five and used to be in great physical shape, it is hard to imagine I could be abused by my girlfriend. But that is exactly what happened. I met my girlfriend, a five foot three 110 pound girl at a library in college. At first we would regularly see each other in the library, and the next semester she transferred her major, landing herself in one of my classes. I had spoken to her a few times before this and thought she was very cute, so when she ended up in one of my classes I knew it was my chance. I invited her out for lunch one of the days after class and she accepted. The lunch went great and we had a really good connection with each other. A few more lunches later we confessed having feelings for each other and started dating. I thought she was moving too fast at the start of the relationship to be honest. She said I love you three weeks after becoming my girlfriend. Four weeks after becoming my girlfriend she opened up to me about her mental health issues, and specifically about her bipolar disorder. She then told me that her voices go away when she is with me. I felt happy in the moment, and caught up in the act, I told her I loved her. We were doing great for the first few months, but five months in we got into our first argument. During it, she went personal, she insulted my dead mother. For context, my mother and I were very close, she passed away when I was 19 and raised me as a single mother. Her insulting my mother was a very low blow and I warned her if she did that again I will break up with her. She apologized but the seeds of our relationship breaking down were planted. That was five months into our relationship. Six months in she started shaming me for putting on some weight. I had been in great shape the whole time but due to exams I had been slacking off and studying more, ordering more food and putting on a few pounds. She wasted no time telling me how she felt. Seven months in she laid hands. On me for the first time. I was in the kitchen when she barged in, yelling at me telling me that she checked the mileage on my car. It had gone up seven miles when the trip I was supposed to make was only three and a half. She claimed she knew I was cheating and yelled at me to confess to seeing another woman. I told her she is crazy, and she went ham. She laid hands on me. She used her own hands and even swung at me with a rolling pin. I tried to leave her that night but she threatened to take her life. Then these threats became frequent. It was a vicious cycle. She would abuse me either physically or verbally, I would get mad and tell her I am leaving, she would threaten to take her life, I would agree not to leave. One after a particularly bad incident where she cracked a rib of mine with a thick mug, I was determined to leave her. She went through the usual cycle of threatening self-deletion and I told her I did not pay attention. She then sent me videos of her hurting herself. I took her back. I had the courage to leave her one year and when her abuse made me want to take my own life. I realized this was the breaking point. I transferred college and ghosted her with no notice. No breakup text or goodbye, formal or informal. I simply vanished, leaving behind my friends and everything I knew. I never heard from her again. I feel like I am an awful person for my addictions. What can I do to improve? I have a crippling addiction to cheating on every single partner I have ever had including my current one. I know I need therapy and professional help. I'm an intimacy addict with a body count of over 150. I am a serial cheater. I cheated on every boyfriend I've ever had all the way back to middle school when I cheated on my 20-year-old boyfriend. Not only that, but I get off to it. My ultimate fantasy, I'm ashamed to admit, is cheating. I like to think of myself as a good person and a kind person, and someone who has a decent moral compass. But my fantasy turns me into a monster. I literally feel like I'm driven by pure evil. I used to ignore the intrusive thoughts telling me to cheat. I've always known that it's wrong and something I can never do, because I'm better than that. But at some point I gave in and never looked back. It took me a long time to even figure out why this awful behavior turns me on. Why is something that makes me feel guilty and disgusted with myself also the thing that I'm so addicted to? Well it's the idea of someone being so turned on, and having so much desire for me, that they're willing to risk everything to be with me. They know it's wrong, but they can't help themselves. They're giving in to their most primal urges and I'm letting them take what they want. I'm giving in to their animalistic needs. Having that kind of power over a man is intoxicating. It's the best feeling in the world. I want men to break their vows, tell me I shouldn't do this and then do it anyway. I like telling them that it's our little secret. I have been roped before by men who have girlfriends, and I love it. I have a boyfriend right now, who I love and enjoy spending time with. He's sweet and kind and smart and treats me with respect. I would probably marry him if he asked me. We've been dating for about a year now, and I've slept with at least 15 other guys behind his back. Honestly. The main reason I even choose to be in a relationship with him is to use him for my effed up fantasies. I can't cheat if I don't have someone to cheat on. So we go on dates, we cook meals together, we do everything that couples do. Yet I find every possible opportunity to cheat on him. I hook up with his roommate a lot, which is one of my favorite secrets. 
It makes me sick to my stomach to admit all of this. But as soon as the guilt wears off, I'm looking for the next person. Who else can I keep a secret with? He would be devastated, heartbroken and break up with me immediately if he knew what I was doing. But thinking about how he would react if he found out, is another huge source of pleasure for me. I'll degrade, talk crap, and belittle my boyfriend to my secret lovers. The words that come out of my mouth are absolutely vile. I tell them that they're bigger than him, that they make me feel better than he ever could, that he means nothing to me. A lot of guys love hearing me say this stuff. They like being my secret. Not all of the men I sleep with are very attractive. Another fantasy I have is my boyfriend coming home early and catching me in the act and seeing some older, fat ugly man with me. He would see me for what I am, a disgusting liar with zero standards who gives herself away to anyone. But he will never find out. If he finds out and we break up, I'll just go find a new boyfriend to be the object of my game. I love pretending that we're meant to be together. The best is when they start being cute, using emojis, like I can tell they really like me. I want them to feel that way because it feels better to hide things from them. It's pretty much the same sort of game I play when I'm trying to get a married man or take a guy away from his girlfriend. I've done it on Ashley Madison, on Tinder, on Bumble. You would not believe how many guys in committed relationships are using dating apps behind their partner's backs. When I get one, I tell them that their wives and girlfriends are nothing to me. I make them say it too. If I can get a man to degrade his own partner while he's doing me then I feel like I won the game. You're probably wondering by this point if I've ever been caught. Yes, multiple times. I've ruined relationships, been ostracized by friends once the word spread that I had slept with someone's boyfriend. It happens. But even still, I get away with it 99% of the time. You would be shocked how many guys out there will cheat without a second thought. They're so easy to persuade. You can't tell anyone is music to my ears. I don't want to get caught, but the idea of getting caught feels really good. I want someone's sweet innocent wife to find out their husband couldn't help themselves. Unless I get mental help or therapy, I'm going to keep doing this. I don't want to stop doing it. There is no better feeling than letting every single man do it raw. What is your worst experience with religious psychopaths? I got ambushed by a herd of devout Christians and was beat with sticks until I agreed to become one of them. I, 19M, recently spent the night with a young Christian couple. Thankfully, not intimately as they were both very unhygienic. I had no idea they were Christian when I met the two of them. Let me explain the meeting. I work at a gay bar. I'm not gay, but as a poor person who needs to pay rent, I'm not picky when it comes to employment. The couple were my customers. They seemed to enjoy talking to me every time I served them something. The bar was not that busy and I liked them. I was surprised to find out that my assumption was wrong and that the guy was not the gay or bi best friend and that the woman he was with was actually his wife. Both of them made it clear that they were straight. The couple ended up giving me a generous tip and made me promise to come to a party they were hosting at their house the following evening. I was at their house the next night. To be honest, I didn't want to go, but I wanted to avoid an awkward apology if I happened to see them at the bar again. So, there I was, at the party. This was no party. At least not for me. It was a gathering of Christians and it seemed like I was the only random person there. I didn't really know what the F I was part of at first, until the Christian couple introduced all the other people to me as sister and brother. The couple asked me if I believed in the big guy in the sky. I shrugged and said I didn't know, but then said not really. Big mistake. The husband said he owned his own business and credited the big guy for making that possible. Before I could respond, he asked if I would like to work for him instead of working at, and he quoted me on this, a place with posters of peepees on the walls. He literally said my job at the gay bar was sinful and shameful. Not gonna lie, I had no interest in working for him. I know beggars can't. Be choosers, but I didn't feel comfortable working for a guy who shamed another guy for working at a gay bar. I declined his offer as delicately as possible and said office work was not for me, especially in telemarketing. The husband pointed at one of the people in the room, an attractive woman, and said that she also used her body to please others before he showed her another way to earn a living without sin. I said, thanks but no thanks when it seemed like he was waiting for me to provide some kind of response. The couple looked dissatisfied. The wife decided to take control of the conversation and asked me if she and her husband could pray for me. I thought she meant to pray for me as in something she and her husband would do in private while I was off living my life in sin, which is why I was like sure, pray away. However, I soon realized they meant pray for me at that specific moment. And not just them. Everyone. The couple encouraged everybody to gather around and not only pray for my protection at the gay bar against my gay co-workers and customers, but also pray for me to change my mind and accept the job I was offered. Cue people who practically knew nothing about me praying for me out loud. It was bizarre. Everyone was suddenly shouting words at me. I had no idea what to do except to awkwardly stand there and occasionally wipe people's saliva shots off my face. What was even weirder was the fact that everyone finished praying at different times. It all came down to one man who went on and on about random stuff that had nothing to do with me. At the end of the prayer session, I told them I appreciated the prayers, but was absolutely not interested in changing jobs and leaving my life of sin. They got angry. The couple then pulled out a stick. They said this was a stick from Jesus and it is used to make people repent for their sins. Then, with the pressure of dozens of people around me I was made to kneel, and the husband struck my back with the stick seven times, one strike for each one of the seven deadly sins, no Meliodas. 
After receiving my lashes I told them I had to use the bathroom. I then bolted out the door, never to return to said couple. I now see them at the bar sometimes, and avoid them each time. My parents cut my sister a slice of my custom-made birthday cake the night before my party because she cried for it. My 11-year-old sister is the miracle golden child. She was born against all odds and she was a girl, something my mother and father have always wanted. They have never failed to make their favoritism obvious, with her birthday gifts being literally 10 times as expensive and her getting what she asks for all the time. She usually breaks something, either a plate or glass, then blames it on me. She is very clumsy and does not break it on purpose, but when she does, she has realized she can blame me and avoid trouble. Patterns like this are recurring and have made me not like her very much. However, I am older and am assigned to take care of her whenever my parents are at work, which usually comes at the cost of my homework or studying. And then my parents get mad at me if my grades are low. My parents are always trying to please her and make her happy, regardless of how much the stuff she wants costs. They can barely remember my birthday most years, and they are always conveniently broke when mine comes around, even though they bought my sister a literal pony last year and she takes private horse riding lessons. This year I wanted to enjoy my birthday so I babysat for money and even mowed lawns to make this possible. My birthday was today but I'm throwing myself my first ever party tomorrow. I have been planning this for weeks and invited all my friends. I bought the food, snacks and drinks and picked up my custom made cake yesterday with my own money. Today when I got home, I noticed that my cake had a huge slice missing, maybe a quarter of the whole cake. I panicked and asked my dad and he shrugged and nonchalantly said that my sister was crying for it and it was just a small piece, my friends won't even notice. I yelled at him asking him why he would do something like that when it wasn't even bought with his money and that my sister could have. Waited for tomorrow. This made him angry and he went on a tirade about how disrespectful I am and how I think I'm an adult because of my stupid party. I've now locked myself in my room and considered calling the whole thing off. Edit, I went downstairs to confront my parents and saw my sister with the cake on the table eating it, most of it was gone. My parents said nothing. I discovered my wife's affair the day she was admitted into the hospital. Years later she can't accept that I have moved on. If there was ever a prize for the most horrible way to learn of your significant other's affair, I would probably win it and be in its hall of fame. My ex and I met in our mid-twenties, it was through a mutual friend at a barbecue. At first she seemed almost too good to be true, not only was she incredibly beautiful but she was also shy and introverted. It took a while for us to officially date but once it happened I was over the moon, when we first tried to get intimate she suddenly started crying. I freaked out and thought it was something I did, but she apologized the next day and told me she was triggered, as it turns out two years before meeting me she was in a long-term relationship with a guy that roped her. She had a flashback but reassured me it had nothing to do with me so we took things slow as she was still in therapy. It was tough but because I loved her I believed once we got over this it would make our relationship stronger and for a while it honestly appeared that way. Fast forward another year and we'd gotten engaged, I was fortunate enough to be able to buy a house for us courtesy of inheritance from my late uncle. Things were going great and I half seriously suggested we plant a peach tree to signify new beginnings and she was all for it. We were wedded not long after that. Of course we had our normal ups and downs like every married couple but I considered us more lucky because she always made it a point to never go to bed upset with each other. Sometime later life basically happened and I was promoted at my job, it meant more pay but it also meant I would be traveling more for work conferences and business meetings. I noticed my wife had been getting down a lot more and wasn't being as intimate as before, she would keep her phone close to her and even stopped gently addressing things that upset her. I tried to talk to her about it but she assured me that she was fine and this was a phase she was going through and having no reason to not trust her I let it go. She would sometimes go to her sister's place and spend the night telling me she just needed a bit of girl time with her sister. The day I got that fateful phone call was the day she was meant to be keeping her sister company again. I will never forget the sound of my sister-in-law's voice as she kept saying I'm sorry, I'm sorry over and over on the phone while I drove home from a week-long business trip. I was confused and had absolutely no idea what she meant. After I managed to calm her down somewhat, she informed me that my wife was in hospital and that I needed to hurry home. My mind went into overdrive as I tried to get more information as well as not crash while I began speeding to get there faster. The only thing she told me is that it was an assault, then cut the call, and wouldn't answer when I tried to call her again. I remember rushing into the hospital barely breathing and frantically asking about my wife when the world's most understanding and patient police officer sat me down to explain what happened. He told me he was a friend of my sister-in-law and he happened to respond to a domestic disturbance call. He arrived on the scene to find a couple fighting. The supposed boyfriend was on top of the female laying hands on her and she was screaming trying to scratch him, this didn't make any sense to me because 1, this had nothing to do with my wife because we're married and 2, literally everyone who knew my wife knew she wouldn't do that. He gave me a knowing look and placed his hand on my shoulder then told me to be very calm because said girlfriend was actually my wife. If it weren't for the severity of the situation I would have laughed in his face but something in the way he said everything made me believe him, I then was ushered in by a nurse to see my wife and what greeted me to this day I still can. Hardly find the words to describe it. I just stood there for what seemed like an eternity, then a doctor came and explained her injuries to me. The jaw was slightly fractured, the left eye was swollen shut and bruising covering half of the face as well as three broken ribs. Then the doctor dropped another bomb and told me she was pregnant. I still couldn't understand how this happened, then I caught sight of her sister. She at first tried to avoid me but at the persuasion of her police officer friend she told her what she knew, it turns out my wife's ex had gotten in contact with her five months ago. He was doing this redemption pyramid step thing where he would apologize to people he has wronged in order to clear his karma. They began talking more than he convinced her to meet up for coffee and show her he was a changed man. 
obviously old feelings resurfaced, coupled with the fact that he appeared changed now, it soon developed into an emotional affair, my wife approached her sister for advice who told her to take things slow and just get it out of her system if she needed to, which then led to a physical affair three months later. She actually told my wife that she should at least make peace with her ex in whatever form it may be and even offered to cover for my wife once in a while. My sister-in-law was in tears at this point and kept apologizing to me saying that she didn't know about the abuse as my wife never told anyone other than me and her therapist at the time about it. I was numb, I just couldn't feel anything and was absolutely dumbfounded by my wife's actions. When my wife finally woke up I was there and she burst into tears upon seeing me. I spent the following months in zombie flight mode, there was individual counseling for her as well as marriage counseling for us at the strong urging of her family. In counseling she was surprisingly forthcoming about how it happened and how she absolutely hated herself for causing me pain, she mentioned how. At one point on her way home from his place she actually fantasized about driving into the river because she smelt like him and didn't want his scent to corrupt me, she said she the tried to end it but was too weak and only after learning that she was pregnant that it actually woke her up and made her realize that any further contact with this man was toxic to not only her but the unborn child as well, hence she went to end things in person for good when he snapped on her. She became a shell of herself and developed a phobia for any other males but me. At one point she couldn't even use the bathroom at night unless I was holding her hand. After the baby was born we got a paternity test and he was mine, but the more time I spent with her the more I realized I didn't hate my wife, I actually loathed her. I couldn't see the woman I married but instead saw his leftovers each time I looked at her. I decided to leave because I was afraid I'd do something I'd regret and be exactly like her abusive ex. She begged me not to leave and even made the ridiculous offer of giving me a hall pass as well as slapping her if I wanted to, I knew at this point I had to get out. She was actually very generous during the divorce, she moved back into her parents and signed a very well thought out co-parenting plan issued by the courts. Moving forward three years later, I met my now fiancé by chance. I was in a bookstore with a buddy of mine and we were discussing Egyptian mythology when this beautiful woman approached me to correct me on my pronunciations of the Egyptian gods and cities. Needless to say immensely impressed by not only her understanding but also by the fact that she is Egyptian herself. We exchanged numbers which eventually led us to dating. When I finally proposed to her it was actually in front of the peach tree I had planted years ago. I got down on one knee but before I got my answer she ran into the house then came out with a ring as well. Turns out. She was actually planning on proposing herself because she was madly in love with me and she just didn't want any other woman to have me. My son, in all his sweet childlike innocence, told his mother what happened because he was present when it happened. My ex literally showed up that night in the rain yelling about how I could propose to my fiancé in front of our tree and that this isn't the end of us. I am completely exhausted at this point, I cannot go no contact because she is the mother of my child but she is basically harassing me and my fiancé. How do I convince her to move on, to get over her fear of men and not force me to get a restraining order? I discovered my wife's affair the day she was admitted into the hospital. Years later she can't accept that I have moved on. My son's birthday was coming up and he told us that he wanted to have a camp night in my backyard for it. Another request he had was for my ex to sleep over as well. He wanted to imitate a scene from one of his kid adventure shows where both parents are sitting on either end of the child and all three are roasting marshmallows on the campfire. Now I had absolutely no intention of denying my son's birthday wishes but at the same time I couldn't have my ex sleep in the same tent as me and my son, that would be far too disrespectful to my fiancé even though she said she understood, it was clear she wasn't okay with it. My ex seemed to take advantage of this and kept saying how much she was looking forward to spending the night with her two men and even went as far as to buy a whole lot of camping equipment that would put Bear grills to shame. She was certainly trying to rub it in my fiancé's face and wasn't graceful about it either. I had to tell her to stop a couple of times but she only relented when I threatened to invite her sister. Ever since our divorce my ex has had a burning hatred for her sister, she acknowledges her own role in the destruction of our marriage but blames her sister for encouraging the affair and not safeguarding from her making choices that would ruin our life together. It's gotten so bad that she refuses to let her sister spend any significant amount of time with our son which at one point caused my ex-sister-in-law to have severe depression and a suicide attempt. My ex-sister-in-law has been trying for years to reconcile with her sister but it just seems to get worse as time goes on. Anyway, I went out and purchased a multi-room tent so that my fiancé could be included. Of course my ex wasn't too happy about that, but was glad to be under the same roof as me. During the birthday celebration my son was on. Cloud 9, he was as happy as Gordon Ramsay being served a perfect risotto. He ran around the yard and pretended he was a great explorer discovering a new land. He has yet to learn what the explorers did after discovering new land, thankfully. When evening came I made the fire and my ex provided the marshmallows. He excitedly sat between us and started roasting his marshmallow alongside us. What I didn't expect was after we were done taking pictures and making s'mores, he handed my fiancé a stick and a marshmallow as well and sat next to her to make his second s'more. It's honestly a mystery how something this pure and perfect could come out of the absolute mess that was the relationship between me and my ex. My ex asked for a bit of my time to which I obliged. We stepped into the kitchen and she apologized for her behavior on the day that I proposed but not for her actions following that. She told me she still sees me as her husband in her mind so the thought of me giving my heart to another woman terrified her. She said she never wanted to cause me pain and would give anything to go back in time and undo her mistakes. She mentioned how happy she was when the paternity test showed that I was the father because she thought it was a new beginning for us and that there was proof of our love. I thanked her for the courage and told her that I would think about it. I ended up calling her several nights later and booking a hotel room where we spent the night. I have not told my current fiancé of course, but I'm now between a rock and a hard place. When I was 13 my dad threw me into a large river despite my fear of water. I still have not recovered.
my dad has continued being a piece of crap after this and has since gone as far as evicting me from my own home and telling me I deserve to go through the rope I did. This is the story that started my hatred for him. So every year my immediate family would travel to a festival held in a town quite far from us. When I was 13 we went and the entire travel they joked about throwing me in the river as a rite of passage. They knew I had a really bad fear of water and I told them this. However, this discussion persisted. So the entire time we're walking around the festival they're winding me up and making me upset and so I threw a teenager tantrum, as most teens would do in that situation. We kept getting closer and closer to the river and fear set in. This river was quite deep, perhaps 7 feet and I did not know how to swim. I sat down on the stones near the river and let my family continue closer to the river without me because I didn't trust them. I fully believed they were going to throw me in. At the time I had a Blackberry phone and was protective of it because it was the only way I could contact friends outside of school because they all lived far enough away that I couldn't see them outside of school and it was in my pocket. My mom asked for the phone because she didn't want me to drop it on the stones and potentially break it. I threw another tantrum as I didn't want my phone to be taken away. Either way I gave my mom the phone in the end and right at the moment she got it off me she shouted now dad grab her and so he did. He picked me up, ran with me in his arms down to the river and threw me in. I was now in the water. They threw me right in and I had no idea what to do. The panic set in and I started flailing my arms around, trying desperately not to go under. My parents laughed the whole time. I thought this was the end of me. It was actually my sister who recognized I was in serious danger and jumped in herself to pull me to shore. I was traumatized as I was sitting there with my older sister shaking. My parents seemed concerned at this point and walked over to help me. I shouted at them when my mother had the nerve to ask me if she and I could take a picture together as I had just undergone my rite of passage. I also didn't have a spare change of clothes so I had to walk around the festival so head to toe, I just felt as if everyone had their eyes on me. The river was far enough away from the festival so sadly nobody outside the family saw me. We walked around for a good six hours after I had been thrown in and had to travel back home still soaking wet. Every year on my birthday this day gets shared as some sort of fun memory and I don't know if I'm being dramatic but it genuinely upsets me every time this story is shared. CPS workers, what's the worst case you have ever seen? I encountered a case so bad that I left my job for two months to mentally recover. A two-year-old child had been brought to the emergency room by her mother. She was cold and blue and she had a living three-year-old sister. My unit supervisor sent me to start working the case. She also called the region to send us a special investigator. By the time we got the report, police were already questioning the mother. It was my first time witnessing a police interrogation. The mother refused to speak English during the interview and she had her friend translate for us. The mom claimed the child had been jumping on the bed with her sister when she fell off the bed and hit her head on the floor. She was vomiting later in the evening and when the mom checked in on her the next day, the child was in the shadow realm. Super sketchy as preliminary reports showed no head injuries. We went to the house to investigate the scene with the police and the mom and all the furniture and family possessions were gone. The house smelled strongly of bleach. It was the first time I had a close look at the mom and she had bruises on her neck, a huge and fresh bruise under her chin, and her eye was swollen. She claimed she slipped and hit her chin on the kitchen counter. In the following days, we learned the truth. A year prior CPS investigated the family when it came out that mom's boyfriend was mistreating the children. It was physical but the mom covered for the boyfriend routinely. The department required the mom to end her relationship with the boyfriend, which she reluctantly did, and provided therapeutic services for the family. But a few months after CPS left, the boyfriend came back to the home. The night of the kid's death, she pooped her pants while the boyfriend was drunk and was watching a sports game. He got angry and stomped her. He did it so hard it almost split her inner workings in two. The mom was correct in that the child had been vomiting and sick the night before her passing. She spent her last hours on earth passing away in an excruciating way. The mom had waited so long to take the little girl to the hospital because she wanted to give the boyfriend lead time to escape. He ended up going to Mexico, where he was later found, brought back and charged for his crime. Both he and the mom are now in prison. I left my husband the day after our youngest moved out. He says I've deceived him all these years. I know I sound like a bad guy but I did have a valid reason. My husband cheated on me with his girl best friend. The best friend he took on dates, had getaways with, and the one who was always just a friend. It was 10 years ago when I got a call from school saying that our youngest, then 9, was sick and needed to go home. When we arrived I heard them in our bedroom. I panicked and made loud noises to let them know they weren't alone and that our daughter was with me. The first year after that was the hardest on me. I felt so insignificant and inadequate compared to his best friend. We started therapy and my husband promised to do anything to make it work again, except cut his best friend off. I compromised and said to limit contact, something he agreed on. We moved apartments and bought new furniture and I started a new habit of changing the sheets every night before bed. All of this wasn't as effective as that one morning when I woke up and realized that I wasn't in love with my husband anymore. After this realization everything seemed easier moving forward. I saw him as a roommate and a great father raising the children. A good friend. We love our children and we wanted the best for them. For these next 10 years we hardly ever fought and we raised three beautiful, happy and successful young people. When I realized that I didn't love him anymore I also stopped caring what if he did it again. It was one of my nightmares in the beginning. I didn't care anymore as long as I slept in clean sheets every night. Around Christmas, our youngest daughter who is now 19 got her first contract for her own apartment. That's when I knew that I was free. 
I also set in motion my plans of moving out and getting my divorce. I found myself an apartment too and I thought my husband could live in our apartment until we settled everything up. When I told him and handed him the divorce papers. He was in shock and when I moved out the day after my daughter, on April 2nd, he was even more shocked and distraught. Now he is telling me that I have deceived him all these years acting like I was fine when I wasn't, while he lived in regret every day for how he hurt me. I am cold and calculated and I am vindictive. I don't recognize any of these accusations. I don't see things that way. I saw it as me doing the best with what I was dealt to make a happy and content life for our children, our whole family really and I think that I succeeded. What more could anyone ask of me? My evil mother-in-law ended up getting exactly what she wanted. My mother-in-law was a pain in the butt for years, and she finally got her way. Many years ago I met who I thought would end up being my lifelong partner. We dated for a while before he popped the question and even though it had only been six months, everything felt right, and I went ahead with accepting his proposal. At this point, I'd never met his mother and it was mainly due to distance. I met my then-husband while we were both finishing college, some seven hours from his hometown so while we'd spoken briefly on the phone, I hadn't met his mom in person. She seemed nice enough though, but a little fake. After we graduated, we moved together to a large city about an hour from where his parents lived. I started working immediately as a courier which I enjoyed as I never wanted to be stuck in an office and it let me get used to the city layout in the first weeks we lived there. I would be sent out to take documents between legal offices, medical offices, wherever it was necessary and one day one of the deliveries took me into an upscale neighborhood to deliver a packet of paperwork to a lawyer. The delivery was uneventful but leaving the neighborhood I saw a for sale sign and I remember it all so clearly because that was the day I found my dream home. For context, I was orphaned as an infant and left with an extremely large inheritance. My parents, while only in their mid-twenties when they had me, had the forethought to set things up in case anything happened to them and they died when I was only a few years old. They'd inherited a lot of money when their parents died before I was born and had an extremely successful business before a car crash sent them to the shadow realm. To put it simply, I wouldn't have to work a day in my life if I didn't want to. My college was paid for, I had not a single dollar of debt and enough to live on was given to me every month by an auto deposit but at the time most. Of my funds were locked up in trusts until I turned 30 at which point I would receive everything. My fiancé, while aware I had money from my deceased parents, had no idea the amount and I had a long talk with him that same day as I sought to pull some of my trust early to buy the house. He was surprised, not upset, but not expecting it when I showed him the proof. It took a while to get the paperwork done and everything sorted with the lawyer but I secured the money from my trusts and bought the house after two months of us living together. Then his mother declared that she wanted to visit. She hadn't seen her baby boy in almost a year and she wanted to see what kind of life he was leading. We agreed to take care of driving and picking her up to go to dinner in our city. His mom, while pleasant and soft-spoken on the phone, turned out to be a chatterbox when we went to pick her up. She gushed over how pretty I was, that her son had finally found someone acceptable, and that she couldn't wait to see the cute little starter home we'd bought. It was a long ride as she went on and on about the things my fiancé had done growing up, the things she hoped he'd be able to accomplish, the dreams she knew he had. It was a little awkward, I barely got a word in edgewise and my fiancé looked like he wanted the earth to swallow him up but stayed silent as he drove us. Dinner was nice, she was quiet half the time as we were eating, and we made polite conversation at an upscale restaurant. I still remember the surprise on her face when I asked the waiter for the bill, and a comment about how great I was treating him to dinner for a change. I didn't say anything, my fiancé looked ashamed of her for a second, but we quickly moved on and I didn't want to ruffle any feathers on the first night I'm meeting my fiancé's mother in person. It was during this night as well that I noticed something I would never forget about his mother, and that was that she didn't seem to realize I was the main handler of our finances. We left the restaurant and the drive to our house was pleasant. We talked about the surrounding area and she commented on the upscale neighborhoods we started driving through. I'll admit, I took a small amount of satisfaction when she got quiet as he slowed down and pulled up the driveway to our house. Once we got inside and she realized the inside was as nice as the outside, she took a seat at the bar and the conversation started up again. Not really though, since it was mostly her talking and us nodding and listening as she droned on. She made comments about him buying the car, him paying for our vacations in the future, and she even insinuated that he financed our house. I let it slide, I was never one to flaunt my wealth and she I think took that as a sign that she was right, but I didn't correct her. The night ended with her being slightly drunk, telling us stories of when fiancé was a baby and eventually he coaxed her into the car to take her home. By the time he got back I was asleep and while we didn't really talk much about the visit, he apologized for some of her comments and we agreed it would never be a regular thing to have her over. The next few years of her in our lives revolved around, apart from her constant backhanded compliments, her second-guessing every single thing he paid for. Ever. He knew I was private about my finances, he never told her anything apart from that we were handling things as a couple and I didn't really care if she wanted to delude herself, so we let it go. We were going to get married in the summer, three years after we got together, and it was only months before I was to marry that I found out I was infertile. 100% I would never have children and actually had to have my ovaries removed due to them being deformed. He still wanted to be with me, despite also wanting children, so we stayed together. 
One morning I was making breakfast, it was a weekend and he was in the backyard in the garden when his phone pinged a text. It was from his mom and she was asking. When are you getting the prenup? I was shocked to say the least and when I questioned him, he was also visibly surprised that she'd brought one up. We'd not discussed one, I had no intention of ever leaving him as long as he remained the man I fell in love with and he had no money that he knew of that needed protection. He called her, didn't tell her I was in the room and it was like she was an entirely different woman. He wasn't on speakerphone but I could still hear her loudness as she proclaimed I was out for his money. He was barely able to speak as she ranted that he'd bought me a house and cars and given me tons of money to live on and she demanded he protect the family money in case we got divorced. He eventually got her off the phone, shouting over her that our finances were none of her business and he'd handle himself however he saw fit. It didn't stop though, every day for the next week she hounded and harassed him about protecting his future in case I decided to take everything and leave him high and dry. It got even worse when his mother discovered I was barren. I don't even know how she found out as myself and my husband were the only ones who knew, and he never told her. Just out of the blue, she started including in her vitriol rants that I was intentionally making myself infertile so I could keep all the money to myself and not have to share with future children. It hurt, he could see it hurt and I've never seen him so furious with someone. That particular phone call ended with him screaming that he never wanted to hear from her again and her wailing that I was taking him and everything else away from her. Up soon. My evil mother-in-law ended up getting exactly what she wanted. To put it mildly, I was done with her antics and she was uninvited to the wedding. My fiancé explained it to the rest of his family, leaving out any mention of my wealth and they all turned on her for the things she'd said and done. I'd met the rest of his family slowly over the years and they'd all liked me, his mother seeming to be the only one with a problem. When we got married, it was a little over a month after we originally wanted, but we just told everyone we dragged our feet a little on the booking of the venue. His mother did not attend but the rest of his family did and were all happy for us. We spent a few happy years together barely hearing from his mother. As we approached 30 though, I found myself more and more okay with not having children whereas my husband wanted a couple. We got counseling, we talked endlessly and after a heartbreaking few months of towing the line, we amicably decided to divorce. He wanted kids and I didn't, there just wasn't a way to compromise on that. We announced it to his family together, many tears were shed by all, but it was overall probably one of the most peaceful divorces you could ever see. It only took two days for his mother to show up on my doorstep. With the sheriff. While hubby was at work. I was flabbergasted. When I opened the door, I was wide-eyed and had no idea what to do but the sheriff stepped forward and handed me a piece of paper. I have to admit, when I read the bold print at the top while she smugly watched me, I ended up laughing out loud. Like, almost doubled over and laughing so loud the poor officer probably thought I was insane for a second. I looked at her, still laughing as she looked angry and confused and addressed her directly for the first time in almost half a year. Mother-in-law, are you seriously trying to evict me from my own home? That's right, she had handed me an eviction notice. I handed it back to the sheriff asked him to please stay where he is and shut the door before she could respond. I don't know what she said but her wailing could be heard loudly and clearly as I walked through the house to my office. When I went back out, I handed the sheriff the deed to my home and he looked it over while she looked over his shoulder. The sheriff did not look amused as he glanced towards her multiple times. In my county, at the time, you had to have a law enforcement officer sign off that an eviction notice had been delivered in person before you could actually take a tenant to court to fully evict. So basically, Whatever she thought she was doing, what she was actually doing was wasting this guy's time with whatever lies she told to get him here. He hands me back the deed, rips the eviction notice in half and starts questioning why she thinks she can just evict the owner from their own home. You need to get out. Get out of my son's house, she shouted that and other incoherent things at me instead and I rolled my eyes, almost amused still and stepped inside while the sheriff started giving her a talking down. I left the door slightly open, but she didn't try to come in nor did the sheriff as I went ahead and texted my husband to let him know what was happening while going back to my office. When I emerged once more, the sheriff had a look on his face of someone who was absolutely done but I was as well, and I'd already decided to burn this last bridge. See, the real reason our wedding was delayed was because we'd moved the date to see a lawyer. I'm not leaving my house, but I will give you one thing that'll make you happy. I told her as I opened the door and she looked uncertain but didn't want to say too much with an officer of the law standing right next to us. We got that prenup you wanted, do you want to read it? She practically tore the paper she snatched them from my hands so fast and she looked so pleased with herself up until it got to the point of splitting assets. To put it simply, everything attained while already married was split 50-50. Everything from before marriage was to be treated as though we were never married. What the F game are you playing at? She demanded, clearly mad and I decided to hand her the single piece of paper in my other hand. She snatched it too and as she pieced together in her mind what this all meant, she actually went pale. You. She didn't finish the statement. She was shaking. She was speechless. I think she was furious. The sheriff was looking like he wanted to take a nap. I took my papers back, asked the sheriff to escort her off my property, and closed the front door. Apparently, it became the hottest family gossip because not long after texting my husband the cat is out of the bag, he started getting calls from his family while he was still at work. Many begging him to reconsider leaving me, 
many telling him to do what he wants and the majority condemning his mother after getting the full story. His family kept her at bay while we went through with divorce as apparently she was beside herself and believed she was the downfall of our marriage. One of his aunts remarked that she was distraught that she'd made her son give up a fortune. It didn't matter that my money was an inheritance and untouchable to him even without the prenup, she was certain he could use it however he wished as long as we were married. I learned many years after we divorced, when his mother passed away, that she'd had mountains of debt. No one knows why she pushed so hard on that prenup. I stayed friends with my ex and am with someone else for the past few years. We even go out occasionally with ex, his wife and their kids. He's happy, I'm happy. We still hook up sometimes. My ex exposed my dark secret to my fiancé. My fiancé is now acting distant and cold. I asked my fiancé Dan to sit down with me to talk about the videos my ex Steven sent him. I told him that I wanted him to feel safe enough to talk about how he was feeling and that I wanted to explain the relationship I had with Steven. He cut me off to tell me he wanted to lay hands on Steven and I had to calm him down. I started by saying how much I love Dan and our relationship and how I don't think him shutting me out is helping either of us. I said I was wrong to lie about my past and that I should have offered that information when he asked, with an explanation as to why I didn't want to do such acts with him. He then asked why I didn't just tell him this when he asked to spice up our life in the bedroom. I replied that, I thought it would be better, given your insecurities about my experience and your past. I feel like it would have caused resentment on your part because I had done these things before but not with you. You have to understand I did these things when I was younger and wanted validation. He said he would have understood that and if I didn't enjoy it I should have just said so. I said it wouldn't have ended like that and brought up what happened when we first got together. He then replied with. I took two days to talk to my close friends about the relationship and it wasn't the fact you had past partners which caused an issue, it's normal for people to have had exes, I was the outlier for being a V-card owner. My insecurity came from the fact you said for the past eight months you were only looking for casual relationships, and I didn't want that, I wanted an actual relationship. The fact you lied about what you were like in bed makes me feel like crap about myself, it also makes me question how honest you were with me about other things in the relationship. I hugged him and told him I was willing to explore the bedroom with him. He said he didn't want to. How it is now us exploring isn't out of a genuine desire from you, it's the fact you got caught out in a lie and are trying to save face. I started to cry. I went on to say that when he asked for exploration I was taken back a bit. I saw our love as wholesome and pure and that by adding these types of intimate acts, I thought he'd think less of me. He held me tighter and said. Why would I do that? Do you know how happy I would have been if it had you doing the stuff with me? I asked him to go to couples counseling with me and that I'd pay for it. He agreed under one condition, that I give back his ring and we were no longer engaged. I don't think I've ever felt so hurt. He said he still loves me but this hiccup has seriously shaken his trust in me and that he thinks that us being engaged adds a level of pressure to the both of us. I will be going to the police station tomorrow with Dan and we will be filing a report against Stephen for revenge adult films. I'm going to start individual counseling to understand why I did those acts with Stephen and why I froze up and lied when Dan asked me to do the same. I truly love him and want to be able to satisfy him and live out both of our fantasies. I asked him again if he was sure of not doing those things right now and he said if he went through with it he'd feel like another Stephen and once I'm ready he'd love to explore with me. I messaged Monica and asked why Stephen was invited to the party and she said that ever since I broke up with him she's invited both to everything and that it hasn't been an issue before. She then asked if Stephen had tried to contact me and that he's been dumped by his girlfriend. She apologized about all this and she thought everyone got along well at the party. I asked Dan what he and Steve were talking about and he said they were talking about work. Dan works in fintech and makes good money and Stephen had an interest in finance and they were talking about the qualifications Stephen would need to get a job in the field. Dan offered his number and said he could help him with some of the qualifications and get him connected with a few people. This infuriated me even more, Dan isn't a bad person and I knew he would never do anything to belittle or hurt anyone. The fact Stephen did this after Dan offered to help him has confirmed that he really is a piece of crap and he is what's coming to him with the lawsuit. It's going to be a long road but Dan and I have our first counseling session on Monday and I hope we are able to move past this and get married someday. Up soon. Update 2, my ex exposed my dark secret to my fiancé. My fiancé is now acting distant and cold. My ex Stephen had his initial court hearing for revenge adult films today and as far as I know he will be taking a guilty deal. This won't cause him to go to jail but according to my lawyer, he will be placed on the offender's registry for a year. Things are a bit slower with my boyfriend Dan but we are both still going to counseling together and I am still going to an individual counselor. Counseling has made me realize that my past behavior towards intimacy was not healthy. I tied a portion of my self-worth to sex and how my partner viewed me in an intimate light. Through working with my counselor I have now been able to understand that I am able to say no and set firm boundaries. Since counseling Dan and I have been able to go back to some level of normalcy in our relationship. Our intimacy life has been a lot better too. We are able to communicate what we want a lot more effectively and I feel closer now to Dan than I have before. Dan asked about doing more adventurous things in the bedroom and we had a long conversation about my boundaries and I have made it clear that I don't want to do those acts. He was very understanding and we left the conversation there. On Monday he asked if we could sit down and talk. I thought the worst that he was going to break up with me but instead it was some other news. 
he asked if I would consider an open relationship. I initially was very angry and asked if he was cheating on me or was planning to sleep with someone. He handed me his phone and said I knew his password to everything so I can check any time I want. I asked him what brought this on and he said that he has a lot of fantasies that he wants to do in the bedroom. He fully respects that I don't want to be a part of them and that he still loves me but he wants to be able to fulfill these before being married or engaged again. He said that it would go both ways and that if I wanted to sleep with someone else he would be okay with it with a few exceptions. As for ground rules he said no exes or flings. Protection is a must, again this would be obvious and that we are open with each other, that if it gets too much or we have a night where we are going out but the other partner wants us to stay at home we honor that. I am currently on the fence as I don't want to be with anyone else. I am fully satisfied with our relationship and our intimacy life but I know Dan wants to explore more. But on the other hand there is a really cute guy at work I would like to bone. I disrespected my crazy religious husband's views. How do I proceed? My husband has always been quite religious but recently he has delved into the deep end into near psychopathic levels of religion. I, 53F, have been married to my husband Peter, 51M, for 17 years. We have two teenage kids, Joan and Eric. Peter and I have been best friends for the majority of our time together, but things changed. About a year ago, Peter got into a bad car accident. He got hit by a drunk driver, and was in a coma for a month. It was a really rough time for the family, and the kids and I were pretty much constantly by his side when we weren't at work or school. Thankfully, he woke up, and he was able to get back to his life after months of recovery and intense physical therapy. Part of this intense physical therapy provided by me of course. Things started to feel like they were going back to normal, until he became super religious a few weeks ago. He started to believe that God had saved him, started to completely disregard the fact that I and the kids were staying with him during this time and attributed none of the work to the doctors or nurses. He started believing that he needed to use the second chance he was given to spread the gospel. He has latched onto a very conservative type of Christianity, where he believes I am the woman and should submit to him. It is causing a lot of friction between us. Our eldest Eric is currently in his senior year of high school, and is working on the college application process now. Our younger daughter Joan has been watching Eric's college applications and is very interested in pursuing college. The other day, she came to me crying, saying she'd asked her dad what colleges were good for computer science, since she's been very interested in coding for a while now, and her dad said she wouldn't be going to college, since her future job was to be a good housewife and mother, and college would be a waste of money. To say I was furious would be an understatement. I went to him and asked him why he said that. He replied that he was spreading the good word, that women were made to serve the husband and the household, and he wanted to make sure we didn't lead our children into a sinful alternative lifestyle. I asked him if he expected me to quit my job and focus on being a wife and mother too, and he said that he'd wanted to talk to me about this for a while. He said that he wanted me to quit my job, since being an accountant is not suitable for a woman. This absolutely blindsided me, since he'd never expressed anything like this before. I told him that I would not be quitting my job and our daughter would go to college, whether he approved or not. He rolled his eyes, and said I'd come around. It escalated last night. Joan was going to go to the movies with a couple of friends, and she came down wearing a pair of jeans and a crop top. Typical teenager stuff, nothing she hadn't worn before. Peter stopped her, and told her she had to change. She asked why, and he said he wasn't going to let her leave the house looking like a tramp. He also added something about her asking for it by wearing that. I was shocked, he'd never used language like that before. I told her to leave just as she was, and she left. Peter asked if I even cared about our daughter's soul, and I told him it's her body, she could dress herself how she wanted. He said her body is the property of God, not her, and that I needed to respect his religion. I told him I'd never respect a religion that treats women like second-class citizens, then went in on him and his new religious views. He left the house in a huff. When did the class clown go too far? In high school we had a gym teacher who was one year out from retirement. He was a really chill guy who really wanted everyone to have fun and improve their health and fitness, was regarded as the man and many graduates would return just to check in on him and say hey. He always remembered everyone and was just a good dude, took no nonsense but still knew how to have fun and make people feel welcome and included. Well he and his wife were getting up there in age and she began to feel terribly ill. They got it checked out at the hospital and she was diagnosed with breast cancer. He broke this announcement to the school and we all became very supportive. People rallied around him, raised funds, and did everything we could do. But there was this one kid who always had to stir stuff up and do his best to be disruptive, like it was his job. He thought he was some sort of gangster tough guy, when in reality he was more of a Dudley Dursey, entitled, fat and a wimp deep down. During roll call attendance in the beginning of class he said something about the fundraisers to the gym teacher. Understandably, the teacher was not in the mood to have his wife with cancer disrespected. There was a little back and forth between when the kid decides to cross the line. He gets in the gym teacher's face and says really angrily, I hope your wife's womanhood rots off before she dies of your cancer. Needless to say everyone was ready to rush this idiot for this, but before anyone could even shift a foot under themselves, the teacher pops him right in the face. A quick right jab, a powerful one too, the muscle memory of an old boxer. It was glorious, the kid fell on his butt hard, the bigger they are the harder they fall they say. 
before he could even react he was swarmed and pulled far away by the rest of the class, and wailed on by the class too. At first the teacher was suspended and there was talk of him being charged, but literally the entire class testified on his behalf and it was somehow swept under the rug, teacher was able to retire early and Dudley was suspended. He received his suspension after coming back from the hospital due to his two missing teeth he got after the class wailed on him. I found out my family is hiding my fiancé's affair with my best friend. I need to confront them but I fear for my safety. I need some serious advice on how to navigate any of this. I, 25F, found out a week ago that basically my entire family has been helping my fiancé, 25M, hide his affair with my best friend. My current fiancé Alex and I have been together since 11th grade. We have had a few hiccups in our relationship so far but so far we have stood the test of time. That was until a week ago, Alex was taking a shower and had left his phone on our bed. Me and my fiancé have an open phone policy seeing as we both struggled with getting cheated on in past relationships. I was in the middle of packing my suitcase for a family trip that is happening after my rehearsal dinner tomorrow, and I heard his phone going off. He yelled from our shower if I could mute his phone. I went to get his phone and saw that it was Peach, my best friend, calling him. I was curious at first but seeing as she's part of my bridal party, I didn't find it too suspicious. I muted the phone and soon messaged Peach from my own phone. Here is the paraphrase of our conversation, me, hey Peach my fiancé is in the shower what did you need? Peach, oh nothing just wanted to confirm with him the flowers for your bouquet and I'll. Me, that's weird. I didn't change my mind on any flowers or anything. The florist was contacted last month and everything was paid for already by my mom's husband. Peach, are you sure? I remember him telling me you changed your mind? After that it was the usual wedding talk after that point. In hindsight, I should have found it very weird that she would call him about six times to confirm a flower choice when she simply could have either texted me or Alex. When Alex got out of the shower, I told him Peach tried calling him about my flower choices. I asked him what made him think I changed my mind on the flowers for the wedding. He paused for a bit. I now know he was. Basically stalling and doing the oh I'm thinking face when I had asked. He then said that he thought I had mentioned it in passing during dinner. I told him that I didn't recall that. He then just shrugged and grabbed his phone and went back to the bathroom. I hate to be one of those people, but for once, my gut actually sunk. I got this really paranoid feeling and I couldn't shake it. I tried to convince myself that it was just my old cheating trauma trying to creep back. Yet I just couldn't let this go. Me and Alex had dinner and I pushed through all the way until it was time to go to bed. I pretended to fall asleep first. Me and Alex usually cuddled to fall asleep. When I knew he was in a deep enough sleep, I went to check his phone again. I checked his Instagram, Snapchat and messages and I couldn't find anything. I then went to his Facebook Messenger. I only saw his main family and most of the messages were about getting plane tickets to come to the wedding. We were supposed to get married in December with a Winter Wonderland themed wedding. However, with my previous relationships, I checked his archives on Messenger. That's when the horrific truth came to light. There was a group chat with Peach, Alex, my half-brother half-sister and my mom. The group chat was established a year ago where basically Alex and Peach confessed to having an affair to my family. My mom did shame them at first. Yet, she later asked Alex if he truly loved Peach. Because you can't help who you love. He said he was absolutely sure and that he also loved me too. Then Maria and Richard offered that he, being Alex, would bring up to me an open relationship. They both are in open relationships and married and apparently it's working for them in whatever la-la land they live in. At this point, me and him were already engaged. Alex mentioned to them that it seems too far deep to try to bring it up. My mom Angie said that they would cover for Alex and Peach until he felt strong. Enough to bring up an open relationship to me. As I was reading, all I could think was how in the actual F could my family betray me like that? How could Peach betray me like that? We've been friends since kindergarten. We even grew up with Alex. How could she process in her mind to F my fiancé and say that she loves him too? All of this in this disgusting group chat? For Alex to have the nerve to say he loves me as well? For him to know firsthand what it's like to be betrayed like this. I honestly wanted to vomit. However I was just taking screenshot after screenshot. The more I read down, I found out that Peach took my spot on our previous family trip. I got a really bad stomach bug a while ago that caused me not to go. I can't even begin to imagine what they did on the trip. And the fact my mother was okay with all of this, I think is what hurts the most. The fact she's known for a whole year, that my fiancé was cheating on me. That's taking the longest to sit in I feel. There is more in the group chat but these were the major points. I've known for a whole week. It's been eating at me inside and I want to explode and cuss them all out. I want to ruin their lives the way they ruined me. It all hurts so effing much and I just really want advice on how to confront them. One thing about Alex is that he has anger issues. I fear confronting him the most. I found out my family is hiding my fiancé's affair with my best friend. I need to confront them but I fear for my safety. I decided I need to send the screenshots to my fiancé's Alex's parents and explain the whole deal to them. That would be the safest option. I was honestly expecting them to ignore it or not believe me. 
however they called rather quickly. They asked me if I had any hard proof of them cheating besides their confession. I confided in them that I didn't. They asked for more screenshots and I just basically sent them a good chunk of the screenshots. His mother made me feel so awful for sending them. She was sobbing and apologizing for her son. She soon became inconsolable. His father took the phone and asked if there was anything his son could do to make it up to me. I was offended that he asked that. I told him that unless his son could shrivel up and disappear then there wasn't anything really he could say. His father said that he understood. I asked him if they could keep this to themselves until I brought it up to Alex. They said they could and we ended the call. For a while, I thought vomiting from stress was rare, but it finally happened. Alex heard me I guess because he woke up and tried to rub my back. I held my hand up and cleaned myself up. This is around 7 a.m. in the morning. Alex had concern in his voice and was asking if I was okay. For once I actually saw nothing but red. Yet I kept the composure. I have no idea why but I guess that will be my superpower I'll hold on to. I ignored him and just went back to sleep. I woke back up at 8 a.m. to start getting ready for the rehearsal dinner. Alex told me he had to get something done before heading to the restaurant. I told him that was fine and that I'd see him later. Before he left he said he loved me and this was one of the days he was excited for. I said me too. Trying not to have much rage behind it. Once he left, I gathered all the screenshots. I scheduled a text message to be sent out at a certain time. Peach's family, our friend groups, his family as well as mine would get all the screenshots at 1.25 p.m. This would be the halfway point of the dinner and people would be dropping off gifts early for us. I gathered the black hole of stress forming in me and headed to the restaurant when it was time. My mother and her husband were already there. My mother hugged me and all I could do was stand there. To feel her hands on me almost felt like she was personally violating my spirit. I did a quick tap hug so she wouldn't get suspicious and we headed inside. Guests started flowing in and everyone was surprisingly on time. Once everyone was gathered, Alex went on this whole spiel of how he was happy everyone could come and that he was excited for his family for the next dinner. He mentioned how I was the love of his life and how he was so happy our families would mingle and we could be one. I wanted to ask him how dare he say that, but nothing but fake smiles and nods from me. Peach was basically looking like a clueless dog and smiling right along and clapping for us. I could barely eat as the stress was getting to me so badly. At the time I set for the messages. People's phones started buzzing and Alex's and Peach's phones were blowing up. I would like to admit that for once a genuine smile crept on my face. It was like watching an entire kingdom crumble and fall. The horrified faces of Peach and Alex when they looked at me was golden. It's the one highlight I will hold on to from this emotional day. My aunt went ballistic. She started calling my mom a cruel heartless beach over and over. My mother hurriedly checked her phone and saw I sent her the screenshots. She started screaming and becoming irate saying I was really trying to ruin her life again. My grandparents' reaction hurt the most because they started screaming at my mother. My grandmother was trying, with a few of our other guests, to hold my aunt back as she started screaming. Every explicative she could. My grandfather was screaming at my mother that he didn't raise a WH re. At this point everyone is screaming and crying hysterics. My other bridesmaids were cussing Peach out and calling her names. I hate to admit again I took joy in that. My grandfather went on to scream at Alex. I just started laughing and sobbing. I had so many emotions that I genuinely think my body didn't know what to do so it did everything. The tears just kept coming. My cousin escorted me outside as fast as she could with Alex chasing us down. He kept screaming my name and begging to talk. I ignored him and my cousin was pushing him away from her car so she could get in and drive off. She took me to my aunt's house and told me to stay there and not answer the door for anyone. I kinda felt like a kid being left at home alone. I didn't and just sat on the floor. That's when I just started bawling. All the emotions I've kept pent up for a whole week just finally came up. After about another hour my aunt and cousin came back home. They hugged me for like a good five minutes. When we finally broke off, I noticed my aunt had a few scratches on her. I'm assuming they couldn't hold my aunt back from my mom for much longer. My aunt caught me up on everything. Apparently after my cousin drove off with me, Alex came back in and started screaming at Peach for ruining everything. They got into a screaming match and some of our friends were trying to split them apart. My grandparents, aunt, and my mom's husband Tony were drilling into my mother for answers. Tony was the most livid. Apparently, during the family trip I couldn't go to, my mom told Tony that I had offered my ticket to Peach so she could enjoy a nice break for herself. Tony at this point is screaming and reading some of her messages out loud. She was begging him to stop and that she could explain. My aunt started adding on that she better start explaining because all she sees is a worthless mother and vile person. Apparently this set my mother off and she started screaming about how she hated me. About how I ruined her life and made it difficult. How she felt like she could never be happy because I was always a constant reminder of her biggest mistake ever and she regretted not terminating me when she had the chance. That set my aunt off and she basically pounced on her. For context my aunt is infertile. In her words, I was the daughter she never got to have. So in her mind, she went full mama bear mode on my birth giver. To make a long list short, here is everything else that happened, Tony is divorcing my mom. 
He's had suspicions for a few months she's cheating again. Peach exposed Alex's text to her that he was sleeping with her because he felt I was growing distant a while back and that he was lonely and didn't know how to bring it up to me. Peach's father spammed her with calls and will be cutting her off financially. My mother has been on a tirade with our family exclaiming I'm an evil person for destroying her world again. Half-siblings felt it wasn't their place to say anything to me and that I should have expected Alex to look elsewhere because humans aren't monogamous and people love who they love. My aunt offered for me to stay with her until I get out of this jumbled mess. I accepted it seeing as I have no intention of going back to that apartment. However, Alex recently texted me telling me that I will regret doing what I did. I actually fear for my safety. I found out my family is hiding my fiancé's affair with my best friend. I need to confront them but I fear for my safety. Since receiving that threatening message from Alex, things have escalated heavily. I got a call from one of my bridesmaids early in the morning. I answered and she immediately started screaming at me about how I could ignore Peach and Alex in their time of need. At first I was confused seeing as I don't give a damn about them anymore. I asked her to not yell at me, but she continued anyway. She screamed that Peach hurt herself. When she sent me the images of what Peach had done to herself. She then told me Alex tried to take too many meds and take his life that way. His friends found him at my apartment all groggy. They took him to the hospital where he was cleared since they didn't have to pump. They are keeping him on watch for the next 72 hours. After this, my friend group has been split very heavily since I didn't respond to either of them before they did this. I still have no intention of talking to either of them. During the initial confrontation with my egg donor, also known as my mother, her husband Tony found out my egg donor lied to him and said Peach could take my ticket to go with them for the trip. They got home and started arguing more because Tony brought up the suspicions he had about my mother cheating. She started screaming at him and confessing everything. She told him my half-siblings aren't his and a lot of other very hurtful things. He had to call the police on her to escort her off his property as she started to get violent. Tony followed up with me this morning and told me that my mother confessed that I was the product of a long-term affair she had with his best friend. Yet after finding out Tony is getting papers, she has tried to backpedal. She has been calling my aunt begging for her to convince Tony not to do this or else she will be homeless. She has been trying to call Tony and his family, but they all have been. Ignoring her. Yet, this wasn't enough for my egg donor. She knows my aunt's schedule and tried to come over to assault me. My cousin was with me still, so she couldn't get in. But, hearing her scream at me some of my very low insecurities hurt and I started to have a panic attack. My cousin took me upstairs when we heard a loud crash. My mother broke in through the window and ran upstairs and attacked me. I hit my egg donor back. All the anger I had towards her I finally let out. My cousin was struggling to separate us that she had to run to get our neighbor. I only have a few scratches and bite marks but outside of that I am okay. I'm also placing charges against my egg donor. Hopefully I can get a restraining order honestly. My mom ran off before the police came, but I gave them Tony's address just in case she tries going back there. I see that those evil people aren't going to stop until they get a response out of me. However, on the weird side, I got a call from my half-sister. She tried apologizing and I cut her off because I don't want to hear it anymore. She then said that since none of this was her fault, could I could watch my nieces while her and her husband go on a day trip. I love my nieces and nephews, but I told her that she could go F herself. If she wanted me to watch her nieces then she would have to ask through my aunt. She started screaming how I was being unfair to her and punishing her kids. I told her I was punishing her. My aunt and cousin are currently packing up Alex's things and dropping them off at a buddy of his. His name is Kyle and he's been helping me through all of this as well. He dropped me off my favorite fruit this morning to my aunt. He also assured me that I can talk to him anytime. I asked him if he would be in further communication with Alex and he said no. He's just holding on to his things until his parents can pick them up. I really appreciate him. My brother hailed Satan at a Christian church event and my parents did not take it well. I'm not sure how to proceed at my brother's level of immaturity. My little brother, who was 15 at the time, had seen a poster at a gas station. It was an advertisement for a traveling Christian strongman show that would be taking place in a large community church in a nearby town. He badgered me for a week, begging me to give him a ride to this event. We weren't church people so this was quite odd. I tried to get him off of it by explaining that events like this were always basically money grabs by churches where they try to convert the unfortunate souls in the audience who showed up without knowing what they were getting themselves into. He didn't care. He just had to see it. These guys were apparently known for such feats as bending metal rods with their bare hands, lifting absurd amounts of weight, and tearing phone books in half. I thought it sounded dumb, but it seemed like it meant a lot to him, so we loaded up into my little Chevy Cavalier and made the trip into town. He insisted that we leave early so we could get the best possible seats. When we got there, there were only a couple of folks wandering around in front of the church, so we went inside and took our seats in the very front pew. While we waited for the show to start, the muscle guys made small talk with us as the place filled up. The show was pretty much exactly what you'd expect. These older, bodybuilder type of dudes would talk about the power of the Lord, bend a big pipe over their knee, give credit to God for their superhuman strength, ask for donations, rinse and repeat. There came a point in the show where they pulled out a stack of phone books. The biggest of the men laid down a long and rambling prayer, picked up a phone book, and tore it straight in half with relative ease. Impressive. 
he repeated this three or four times. Then he asked for audience volunteers to try to replicate what he just did. My little brother was absolutely giddy. He jumped up out of seat immediately. Me 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 please, pick me. Now, my brother was maybe 120 pounds. He never worked out a day in his life. I grabbed the back of his shirt and tried to get him to sit down, but he was determined. Come on up here little dude in the front, said the muscle-bound ringleader. My brother obliged. Now who here thinks this kid has what it takes to tear this telephone book in half? Obviously the crowd politely laughed. My girlfriend and I exchanged nervous and uncomfortable eye contact for a moment. Let me tell you little guy, there is no way that you're going to be able to do this today, but if you train hard and give yourself to God completely, one day he will make all things possible for you. The man handed my brother a phone book that had to be four inches thick. As he took it in his hands, the crowd laughed again. Almost instantly, my brother held the book over his head, screamed Hail Satan, brought the book down to his chest, and easily tore it in half. The crowd gasped loudly. The muscle monsters just stared at him. He then tossed both halves of the book to the ringleader guy and walked down the aisle of pews and straight out of the church. My girlfriend and I had to have been bright red. I was mortified. The ringleader didn't say a word. He just stared absolute lasers straight into us. We awkwardly stood up, kept our eyes on the ground, and followed my brother out of the church. The building was silent. When we got outside, my brother was standing by my car just laughing his butt off. It's all a big trick. I looked it up on the internet. These guys are bogus. Carrying a phone book in half is super easy if you know the technique. I, like everyone else in that building, did not realize that. He was beaming with pride. I couldn't even scold him because it was a hell of a thing to pull off. It was even more impressive that he managed to keep his intentions to himself and had the cojones to follow through. Unfortunately, someone in that church knew who our parents were. They called them to let them know what we had just done before we even got home. Spoiler, they were effing irate. I got my driving privileges taken away for half of my senior year because of this stunt, and my brother was beat to a pulp. My best friend's abusive entitled ex ghosted her then returned years later demanding that she gives him her house. Alexa and I have been friends for years and live together with my parents who adore her like their own daughter. Alexa came to the US from Latin America at 19 as a student. She also started dating her ex after many years of hanging with each other both during vacations and online. I knew them both since high school and they seemed good together. She tried to convince him to move together a few years before their breakup. He was living with his parents who wanted him to leave. At this point she had already finished college and had a job in the US that granted her a visa. He had quit college and worked part-time. From what I can gather, he didn't want to leave his parents' place because of free food and no rent. So instead she asked me if I wanted to move with her so we could afford a bigger place. I said yes and we moved together, adopted a cat and the dog, and pretty much became Grace and Frankie. Around the start of the vid, things got bad for them. This is what I was told and what I saw. They never talked or hung out or anything. I was in a breakup at that time myself, so I wasn't really on top since I had my own issues, but my friend cried so much. She didn't even get a happy birthday from him. He essentially ghosted her one day out of the blue. No breakup Ted or anything. After a year of no contact, she assumed the relationship was over. She changed all her social media to single, which he could see, took him off her emergency contacts at work and at her doctor's, and just moved on with her life. This year my stepdad's health has gone downhill and my mom needs help caring for him. I put in the idea of all of us living together and I'll care for my dad. Eventually I'll care for my mom too. My mom loved the idea and asked my bestie if she wanted to move with us too so we could all be together and also because at this point, I can't see myself not being in the same house as her. We've come to terms with being single ladies. Heck, we've joked that one of us should adopt and we've become a parent and aunt dynamic. And now the joke is more serious since I'm considering it and she's incredibly supportive. Either way, we found a perfect house. Four bedroom, three bathrooms. Enough space, a yard and everything we need. Since I don't have immediate plans for adopting yet, I have a ton of paperwork and years of planning ahead, we made the extra room into our office and gaming hub. We both work at the same place, totally not on purpose, they were hiring and we both needed visas. And as proud first-time homeowners, we posted pictures. Her ex, who by this point has been MIA for three years, messaged her saying he was so excited to move into the new house. She told him this was her house with me and my parents. He said since they were a couple she should kick me and my parents out so he could move in. I want to point out that my parents paid for a large portion of the house. Alexa obviously told him he was not moving with us and that he ghosted her so there was no relationship. He went on a tirade that he never broke up with her, that she was abandoning him, that she never cared about him, etc. I got ticked off, took the phone from her and told him he could live in a bear cave for all I care, but to leave Alexa in our house alone. He went ballistic and began calling me the F slur as I am by. My friend started crying and I was absolutely done with him. I never thought he was abusive, but my friend confessed to me that this was not new. He always had issues with the two of us living together and accused her often of cheating on him with me. We ended the call, and I told her she needed to block him for her own sanity's sake. She deserves so much better than this manchild. She got me to leave my abusive ex when I was in high school. She took me to the hospital when he laid hands on me up and she called my parents. 
my friend is family. And I'll be dead before I let some stage 5 Peter Pan syndrome Beetlejuice looking dude with commitment issues make her suffer. My toxic cousin copies my entire life. I plan to use this to ruin her. My cousin used to be my best friend. I used to do almost everything with her. I'd visit during the summer and she would visit during the winter. Somewhere after turning 21 we stopped talking due to her boyfriend and I not getting along but we eventually made up after three years and their breakup. It was really ugly and he laid hands on her till she was hospitalized severely. In November of last year my fiancé proposed to me and I was extremely happy and told my family. I also told my cousin and her new boyfriend when they came over for Thanksgiving and she seemed kinda upset. I brushed it off due to me just being excited and she left without saying anything. Three weeks later she told my mom she's getting married and my mom told me. I originally didn't have a problem until she started trying to rush her wedding. Everyone was telling her to slow down but she would just get upset and she spent all this money she can't get back. Eventually she gave up on the wedding and I didn't hear from her for a while. My mom recently told me she's getting married on the exact day me and my fiancé decided on. I asked her what was going on because it felt weird and she said it was nothing. Now growing up, she always tried to one-up me and I always let it go because my mom would always say that we were better off than she was and I really just wanted to spend time with her at the end of the day but it was never enough. My family thinks I'm being ridiculous and is saying she's not trying to outdo me. As a test, I told her I was pregnant and wouldn't you know, two weeks later and she announced she's pregnant. I am just so tired and I don't know what to do because my family is saying to just ignore it and just go to the wedding but I can't. My toxic cousin copies my entire life. I plan to use this to ruin her. My cousin's actions of copying me continued. Her parents spent over 15k on her rushed wedding and she decided to just go to the courthouse instead. She changed her plans last minute after I said I was going to the courthouse myself. Her parents were furious. Not only was it a waste of their money they can't get back, but they also can't come down for the courthouse wedding they're doing. I also asked if they knew about the GoFundMe that she set up asking for donations in case anyone wants to help them celebrate and they said no. Her dad was having none of it and called her to take it down. I'm not sure if it was taken down or not since I have her blocked on all social media now. About me lying about being pregnant, her parents and my parents, and most of my friends, were all in the loop about me lying. Her fiancé kept spam calling and texting me about what kind of things I was buying for my baby and I told him a whole bunch of things. I made an Amazon wish list and sent it to him. He did mention that it was kind of expensive but I kept saying how much I needed these items because they were so cute and that I knew my cousin would love them. Veiled. He ended up buying a lot of stuff. My cousin called me asking to go shopping with me for the babies and that's when I told her that mine was a false positive and how let down I was but that I was happy for her. Her fiancé called me extremely ticked off because there were things he bought that he couldn't return and I should have told him sooner. I asked how that would matter since she is actually pregnant and he hung up. I talked to her mom and she told me that my cousin admitted to faking being pregnant and now her partner is upset with her for lying. My narcissistic father-in-law starved me when I lived with him. My husband was not happy about this. My narcissistic father-in-law starved me when I lived with him. My father-in-law has many narcissistic tendencies. From afar he can come off as charming and even generous. But behind closed doors he can be menacing and manipulative, and he seems to have always had it out for my husband since my mother-in-law married him when my husband was 14. My husband essentially went and lived at a boarding school to escape his stepfather who laid hands on him, didn't speak to his mother for two years, and was essentially on his own from his teens onward. He did go to live with them for a few years when he moved back to the UK, and my husband tells stories of being abused by his stepfather, who would rant and rave at him and demand sums of money from him. He also did a lot of things to make him as uncomfortable as possible in his house, and even admitted to doing it on a few occasions. For example, my husband worked security at nights, and his stepfather refused to move his personal computer out of my husband's bedroom and would go in there all day and type loudly so my husband could not sleep. Many years ago, after my husband and I had gotten married, we were going to be moving back to London. However my husband was finishing his training in Oxford and would not be able to join me for a few months. My in-laws invited me to stay with them. I was initially worried given my husband's experience with his stepfather. But I had never had an issue with him, and he had actually always been nice to me and seemed excited to have me, so I didn't think much of it. But when I arrived it quickly became weird. I was barred from working on the computer in the living room while they were watching TV, but I was full-time trying to apply for jobs and find a flat, so I started sitting upstairs to work on my computer. But my father-in-law didn't like this and accused me of avoiding them, so now I was required to sit with them in the living room if they were in the living room. It was okay, because it gave me time to have nice conversations with my mother-in-law in the evenings. But my father-in-law let me know privately that he didn't appreciate this, and if I wanted to be around in the evenings to not disturb him with my conversations with my mother-in-law. So. I was forced to sit there silently not working on my computer and not talking. Weirdest of all was that I initially wasn't allowed to keep my own food in the house. There are some dietary restrictions in the house, and my father-in-law was triggered by all dairy stuff. My in-laws thought I couldn't follow them. Even when I was allowed to keep my own food, I wasn't allowed to cook if they were cooking or might cook soon. My in-laws had two younger children, 
and my stepfather would make dinner for them before my mother-in-law got home, but he mostly did not invite me to eat with them. My mother-in-law would then get home a couple hours later and make a meal for herself or heat up leftovers from the meal my father-in-law cooked. My father-in-law worked a lot from home so he was there a lot of the time. I would try to make myself dinner earlier to avoid his cooking time, but my stepfather thought that would conflict with him cooking dinner at 5 p.m. It didn't seem like there was an early or late enough time for me to make food. After he was done cooking he wouldn't clean up, and I wasn't allowed to touch the food or clean it up because my mother-in-law might want it, so I couldn't make anything for myself then. Basically, I could only make myself food when he wasn't around, or if I was cooking for all of them which I did a few times. Evenings became fraught. I get really hungry so I took to going out to grab cheap food at the local chip shop so I wouldn't be at home to interfere and awkwardly not be invited to meals. In my mother-in-law's defense, I think she thought I was being fed by my father-in-law, and had no idea all these weird restrictions on my access to food in the kitchen existed. And if my mother-in-law was home, I was typically always invited to meals. So weekends were much less of an issue than weekday evenings. Anyway, one day I was home, hard at work applying for jobs. And I could smell these wonderful food smells coming from the kitchen. My stepfather was cooking something that smelled delicious for my brother and sister-in-law who were, at this time, like eight and six years old respectively. And in a strange twist of luck, my mother-in-law had managed to get off work early and showed up as a surprise to have dinner with the whole family. I'm sitting up in my room, plotting where I might go to get a cheap meal of my own as the food smells were really making my stomach growl, and I figured I wouldn't be invited. But then I heard my mother-in-law call up the stairs that dinner was ready and would I please join them. I was ecstatic. I was being invited to dinner and I was going to get to eat whatever that great smelling food was. I got downstairs and I was thrilled. They had made grilled veggies with potatoes and these delicious looking sausages. My mother-in-law cheerfully asked me, what kind of sausages would you like, the meaty sausages or the vegetarian sausages? I looked at the vegetarian sausages and they were not appetizing looking. They were all shriveled and kinda gray looking, and the meat sausages looked. So good. I'll have a meat sausage please. I was so excited. My mother-in-law was about to give me a sausage when my father-in-law stopped her. And now you need to imagine him talking with your best scouse accent, oi, she can't have those sausages. The meat sausages are for the kids. Mother-in-law, surely she can have at least one. Father-in-law, I made those for the kids and she can't have one. Me, I'll just eat one. There was a plate of at least 15 sausages and I felt like there was plenty to go around. Father-in-law, but what if the kids want seconds? So it was decided that I would eat the veggie sausages. But at least it was food that I didn't have to buy from the chip shop and eat on a park bench on the street so I accepted my fate. That veggie sausage was the worst veggie sausage I have ever had. It was somehow both soggy and dry. It made this squeaking noise as I ate it, but I was hungry so whatever. I should note that my eight and six-year-old brother and sister-in-law were the pickiest eaters I have ever seen. I had up until that point never seen my brother-in-law eat anything other than potatoes bread and cheddar. My sister-in-law I think primarily subsisted on white carbs and candy. I looked over at their plates, and they had eaten the potatoes, but the sausages sat there untouched. My father-in-law noticed that the kids weren't eating their sausages and piped up. Father-in-law, kids you better eat those sausages. Brother-in-law, I don't like them. Sister-in-law, you know we hate sausages papa. An argument ensued with my father-in-law yelling at my brother and sister-in-law to finish their sausages but they refused. And I'm starting to get excited. Maybe this means I can have the sausages. But then my father-in-law stands up in a huff and shouts, what a shame. Why does nobody want these? He went over, grabbed their plates and tossed them and all the other leftover meat sausages in the trash. My husband visited a few weeks later and I told him about this incident. It led to a fist fight between my husband and father-in-law actually, a fight my husband won. My racist sister-in-law keeps insulting me and my culture. I need to make her pay for it. My sister-in-law has always cracked prejudice jokes at my expense but recently she has gone too far. I've been married to my wife for 10 years and we're a mixed race couple, I'm Asian and she's Caucasian. I've gotten along with her family, but I always felt like her father-in-law and specifically sister-in-law Sarah never liked me. For context, I'm a professionally trained chef with 15 years of experience and I work at a high-end Chinese restaurant in a large US city. My crew and I have won several awards and I've been explicitly told I'll be the next executive chef. Sarah is also a professionally trained chef and works at a popular upscale French restaurant in the city. She constantly brags about it and compares herself out loud to Ramsay and Bourdain in complete seriousness. Whenever I'm at my in-law's house and helping out in the kitchen, Sarah is always criticizing everything I do. Whether it's chopping braising or marinating. She always butts in with comments like um I think you should actually do it like this look. I've been patient for my wife's sake and sidestepped those comments, saying things like, thanks but I think I'll stick to the way I do it. Things came to a head two weeks ago when my wife, father and mother-in-law, and I were in her parents' kitchen preparing dinner for my mother-in-law's birthday. We were running a bit behind so things were heat, and that's when Sarah walked in. She took one look at what I was doing, scoffed and said something like oh wow, okay so that's not the right way of doing things. It hit a nerve and I pretty sternly told her to stop criticizing my cooking and that I'm also a chef like her. She laughed and said making some Kung Ching chicken at some rat-infested Chinese restaurant doesn't count. 
The kitchen went silent, father-in-law chuckled, and my mother-in-law yelled Sarah what is wrong with you. I stopped what I was doing, swore at her and called her a racist piece of crap, apologized to my mother-in-law for not being able to stay and left for home with my wife. Apparently this caused a massive fight after we left, with my mother, brother and other sister-in-law taking my side and my father-in-law and Sarah saying it was a joke but kind of true, and that I was being too sensitive. The extended family somehow got wind of this and now everyone is arguing and taking sides, with my wife even getting texts from some of her cousins apologizing for Sarah's behavior. Despite being on my side, my wife is begging me to apologize so that the fighting will stop but I refuse to because F Sarah. I was 24 years old when I went trick-or-treating. Doing this literally saved my life. When I was 24 years old I was battling substance abuse and I was about to be evicted from my apartment because I couldn't pay rent. I had lost my job and no longer had an income. My father passed away from cancer a year prior and that is when my issues began. I began to starve when I was on the brink of eviction. My only nutrition came from free popcorn offered at a grocery store, which was a 30-minute walk away from my apartment. Shortly before I lost my apartment, I came to the realization, I could dress up in a costume, go trick or treating by myself then survive by eating the candy. I didn't have a costume. I was starving, 6 foot 3 and 120 pounds. The fatigue was severe. I came up with the idea to put on a bunch of Ed Hardy clothes. I came up with an alibi, the reason for my costume was because I was the ghost of Ed Hardy, a famous tattoo artist. At this point I was battling withdrawals. Not because I decided to quit, but because I had no money to buy the substances. Then came Halloween night. Imagine a skinny 24-year-old pale and sickly guy, going door-to-door -door asking for candy with a black cloth sack. I looked like a criminal. But I got so much candy. I could not believe the generosity of the people that I interacted with. Complete strangers chilling at home, who were expecting children, filled my bag with candy. Some people looked shocked, others found it funny. I still can't believe I worked up the courage to do that at age 24. I met one particularly old woman who had a heart of gold. She asked me why I was treating at this age and I said it was for my kids, I was lying but too embarrassed to state the real reason. She looked at me like she knew I was lying and asked again, this time I told her the truth. She listened to me and then filled my bag with so much candy. She then told me to wait there and left for her kitchen. She came back a minute later with around six or seven tins of canned food. I teared up when she gave them to me. She gave me her number and told me to call if I ever needed anything. I thanked her and left. After about an hour of trick or treating I returned home to my apartment. The door lock was broken because a crackhead that kicked my door in a few weeks prior. It didn't feel like a safe home because of that, I couldn't lock the door. I proceeded to fill my stomach with as many candy bars that I could. I packed my stomach with chocolate. Due to extreme starvation followed by heavy nourishment, I experienced a very strange but intense euphoria. It felt as though I smoked a large amount of Mama J and had become one with the couch, one of those buzzes where you are the molecules you interact with, that's how good it felt. Lights became dim, my vision shifted to fuzzy, and an incredible sense of peace washed over me. I felt so calm, I ended up blissfully falling asleep in my queen-size bed. The fear of my housing situation melted away and all I felt was tranquility. My boyfriend went 18 months without talking to me. Here is what happened. I realized about 9 months into my relationship with my boyfriend that he never started conversations or made plans. To be honest, I don't even think he made the original first move that began our relationship. When I noticed this I decided to put it to the test. I mean, we spoke every single day, he always answered quickly, and was engaged in the conversation the whole time. But he just never initiated. I wondered if I just never gave him the chance to. Especially since I'm an early riser. So one day I didn't text him first thing in the morning. I figured that he would probably wake up and see that I didn't text him then just message me quickly. Then all of my problems would be solved. I was literally giving myself a migraine from worrying about it. Anyways, I woke up at 7 in the morning like usual, and didn't text him. Typically, he wakes up between 9.30 and 10. So I assumed I would get a text around that time. But 11 eventually rolled around and my phone was as dry as the savannah. I waited another few hours. Still, there was nothing. Then I waited all the way into the night. Finally, I gave up and laid into him a little bit. I wondered why he hadn't texted me at all. But he didn't really have an explanation. He just said that he thought I wanted to be left alone. I wondered why he wouldn't inquire even a little bit about why the person who he spoke to every day for the last nine months suddenly wouldn't text him. But he seemed unbothered. For a few weeks, I just let it slide. But then it started to get to me. I told my friend about it and they suggested that I see how long it takes for him to text me back. I was curious, especially since we just had a conversation about it. So I did it again. But this time I was going to commit to it for as long as I possibly could. Boy did I commit. I didn't hear from him for a day, then a week, then a month. At this point, our relationship was over in my eyes. He couldn't even text his girlfriend. But he could post pics fishing with the boys on a story. Eventually, the holidays came and went. Our first anniversary passed by. I had gotten over him completely. Eventually, it was the 18-month mark of when I decided to not initiate a conversation with him. I felt sad, disappointed and annoyed. It was frustrating that a good relationship had been thrown out of the window. In an effort to make myself feel better, 
I decided to grab some ice cream. I walked into the grocery store and was suddenly face to face with him. He turned to me with a huge smile on his face and came in for a hug. Hey babe, how are you? I haven't seen you in a while. My jaw dropped. I was in complete and utter shock. He just called me babe? Then he began chatting as if nothing ever happened. As if a year hadn't passed since we last spoke to each other. I told my grandma about you, she wants to meet soon. I reached into the freezer and grabbed the ice cream I wanted. Then I left. I couldn't believe what had happened. It's been another year since that happened and I am curious if he thinks we are still together. I think I fell in love with my roommate. I really need help figuring out if she likes me back. On New Year's 2016 I met my roommate through a friend of a friend. We got along pretty well and I admired how confident she was and the fact that she spoke four languages fluently. She told me she thought I was funny and we had a lot in common. We went home and figured we'd probably never see each other again, mainly because this was in California where I was only visiting. I lived in New York. In summer of 2016 while visiting California again, I got invited to a group watch for Stranger Things with the same group of friends. Sure enough, she was there. It was only supposed to be a couple hours long, but a few of us decided to stay and binge because we really liked the show. Her and I were two of those people. She remembered who I was and I was freaking thrilled. It's crazy because I genuinely wasn't into her romantically right away, I just really wanted to spend time with her. We ended up having a great time and exchanged numbers. From then on we were pretty good friends, despite the distance. Our relationship was unique compared to any others I've had right off the bat. It was such a haphazard mix of barely knowing anything about each other while also knowing really deep and personal stuff about each other that no one else knew. I'm sure this was partly because of the long distance, but still I'd say we were pretty close. By the end of 2017 I considered her one of my best friends. In 2019 I got a job and I was allowed the option to relocate. One of the possible locations was a city in SoCal and I took it. Me and her decided to live together and everything got a thousand times better. I can't even describe it but to no one's surprise, we made great roommates. Quarantine affected her job pretty heavily since she worked in fashion. She ended up staying home a lot and I was able to do my job from home. Her family is small and consists of only a few people, and I don't really have any living family left, so this fortunately made the whole vid thing a lot less scary. This led to us spending tons of time together just talking and enjoying each other's presence, even learning some new languages together. Last year she brought up how she'd love to live in different countries for a few years at a time. She asked me how I felt about moving, and I told her I would go anywhere in the world with her if she asked me to. I think we both assumed I said this because I, like her, love experiencing different cultures and languages in different places. But in retrospect I think I was already in love with her. It's coming up on one year we've been living in a different country and it's been refreshing and scary for many reasons. But mainly this has been the hardest year of my life because I'm always so close to her. We don't have many strict physical boundaries, so she'll walk in and use the bathroom while I'm in the shower, she'll lay on me and fall asleep if we're both on the couch cuddling, or even in bed when we cuddle until one of us falls asleep. This has never been a problem and we both completely trust each other. But recently, having realized how I feel, it makes me really nervous. I'm so afraid she can hear my heartbeat when she's near me and it's so embarrassing. She's been making jokes like I've always wanted to dress up my boyfriend, and just jokingly referring to me in that way. I'm so dumbstruck I honestly can't remember if she's always made jokes like that every so often and it only stands out to me now because of how I feel, or if this is new. Last night we were messing around with her extra makeup palettes, yes I let her practice makeup on me. Yes I know, I was doing a terrible job putting makeup on her because I never use it, and she was comparing shades of eyeshadow on me. Our faces were incredibly close and I kept effing up and dropping things and stuttering, which aren't the usual for me. She definitely noticed. I just can't express how completely and over my head I am. I need to tell her. I think I fell in love with my roommate. I really need help figuring out if she likes me back. I came really close to chickening out and not telling her. I got back from work yesterday and tried to act normal, but effed up as my voice cracked when I asked her what she wanted for dinner. She could immediately tell that something was off with me, and like someone who just got caught at the family function baked, I used the excuse of I was just tired. However, I was far from just tired. My body was tingling and my stomach was in knots like I swallowed rope. I kept noticing small things about her that were making me crazy. Even just the way she was standing when I walked in, how she smiled at me, and the French tips on her toes. What she was wearing and how it fit her. Everyday things that were making me lose my effing mind. I knew I wasn't going to be able to sleep without telling her. Basically I just ended up blurting it out. Romantic I know. She was sitting with me and I told her I loved her. She said she loved me too, but we've said that to each other before. So I clarified that no, I meant I am in love with her. She went quiet for a moment and I thought I was gonna effing pass out. You ever see that meme of Spongebob being dehydrated in Sandy's crib, that was me. Everything is a blur after that because she kissed me and I couldn't hold back anymore. The release of everything I've felt for these past few years is effing indescribable. We had intimacy there and then, I was in so deep that King Arthur would struggle to pull me out. I can't believe that telling her took me so long, completely unlike how fast I nut the first time. Either way when I woke up this morning I thought for a split second that I just dreamt everything. But with her next to me, honkers hanging out, I've never felt so relieved in my life. I grabbed one and just rested on it like a pillow. I love her more than anything. Which I already knew, but it feels so different now. I called out. Of work today because I can't pry myself away from her. I'm being extremely cheesy but I literally do not care. 
And yes, the dressing up my boyfriend thing was part of her trying to drop hints. I asked her about it. I'm effing pea brain. The original Karen berated me for taking my father to the hospital and her car was then shoved into a ditch as a result. The year was 1970. I was 11 years old at the time and was going to school 20 miles away. On this particular day I missed my school bus and my dad had work so he could not drive me, so I stayed home and worked on the farm instead. It was springtime and my dad was out in the field harvesting field corn. It was getting close to noon, so I went into the house and started lunch. By 12.30 he isn't in for lunch. This man had a stomach you could set a clock by. I head out towards the field to see why he is late. I see him staggering towards the house like he is drunk. I wasn't alarmed, just wondered what was going on. Why is he walking like that? He is finally a few feet from me and raises his forearms towards me. It took a few seconds to understand the fact his arms no longer had hands on them. He had the presence of mind to have shoved both hands into the bucket of axle grease we had by the machine shed. I ran in the house, grabbed the keys and got him into the truck. I had been driving around the farm and back roads for a couple years now. We set off for the nearest hospital. It is about 30 miles from where we lived. It just so happens there is a river with a drawbridge you have to cross to get into this town. They are in the process of building a higher bridge and getting rid of the drawbridge. So as you can imagine they have moved the original road, narrowed the lanes and all the usual construction stuff. I get about a mile from the bridge and traffic is at a dead stop. The bridge is up for an approaching barge. My dad is in the seat going in and out of consciousness. So I am in our farm truck and pull off the road. I start driving through the construction area to get to the head of the line for bridge traffic. I am honking like an idiot and waving my hand. The workers are yelling but moving aside. One guy pulls his truck across in front of me and jumps out cussing me out. I later found out he was the foreman. I had to stop when he blocked me because of caterpillar tractors on each side. He comes to the door, yanks it open ready to end me. He saw my dad and yanked me from the seat, threw me in the bed of the truck and started screaming on his radio. This man was doing about a dozen things simultaneously. His workers are running ahead of the truck to where the line of cars are. He is on the radio telling the bridge operator to stop the barge, and lower the bridge, not in a minute. Do it now. All this probably took him a minute to two minutes. To me it was only a moment. He drives the truck up to the bridge. Here comes the original Karen. This lady is burned into my memory. She is driving a Cadillac with a huge bleach beehive hairdo, cigarette in her claws, and the ugliest mug face I have ever seen. The construction guys have been telling her to back up and move so they can get the truck onto the bridge. They explain the injured man in the truck. I hear this bleached cow yell she doesn't care, the injured man can wait. She needs to get to her beauty appointment. The foreman tells her he will use a caterpillar to move her if she doesn't move willingly. She refuses stating do you know who my husband is? At that point our truck was about two inches from the side of her car. My dad holds up his hands. She apparently saw the blood, and the fact the hands aren't there. She fainted behind her wheel. The foreman and his guys put her car in neutral and pushed it into a ditch. The foreman drives us to the hospital. He is also on his radio telling whoever he is talking to that he wants the cops there to arrest her and her car towed for putting someone's life in jeopardy. I don't know what all happened to her, I do know this foreman was a force of nature. What happened with my dad was that his sleeve got caught in the gears of the corn picker when he was working on it, without turning it off. Once his right hand went. And he tried to pull it out with his left hand. He ended up spending several months in the hospital and many operations. In the end he lost his right hand completely, lost everything on left hand but his thumb. He lived another 30 years after that. I'm using my girlfriend's private poetry to make a song. I don't see how this is wrong. I hope my girlfriend can realize how dramatic she is acting. To start, my amazing girlfriend is an incredible poet. She's been writing since she was in elementary school and has won state contests and awards. Well, I'm an aspiring rapper and have been rapping since I was 19 so it works out perfectly. I can write good melodies and sing a little as well, but I suck at coming up with lyrics. My girlfriend helped me write a couple songs last summer and my SoundCloud followers love them, I even rap them live too. Recently she moved into my house and as I was helping her unpack her stuff at my place I noticed a really old shoebox. As I started to open it, my girlfriend, for some reason, freaked out and snatched the box from me like a fat woman snatching the last mozzarella stick. I laughed, asking what was so special about it trying to grab it back, and she was acting like she saw a ghost. She got super defensive and told me it was, bad poetry she wrote in middle school that she's only holding on to for sentimental value but she doesn't want anyone to see it. I tried to convince her to let me read it, but it just made her more mad so I dropped it, realizing she was just being immature, being 17 and all that. I couldn't stop being curious though, it was like that shoebox started to taunt me. I eventually waited until she went to work from home on her laptop in the spare bedroom to finally go through all the notebooks of her poetry behind her back. Some of it was really effing cringe, some of the worst I have ever seen, but some of it was seriously just as good as her current writing. So all throughout last week I started working on a new song based on her old poetry without her knowledge. The song turned out awesome, so I posted the SoundCloud link to all my social media accounts and my fans adored it. I showed her the good reception it was getting so she could see how incredible of a teen poet she was, and to my surprise, she flipped the F out. She threatened to take me to court for plagiarism if I didn't take it down right away, which I did, but now she's telling me to take down the other two songs she helped write because she can't look at me right now. All I did was show her how talented she's always been, and now she's messaging all of her friends looking for a couch to crash on. I really love this girl. I don't want her to leave, but I also don't get how I'm in the wrong. The writing is anonymous, my devoted fans believe I wrote it. Why is she acting this way?
My narcissist boyfriend is calling me a cheap WH re because I wouldn't spend thousands of dollars on Halloween decorations. My boyfriend has always been verbally abusive but I put up with it because I was convinced I couldn't find anyone better, now I'm not so sure. I own my house and my boyfriend convinced me to let him move in in January. We had a ton of early money arguments and agreed that we would keep to a household budget. He agreed to pay down his credit card debt. Early after we moved in, my boyfriend told me that as a kid he always wanted to live in one of the houses that were totally decorated for trick or treat and handed out full-size candy for the children as he loves to see their cute little smiles. I took this as a comment and not a plan. When the end of September came, we went to the Halloween store, and he was under the impression we had savings for this. I didn't know. We go over the monthly budget together, and it was never listed. When he found out that there was no Halloween savings, we had a huge argument. He called me cheap, unloving and even disgusting in the store before storming out. He made a comment about stuff like this being the reason for my dad leaving at a young age. Afterwards I talked to friends who all said he had talked about trick or treat extensively and how much it meant to him. I chalked this one up to a misunderstanding on my part. So I came up with $500 of my own money and went to him with an apology. He truly had convinced me that his reaction to the dispute was reasonable at this point. He decided to buy one big piece, an animatronic clown and some lights. It burned through the $500, plus he put a little on his own credit card. He wanted another big piece and was mad I wouldn't put it on my credit card. I asked if he wanted to put up handmade decorations or spider webs but he said it would look cheap. A few weeks later, we had a fight over candy. He was still stuck on buying full-size bars. We easily get over 250. Trick or treaters and I said we just don't have that much money. So we got the bulk bags of good small bars. I also had these little coloring books for the allergy and diabetes kids. Jump forward to Halloween. Early kids show up and he is letting them grab handfuls. I remind him we have a ton of trick or treaters coming, and he got really annoyed. I had ordered a pizza for us. So I get it and go inside for about 10 minutes. By the time I came back out, the trick or treat bowls were empty. He had been dumping a third of a bowl in each kid's bag and had given out all the coloring books to whatever kids came along. He told me that I'd have to go run out and buy more candy on my credit card. I said I wasn't going to do that, and it wasn't my fault he just handed out 20 pounds of candy. He started yelling right there in front of the kids and I told him to come inside. He responded that he wasn't stopping trick or treating even if there was no candy. I told him to have fun with the clown, and went inside. He came in 15 minutes later. Then he demanded that I leave for the night so that he could clear his head. He argued it was fair because I had already eaten and it was my fault that trick or treat was ruined because I'm cheap. He left and went to a friend's house and I guess they spent the rest of the night drinking, handing out trick or treat candy and texting me how awful and cheap I am. My narcissist boyfriend is calling me a cheap WH re because I wouldn't spend thousands of dollars on Halloween decorations. My boyfriend and I met up a few days later as he had spent a few nights at a friend's house. I said that for things to continue, we needed couples counseling and I expected him to set up the whole thing. He was surprisingly open to this and said he would work on it. And that's where things started to unravel. Our mutual friends had been really in his corner, cussing me out. But I found out the story that he had told them was way off from the truth. In his version I prevented any money for Halloween, and had gone cheap on trick-or-treat candy and was only handing it out to children I liked. Once they sort of heard my version, backed up with pics and receipts, support went to me. In fact his friends had been giving him a lot of ribbing about how he acted, which he hated. In the meantime, he had been working on getting us counseling, but found that getting therapy on his insurance meant months-long waiting lists. So instead, he came up with this couple's coach who was religious. Our first meeting was only three days after. One funny thing that came up was that my ex immediately handed over a printout of the household budget, and the coach praised it. But the coach thought my boyfriend was the one who wrote it and that I was failing to follow it. So what followed was this weird thing where my boyfriend wanted all the praise, but also wanted the coach to badmouth the budget because he hated the budget. It took the better part of the first session to explain to him the actual situation, and the coach was weird about the fact that it was the woman in the relationship dictating money, even though he liked the budget itself. The next day, one of our friends found the Reddit post and sent it to my boyfriend. All hell broke loose with him saying that I had betrayed his trust. Our next couple's coaching session was all about that, and honestly. I felt terrible for airing his dirty laundry. The coach and him both crapped on me a ton in this time that I had publicly humiliated my boyfriend. One thing that was seemingly positive at first about the coaching was the coach pointed out that my boyfriend had never had the ability to have holiday traditions because of his upbringing. I genuinely felt bad about this, and rolling into Christmas made a huge attempt to incorporate him into my family's traditions and to ask if there's anything he wanted to do. He responded by crapping all over my family's traditions and his only contribution was to suggest something really extravagant that would have cost a fortune. I swear he only did this just to badmouth me when I said no. This was all bookended by our twice-a-week visits to the couple's coach who I increasingly hated. He would go through super religious prayers and have issues with us living together before marriage. Neither my boyfriend or I responded positively to this. But my boyfriend would get really into it when the coach would talk about more misogynistic men as head of household stuff. 
When I said I'd prefer moving to a regular therapist, my boyfriend said I was undermining his work getting us help. There's a dozen little things that happened in there where I should have broken up. But last week was the real final straw. Ever since my boyfriend found the post I had made on Reddit, he has been obsessed with going through my phone. Because of my career I wouldn't let him. I have a lot of emails and access on my phone that's sensitive information in regards to work. I made a compromise that he could ask who I was texting and I'd show him at any point. This wasn't good enough. I don't know how he got into my phone. But he went through it fully and started raging out that I was keeping things from him. But none of it had any relation to him. Like, I had a group chat where we were planning a wedding shower for a friend. He's only met this friend in passing. He knew I was helping plan it, but was mad that I hadn't let him know every little detail. Specifically, we were surprising the bride by flying in her aunt who she rarely sees. I wasn't contributing to this financially, just knew about it. And somehow my not telling him that specific little thing was keeping secrets? We were still fighting over this when we went to a party with friends. Apparently in digging through my old chats he found where a friend of mine had talked to me in confidence of a tragedy she went through. Only her husband and sisters were really in the knowledge. Later that week we held a little house party where said friend and husband attended. My boyfriend was drunk and started talking about this loudly to her with her husband right there. Her husband told him to shut up and my boyfriend basically got all superior about knowing things and there not being secrets. It was very close to being a fight. I told him not to come back to my house after that, and he seems really shocked we broke up. My narcissist boyfriend is calling me a cheap WH re because I wouldn't spend thousands of dollars on Halloween decorations. My now ex finally came by to pick up his stuff about a week ago. He's hemmed and hawed about this now since he left. Initially he only took the bare essentials, and has drug his feet. I think he thought I'd take him back for the fifth time. When I said this man was a narcissist and emotionally abusive I did not lie. Our relationship has stemmed a total of three years and I have broken up with him four times and taken him back each time. He has destroyed my belongings in a fit of rage, and insulted me on private matters more times than I care to count. These were things that led to our previous breakups. He thought this time was going to be no different and he was going to be able to sweet talk his way into getting me to take him back once again. Finally, he shows up with his best friend, also a waste of oxygen, to get his stuff and try to talk me into trying again. Every single thing he pulls out of the house, he is snidely telling me that I will miss having it, telling me he loves me more than anything and so on. I ended up yelling at him telling him I will not take this kind of manipulation from him again and he seemed to finally understand the message I was putting out. Also, before he moved in I had a fully furnished house. His contributions were either things that only he used, or stuff that I had duplicates of. Except for the clown I bought for Halloween originally. When that finally came up he was angry. He said that he was now living out of his friend's bedroom, and doesn't have room to either store it or to display it at Halloween. So he wanted me to pay him back for it. I pointed out that I had paid for it in the first place. He has this whole alternate scenario where I had given him the money to buy it as a gift, therefore it was his money and I had to repay him. An argument broke out, he stormed out with his stuff, and left the clown. I've sold it for $200, and look forward to visiting it in the proper, long-term Halloween setup. My mom caught my dad having an affair and my dad's 19-year-old lover punched my mom in the face. I'm shook up by this whole situation and I really expected more from my dad. I woke up this morning at 5.30 a.m. to my mom calling me. Her health has been declining recently so I answered thinking I was about to take a trip to the hospital. She's crying and says thank god you answered. Then I got the story. Basically, my mom and stepdad own a bar together. He's always been very abusive, only physically to her a few times, but emotionally and verbally to the whole family consistently. His comments about my sister's weight were the reason she ended up in hospital for anorexia. Anyways, lately my stepdad has been coming home very late. He is known to get drunk while working and sometimes stay the night there. On this particular night, my mom decides to drive to the bar to make sure he's okay. She gets there, sees his truck and goes inside. She walks to the back where there are couches, and sees him lying unclothed with a younger girl with purple hair, tattoos and piercings. Of course, my mom freaks out, calls her names and tells her to get out of the bar. The girl then retaliates by calling her a slur of names, including the N-word, and says this is my bar now beach. And then she proceeds to sock my mom in the face with a ring still on her finger. My stepdad did nothing to defend my mom. My mother ran out crying and went back home. This morning my waste of oxygen stepdad comes back home and all he has to say is that he loves my mom and she was just a F. My mom is in pieces and with a swollen eye, and although I'm furious, I'm still almost grateful it happened. He's cheated maybe over 40 times in the past 12 years, and maybe now that she's finally seen it she will leave. However, she always talks about leaving, but she never does. She has that, hashtag anxious attachment style. I really need to talk to her and convince her to leave. My mom caught my dad having an affair and my dad's 19-year-old lover punched my mom in the face. I got off work a little early today, thanks to the holiday tomorrow. I went home to pick up my mother flowers and some cookies. When I got to her house they were both home, including my younger brother and sister. My mom and stepdad were in their room talking. My younger brother was completely oblivious to the situation, all he knew was that my stepdad didn't come home last night. My younger sister knew everything, and said if my mom didn't leave this time she was moving out and going to live with my dad. 
My mom came out of the bedroom shortly after I got there and told me my stepdad was very apologetic and calm and so was she. But she can't stand him, stand to look at him, understand how he can do what he does. I couldn't stop thinking what does he live for? He's constantly telling her in his FU, you're nothing without me, but in reality his own children don't talk to him anymore, and all he has are the drunks at the bar that only associate with him because he's the owner. We have each other in the futures we're building for ourselves, he's got us. If we're gone then what? I mentioned that to her, and she pushed me to ask him. I felt scared and quite a bit awkward about it, but she really wanted me to ask. She knocked on the door and said I wanted to ask him a question, and he said it was fine. So I asked him, what are you living for? What makes you wake up in the morning and what do you have that makes you happy? He couldn't answer me. He looked at me and said I don't have an answer for you that's a really hard question. The next hour was spent with me mediating a talk between them. I told them why their relationship was failing and what they would need to do if they were willing to fix it. My mom was spilling out her heart to him about how lonely she was and how hurt she is about everything. Instead of apologizing, saying how much he loved. Her, saying what he would put forth to fix it. He fell asleep mid-conversation. I took her outside and told her this time, if she doesn't leave, she's an idiot. He could not wait for her to stop talking about how she felt. He did not care about a single word she was saying. He just wanted her to shut up and it was painfully obvious. She told me she was disgusted, and she doesn't think she can stay this time. We're all pretty confident she will leave and we can't wait to move on. Also, we found out the girl is 19 years old, and was drinking at the bar underage. He'd been picking her up from her house, effing, taking her to the bar, effing after work, and then going to her place some nights too. She's told my mom that she's in love with him and will fight her for him. My mother is unfazed by her and thinks it's sad to be so brainwashed. Edit, my mother has changed her mind again and told me she is willing to stay and try again. God help me. My golden child sister announced my pregnancy when I wanted to keep it a secret. My family took her side. Growing up I was told I was infertile, but 13 weeks ago I got the miracle news of being pregnant. My boyfriend and I were overjoyed. I told my family around 10 weeks in, I am close to them, I have no reason not to trust them. I told them to keep it to themselves because I am still stressed about the pregnancy and want to wait till the 13 week scan to tell my friends. I especially told them not to tell my sister, she is blabbermouth and I am low contact with her. She is also the golden child so she can do no wrong in my parents' eyes. Aside from her, my parents and I have a really good relationship but they are very emotional and happy people who would want to tell the world about it. Today I had lunch with two good friends. I told them I was pregnant and was expecting some congratulations but got some half-hearted applause. One of my friends works with my little sister. She said that my sister blabbered about it at work to everyone who was willing to listen. She made jokes to the co-workers, telling them not to get happy yet because we don't know if this baby will make it. She knows I have had a miscarriage before so this really hurt me. I was so angry because I asked my parents to keep it a secret and I think they should respect my boundaries. I sent an angry text in the family group chat, I expected my sister to say sorry like she always does, then go back to her old ways. Instead, my whole family took her side. I kind of expected this, but it really made me see very clearly how they favor her over me. They said you already told it to us so why does it matter, you already have a lot of nice moments, so this is her moment. We argued about it for a little bit and I had to leave the group chat when my sister refused to apologize and my parents demanded I apologize to her for being unreasonable and blaming her. I was so sad because of their reaction. I don't get how you would think it is okay for someone else to out your pregnancy to a friend and then act like it is not a big deal. My wife cheated on me and my daughter is trying to talk me out of divorce. The reason she gave me broke my heart. I'm seriously considering staying with my wife after my conversation with our daughter. I have recently found out that my wife of 20 years was having a two-year-long affair with an old ex. I was completely hurt over this and have started divorce proceedings. Obviously this has been hard on our four children but I cannot spend the rest of my life with someone I can't trust. For context, before we got married my wife's family had money and demanded I sign a prenup. I had no problem but since then the family money has been lost due to bad investments and lawsuits. My wife was a stay-at-home mother for the majority of our marriage, our youngest child is 19 and because of the prenup she can't get alimony. In short, my wife will be screwed. The only thing we own together was our house and while it is paid off, my wife won't be able to afford the upkeep so she will effectively be homeless. I have no intention of giving her any type of support for any reason however. Since serving my wife divorce papers I have refused direct contact as my lawyer has advised, but she's now playing dirty by getting the children involved. We have two boys, 23 and 21, and two girls, 25 and 19, and my wife has been pleading with them to get me to agree to halt the divorce proceedings in favor of counseling. After I told my children that I had no interest wasting any more of my life with that woman they have all essentially backed off except for my oldest, Christy. She's very close to her mother and can't imagine life where her parents aren't married. Christy tells me that her mother realizes her mistake and will do whatever it takes to make things right. She says that I owed it to the family to work things out. I refused and told her that it wasn't her place to make those kinds of demands. Since then the only time Christy talks to me is when she's sobbing and asking me not to. Destroy the family. I understand that this is hard for her and offered to pay for therapy so she can cope, but she said there wouldn't be anything to cope with if I wasn't trying to divorce her mother. Christy then revealed the real reason. She has stated that my wife has confided in her that she will indeed end herself if I leave. She has started taking too many meds and will go through with it. Christy also added saying that my wife will let me cheat on whoever I want provided I stay with her. 
She went on to say that if I go through with this, and my wife does end up taking her life, she will never speak to me again and will convince the rest of my children to go no contact with me. What should I do? My husband blamed the fact he cheated on my underwear and the fact I'm not fresh. I don't even know how to comprehend this situation. My husband, 41, and I, 32, have been married for a little under two months and have been together for four years. Beside the usual quarrel and disagreements about dull and mundane tasks we were doing good. He never complained about anything. Our intimacy life was amazing and he told me so very often. He even texted me when we're at work all kinds of naughty stuff that made me blush in my office and he helped me go to town on myself in the work bathrooms once over FaceTime. Friday I came home early. I found my husband with another woman, much younger, in our bed. I started literally running away in shock and he couldn't really leave the apartment before putting his clothes on. This was enough time for me to take the elevator alone and leave for my brother's place. My brother and my sister-in-law don't know the full details, just that my husband was cheating. This morning my husband came knocking. He begged me and asked my brother to let him speak to me. My brother asked me if I wanted him to kick my husband out but I told him that now I wasn't in total shock anymore, maybe I should just hear him out. My brother, sister-in-law and my baby nephew left for brunch. My husband looked like he had been crying the whole weekend and wanted to hug me. I told him to stay on his side of the kitchen island and not to come nearer or I would scream. He started first with a half apology and later explained why he was cheating on me. In his words, I never made an effort for him. I'm always wearing hot underwear and never the hot type. That's a turn off for him. He felt like I didn't really care. I was stunned and didn't understand what he meant. Why didn't you tell me this I asked. Why not try to buy lingerie like many men did to their wives? He said he didn't want to offend me by suggesting that my underwear were dull and a turn off. He also stated that he wanted to sleep with some fresh and not me, a woman getting up there in age. I was just in shock. I then asked, so it was basically my fault that you cheated? He didn't say no. Just looked at me crying his eyes out. I tried to remember what the girl was wearing. I couldn't remember because my eyes went blurry the second I saw them. He asked me what I wanted to do. He asked me if I wanted to know more about the woman in my bed, he told me she meant nothing. I interrupted him immediately and told him that I was good. Then I told him to get out and that I needed time to think, even though I already made up my mind on divorce. I just didn't want him to stay longer to try to talk and argue and cry more. He has left now. I don't know what to feel. My husband blamed the fact he cheated on my underwear and the fact I'm not fresh. I have spoken to a lawyer and filed for divorce instead. My husband was so angry about it. He thought I was moving on too fast with everything and without even properly hearing him out. What more does he have to say? He texted me that this couldn't just be it? That he won't kiss me again? The last time he held and kissed me, he didn't know it was going to be the last time or he wouldn't have let go. He's not the only one thinking that I'm moving too fast though. My family is super religious and are very reserved about it, with my father even taking my husband's side. My brother even told me that I was welcomed in his home as long as I wanted so I didn't make any rash decisions, alluding to me filing for divorce. My mother-in-law called me a few times and she apologized and asked how I was doing, but she had ulterior motives too. She is worried about the financial part of the divorce. She asked me whether I thought being married for under two months would make me entitled to my husband's property. I don't know if I can take half when we've been married for such a short period of time. Now to what my husband did yesterday, as I said my husband is very angry with me and yesterday I knew the full extent of it. I received a delivery to my brother's house. A beautiful gift wrapped box. Inside beautiful lace undies. My size. Thank goodness my brother and sister-in-law were out on their usual walk and Sunday brunch because I broke down crying. I cried for two hours straight. After I calmed down I knew that my husband, after coming to his senses, would regret his very petty actions and would start reaching out to me. When my brother came home I told him that I was going to visit my best friend and that he couldn't tell my husband where I was. My brother knew something was wrong because my eyes were still swollen but he respected my wishes that I didn't want to talk about the details. I just told him my husband did something hurtful and that he would try to apologize once he calmed down. I was right because my husband went to my brother's house asking about me because I wasn't picking up or answering him. He called and sent me at least 50 messages. I didn't read any because I had muted my phone. I also called in sick. Today my husband apparently showed up to my workplace hoping he would see me there. I was so close to putting the undies on and blasting Instagram with pictures of me in them. I'm happy I came to my senses and put my phone aside. Edit, I posted the pictures on Instagram. Edit 2, I have now spoken to my husband. He then told me that he knew my ick story was for him. He said he was sorry for what he made me feel. He always thought I was beautiful and it never had anything to do with my undies. He apologized for sending me the lingerie. He said he was angry with me when he did it. He asked me to burn or throw them away because I'm beautiful even wearing a potato sack. I told him that I was going to use them the next time I have intimacy. My cheating husband just confessed to being in love with my sister while I'm pregnant and I don't know if I should tell her. I love my sister very much but I wonder if she deserves to know the truth. 
My sister and I had a crappy life growing up with a passive mother and abusive stepfather. My sister was my protector and role model since no one of the adults were. She tried to shift my stepdad's abuse on her when he got drunk so he wouldn't hurt me. When she left for college she let me stay in her bed while she slept on the floor in her student room on the days I managed to run away from home. When I turned 16 she let me move in with her permanently. We never saw our parents again. My husband is very similar to my sister. They're both very calm and kind and both very intelligent. They have the same sense of humor, love the same music, books movies and games. It's like a weird perverted thing that I found the male version of my sister to fall in love with. They get along very well and that was so important to me because they're my only family. I'm currently 26 weeks pregnant with my husband's child. The only thing with my husband is he has cheated on me before, but I forgave him and took it back, I fully believed in my heart that he had changed. As far as my sister goes, she met her boyfriend a few years ago. He got along very well with me and my husband, although I always felt that my husband never really liked the guy for reasons unknown. When I asked him once why he didn't like him, he got flustered and told me that he didn't know it was noticeable and apologized. He told me he just didn't think he was good enough for her. Her boyfriend proposed to my sister last night. We were just having pizzas and they were having beers on my sister's balcony, and the boyfriend just suddenly went down on his knees and took out a ring. She was very surprised but happy all the same and said yes. When we went back home my husband was a little tipsy. He told me he wasn't tired and that he's going to have one more beer and watch TV and that I should go to bed. I went back to the living area and he was sitting there crying. I asked him what's going on and he told me that he was in love with my sister. He has been for years but that he knew how wrong this was. He told me that loved me very much and promised to be a good husband and father to our daughter. He said he meant it when he said he changed and won't cheat again but he cannot harbor these feelings much longer. He slept on the couch and he's still sleeping now. I'm shocked and full of anxiety. I don't know what to do or how to feel about this. My sister, should I tell her? Nothing can be the same again but she's my only family and my best friend. And my husband. Is this over? I have been so blind now I see everything, of course he's in love with her. How could I be shocked now? Can I save this marriage? My cheating husband just confessed to being in love with my sister while I'm pregnant and I don't know if I should tell her. After my sister's engagement and my husband's confession, he made me a promise that he will love me and that he's going to do all in his power to be a good and loving husband and father. He promised not to act on any of his desires for my sister. He didn't want me to tell my sister anything because he was embarrassed and we slowly started to plan a future together in another city. He was already getting a better job offer in the other city and now he thought it was time to move on and I agreed. I told my sister that we were moving and she was very distraught but she has always didn't object and supported me. I don't know if she felt it was weird that my husband wasn't hanging with us anymore but she never asked. She was probably just busy with her own happiness and the changes in her life. After her vacation she came home and told me everything. She was pregnant and she was glowing, and that was the reason for this sudden engagement. Her fiancé wants to get married before the baby is born. She asked me to keep it a secret because she was waiting for the second trimester to make the announcement. She finally broke down crying about me moving away when she needed me the most but then later apologized for being selfish. She understood that we needed to provide the best life for my daughter including finding better jobs elsewhere. I cried for a whole week. A week ago my husband was in a job interview in the other city and he was going to stay there for the week to sign a lease to a new apartment. My sisters and her boyfriend made the announcement that they were expecting last Tuesday, the day after my husband's interview. Not 30 minutes later my husband called me. He was drunk and he was crying and asking if it was true and if I knew. He called me a cruel liar and a disgusting selfish woman for not telling him. He said it was so unfair. My sister's fiancé was a loser and he didn't deserve her according to him, and he told me he needed to be alone for a while so switched off his phone. On Friday he texted me that he didn't want to be with me anymore and that he didn't want to be in my daughter's life. He said he would not be willing to pay child support either and is willing to go to court to try to avoid it. He told me if I agreed to free him from his responsibilities as a father he would leave me the house. I tried calling him but he had switched off his phone again. I cried all night. Yesterday morning my sister called me to ask what's up. My husband has asked her to meet up with him because he wanted to tell her something that he couldn't say over the phone. He was coming on Monday to see her. She asked me what's going on but I was too tired to tell her anything. She and her fiancé are coming over today and I will probably need to tell her everything now. My cheating husband just confessed to being in love with my sister while I'm pregnant and I don't know if I should tell her. My sister was here and I told her everything. I told her that my husband Lucas was going to call asking to meet her, probably to tell her he loved her and to try to convince her to run away with him. Or maybe something more sinister. He has had problems in the past regarding anger and violence when being rejected, so she needed to stay away from him. Her fiancé was on the edge of his seat with anger. My sister was just crying and apologizing and trying to hug and stroke my hair. I hated her touch. I don't know why I know nothing is her fault. I told my sister that now I warned her I want to be on my own for a while and that I didn't want any contact with any of them. I have been thinking about moving to another city. I texted my husband that I've told my sister everything and that both her and her fiancé aren't happy. 
He called me an hour later. He apologized and told me he didn't mean to freak her out. He just wanted to see her and say goodbye but that he won't bother her if she feels scared. He's still the same man and wouldn't let anything happen to her. He didn't ask about me or my baby. He's staying in the new place and he's starting his new job in September. He thought he would come back to say goodbye before moving to his new city permanently. My sister texted me later that she loved me and that she would stay out of my way if that's what I wanted but to please not go through with my plans to move. Because she needs me and she would do anything to make it up to me. I didn't answer. I hate it when she's so perfect and kind. F off. My cheating husband just confessed to being in love with my sister while I'm pregnant and I don't know if I should tell her. After a lot of talking and discussing our future, my husband and I have decided that getting back together is probably the best thing for all of us. My husband has been going to intensive therapy and we were talking to each other almost every night before the decision to get back together. He told me that he wasn't being himself when he told me that he didn't want me or our baby anymore. He told me that he was under the influence and confessed to hiring a cheap intimacy worker after he told me he did not want a part in mine or our daughter's life. After he went through with the intimacy with the worker, he realized what he had done and came to the conclusion that what he wanted most in life is to be my husband and a father to our daughter. I broke down after he told me this and I found it very hard to forgive him, but I believe we are on the right path to healing from this whole fiasco. My husband, like me, carries a lot of trauma from his childhood. I fully understand him and I believe him when he says that he didn't mean the hurtful things he told me. I also believe he could be a better person with therapy and I believe that he loves me and our baby. Last weekend he came home and we spent the whole weekend together. He was the same loving and caring husband I've fallen for. I love him and I truly believe what I'm seeing now is his true self. He helped me pack my things and we have moved out to our new city and new apartment. I feel butterflies in my stomach like we're newly in love. He starts his new job September 1st so until then he's just mine. As for my sister, I haven't spoken to her since that dinner she had in my house with her fiancé. I was clear that she wasn't allowed to contact me again but I've noticed her the first few days coming by to see that everything was okay, without daring to knock on my door. And I just felt so much. Love hate towards her. She will always be a constant reminder of the pain from the past and the pain her mere existence put me through in regards to my husband. She had a miscarriage earlier this week. As bad as this sounds, I took some sick and twisted joy in it. She will know what it's like to have someone that you love ripped away from you through no fault of your own. I found out about the miscarriage through a mutual friend because my sister has deleted all her media since we last talked. We need to concentrate on our little family now. She's not a part of it. I love her and I don't resent her and maybe in the future we can be sisters again but I don't want anything to do with her right now. I have blocked her and her fiancé's numbers and so did my husband. Please wish me happiness because I finally can see that in my future. My homophobic best friend turned into a bridezilla and ruined our friendship. I'm happy things turned out sour for her. I really can't believe my best friend was a monster all along. She and I have been best friends for over 20 years. We grew up together essentially and she recently got engaged to her boyfriend, who I have met and he is a great man. Once her wedding was announced, she immediately asked me to be a bridesmaid. I happily accepted, but then I saw her list of requirements. She wanted me to wear a feminine dress, specifically pink high heels, and I had to grow my hair to at least bob length. I had to dye my hair blonde. I had to get a tan and I definitely had to use body makeup to cover all my tattoos. This was a gut-wrencher for me. The thing is, I am a lesbian who is also a tomboy. I feel deeply uncomfortable wearing heels and dresses. They create trauma for me as when I first came out as a teenager my father berated me and forced me to wear these clothes, creating awful memories around them. My best friend knows all about this. But hey it's the bride's big day right? I offered to do all except grow my hair as I really liked it short. Apparently, that was not good enough. According to her, I would ruin her photos with my short hair. What started as an argument between me and her evolved into the whole list of guests bombarding me with texts about how what I am doing is unacceptable. Group chats were specifically made to tell me I was being stubborn and it's for one day and I should suck it up. I went back and forth with them for a while but around that time, my mother was diagnosed with a terminal illness. We mutually agreed my mother was my priority and I stepped down from bridesmaid to guest. My best friend asked me what me and my girlfriend would be wearing, I replied that we had tailor-made suits from a wedding last year and they would be perfect. She told me she didn't want everyone staring at the two effing decats in suits and that everyone would be talking about us and taking attention away from her. I was gobsmacked at this request. I told her unless she was telling all the guests what to wear she could f right off. I went to the wedding wearing a suit. It went swimmingly. An absolutely grand affair with no expense spared. I left after the first dance to get home to my kid and was told the next day that at the end of the party the bride was sobbing that I left early and ruined her day. She also texted me to tell me the money I had gifted her was nowhere near the cost of hosting me and was demanding for me to give it back. I laughed at her request. I heard that day after her party she went on a huge rant about this to her husband, who is an avid LGBT supporter. He texted me behind her back asking if the things were true. I confirmed it and told him that his newlywed wife did indeed try force me to bring back old traumatic memories and dictate what we wore. I also mentioned that she called us two effing decas. 
The husband thanked me. A few days later I got a call from my former best friend screaming at me for ruining her marriage. I did not have much energy to talk it out with her. I only said one sentence. You made your bed, now lie in it, then hung up the phone. I felt like a total badass and my girlfriend told me I was. I feel proud of myself. I make $50,000 per year. There is no reason I should be struggling to stay afloat. I'm in my late 20s earning 50 grand a year, should be enough for a comfortable life right? Let's break down where my paychecks go. I get paid once per month. $50,000 divided by 12 is $4,166. That's our base. $1,363 gets deducted for taxes, retirement, insurances and my obligatory Medicare and OASD payments. So my take home each month is $2,803. My rent for a one bedroom apartment is $1,000. Now I'm at $1,803. I pay for groceries, gas, internet and medication, which is on average $1,300. Now I'm at $503. My electricity bill is about $30. Now I'm at $473. I contribute to a Roth IRA in addition to my employer-sponsored retirement fund, and that's $192. I'm at $281 for the month. I also have a loan payment of $160 a month. I'm at $121. I teach exercise classes at a local gym in exchange for a discounted membership, which costs me $50 after the discount. I'm now at $71. I have $71 to my name each month. I don't include car insurance in this because I pay for that six months at a time. If I added that, I would be in the negative every month. This also doesn't include getting an iced coffee every once in a while or buying new clothes when I need them. I don't live outside my means, but I should not be struggling to stay afloat. I also only eat about a meal and a half per day, as that is all I can afford right now. My diet consists of tinned goods mostly as well as plain white rice or pasta, as that is very cheap to buy in bulk. I am so fed up with the government playing their little game and fighting against each other like bullies on a schoolyard instead of actually doing something, literally anything to make the economy more stable. I would love to own a home someday, but it's an unrealistic goal. I should not spend as much time as I do stressed about my finances, nor should I have to have a spouse to make a dual income in order to afford to live. My diploma should be enough for that. I live. In the Midwest, which is why rent is so cheap. I can only imagine the strain on those living in pricier cities like New York or LA. My cheating husband feels he is entitled to me being the mother of his affair child. How he can even demand this is ridiculous to me. I, 23F, and my husband, 44M, have been together for five years and married for two. I met him at the church I started going to when I moved cities to start my career. I work for an insurance company and he was the pastor of this church. I know that we have a notable age gap, but he was always kind to me and made me feel special. Besides his very occasional and brief angry or violent tendencies, our relationship was great. Until a week ago when he came home and told me we needed to talk. He told me through tears that he had been having an affair with one of our community members, 21F, and that she had been pregnant with his twins. She had gone into labor, she and one of the twins died and the other was in the NICU. He said we need to step up and that he wants me to turn my office into a nursery and set up a cot in the room so we can take turns to look after the baby. He told me that being religious he feels it is his duty to make sure his wife follows a good path and does not turn away when faced with hardship. He says he is willing to step up and father the child, and fully expects me to do the same. I became distressed and told him I wanted some time to think as this all hit me harder than Eminem hit Kim back in the day. Before I even had time to think he kept talking. He told me that I had made a vow to him in marriage and that God had blessed us with a child. That this is our cross to bear and that God will never give us something we cannot handle. I told him that it seemed God had given her more than she could handle because she had died. He slapped me for this statement and told me that I needed to serve my husband. He stated that God had chosen me as this child's mother and I needed to be his humble servant. I just feel so strange. Yesterday I cried so hard I threw up. This woman died, yet I feel bad for myself. I feel so. Ugly. I feel like I have truly seen my husband and he no longer looks kind, he looks his age and very tired. I want to abandon him and the child. My cheating husband feels he is entitled to me being the mother of his affair child. I knew I had to leave but I was very much worried for my safety, especially since he assaulted me previously. Therefore, I didn't leave right away. It just wasn't that easy. I stayed for two months. For a while his words caught up to me and I wanted to make it work. I went to marriage counseling with my husband, but it was ultimately fruitless. Of course it was Christian counseling as he insisted, I felt like their goal was for me to forgive him rather than actually trying to help me. I was so utterly alone during that time. My parents and brother are also very religious so even though they weren't happy with my husband, they kept urging me to do what a good Christian wife would do and told me to obey him. I spent so much time suffering in my own head that I began to realize that I was just going through the motions, doing what I thought people expected of me. I entered a state of derealization for a time, and that was an absolute mind f. The feeling of nothing being real, not even myself. During this period my husband brought his baby home and while he tried to split the cares 50-50 at first, he ultimately didn't trust me to look after the baby because I was lost in space. So he ended up being the primary provider. When I was with the baby, all I could think about was how its existence ruined my life, 
it'd look at me with big blue eyes and I would just wish it would disappear. I would actively spend time resenting the baby, there was a time when I was thinking to myself and I wished it would fall on its head or be catapulted into space. That was when I knew that I needed to leave. I was blaming a baby and wishing ill upon it, and that was not okay to do. I don't remember much about this time besides that, it's mostly a blur otherwise. I sought services through my work to talk to a therapist, and I eventually came back to earth, she helped me make a plan. On a night. He had long Bible study I packed my essentials and dipped. I met him pretty quickly after college so I did not have much to take as far as furnishings. I fit everything I wanted in three suitcases, and four moving boxes. It all fit into my SUV after some mediocre Tetris skills. I was able to change my phone number online before I left, but I did leave the divorce papers under his pillow with my lawyer's contact info. Kind of like the tooth fairy but for adults a-holes. He contacted my lawyer and left some very aggressive messages to me, something that will be used to my advantage according to my lawyer. I think my autistic boyfriend violated me. I know what I need to do to get my revenge. I have been processing this for a few days and really need help. For context, my boyfriend is autistic and he got diagnosed last year. He lives on his own and he has not disclosed this information to his family, as they are overall very nasty people who have openly stated they would resent a child if he or she came out neurodivergent. My boyfriend has confided in me about his autism and it is manageable. Sometimes he fails to understand social cues or emotions, but in general it never impacted the quality of our life. However, last Friday night we were doing the deed. He was already going way harder with the Dom role than he ever has. He was saying how he should swipe Tinder while I was giving him brain and then he started watching adult films, loudly complaining that the girl in the video was so much hotter than me. He was being kinda rough and already put me off by putting his toes in my face which he knows I hate with a passion, but I was in a subspace at that time so I couldn't really protest as much as I wanted to. Later he was behind me and decided he wanted to enter through my back door. I told him twice I wasn't ready and that I didn't want to as I have never done that before. I know you need to prep before and I told him this. He didn't listen and told me that he would have whatever he wanted and proceeded to enter my back door. Thankfully he is three and a half inches max so it was not too painful. However, I kept trying to wiggle away subconsciously but he kept getting mad and yanking me back. When we were showering after he made a rope joke at me which I kinda laughed off at the time, but now I am feeling like it was more an admission of guilt on his end. To make it worse, he invited me over at 8 p.m. so I assumed I was going to stay the night but at 1.30 he told me that he couldn't sleep with someone else in the bed, so he kicked me out in 5 degree weather in his city where. The buses had already stopped running for the night so I had to call an expensive cab back to my city, and I bought him takeout because he is too broke to even go halves. I'm thinking of informing his family of what he did. I know what he did was wrong but I can't help but feel guilty if I do tell on him. His family would disown him I am sure of that. On top of that, I fear for my own safety if he finds out that I am the one who told them. My parents abused me horrifically throughout my entire life. They are suing me for $75,000 for speaking out. Life is hell right now. I am a survivor of all forms of abuse at the hands of my parents. My life was made awful from as young as I can remember. My earliest memory is of my father shaking me before he threw me across my bedroom. My mother worked hard to gaslight anything I said growing up in order to maintain the functional facade they portrayed to the public. They look like wealthy, entitled, white Americans. I used to fall asleep sobbing for my grandmother, who knew what was going on in the home but never interfered. I was left to rot despite pleas for help. I was punished and isolated for trying to speak out or seek help. My parents would take away the books I was reading, or my sketchbooks, and force me to sit for days, weeks without stimuli. I was never allowed to keep any records within the home. My mother found my diary once when I was in high school and forced me to sit in the middle of the dining room while my father, mother, and sister took turns reading passages out loud and screaming at me. If my dad went on an unprovoked rage and broke our belongings or artwork, threw us around, or had a tantrum, my mother would rage at us for not being better. Once, my youngest sister spent hours in a bush at night during the polar vortex without proper clothing because she was too afraid to go home after my father lost his temper. My mother refused to call the police to look for her because she didn't want my dad to get a record. I was never allowed to use the phone or computer in the home without supervision and had no privacy, even as a teenager. My parents picked all of my class schedules in high school and kept me from getting a job so I had no money to apply to any colleges. They forced me to attend a specialized engineering college they picked at the threat of financial abandonment, and I begrudgingly completed the degree my father had failed to earn. Himself. I have almost no detailed memories from this period of my life or beforehand, it's all just a vague fog. They actively tried to keep me from going to medical school and I had to petition for independence from them citing horrific abuse to continue my education. Myself and my two sisters all have very severe, undiagnosed eating disorders because my parents didn't believe in mental health care. We were never allowed to see doctors growing up unless we were sick for weeks or severely ill. Instead, my parents would wait to hear my sisters vomiting in the bathroom and would barge in and humiliate them while they were in the shower or on the toilet, screaming that they were hurting the family with their choices. My parents do not allow my sisters to contact me. Last time I saw my youngest sister, she was 5 feet 4 inches and weighed 90 pounds. 
My father had numerous affairs with naive, impressionable women who were closer to me in age than my mother. Usually they were his employees. He and my mother still tried to tell my sisters and I that if they ever got divorced, it was our fault because we were so exhausting and bad. I remember a handful of times when I mentioned emancipation or running away. I was locked away in isolation for two weeks because of even mentioning it. I decided to cease contact in November of 2019. Everything was good for a while. I changed my name, I moved state and as far as they were aware, I had disappeared. I was finally starting to live life without the fear of being unalived every day. But they found me. They effing found me and have the audacity to sue me. They are suing me for $75,000 and they are attempting to permanently silence me about my childhood through the civil courts. Their lawsuit is based on a single Facebook post. A video linked to Dr. Romani's page regarding narcissistic abuse by parents which they found on my private Facebook page. This post was five days away from being past the statute of limitations when they happened to stalk my profile. Using someone else's Facebook and saw it. My parents' lawyer is a well-known alt-right lawyer. They attempted to sue me during my final year of veterinary medical school, hoping to bankrupt me during the most rigorous point in my studies. They have dragged my younger siblings who are still reliant on them for survival into the mess to testify against me, despite the level of evidence I have against them. My father calls me crazy in his legal documents against me and my mother attempts to blame me for everything wrong in her and my siblings' life. She blames me for my minor sibling having a bad high school experience when my father had an affair with his employee and got forced out of his job, so they had to relocate my sibling to another high school across the state apparently that is my fault. My affidavit is of 50 pages of detailed remembered traumas at their hands with drawings, texts, and other evidence included. My parents abused me horrifically throughout my entire life. They are suing me for $75,000 for speaking out. No one, including my lawyer, seems to understand how terrifying it is to be threatened with being legally silenced or being pressured to sign an agreement that says I can never countersue them for my pain and the abuse they are still perpetuating against me. I am terrified I will not be able to seek therapeutic or medical care because, if my rich parents win the effed up pay to win civil court case, I will lose my right to even disclose my history to anyone around me in speech or writing, including medical and therapy professionals. I basically have to shoulder the tens of thousands of dollars associated with going to court if I am going to have a hope at ensuring the same freedom of speech you enjoy. I have thought about opening a GoFundMe for the lethal case but I am terrified I am not allowed to or that I will get in trouble for it. I reached out to Dr. Romani, and got no response. I reached out to some big profile rope lawyers, and got no response. You have to be rich to receive any legal care in this country. I was being quoted 712 k as a retainer for an average lawyer plus $150 to 400 in hourly fees. I can't afford that. I am on Medicaid and living on student loans. My lawyer is working with me financially but he has clearly never worked a case like this with a victim like myself before and I am terrified what that will mean during trial. I can't even talk to my partner about the case right now and I tried to ask my lawyer if getting married would change that, and he acts like I am being silly or overdramatic. He doesn't understand my partner is my only support system and that by isolating me from him, my parents are continuing to control me like they did when I was a child. I am afraid to ask my lawyer at what point I should just go to the media because he doesn't understand my fear. After dwelling on it for a while, I decided I needed to get any physical proof left on my body from what they did to me on paper. I completely booked myself solid with back-to-back -back doctor's appointments in the two weeks after I finished school. I decided I needed to get all my chronic pelvic issues diagnosed and in a medical chart before the civil case. This was not an easy feat. I have severe anxiety and terror around doctor's offices that stem from my childhood. Firstly, my parents would lock me in my room without stimuli for weeks so being shut in a sterile room waiting for any doctor is its own kind of special hell for me. Secondly, because of my history of intimate trauma, I have had severe panic attacks and difficulty verbalizing the pain and the symptoms I have been struggling with, especially when a practitioner is trying to put something into me. Historically, I've struggled with such severe pelvic floor muscles tightening, that I have had difficulty even receiving pelvic exams. Additionally, I had been taken to my parents' doctors growing up, and they invalidated and terrified me at every opportunity when I did manage to speak up, my mother's gynecologist didn't care about any of the symptoms I tried to bring up to her for example, when I begged her to help me about my butt pain, she scoffed at me and told me to stop having so much backdoor intimacy, which shocked and silenced me because at the time I believed myself to be a V-card owner, not remembering that my butt pain was due to my father roping me. I made an appointment with a urologist who was a survivor herself. That made a huge difference for me. She talked to me before the exam and was very clear about what she was doing during the exam, which greatly relieved my anxiety. I explained how I have had to manually remove stool from my vault for as long as I can remember. I described how I can feel stool herniate into my womanhood and I have to put a finger in order to even pass it. I described how I constantly relive the terror and the severe pain. I hyperventilate during intimacy and historically, partners have struggled to even get inside me because my body shuts down in a rigid way. I described how I had urinary pain as a child and my mother just blamed the soap she was using on me. My grandparents described me holding my womanhood in pain for weeks before I saw a doctor. I have these pediatric records. I described how I can't, to this day, 
properly empty my bladder and how I have such poor urine flow, where it barely trickles out. I describe how I had a memory of my father biting my pink bean so hard that I lived my teenage life honestly thinking I was born without one. She diagnosed me with severe pelvic floor dysfunction that is also causing bowel and urinary dysfunction. She said it is something they see in survivors, you get stuck in rigid fear and basically never come out. She has referred me to a pelvic floor physical therapist and I am planning on attending despite my anxiety about it. I also went to my primary care office and told them I was suspicious of ephemeral hernia because of the chronic, throbbing pain I have had in my lower right quadrant for as long as I can remember. My doctor was skeptical, but sent me for an ultrasound where they found a mild tear. My mother also had a similar hernia, but it appeared after she had three children. I have never been pregnant and I attribute the hernia to my father repeatedly stepping on me when I was little. I am being referred to a general surgeon to discuss getting it repaired. I hope all my hard work makes a difference. I am scared and tired of feeling trapped. Update 2, my parents abused me horrifically throughout my entire life. They are suing me for $75,000 for speaking out. Last summer, my estranged and abusive parents decided to attempt to sue me through civil court for 75k on six counts for a post on my private Facebook page, a link to a Dr. Romani video. I managed to find legal help and have been guided through this nonsense by someone who understands the legal system. My lawyer has been a godsend and I wish all lawyers were as upstanding as he is. The first part of any civil case is the discovery period. I had to present my stacks of evidence to my lawyer. My parents have no evidence, so they presented personal statements that were violently bitter and hateful. In these personal statements, my parents demand the courts permanently silence me as to protect their reputation and now feel as though they are entitled to 75k from me due to their emotional pain. My younger sisters, one of whom is still a minor living in their home, also wrote personal statements against me. I was initially devastated by these statements but have since grown angry. My lawyer feels I have a very strong case against all of them because of the sheer amount of evidence I have collected throughout my lifetime and all the text messages between me and my sisters that detail abuse. My affidavit is a painfully detailed list of the intimate, physical, and emotional things I have experienced by them throughout my life with associated pictures, journal entries, school work, and dated drawings as proof. Apparently, 98-99% to of civil cases settle before trial, because of the exponential costs associated with taking someone to court. Usually, the plaintiffs and defense will be encouraged by the courts to come to some sort of mediation agreement before trial ever occurs. I told my lawyer I had no intentions of mediation. As far as I am concerned, I am being further abused by the people who made my life a living hell and I owe them absolutely nothing. I am not going to go back and forth with them on whether I owe them 75k or 25k or $1. Since I was not interested in mediation, my lawyer recommended moving forward with case evaluation. Case evaluation is when a group of three unassociated lawyers, case evaluators, read over the presented evidence from both sides. One lawyer argues the plaintiff's, my parents, side, another lawyer argues the defense's, mine, side, and the third remains neutral. My lawyer and my parents' lawyer also attended this hearing. The three case evaluators then take all the information provided and predict how the dispute will play out if actually taken to court. They will then offer a value amount for what they think the case is actually worth. This value is then reported as an offer to the plaintiffs and defense. If both parties agree to the offer, the matter is considered settled out of court and neither party admits any guilt to the other's claims. If one or both parties decline the offer, then the case proceeds to further mediation or trial. My parents were demanding I pay them 75k and that the courts permanently silence me. The case evaluators came back with the recommendation that my parents' case is worth 1k. This means that if my parents and I both accept, I pay them 1k and the matter is settled before they can drag me through the emotional turmoil and financial devastation of civil court. If either myself or my parents reject this offer, we will likely be asked to further mediate or a court date will be set. I initially found myself torn on what to do. Officially, I have decided to accept the 1k settlement because I am living on student loans and Medicaid right now and can't afford to go to trial. Honestly, paying them a single cent makes me want to vomit blood though. I do not think I owe them 1k. I understand that the case evaluators basically took my side, compared to what my parents were trying to demand, but the thought that they still somehow think I owe them 1k after reading. Through all my testimony makes me nauseous. I guess here is where the upbeat portion comes in. No matter what, I now firmly believe that my parents are effed. They dug themselves a hole and now they get to lay in it. If they agree to the 1k, my lawyer is certain that they are taking a huge financial hit as their lawyer fees alone are likely exponential and that they will in no way make any money on this whole endeavor. If both of us accept the 1k offer, I would save tens of thousands of dollars in legal fees by not going to trial and the emotional devastation of all this will finally end. If they reject the 1k offer, I will refuse any further mediation. Again. I will not negotiate with them. It will be up to the jury what I owe my parents and I would hope to God they ruled zero dollars based on the amount of evidence I have and my credibility as a doctor. We have a month to make a decision on whether to accept or reject. Update 3, my parents abused me horrifically throughout my entire life. They are suing me for $75,000 for speaking out. 
I continued meeting with my lawyer, who was receiving regular notices from my parents' lawyer that he should expect an injunction to be filed against me within the week. This injunction would attempt to silence me permanently. I began contacting witnesses and preparing for trial. Seemingly out of the blue, my parents' lawyer basically sent an agreement that the case would be closed if I paid the 1k agreed upon during case evaluation or I agreed to sign the initial settlement agreement that silenced me and kept me from countersuing in the future. It was sent via email with a heavily implied threat of another case against me for all their legal fees if I was ever caught defaming them again. Meanwhile, an amazingly kind person who is a lawyer in a different state reached out to me after somehow finding my Reddit posts. They offered to reach out on my behalf to try to get some more information for me and were able to connect me to a well-recommended lawyer in my state. I met with the lawyer. She had read through my information and evidence before our meeting, and was horrified by my situation. She was worried about the constitutionality of it all and asked if she could ask around a bit for me, but I kind of doubt I will hear back. She discussed my options, I could certainly make a criminal report, but that would require me to sit down with the police, who would then reach out to my parents to get their side of things and they would almost certainly sue me again. She said if I chose to make a criminal report, I would likely be dealing with a legal fallout for the foreseeable future as they will try to say I am furthering defaming them. She warned me that it would be he said, she said on the stand if I chose to go ahead with charges. She warned me that justice was rarely served when this much time had passed, but at the very least, making a report would allow me to tell my story. She said in my state, defamation cases are being used to further silence victims who have made criminal reports. Her best advice long term was to leave the state and move somewhere with anti-slap laws and protective laws for victims. She had recommended I reach out to the ACLU because my case may have implications for society at large. I don't know if I want to keep trying. At this point, I do not think I want to make a criminal report. My bones are tired. I sat down with my original lawyer today and he is certain they will re-sue soon. I am trying to be optimistic. He showed me the most recent email from my parents' lawyer, who said they were going to send me to debt collection next week for the 1k settlement. It's not even the first time my parents have sent me to collections. I made a GoFundMe for my legal fees and their 1k and posted it on my Facebook profile, begging others not to share it publicly because if my parents see it they will sue me again. I am doubtful I will get much help given that most of my friends are very recent college graduates. I just found out that my boyfriend is into Lolican. I'm scared to confront him. I just found out my boyfriend is into Lolis. We both have a shared interest in anime, but I always noticed that the female characters he liked had a cutesy, innocent charm to them. They had big honkers and butts so I chalked it up to slightly off-putting, but because they were adults it was fine. Last night he let me look at his Instagram with him on my chest. There was so much adult films of small girl characters. Like actual kitties. It made me nauseous, especially when he was smiling and joking about oh now you know I'm a creep. When he realized I was uncomfortable was when he admitted it was gross and weird, but he didn't see anything wrong with it. We had a long, tense conversation about it, but he still didn't see why it was a big deal since it's just drawings. When I asked why he liked it, he said it's about the innocence of youth, the purity, the contradiction. He assured me that this didn't extend to real life since he has a 10-year-old little sister and smaller nieces, and he condemns that kind of thing and people in the lolly community who are like that. I then told him that I was a victim as a kid so hearing him explain why he liked looking at them being violated made me exceptionally nauseous, and he got really quiet, but didn't have a response to it. He said he would delete everything and not look at Lolly again because he values me over Jack material, and doesn't want to make me uncomfortable. But he still believes there's nothing wrong with it. I think he made it clear that he would continue on if I didn't ask him to stop. Or even if he broke up. I feel defeated in trying to change his mind because he's so rooted in the opinion that liking Lollican is harmless. I agreed to continue with the relationship if he did delete everything and never looked at it again, but I'm still so torn. He's genuinely the best guy I've been with and we're perfect for each other. It's just shaken me that someone so caring and attentive and genuine is into something so vile. Edit, we met at the restaurant and it was awkward and tense. I was so nervous that I decided to talk to him in the car because I didn't want to be face to face. I unloaded everything that was wrong with Lolican, how I personally felt, how it was objectively bad, how he was aligning himself with creeps even if he felt he wasn't one how his reasoning was a direct quote at the child lover textbook, that I was concerned with where he was headed, etc. I laid it all out. I expected pushback but he was genuinely appalled by hearing all this. Apparently it was the first time he considered this perspective, he genuinely believed that fiction didn't affect reality. He said he always knew it was gross and taboo, but he didn't realize it was affecting his well-being and making him that way. I think he almost cried but it was hard to tell in the dark. He did say he was burning with shame and I could tell he was being genuine. I had broken through. He told me that hearing a loved one say it really broke it down for him. He's done with Lolican for good, not just for me, but because he's mortified at how deep he was and how effed up it actually is. I ended up forgiving him because of all of this. We will try recover from this together. My boyfriend gave me a pros and cons list about myself for our anniversary. Sometimes male audacity astounds me. So I met my boyfriend on Tinder in the beginning of my freshman year of college. 
I was a very naive 18-year-old while he was an experienced and mature 25-year-old. Despite his age, he was a junior and a brother in a notoriously filthy frat. He told me to come to his frat's party, so I went with some girls I'd met at orientation. There he took me upstairs and we made out, but I think he could tell I was very inexperienced so nothing more happened. I pretty much fell in love with him after he told me he was okay with just kissing as I was not comfortable doing much more. I didn't see him until a couple of weeks later when he invited me to a party he was throwing. I was expecting us to at least hook up, but when we got there he was clearly with another girl, and there were tons of other random girls who I assume he was also hooking up with. I was naive but not an idiot, so I forced myself to get over it, and I didn't see him until my spring semester, when I drank too much and he ended up at my dorm when I invited him and I lost my V-card to him. I didn't see him again until the fall semester of my sophomore year. We hooked up the first week we were back on campus. I didn't catch feelings again though, until we started to hook up regularly every week. At that point I was again pretty much in love with him, although this time I did have reasons beyond just him being a large, attractive popular man. We weren't dating, but we got to know each other and I saw his virtues, which seemed acceptable. Looking back, being 25 banging an 18-year-old isn't a good virtue, but I digress. However, it was still clear to me that he wasn't into me in that way, and that I was one of a number of women he was sleeping with, so I didn't say anything and I kept it casual. He also had a pretty terrible reputation as a F-boy, even amongst his frat brothers. His Instagram comments were usually filled with them saying things like most active man alive and all 2,500 of his followers are his girlfriends. He graduated at the end of that spring semester, and we saw each other one last time before. It was incredibly intimate and really cemented everything I felt for him. So, after we both left campus, I confessed to him that I really liked him, and that I wasn't okay with just hooking up with him anymore, for my own sanity. Miraculously he said he also had feelings for me, and he asked me out on a real date. We started dating and have been together since, and the whole time has been healthy and happy for us. Last Thursday was our one-year anniversary of becoming official. He got me an incredibly thoughtful gift basket, including some jewelry, a painting, and a card. In the card though was a printed picture of a pros and cons list on a whiteboard. Here's a paraphrase of the list, pros, cute, great butt, good in bed, a trini, likes me a lot, sweet, lots of friends, doesn't go out, close to her family, really smart and academically successful, good future ahead of her and definitely not a gold digger, would do wifey duties and make me dinner after work. Cons, kind of a SLT, met on Tinder, frat rat, blacks out a lot when she does go out, doesn't care a lot about her appearance, kind of nerdy. Based on that he apparently decided to ask me out to dinner and then decide what to do based on how it went, and it went well enough that we started dating. He showed it to me with nothing but good intentions, but I was absolutely floored for obvious reasons. I have been pretending to be sick since then as I figure out what to do. On the one hand, he is my dream man and I am so glad to be with him. He has been nothing but incredible to me and we have a great relationship. And logically I know that he wasn't in love with me or anything when he asked me out, as I'm sure he had some idea of how I felt and he never did anything about it. But it still hurts to think. That his feelings towards me were so ambivalent that he needed a goddamn pros and cons list to just ask me out. My boyfriend gave me a pros and cons list about myself for our anniversary. After sitting down and thinking about the present, I came to the realization that it was a slap in the face. I also realized at least somewhat that the entire time we'd known each other before dating he had treated me like crap, but I justified being with him by saying that he'd changed because I'd won him. But the pros and cons list made me realize really just how little he thought of me, and giving it to me made me think that he still felt the same way towards me. It also made me realize that in his mind he was settling for me, and that he probably only really liked me for the things I did for him. I also did make my own list of the pros and cons of him and gave him my own list the next morning. My list was, pros, 6 foot 2 big attractive popular, good job and makes lots of money, close to family, can be sweet, pays for things, submissive. Cons, NPC, has no hobbies or interests and drinks a lot, clearly doesn't respect me is kind of stupid and not interesting, hardly an intellectual and not well read, don't have a lot to talk about together, friends don't like him, not good in bed. My list made me realize that not only does he kind of have nothing going for him, but being with him also reflects pretty terribly on myself and my values. I'm not really ashamed of myself because I met him when I was 18, but I hope I will not be this shallow of a person for my whole life. So I broke up with him that same morning over coffee. Watching him read this list was glorious. I think I saw him cry when he read the cons list, all he could ask me was, you think I'm that dumb? I didn't respond but instead just broke up with him. His ego is fragile enough, no need to curb stomp it. He did try to convince me to stay, but I was firm and we are officially broken up. I blocked him on everything because I have no self-respect when it comes to him, and I have no doubt he would try to booty call me soon if I didn't. Edit, he messages me on a different number when he was drunk and I ended coming over and sleeping with him. I hate myself. Edit 2, I'm pregnant and it's his. My golden child sister tried tricking me into racially abusing my wife. She's mad I blew up at her over it. My sister Annie has always been the golden child. 
She is a miracle baby and while I do understand, there was no reason for my parents to favor her the way they did. She did horrible things to me growing up, and her behavior was often justified. For example, my first girlfriend struggled with mental health, and Annie made a joke about S aside to her. I of course got mad at Annie and I got into a huge argument, but my parents took her side. Things like this have happened all my life. Due to this, my relationship with my family is strained, but we are civil most of the time. So, last night my wife and I went to Annie's birthday party. Annie still lives with our parents and has never moved out, so my parents were present. Some of Annie's friends came too. Our whole family is white, whilst my wife is Chinese. She was born in China, and became a citizen when she and her family moved to the US when she was 16. She and all of her family speak Mandarin, and my wife is also fluent in English. Out of respect and curiosity, I've been learning Mandarin, and I want our future children as we are expecting to be able to speak both of our languages. It's been about two years of learning and I'm not very conversational yet, but I pick up on a lot of things, can understand the basic gist of most conversations, and I can speak basic sentences like, is the food hot? i have also learning how to read and write Mandarin. Mostly reading right now as I find it helps me learn better, and I sometimes drop cool sentences into the family chat on Facebook. Annie doesn't speak very much in this family chat, but will post Fox articles, usually articles about China that are very critical of the government. I digress. So last night, we're at the dinner table when Annie hands me a slip of paper. I ask what this is as I unwrap it. It says, Tiananmen Square 1989, and I look up at her and she has this dumb grin on her face. I ask her what this is and she goes, can you translate that into Mandarin? Of course, I got really freaking mad. I immediately started yelling, called her a racist and said we were leaving. My mom and dad got mad at me, and he said I was being dramatic, and her friends, all of whom are also white, didn't see what the big deal was with Annie's actions. I basically told everybody off using very big adult words before leaving. My phone started blowing up with text messages saying, you're not even Chinese what the hell and you ruined her birthday party. I briefly spoke to my mom this morning where I tried to explain why what she did was racist, targeted towards me and my family, and is unacceptable behavior. I told my mom that I won't be going to the house anymore if she's there and that she needs help. My mom echoed what my sister said proudly and told me to get over the joke. I'm really thinking of going no contact. My nightmare mother-in-law purposely tried to poison me and is now playing victim. For starters my mother-in-law has never liked me. She thinks I stole her son and brainwashed him because he stands up to her now. By this, I mean stuff like she got except when we wouldn't let her give our baby water, she has been racist to men many times as I am Middle Eastern, and when my husband stands up to her about it, she plays the victim card, blaming him for choosing me over her. We have been very unsuccessfully working at boundaries with her. Every boundary she pushes harder and punishes us with silent treatment when she doesn't get her way. Well we didn't go to her Thanksgiving this year but we made a compromise to come later for a one-on-one -on -one dinner with mother and father-in-law. For context, I cannot eat any dairy. I have a lot of stomach issues that I'm waiting to see a specialist for an endoscopy. I'm not just lactose intolerant. Dairy products mess my stomach up in ways that I am bed-bound for two to three days a time. Until my endoscopy, the doctor instructed me to avoid all trigger foods and of course no dairy. When invited to dinner, my mother-in-law was told by my husband everything is fine but dairy. Mother-in-law knows of my dairy problem, and this is one boundary she has never crossed before, so she was not worried. The day comes and we're on the way there, and on the phone my husband says again mom remember no dairy not even butter. She said yes I know I know. We get there and she tells me I'm making chicken cooked on the barbecue, grilled veggies and baked potatoes. Which is perfect. All safe foods. We get to talking and it turns into passive-aggressive comments against me, more of the same stuff, slightly racist but nothing I have not put up with. My husband says let's go for a walk for a break from her. We come back, and I kid you not, the dinner menu is changed. Chicken covered in cheese cooked in the oven instead of on barbecue, mashed potatoes with butter and milk all. Threw it and vegetables smothered in a butter sauce. My husband asks her. What does this menu change? You couldn't have put her chicken without cheese? Left her some mashed potatoes without butter and milk and not added butter to her vegetables? She starts to cry and says nothing is good enough for her that she is just trying her best. That she didn't want me to have dry chicken or I would complain. But I would never complain, I'm the quiet people pleaser type. It turns into a huge fight because we upset mother-in-law. Husband says I thought we got over this hating my wife stuff, and you were going to respect her because this seems very intentional. Mother-in-law says I am but she is the one who hates us, she keeps you away. She goes on, saying that my husband has it all wrong. My husband then tells her he is so disappointed in her and this dinner was supposed to be the start of us working on our relationship, but I can't eat any of this food. It will make me very sick and that he told her multiple times beforehand. She just cried and played victim which ticked off father-in-law who took our side. So we left. My husband said now he is done and sick of us being made to always be the bad guys and today is the first day of NC. I feel guilty though and upset that things came to a head over something involving me. Does the guilt get easier? The guy that I'm seeing has a micro PP as well as ER pill dysfunction. It is two and a half inches y'all when stiffer than a statue, maybe an inch at most when soft. So I just started dating this lovely, wonderful man who is so kind gentle and loving. He makes me feel unlike anyone I've dated before and I have really started falling for him. 
We've been on several dates and he has slept over my place a couple times. The first time he slept over, he gave me brain and it was mind-blowingly amazing, I didn't finish, but enjoyed it all thoroughly nonetheless. The second time I got to see him unclothed, and I was honestly shocked at how small his mighty sword was. I hate myself for feeling so shocked about it honestly. On our first date he lightheartedly and jokingly said he had a micro PP and I was entirely convinced he was joking. But I found out on the second sleepover date that he was, in fact, not lying. He also had told me that the only way for him to get or maintain a stiffy was by using supplements. This didn't really faze me at the time. When I initially saw it, I didn't react or anything, I just kissed and loved on him as much as I could, reassuring him that I wasn't worried and it was okay. I tried to give him brain but it felt, wrong. I felt like there was nothing there, I may as well have been blowing the air. I felt so guilty that he had performed such unbelievable brain on me the previous date and my, usually really good, performance felt so, horrible. At least to me. He said it felt good, but he just had no real reaction and I felt like a fish out of water. When he did not, I barely felt anything. The load matched the size of his member. Does anyone have any advice on how I can make this relationship work out so that it is pleasurable and satisfying for the both of us? He is literally so perfect in so many ways and I really would love to have this relationship last. I never want to make him feel bad about these things, and I don't want to be disrespectful to him, but it's really hard to be satisfied when someone is stiff in you and you don't feel it at all. My fiancé's family bullied me into getting a nose job. Now my fiancé is mad at me because I don't like it. My fiancé's family never held back on jabs about my nose. My fiancé said he knew they really loved me the moment they started with the jokes, they're the kind of family that loves to make fun of each other, but also loves to take it way too far. I've seen the parents make a SSI jokes to my fiancé's depressed little sister before, they're those kinds of jokes. As far as my nose goes, my grandparents used to make comments about my nose that were kind of crappy, especially because my dad is Jewish and I got the nose from him. In general I've tried to not be sensitive about it because my fiancé's family don't like sensitive people, although my history with it and knowing my nose came from my dad who I don't know made it a bit harder for me. My fiancé made this comment once which was supposed to be joking or sweet where he basically said he was so lucky for my nose because it was the only way he had a chance with me. That comment stayed in my head since, the idea that I'd actually be beautiful if it wasn't for my nose. I've had really bad self-esteem and would go in and out of believing I'm ugly. I started thinking about having a nose job. After we got engaged, I realized if I was going to do it, I should do it before the wedding. He was really supportive of the idea and excited for it. He made some comments about being glad I was losing the beak, something he'd never expressed before I suggested it, which confirmed to me that I needed it. My fiancé loves my new nose but I hate it so much. I feel like I'm staring at someone else's face, I look like any other woman in the world besides myself. I've always struggled with depression, and I was finally in a good place before this. Now I can barely get myself to leave my room for work. My fiancé is really frustrated with me, he thinks I objectively look better and I need to get used to it. I know I'll have to. But I've been wearing a medical mask in the house because I can't stand to look at my face. He says this is me sulking like a toddler, but I can't control how I feel. He asked what I was going to do for our wedding and I told him that I don't want to be in any pictures. He freaked out saying my selfishness was going to get in the way of us having a happy wedding. I didn't want to let this hurt him, so I tried to come up with options like wearing my veil covering my face in the pictures, incorporating a scarf into the outfit, wearing my mask, etc., and he said if I do any of that we might as well not get married at all. That hurt a lot. I can't stand to see myself in pictures like this and having everybody see my nose the whole day would make this even worse for me, I'm already going to be blaming myself for the fact that I won't have my nose in pictures. I feel like I'm ruining the day for him but what he wants will ruin it for me. My girlfriend calls me by her new co-worker's name in the bedroom. She denies that she is into him. My girlfriend and I have been dating for six months. A few months ago she met a guy named Chris at her new job and they've become good friends. Apparently, Chris looks like her dream man, he is taller than me, fitter than me, and has a better beard than me. Also, since meeting him, she's taken up a hobby of criticizing me for minor things constantly, and no not my PP thankfully, as it is very much not a minor thing. Either way, I've hung out with Chris and her a few times. He's a nice enough guy, very macho, and a bit red pill. Apparently Chris thought I was soft the first time I met him. However, I do not get a vibe from Chris that he's into my girlfriend, but she talks about him constantly. Yesterday it was my girlfriend's birthday, and at it she got very drunk. At some point during it, I'm chatting with someone and out of nowhere she points at me and drunk yells at everyone that I'm only talking to the person because I'm too awkward to talk to anyone else. I give her a funny look and don't say anything while she laughs at me. Nobody laughs with her. Later, I notice her having an animated conversation with Chris telling him that if he was a rod, she would polish him. She thinks it's really funny and keeps talking about how much she wants to polish Chris's rod, which seems intimate to me, but I'm not sure. That same night we had intimacy. We're both drunk. We're really getting into it when she moans oh Chris. A moment later she corrects herself, I'm drunk and atrony and non-confrontational so I ignore it. In the morning I bring up her calling out Chris's name during intimacy and she denies that it happened. She even texts him in front of me about the rod thing and Chris agrees that it was just a joke, saying he didn't think she meant anything intimate from it. 
I asked her to scroll up and show me their texts so I can confirm that nothing is going on between them, but she refused to do so. She claimed it was private stuff regarding Chris' family and she wants to respect his privacy. By not showing me. She never scrolled up to show me the texts. Well, I still can't stop thinking about her calling out Chris's name during intimacy. I remember it very clearly and it's bothering me. Have any of you made a new friend and then called out their name during intimacy with your partner by mistake? My transphobic mother hired a man to dress like Elvis Presley to convince me to detransition. I went no contact with my egg donor in 2021 after many attempts to get her to understand that I was trans, to get her to accept me and to get her to stop dragging me to church or having random pastors show up at my doorstep getting me to repent for my sins, she actually did this by the way. So last night I was at work and get a call with my dead name, telling me how I'm getting a package from my egg donor. The call is sketchy, the man vague about what the package is, and says that he'll be there at 11 the next morning. I proceed to have a panic attack in the kitchen. After calming down, I figure I should look at the package, if it's important information like details to my legal documents, I keep it. If it's a random gift, I'll donate it. So figure me surprised when instead of a package I open my front door too, but a man in a red shoulder cape, greased hair, sunglasses indoors and a big effing acoustic guitar. For reference, I live in a very small building, resulting in small cramped hallways with thin doors that every neighbor can hear through, so imagine my horror when he starts singing loudly at 11am. My wife bails as second-hand embarrassment is something she struggles with greatly and stands on the balcony in mild horror as I'm glued in place as a love song is sung to me. I think it was a Elvis song. Fits in theme. When it finally settles in that I live in a clown world I close my eyes and just let it happen, this guy's getting paid to do this, whatever. He finishes and what comes out of his mouth next floors me. He said, you know you shouldn't give up your want to see your egg donor. She has different views than you, you have to respect that. I responded with confusion because it came out of nowhere, he then proceeds to tell me that egg donor loves me and that contact is the most important thing, and that family is family and there's no replacing it. I tried to be polite and tell him it's none of his effing business but he continues. How old are you? 20? I corrected him with my age, which was a horrible idea because he then launches into another preach about his 26-year-old and family as family. I was in hell. Luckily my wife finally got over her cringe and stepped back into the hallway, he asks her if she's my sister, to which I say she is and that we f daily. I proceed to tear up the paper he gave me as my wife laughs until she nearly pukes. I pranked my disabled friend into thinking that her idol messaged her. I feel so guilty about it. For context on how this came to be, I do animation as a pastime. I've met a lot of people in the animation community and I've learned a lot from them. In this community, I met this sweet, autistic girl who has an incredible talent for creating models. I'm talking models fit for actual film production now see, she enjoys this 3D animated series online that she bases her model's art style on. I happen to love this series too, and commissioned my models to be in the same art style. One thing to note about her is she gets so excited when someone points out that they love her work. This is a dream of hers and she can't help but smile ear to ear when we talk about something and I compliment her on her art. Well, the other day, she did this anonymous message thing on her social media. Where you could send her an anonymous message and she'll reply to it on a public post. I pretended to be the voice actress of her favorite character in her favorite show and told her that I loved her work and that she was incredible. Realizing that she was on the spectrum, I figured this would be the perfect prank to pull on her as she would undoubtedly fall for it. She got super excited and posted it with gusto. I laughed to myself as I knew my plan had worked and now all that was left was for me to tell her it was me and have both of laugh at this harmless joke of mine right? Wrong. I told her it was me and she called me a jerk and told me to actually f off. Which. Is fair. I knew she enjoyed this series and characters but I didn't know it meant so much to her. So right now, I've sent her a short apology and I'm giving her space. Waiting for a little while for things to cool before I send her a much more genuine apology explaining myself and letting her know that I understand if she doesn't want to work with me on models anymore. I pranked my disabled friend into thinking that her idol messaged her. I feel so guilty about it. I found the voice actor of my friend's favorite character on Cameo and was planning to get her to message my friend directly as a form of apology. This was a great idea in my eyes. I booked it and paid the extra fee to have it done within 24 hours. 24 hours had gone by and. Let's just say I better get my effing money back. I went to a different plan, and that was to talk to my friends about the entire situation. So after my conversation with my friends about it. Without my knowledge, one of our mutual friends contacted the girl I pranked, explaining that I was sorry and only wanted a chance to make it right and all. That we didn't understand why she felt so strongly about this. Which unalived me inside when he told me he contacted her. But we got an answer. She said she had felt like, she had finally been recognized by someone she looked up to so much. That it was because of their hard work that she got enough clout that it got them recognized. That it hurt them to realize that it was just me and that she didn't earn anything. That she finally overcame the challenges that autism has presented her, but nope. I had already figured that from their reaction to the joke. But. That's not the worst part. Remember the cameo request, it came through and asked me what I wanted the actress to say on the video. I was delighted about this. One thing I know about my friend, is that she is also transgender and is very sensitive about the topic. I went through all of her socials and tried to make sure I got the name right as well as the pronouns before I contacted the actress and had her send the video. Turns out, her socials still had their dead name. I had their idol dead name them. I showed her the video too through one of our mutuals. She says that I was already beating a dead horse trying to apologize, but that that private message was basically turning that dead horse into tenderized meat and like throwing an extra bag of puppies into a river. 
but now I robbed her of a chance of actually earning her idol's attention. And that it didn't help that she had to hear their idol dead name them. Though, in my defense, a little communication sure would have gone a long way. That's the only thing that kind of upset me about how she handled this. I never would have gotten that message if she just told me this themselves. A message from the LTBGQ community in Uganda currently facing mass genocide. The Western media is silencing them. Hello, we are queer people from Uganda fleeing persecution and discrimination. Kakuma refugee camp is located in the northwest of Kenya where we've been living for about four years facing the same persecution and discrimination from fellow refugees. We are highly discriminated against to the extent that we cannot find jobs, and are unable to earn income to sustain basic necessities, many of us starve to death. However, we keep our heads high and we hope to be able to receive the support so that we can get housing, mosquito nets, food, medication and other supplies. Help support our campaign even a little. We left Uganda in 2020 after the attack which involved the death of beloved family members of the LGBTQ community, as well as the members themselves. We were brutalized and hurt after they found us at parties, meetings and had always suspected. The community wanted to set us on fire when the police came in, this is when we got a chance to run away. We came to Kenya hoping for safety from the UNHCR through the Red Cross but unfortunately it is not how we hoped it could be. We were brought to Kenya and relocated to the community at Kakuma refugee camp where we found our fellow LGBTQ refugees going through the same torment like us. We had a collective voice and about 540 LGBTQ members gathered at the compound of UNHCR in March 2020 to ask them for protection because we had a lot of insecurities from other non-LGBT threatening us to be killed. We never got the help but instead tear gassed and brought back to the camp illegally and violently. We still gathered all together and it's here where we need your support. At this point we struggle with medicine, food, sanitary for lesbians, clothes, milk for babies and other gender affirming items. We fled from our home countries because of persecution and being LGBTQ, it's not related to any political issue. It's just about us being LGBTQ that we were brutally attacked by our ignorant communities. Kakuma is in the desert, very hot and occupied by Turkana as the natives of the area. The government of Kenya and UNHCR started the camp back in 1992 and is the only place in Kenya where LGBTQ people can seek asylum, and even then the conditions are horrendous. We normally face attacks and are discriminated against even at water supply points and abused for who we are. We would work but we can't find work because we are being segregated and no one can provide us with jobs, otherwise some other nationalities and communities have jobs and they are working in the camp. Kakuma in Africa in general is not safe for gay people and therefore relocation to a safe place had to be done as soon as possible. UNHCR has been able to provide some food thankfully, but it is not enough. On so many occasions we have been attacked and UNHCR has not helped us and the medication that we would get, we are actually not given at the IRC hospitals under UNHCR. We instead look at privately owned clinics because we are not given medicine in these hospitals. UNHCR has delayed the evacuation of gay people from Kenya. We have lost lives here, bones broken because of UNHCR being reckless and bureaucratic. That's why we go to the UNHCR compound to seek help from UNHCR and instead are being tear gassed and brutalized by Kenyan police under the orders of UNHCR officials. Interaction with other refugees has of course been negative. We do not associate with other refugees because they have always given false information about us and we have been jailed on so many occasions and expensive bails only release us. They have always said we spoil their children and we do not deserve anything good apart from death and refer to us as a curse to their homeland. If you're found by a group of non-gay people, they can actually unalive you, this is what happened to a close friend of mine. Our call to action is that let us fight this violence together, let's join hands and support one another because as gay people if we do not support one another, no one will support us. And as well call up non-LGBTQ to intervene for the elevation of humanity. We believe if you people that are a bit safer than us, fight for us, we shall prosper and leave this homophobic environment in Kakuma. Also we call for private sponsors, and continue the food supply until we find safe and accepting places elsewhere. My terminally ill husband just came to terms with his death. I can't accept that he will die and leave me behind. I have been married to my husband for over 10 years, we met when I was 24 in a club, ever since I knew him, he could never accept any health damages, he fell from a ladder from 3 meters or so, went into hospital just because I insisted, came out with a diagnosed broken leg, was told to wear a cast, disobeyed that request and raw dog the healing process. When he was 25 he started to complain about his knee hurting really badly when he bent it. It took me 5 years to send him to the doctor over this, he ended up having surgery after which he was supposed to rest for 2 months, after 2 weeks he was back to working out and jogging. 2 years ago he was diagnosed with leukemia, he straightway stopped smoking after the diagnosis and worked out even more than before, so he boosted was his health. It didn't help at all and last month his health went downhill, he got all pale, lost all of his hair, he got weak to the point I had to help him upstairs on a few occasions. 2 days ago while dining, our 15-year-old daughter asked him if he could take her hiking to the Alps next year, he just said something in the lines of I'm not sure if I'll still be around by that time. I still held my cool, after that our daughters left to go to sleep and I blew up on him. I just started screaming, I can't even remember what exactly it was anymore, something like, from the moment I met you you never gave into any health condition, you always overcame everything, and now from out of nowhere you accept your own death. Normally he would raise his voice at me saying, we are not animals in this house so we will not scream at each other. But not then. He just glared into the corner of the kitchen and said nothing, and when his eyes started watering my heart shattered into thousands of pieces. 
At that moment I knew I had only a short time left with the love of my life, and I will forever regret blowing up at him. I apologized for everything, he told me I didn't even have to, that it's only natural and that stages of grief are a real thing. My terminally ill husband just came to terms with his death. I can't accept that he will die and leave me behind. Our daughter is at my parents' house and I have had some wine, maybe it will give me the strength needed to write this. Sadly, it happened, my husband died about half a year ago and I miss him so damn much. Before his passing, me, my late husband and our two daughters started attending grief counseling. Without it we would most likely be more destroyed than we already are. My husband and I also filmed videos for our daughter's life goals, we together made some videos for their graduation, marriage, first child and other major life goals, it actually took us much longer than it could have because it was just too hard for us, the realization of the fact our life together was over was just so hard, if the text doesn't make sense I'm very sorry I'm crying with every word I write. Now to the happy part, before the love of my life got really bad we tried to do as many things from this bucket list as possible, I've never thought I could enjoy so many things I wouldn't care for otherwise, like MMA, it was his passion for such a long time but he never actually saw a fight in person, we finally went to the castle in the center of our city for the first time after living here for 6 years, never had the time, now we had all the time in the world for ourselves and our kids, we traveled a lot, we went to see the Stonehenge, such a curious sight. After that we went to see the fjords which fascinated him so much, we went to see the northern lights too. It was just so beautiful, we couldn't stay long anywhere so we could get back for my husband's therapy and girls had to go to school. We also got to see the Colosseum and some more great sights. I hated myself for quite some time after the events of my last post, when he was still alive he mentioned it only once, told me not to worry about it, that it was just the silent thought said out loud, that he doesn't want me. Do ever worry about it again or he'll haunt me, some of you might think that it was not nice but we used to have a specific humor and we have one rule in our house, as long as it's funny it's allowed. Also if the person who is the butt of the joke finds it funny it's okay. He got really bad about a month before passing, I mean, when we were traveling he was in a wheelchair, but that was only for the long walks, but the last month he already couldn't move without it, I hated to see him in that state, it hurt both me and our daughters, it was just so painful, and I also saw his pain in his eyes, he was so angry that he couldn't go by his own way, euthanasia is not legal where we live, he always was pro, I didn't used to be, but now when I saw in how much pain he was I would do anything just for him to feel better, he deserved to choose his own way out, what he didn't deserve was to spend his last days in pain or under substances. His last moments our whole family was with him, with my parents and in-laws too, in one of his last moments conscious he told us all how much he loves us, I tried to be so strong for our girls, and I was, I stayed together until after his funeral, after seeing him lifeless I broke down knowing that it's all over, but at least he didn't feel any more pain. I will never forget you Patrick, I will forever love you, you were my light in this dark world, you were the fire that kept me from freezing, now I will try to be as good of a support you were to me to our daughters who love you so much, I miss you. You want to bug me? Enjoy the wheelchair and permanent brain damage scrub. I almost feel bad for what I did. So in 1989 I was a 19 year old kid living in NYC. I was a brokey working as a delivery guy at a dingy hole in the wall pizza place that's long since gone out of business. I had moved to New York looking for work after my uncle's construction company went under, and had found a tiny crap hole of an apartment which was the only thing I could afford on the salary I got from the pizza place. The only reason I took the job was I needed money and it was extremely close to my apartment, only a short walk down a back alley. I want you all to keep in mind while reading this, the New York of 30 years ago was not the touristy New York of today. On alivings were a lot more common, you would see hookers working the corner pretty often, I even hired one specific one regularly, Times Square was a cesspool of N-day bars and adult films theaters, gangs would rob people on the subway, and it was almost every day where I lived that you would see a junkie passed out in an alley or along the side of the road. The whole ordeal started just after closing one night in July. The guy who owned the place, Paolo, said that I could take some leftover pizza home with me that had been sitting under the heat lamp all day, but hey, at least it was free. I had been working at the pizza place for about a year by this point, and I was on really good terms with Paolo and his brother Joseph who both ran the place. Paolo was easily pushing 300 pounds and had a habit of smoking a giant cigar while cooking. Joseph was always in the back handling the money side of things and taking phone orders. The restaurant had an exit into the alley which I would take to get back to my place. There would usually be a homeless vet named Alfonso that would sleep next to the hot air vent behind the place who would bum a smoke off me and we would shoot the poop for a few minutes after my shift. After talking with him I started to walk home, and after I had gotten quite a distance away down the alley I heard some bottles rustling behind a dumpster that was right ahead of me. My first thought was it was some rats, until this crazy eyed dude swung out from behind it with a hunting knife in one hand and a metal bat in the other. I remember this guy looked like your stereotypical junkie, track marks all over his arms, disgusting clothes on, wild dirty hair, and fidgeting like a spinner. He started yelling and half screaming at me to give him my wallet. At that point my adrenaline was through the roof as I had never been mugged before. I was carrying the pizza box with two hands, and when I shifted it to my left hand to reach into my back pocket for my wallet with my right, he started advancing on me. He started muttering to himself asking why I was doing that and sort of grunting while jabbing at the air in front of him. At this point I know this guy is baked off his butt on something or a definite head case. 
He was really close to me by this point, and before I could take my wallet out he loaded up his right arm and slashed me across my face with the hunting knife just below my left eye. At first it didn't really hit me, and I was stunned for a second. It was at that point I started thinking, this is it, I'm gonna die in effing alley over the 4 bucks I have in my wallet. That's when I decided to start fighting, if I was going down, I was doing it swinging. I threw the pizza box in his face which made him step back a little bit, and using both hands I grabbed the bat out of his left hand that he was still holding. I flipped it around, and aimed for the outside of his left knee which was the one closest to me. It connected and I heard a snap when it buckled inwards. This brought him to one knee, but he started to get back up again like he couldn't even feel it. I swung it like Johnny Sins and hit the left side of his dome which made a crunch sound before he crumpled like a piece of paper to the concrete. I remember being so incredibly scared, absolutely terrified. I don't remember much after this. Years after this happened when I went to see a psychiatrist for other reasons and this was brought up, and she told me it is likely because my mind was trying to shield me from the trauma of the whole experience. The next thing I remember is being soaked in blood and standing above this guy. I knew he was still alive, as he was gurgling out of his mouth and his chest was still rising and falling. There was red coming out of his ears, nose, and mouth. His right hand and arm that had been holding the knife was a mangled mess with fingers jutting out every which way while the knife was a good four feet away on the ground. I dropped the bat and half stumbled, half walked back to the pizza place. Alfonso had heard the screaming and came to look. He told me that I had a glazed over look to me and I was almost entirely soaked in red. He led me back to the pizza place where Paolo started called the cops and an ambulance and Paolo's brother, Joseph, rushed out of the back and grabbed a bottle of cheap Prosecco we had from below the counter to douse my cut with while stemming the bleeding with table napkins. I spent the night in the hospital because apparently I was disorientated and so confused I didn't know where I was because of blood loss. The next day I was doing better, and there were two cops that came to take my statement. After I had told my side of the story the older looking of the two cops said that after 10 years on the job the guy took the worst beating he'd seen anyone take and survive. The younger looking one started telling me what I had done to the guy which included, severed knee ligaments, broken and dislocated fingers, broken ribs which had punctured a lung, a broken femur, multiple crushed and pulverized bones, a severed spinal cord with a couple broken vertebrae, a burst ear drum, multiple teeth knocked out, completely fractured jaw, a broken nose, a burst eye, a destroyed eye socket, and a completely destroyed cheekbone. He also told me that I had hit his dome so hard there was spinal fluid leaking out of his ears. They said that they had spoken to Alfonso, Paolo, and Joseph, and they corroborated my story that the bat was the junkies and I had most likely acted in self-defense. Although I had no answer to their question of why didn't I stop after he went down besides I don't know and I don't remember. After a couple days I was discharged and after just a little while I was back to working at the pizza place. Although I now had a massive scar running down the side of my face and Paolo jokingly called me Scarface all the time. Even now I jokingly say to my wife before sexy time say hello to my little friend which we still giggle maniacally about together. I was also super jumpy right after the fact whenever I heard bottles clanging together, which unfortunately happened a lot because Joseph used to take the empty cola bottles to the recycling plant at the end of every week. At the time it happened the whole AIDS panic was in full swing, and the guy being a junkie instantly made me realize how much crap I could be in. If I was infected without knowing it I could have passed it on to my wife or even my children by accident. After quite the panic between me and my wife because of overlooking this we got the blood results back just a bit ago and turns out I have it, and so does my wife. The junkie got the last laugh. My lunatic friend is trying to convince me to scam restaurants into buying his homemade ketchup. What the actual f? So my friend Richie has been obsessed with ketchup ever since I met him. This man puts ketchup on every single meal he eats, ranging from the simple stuff like chips, to literally eating fish with ketchup, dipping his veggies in ketchup, and he also knows the entire history of ketchup. Who it was made by, when was it made, as well as the complete history of some world-leading ketchup brands. He is always trying out different recipes to make his own ketchup and getting me and all our friends to try them. Recently he made his best ketchup yet. I tried it and it wasn't bad. It was ketchup. Now he has decided he is finally going to break into the ketchup game. He is convinced he is going to launch his own ketchup company and grow it to be one of the top providers of ketchup in the US. He literally has a photo of Heinz ketchup on a dartboard. He throws darts at it and mutters things like I'm coming for you. He has a scheme he wants me and others to participate in. Essentially it involves us all going to a restaurant, sitting at different tables, and enacting lines from a script he wrote that will culminate in all of us trying and loving his ketchup and convincing the manager to buy it. He wants us all to memorize lines. The gist of it is one guy is supposed to call over a waitress and say he likes the French fries, but hates the ketchup. I am supposed to lean over, from another table, and say sorry to butt in, but I have to agree. I'm tired of this old-fashioned, factory-produced ketchup. Where's the real tomato flavor? After a few other people do this, my friend is going to say you guys won't believe this, but I'm a ketchup chef, and I have a few samples. Would you want to give it a shot? At this point everyone is supposed to try the ketchup and act astounded by it and basically all exclaim it is the best ketchup they ever had. I am supposed. To stand up on my table and make a trumpet sound effect and then yell to the entire restaurant we have the best ketchup ever made over here. Everyone come on over. One of the other people is supposed to get the manager of the place over and we are all supposed to try to convince him or her to buy an order of my friend's ketchup. He is going to act surprised and embarrassed and try to tell us to stop putting this poor guy on the spot in regards to the manager. He then assumes he will make a huge sale. Then he wants to do this same operation at other places in town. I told him no way am I doing this. I hate public speaking and acting and having attention focused on me, also the idea is just so effing dumb and crazy to me. I told him that straight up. He acted offended and said I am ruining his dreams. 
I am astounded by this but some of my friends agree and think he is showing hustle and that we should all help him launch his ketchup business. Aside from his ketchup obsession Richie is one of my best friends but it seems our friendship is being ruined. My psycho mother-in-law actually violated my infant baby while I slept. I am currently a stay-at-home mother with my 8-month-old son. My husband and I have been married for two years, together for five. My mother-in-law is a complete psycho and doesn't understand boundaries at all. My husband is an only child and of course, she thinks he is her baby. I've had issues with mother-in-law since the start of my relationship with my husband. My husband is torn because he loves his parents but this has gone too far for me now. Mother-in-law is a classic Ursula, everything from asking me when my last period was, to going through my nightstands and bathroom, throwing herself a grandma shower before my son was born, setting up a full epping nursery in her house as well as our house without any forewarning. She had a complete meltdown when I banned her from the delivery room and would not let her massage my honkers with baby oil for learning to breastfeed when she came to visit after my son was born. My son is formula fed, I never planned to breastfeed and she just can't accept that. How dare I rob her baby of his health by feeding him formula poison. She's never wrong in her own mind and I would just ignore her constant delusional parenting advice. She's retired and wants to spend as much time with the baby as possible. She always wants to be the one to change his diaper and always wants to watch me change it, which made me super uncomfortable. She would always make awkward comments about my son's pee pee looking just like his daddy's when he was that age. So inappropriate. I wish I would have gone no contact with her a long time ago, but she's been on a strict once a week for a few hours at a time visits with my son husband and I. The once a week thing was even too much for me but I wanted to compromise for my my husband's sake. His grandparents were very involved in his childhood so maybe that has something to do with his mom thinking she can undermine my parenting. Anyway. Mother-in-law was over yesterday for her weekly visit. My husband was at work so it was just me with her and my son. I accidentally fell asleep on the couch while my son was in his jumper and mother-in-law was sitting on the floor next to him. I woke up 30 minutes later and mother-in-law and my son were nowhere to be found. I heard splashing from the upstairs tub and found my mother-in-law taking a fully unclothed bath with my son, with baby oil applied all over both of them. She was doing it like it was the most normal thing in the world. At 2 o.m. in the afternoon. I grabbed my son from her and she started sobbing, saying that I was robbing her of her baby and how dare I not let her do normal grandma things like take a bath with her baby boy. Oh and my husband was loving his bath time with grandma and he loves her so much. Saggy honkers flying all over the place as she's protesting in the bath with soap on her face. You guys. I don't even let this woman change his diaper or give him a regular bath ever. And now she does this? I'm coaching a high school football team and the players are super disrespectful to me. Last week they crossed the line. I'm in my third year of coaching at a small high school for the varsity squad. I'm an assistant helping with skill players. I'm quite young compared to the rest of the staff. I'm dealing with a lot of problems with some of the kids. There are two boys on the team who talent-wise are good, but their attitudes are effing horrible. These players are starters yet they don't hustle during practice, they screw around and don't even try because they are given playing time anyway by the head coach. One of them is the coach's son of course. The tipping point was this past week. During a drill, these players cursed at me and told me to go f myself after I told them to stop messing around during my drills, I didn't yell or curse or anything, I simply told them to stop messing around and listen to me, I told them to leave the field, these players proceeded to slam their helmets on the ground and throw a tantrum on the sideline. The head coach saw this and put them back in, telling me take a softer approach. At another point, these same players refused to participate in a blocking drill I put together. I was told by one of them, during the drill, your drills suck, try and find something that actually works. These kids are not doing the drills I put together and when they do, they are not trying or bringing any intensity. I'm talking walking through, helmets unstrapped, mouthpieces out. I blew up at one of the two boys in particular, and he retorted by making a comment about my dead wife. It's no secret that my wife is dead, almost the whole school knows but of course nobody has ever made a comment about it, until now. I saw Red and absolutely chewed him out, yet he refused to apologize and just walked away. Right after this, I complained about it to the head coach and told him word for word what the kid said to me, and he has did absolutely nothing. About it. He told me, sometimes you have to look the other way on things like that for the best of the team. He is still giving these kids playing time and will not take them out despite their disrespectful behavior. Cursing at a coach in my opinion is unacceptable in the first place, insulting a dead wife deserves a beating in my opinion. To be honest the kid is lucky I caught myself or I would be in some legal trouble right about now. Me going to the athletic director is not an option, as he is also the head coach I'm dealing with here. I've also been told I can't make them run or do drills like up-downs because that is too hard on them. I cannot understand what the issue with these kids is. It has been this way since day one and truthfully I am tired of the disrespect. I get they are kids but allowing them to curse and disrespect a coach and letting them play without discipline does not seem right. I'm coaching a high school football team and the players are super disrespectful to me. Last week they crossed the line. I decided after consulting with my family and friends, that I would do my best to finish the season and focus on the other kids as I don't like to quit and try to finish what I start. Unfortunately, it did not work out that way. I decided to not focus on the kids who disrespected me and just went on with practice as usual. The next week after the incident, during the first game of the year, one of the players who had cursed me out was in the game, and he made a tackle and started taunting a kid, I couldn't hold my tongue here so I yelled out to him do not taunt. 
he proceeded to wave me off and continued to taunt the opposing players. I saw red and had enough. He blatantly disrespected me during a game and did not listen. When he got back to the sideline, I went over to him and told him he will not blow me off and he will show me respect, he turned around, looked me in the face, and said it's a contact sport bro, f off. That was it for me, I yelled at him and said I am not your bro or your friend, I am your coach and you have absolutely zero respect for anyone but yourself, do not speak to me like that again. For the rest of the game, I was fighting back tears, I didn't even bother to coach up the other players, because I could not bring myself to do it. The head coach came over at halftime and asked me what was wrong. I explained to him that the kid cursed at me and disrespected me again and that I was tired of it. He told me this wasn't the time or place and that we would discuss it on Monday. The kid continued to play and I was mute. We rode the bus back and my mind was made up. I was done. I called the head coach the next day and told him I was done. He said he was shocked, but that leaving the team was not a good option and felt like other avenues should be explored before I decided to walk away. I told him he needed to bench this player at a minimum and that considering that I was a coach, he shouldn't even be allowed to play or be a part of the team. This is the same player who insulted my dead wife by the way. He disagreed with me, stating you're young this is what kids do. And if I bench him, what will the other kids say? How does that look? He said he would give him extra conditioning that Monday but he refused to bench or remove him from the team. His concessions were to either move positions for me to coach or to call the kid's parents, but my mind was made up, I was done and told him the kid didn't deserve to play and that I refused to be a part of a culture that allows that kind of behavior. All is done right? Not even close. A couple of days later, I woke up to several text messages from friends and peers in the district. The team has a group chat on Snapchat and this same kid searched for me on Facebook, and screenshotted my profile picture of me and my dead wife and he sent it to the group saying, I f the coach's dead beach and made her scream my name. This came to light because one of the players screenshotted the group chat because he felt like it was wrong of him to say that and showed it to his older brother, who sent it to a mutual friend of ours who sent it to me. I was beyond furious and had enough. Sure, the photo is public and they can access it, but how they even found it I have no clue. I left the team and did nothing to this kid, why was he making comments and disparaging remarks? I called the head coach and laid into him, I told him that his culture was a joke and he was doing nothing to support me, a coach and a co-worker. I told him that I was going to the superintendent and would be filing a harassment complaint with the sheriff's office. He told me you need to let it go, kids will be kids and say things like that, you're not their coach anymore, so why do you care? I filed a complaint with the super, and ended up meeting with the school principal and the assistant AD. The meeting was a joke, they called the kid in, and for the whole meeting they talked about how it didn't spread and that the student apologized to them and took full responsibility and a punishment was given, although they refused to tell me the punishment. They also told me they were scared that the player was going to quit. They were defending this kid. I told them I did not care if he quit, that this goes beyond coaching, that my dead wife's name was harassed. They told me they understood and felt like another issue would likely not happen as the kids seemed apologetic. I left the meetings and immediately filed a report, the sheriffs told me that the incident was documented and that if another issue took place, this incident would be on record. I later found out that the kid was benched for one game and was forced to apologize to the team for his actions. I don't expect a fake apology, but I do find it funny how he apologized to everyone except me. The kid was not remorseful, he was sorry he got caught. They also began harassing the kid who screenshotted the messages and showed his brother, calling him a rat and snitch. My leech of a boyfriend makes me pay for absolutely everything. The one time I told him no he blew up at me. The power of male audacity is beyond me. My boyfriend and I had plans for me to pay for us to go out on Halloween for a night of food and drinking. I even bought us a couple's costume because he wanted to dress up. Here is the issue, my boyfriend has not had any source of income for 6 months and has no car or place of his own, he lives with his mom who thinks I am not good enough for him and enables his behavior. Either way, I have a car, job, and my own place. I am the one who has to make the effort to visit him every day even though we do not live very close to each other. I still go see him every night after I get out of work at 9 p.m. if we want to do anything, even something inexpensive like getting snacks or a cheap fast food run, I am the one paying for it. I drive us everywhere. We went to an expensive haunted house and I paid for it. I spend a lot of gas money and money in general to see him. Even though I am barely getting by financially. I make time for him even when I am exhausted after work and just want to go home and work on my studies. He does not always make time for me and I go days where I never see him because he sleeps 18 hours every day, no exaggeration, and I can't get a hold of him so he sleeps through our plans. He has made no efforts to get his life together while I feel like I am the one who does everything for us. He was on government assistance for 5 years while not working until 6 months ago when the assistance stopped and he lost any source of income. He sits around at home hanging out with his mom or sleeps all day. I feel like he is putting in no effort for us and is not taking our relationship seriously. On top of that, he can be very emotionally abusive. He guilt trips me if I ever go out with my friends, does not allow me to go out with my friends because he is worried I will cheat on him, and raises his voice at me. A lot. On to the issue at hand, the other night after I took us on a date he complained that I am not doing enough for him. He went on a huge long ramble that I need to make more of an effort for him emotionally. I got very upset because I am in therapy trying to work on things. The reason I'm not there emotionally currently is because he pushes me away when I try to talk to him and he says he doesn't want to talk. After saying all of this, berating me for apparently not doing enough, 
claiming that I do very little to contribute to our relationship, he sat back and watched me pay the $95 bill without even saying thank you. When we left the restaurant and came back to his, I told him if he wants to drink and eat on Halloween he can pay for himself. This caused a huge argument with us, he called me a liar for going back on my word, and started pulling all the victim cards. It was late in the evening and his mother was in bed. She came down to us and saw us arguing. Without getting an explanation from both sides she started berating me too, they basically ganged up on me and his mother stated I better pay on Halloween. I wanted to stay over originally but I just left. Do I even bother with this relationship anymore? A heated argument between my boyfriend and I escalated into him getting very violent. I should have listened to my friend all along. My boyfriend, 25M, and I, 18F, have not been having a good time lately. We fights all the time over minuscule stuff, our intimacy life feels forced, he makes me have intimacy when I don't want to, I yell at him over nothing etc. Either way, things really escalated last Friday night. We were staying at one of our friend's apartments and we drank too much alcohol. We had discussions about hot topics which turned heated very quickly, we were watching TV with some friends, and the TV show was talking about this married politician who asked his two female co-workers to have a three-way with him. My boyfriend said that this man did nothing wrong and that love is free and that he's envious of poly people because they are more open-minded. He went on to strongly hint he wants a poly relationship himself. With the conversation going on he said that his friends are more important to him than women, because they stay loyal, and that our love was nothing special and could possibly end. I felt humiliated in front of our friends. We went home and kept fighting. When he said to me, you're effing stupid, you don't understand anything you dumb f, after I was expressing my overall disappointment, I had enough and slapped him. I made a mistake. He started slapping me too, with much more power, and I started crying. Then he proceeded to put me in a rear neck hold, smash a plate over my head and throw a few haymakers at my ribs. I think he broke a rib or two. After doing all of this he saw me on the ground and started booting me. That way he tossed me on the ground outside the door, with all my stuff, saying I had to go away. I was drunk and it was 3 a.m., I asked a friend if I could crash at his place that was nearby and he said yes. Yesterday my boyfriend wrote a message to me saying that it's all over, that he's tired of me and this is not what he want from a relationship, but I feel so bad, lonely and hurt, I feel like I started this fight. I also lost my best friend in the process because she was trying to keep me away from him. She told me that he had roped her in the past and that he is a violent man, but I didn't listen. I suppose now I pay the price. I accidentally stumbled upon the greatest single hack in fitness history. So everybody has tried to transform their bodies right, everyone has started the gym and gone out of their way to find the greatest supplements in the world, the fanciest creatine out there, bought Turksterone and Ashwagandha, pre-workout with enough caffeine to stimulate 12 horses for 72 hours straight and so on. Well, turns out that none of these supplements are even remotely close to being as effective as something you would never even suspect. This is proven to be directly correlated to muscle gain, fat loss, energy levels, sugar cravings, reducing the risk of Alzheimer's, reducing the risk of heart disease, increasing memory and your brain's ability to intake information efficiently, regulating blood pressure, improving your immune system, boosting your mood throughout the day, improves concentration levels and attention span, boosts cardiovascular health and reduces risk of literally every single disease imaginable. Do you know what this magic supplement is? It's effing sleep. Sleep does all of this. Sleep is literally the elixir of life. If you read a hypothetically go just 50 hours without sleep, you would start hallucinating, you would become devoid of the ability to think, you would literally be a zombie with no desire to do anything. So all of you sleep deprived college students relying on 4 morning coffees not to fall asleep in your class because you stayed up you till 4am scrolling TikTok, just know, your habits right now will eventually lead to you contracting Alzheimer's, becoming obese, because lethargic, with no attention span and suffering from a heart attack. This is no joke either, get your sleep. I'm leaving my girlfriend over her disgusting actions when she was drunk. She claims she doesn't remember them but I think she's lying. I had enough of it all. Her blatantly trying to F my childhood friend in front of me was a sign of disrespect and I had to resolve it with my girlfriend. I sent her a text asking her to explain her actions, and once again she claimed she had no idea what I was talking about. That was my breaking point. After work yesterday, I called my girlfriend and ended things. I told her my reasoning for this and brought up her being a pathological liar. It started off with a lot of crying and pleading, her begging me to stay, but when she realized I wasn't budging she turned hostile and started calling me a pathetic loser. I just hung up on her because I didn't really want to deal with it after an 11 hour shift. She then went on to text me this. Ha 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 you are effing pathetic. Your two was to even break up with your chest. You must think I'm stupid, I know the real reason is because of the other night. Sorry it's not my fault your friend is hotter than you. Being around him and you at the same time made me realize how much I settled and how much more is out there. Have a nice life honey. Followed by. If I hit up your friend tonight mind your business. And then she sent a screenshot of a meme saying, when you realize you pick the ugliest one in the friend group. So yeah, definitely full of crap. Definitely knew exactly what she was doing, definitely dodged a bullet. I sent those screenshots to my friend and he called me. He laughed hysterically and said, damn bro you really know how to pick the crazy ones. But she is delusional if she thinks I'd leave my girlfriend over someone who acts like that. You can be pretty as you want but if you act like dog crap you are dog crap, and you can't polish dog crap. 
We had a good laugh at her expense and he told me to call him if I need anything. My manipulative ex-boyfriend lied to me throughout our entire relationship. Years later he has come crawling back giving me the opportunity for revenge. I started seeing a guy I met in the gym two and a half years ago. He was cute and romantic, swept me off my feet and really made me feel for him. I loved him with every fiber of my being. Everything was going well for us, regular intimacy and great emotional chemistry. However, 10 months in when he confessed he technically had a girlfriend who he had been living with for a few years. He explained to me that they were pretty much broken up and it was more of a roommate situation until their lease ran out then he was going to leave her properly and get out. He kept telling me how she was mentally abusive to him and super codependent. He stated he was miserable and felt trapped, he was just waiting out the lease on their apartment. I was angry that he hadn't told me earlier but I understood why it was something awkward to bring up and explain to him that I wasn't comfortable with the situation. However we had a great relationship and a deep connection and if he was serious about leaving her we could figure something out. He told me that she was very aware he was leaving her and she didn't care about who he was seeing or anything like that, and if I'm being honest I was so infatuated with this man I felt no reason to question it, I just believed him. So we continued our relationship and the date the lease ran out got closer and closer and he was making zero effort to move out. He would mention it occasionally but with no real plan of action so I started getting suspicious. He told me she was being manipulated and saying that if he moved out her life would be ruined and she wouldn't be able to afford her bills and may hurt herself, he said that although he didn't want to be around her he didn't want to add any more stress or pain to her life and he felt he had a duty of care to her so they ended up renewing their lease. So given that I don't want to be labeled as a homewrecker, I met up with him and explained how he's made me feel completely used. That it seemed to me like he doesn't care about me or our relationship. He basically responded by love bombing me. He was telling me I was his soulmate and that one day he was going to marry me. He just doesn't have the heart to hurt her and cause her more stress, but he would get out when she was more stable and we would be together. As previously stated, up to this point I was under the impression that she knew he was seeing someone and was planning on leaving her, I then found out from a mutual friend that was a total lie. She still thought he was her boyfriend and even though their relationship was rocky, she had no idea he was planning on leaving and even less idea he was seeing anyone else, much less sleeping with someone else. I was absolutely furious when I heard this. I cut everything off entirely, I told him I knew he had been lying to both of us and not to contact me again. I stopped responding to his messages, I thought this would be the end of it and I started moving on with my life. Fast forward to about 3 months ago, I walked into a cafe and there he was, sitting alone in a corner, I got my coffee and sat down far away from him. Clearly I didn't sit far enough away because he walks over and asks if he can sit down, I say yes and we have a bit of a catch up chat. He apologizes for everything that happened and throws in a bit of guilt tripping and a woe is me story of how bad the relationship was. I hear him out mainly just for my own closure's sake. So I get home and do a bit of snooping on Facebook. I see they're still together, still living together, and she's pregnant. By this point I'm just relieved I dodged a bullet and I'm not a part of their toxic situation anymore. So then last week he messages me, he tells me he's not stopped thinking about me since he saw me, letting me go was the biggest mistake of his life, and he wants me back. He starts going on about how seeing me brought back all the memories and reminded him of how happy we were. He also tells me he still believes we are soulmates. He finishes his overdramatic wall of text by saying he has finally got his life sorted out and is single, he then asked me if I would be willing to give him another chance. I don't mention that I've seen they're still together or any of that stuff, I just reply saying it was good to see him but I've moved on. I've been thinking about this for a few days now and I just don't know if I should tell his girlfriend. Should I? My manipulative ex-boyfriend lied to me throughout our entire relationship. Years later he has come crawling back giving me the opportunity for revenge. I ended up telling my ex what I knew. I messaged him letting him know that I knew that he and his ex had never broken up as he said they had, I told him that I knew she was pregnant and I wasn't afraid to tell her what he was doing. He tried to deny everything and said that I must be mistaken. That they had definitely broken up and she was not pregnant and if she was somehow pregnant it was nothing to do with him. I sent him screenshots of the announcement from her public Facebook posts with him tagged. I basically told him that I wanted the full truth from him and asked him what made him think he was going to get away with manipulating and lying to two women who deserved better than him. He got defensive but finally told me that he didn't love her and didn't want to be with her. That the pregnancy had just happened and she was so happy he didn't want to ruin her joy by leaving her. He told me that he really had meant everything he had ever said to me and that one day he thought we could work it out. I told him I'd been done with him for a long time and wanted nothing to do with him going forward, he seemed upset and slightly shocked at this revelation. I told him that I have chat logs of all our previous conversations going back 3 to 4 years since he came into my life. I said I have all the conversations where he had told me he was leaving her, the conversations where he had lied and said she knew he was seeing someone, all the chats where he had tried to manipulate me into staying with him, messages where he had told me he loved me and couldn't stand her and couldn't wait for their tenancy to run out so he could leave, and even him trying to reach out a few weeks ago. I even have a screenshot of him making fun of his girlfriend's weight and appearance to me, something I scolded him for. I made him aware. I had all of it and would be forwarding it to her because she has a right to know what sort of man she is having a child with. He practically begged me not to and told me she wasn't mentally stable enough to deal with this right now. 
In the end he blocked me on WhatsApp so I decided to leave it and didn't message her, I assumed he would just take this as a warning and do better. And then she messaged me on Facebook. She sent me a message accusing me of trying to ruin her relationship and start an affair with her best friend and soulmate. I don't know exactly what he had said to her about me but I didn't want to be painted as the bad guy in this so I decided to just go nuclear and sent her literally everything and an apology to go with it. I told her that I had been seeing him beforehand and was under the impression they were separated and she knew everything about us. In the screenshots I sent it showed his phone number so she would clearly know it was him who had sent the messages. Due to this, he wouldn't be able to easily gaslight her into believing he was innocent. I calmly advised her to read everything then she could make her own choices. I blocked her and him on Facebook and blocked him on WhatsApp too and deactivated my Facebook account just in case anyone else tried to involve themselves. Edit, she just messaged me asking for help because she confronted him about it and he blew up at her, trying to literally strangle her. I'm going to try house her for a few days. I have fallen in love with my girlfriend's fat and ugly sister. I think she feels the same way. I want her more than anything. I have been with my girlfriend for almost a year now. We live together, and overall we are happy together. We live in our home state, and her younger sister, whom I'll refer to as Beauty, lives in a different state with her husband. I had only seen pictures of beauty from when she was younger and only heard her on the phone when she and my girlfriend talk. My girlfriend often speaks negatively about beauty's appearance, calling her a fat whale, a beluga and ugly behind her back on a daily basis. She says things like, I talked to beauty today, she was showing me new cute clothes she bought, and she looks so fat in them. Beauty layered her hair and it looks ugly as hell. Beauty's husband built her a library in their home. Can you believe he would do that? I don't know what he sees in her. She isn't even pretty. It sounds like jealousy, but their relationship has never been particularly close. My girlfriend talks about their childhood and how different they were, often emphasizing their petty fights and annoyances. My girlfriend also states that she was the golden child, and this often upset Beauty as her parents would take my girlfriend's side. However, my girlfriend says that was a long time ago and Beauty should let go of that. Personally, I don't pick sides, but they still argue a lot. The only thing that has changed now is that they can hang up when they get annoyed and start fresh another day. Last spring, only a couple of months into my relationship with my girlfriend, Beauty came to visit with her husband. When I first saw Beauty smile, it was like a ray of sunshine. Her face is round and soft, her cheeks are bubbly rosy, and she has a cute double chin. She has a contagious chuckle that made me chuckle with her. She is kind and very welcoming. She hugged me when we were introduced, squeezing me with her thick arms into her ample chest. I can't deny it, I fell in love with that hug. She was wearing a purple dress, and her hair was long and wavy. I can't fathom how anyone could consider her ugly. That night we had dinner, and she was so funny and talkative. My girlfriend was in a good mood, and every time I looked over, they were huddled together, laughing and gossiping. I admit I mostly focused on beauty. She outshone my girlfriend in my eyes. I met her husband, whom I'll call Beast, because of his imposing appearance. He's a big guy, tall and muscular, with a long beard and covered in tattoos. They look like a demon and an angel together. She is soft and round, very fluffy around the edges and acute as a dough ball, and he is a rock, word to Dwayne Johnson. She smiles with her teeth, and he smirks slightly in conversation, but when he grins, it's with teeth. I got to talking to Beast and mentioned the girls. He said that my girlfriend was great and that he's glad she and Beauty have a good relationship. I complimented Beauty, saying she was funny and sweet. Beast got a distant look in his eyes and shared that he fell in love with Beauty at first sight. He proposed within eight weeks, and she told him to be patient, but they married within seven months of dating. They eloped, and when they got married, Beast told Beauty she didn't need to work anymore. He supports her hobbies and just wants her to be happy. I got jealous at that point, thinking I could do the same. I tried stirring the pot by making an inappropriate comment like, a hardworking guy like you can't possibly want to be with a lazy woman, can you? I could see him holding back the urge to slap me. Soon after, Beauty and Beast left, and I had to rely on social media to keep tabs. It turns out Beauty was pregnant the last time we saw her. I followed her on social media, messaged her occasionally, and commented on her pictures and posts. A couple of days ago, Beauty and Beast visited my girlfriend's parents' house. When we arrived, my girlfriend immediately asked her mom about Beauty and made a joke about her weight. They laughed together, and my girlfriend handed me a stuffed animal for the baby, suggesting I go give it to Beauty while she helped her mom. When I went outside, I found Beauty on a hammock with the baby. She was wearing a white dress, gently swinging with the baby on her chest while breastfeeding. Beast was sitting in a chair nearby, watching over them. She hummed and I felt jealous. I wanted to be there, in his shoes, watching over Beauty with our child, feeling calm and at peace. Beast's back was to me, and he didn't see me watching. When he got up and picked up the baby, I even caught a glimpse of Beauty's nip before she discreetly covered herself. I'll admit it, I got a stiffy. I've become obsessed with Beauty, and I know I need to end my relationship with my girlfriend. It's been almost a year, and it's become too casual for both of us. We're not deeply in love, but we've grown comfortable with each other. She sometimes messages me first, asking about our relationship or anything along those lines. Her messages can be flirtatious at times too. Last night I had a dream in which I was doing the deed with beauty and I woke up with my undies stained. I can't keep doing this. My disabled brother has ruined my family's life. I plan to put an end to it all tonight. I will go through with it and I don't care about the repercussions. 
My brother is nonverbal autistic and the biggest effing vegetable I have ever encountered in this godforsaken life. What this spasmoid can't communicate in words he communicates through violence like. Nothing anybody says or does can change his toddler level mind. He understands no, and he finds it funny. I grew up being told not to show fear or anger in front of him because it would only egg him on. My parents did everything they possibly could for this fat waste of oxygen. When he and I first got diagnosed, they took training and education programs to learn how to best help us with our challenges regarding the turnip. They took him to therapy regularly. They spent countless hours searching for any resources that could help this carrot live a better life. They tried all kinds of medications the psychiatrist suggested, and nothing short of straight-up sedation ever helped. They even sent him off to a temporary residential facility hoping it could provide him the help he needed, and the place sent the nonverbal sausage back saying he was a ray of sunshine and they loved having him. He came home, and within two weeks our home was causing ruckus again. I watched this spaz touch my mom and dad. Eskually, very obviously eskually. They'd sit there and do nothing, because it was better than the tantrum he'd throw if they resisted. Everything in our lives was about avoiding setting that piece of human waste off. I watched them wrestle their own son to protect me. I saw the bite mark on my mom's arm, the one she got trying to restrain the dimwit from attacking me. The mark that didn't go away for months, that left nerve damage that still hasn't fully healed. It'll probably never heal. Not without physical therapy, which she'll probably never have time for because caring for that abomination is a 24-7 job. I remember when dad first started locking himself in his bedroom to keep out his own son at night. What set it off is my brother climbed into mom and dad's bed at night and woke my dad up with brain. Every day, I remember hearing my mom's blood-curdling screams from downstairs, her begging the slimy fat disgusting pig to stop. I ran downstairs to find the vegetable pinning him to the ground, tears streaming down her face as she yelled at me to run and get dad. I remember all the times my mom cried because she felt powerless to help her son, I remember the fights my parents used to have about what the hell to do. The chill, light-hearted, go-with-the-flow father from my early childhood has transformed into a shell of his former self. He rarely talks to anyone anymore. When he does, he's always irritable. He takes anti-anxiety medications now. My mother and I think he has PTSD. From his own child. All mom ever wanted in life was a happy family. The kind that sits down and eats dinner together, goes on fun trips together, laughs and smiles together and makes good memories. Having that, thing, destroyed that dream. I refuse to let it destroy mine. I'm going to unalive him tonight in his sleep and frame it as S aside. I cheated on my abusive husband and fell in love with my affair partner during my divorce. My husband's reaction was unexpected. I'm in the middle of a messy divorce with my husband. I started dating him when I was 15 and he was 19. We got married four years later as marrying him was the only way to escape my abusive childhood home. As a teenager, I was broken in mind body and spirit from repeated childhood rope at the hands of my father. As far as my husband went, he made me feel complete when I was with him at the time. I was getting preyed on by someone who took advantage of my need for a safe space, but sadly I was too young to realize it. He love bombed me a lot, he used to tell me he would protect me from my father and from the hurt the world had to offer. I believed him. I thought if I was with him, I'd be okay. Things were okay for the most part, he laid hands on me sometimes, but compared to my childhood it was nothing, therefore in comparison I thought I was in a loving relationship. Then my husband lost his best friend in a car accident. His infrequent outbursts became more common as his drinking got worse. He would scream at me tell me I was worthless and stupid, laughing at me for being roped when I was young, making jokes out of it at his friends, and started laying hands on me harder and more often. He was telling me I wasn't enough anymore. Then he started turning into a monster. Three months after the death of his best friend, he roped me for the first time. He knew my past, he knew my trauma regarding it, but he did it anyway. Then he continued roping me. If I said no to it, he laid hands on me. He burned me, whipped me. Shortly after he cheated on me with his friend's girlfriend, and his brother's girlfriend. To be honest, I thought I deserved this behavior. I thought I deserved the abuse because I wasn't good enough. Everything he had told me, it started to make me question my own self-worth. This is where my infidelity started. I found out about his friend's girlfriend because a friend told me. My husband didn't deny it, if anything he took pride in it. I felt broken. I resolved to stay and work it out with him, but I ended up close with his friend. We started hanging out together, and I felt very safe with him super quickly. He seemed unlike my husband, his mannerisms, the way he treated me, everything about him was different. I pumped the brakes on our relationship when I thought I might have feelings for the friend and talked with my husband. He, maybe because he was drunk, maybe because he thought I wouldn't do it, gave me the go ahead to sleep with his friend. He said he figured if he effed around, I could too. And so I did. I enjoyed every minute with him. At first, it was purely intimate. He was leaving a bad relationship, and didn't have a micro PP like my husband. I was trying to learn how to ask for what I wanted and was practicing saying no with him. Our relationship developed over time, I found out how awesome he was, and little by little, 
my personality felt like it was coming back. One day, I decided to tell him everything my husband did to me. With my new confidence, I learned that I didn't deserve what I was being put through. He was absolutely horrified. Said he figured something was up, but didn't realize to what extent. He said he would be there for me, no matter what, and he was. We fell in love, and I didn't know what to do. He loves me, but isn't sure if he wants to be with me because of the severe blowback he'd have personally. I ended up deciding to get divorced from my husband. Even if I couldn't have my husband's friend, I knew that I couldn't be in that home, constantly scared and freaking out, trying not to set my husband off. Filing for divorce served like a switch for my husband. He stopped drinking immediately, said he would go to couples therapy, and honestly, all the abuse stopped. All the physical, intimate, emotional and verbal. I felt like I was making the wrong decision. Like I should stay, but I knew I could not ever go back to how it was. He asked me to stop seeing my partner. I told him I did, but I did not. I couldn't, and even though my husband was trying, I couldn't get over everything he did to me over the last three years. Maybe I could have if I stopped seeing my friend, but I didn't. I just knew I never wanted to go back to the potential of that. Now, I feel horrible, I still am seeing my friend. I'm still in love with him. Even with the uncertain future, I enjoy every day I get to see him. He said he feels the same. The guilt about it eats at me, but I just can't stop seeing him. My boyfriend verbally assaulted my best friend's boyfriend. My best friend is now distant and I don't know whose side to take. F them all honestly. Two nights ago my best friend and her boyfriend came to mine and my boyfriend's house for dinner and drinks. I'll call them Jack and Jill, because they definitely went up the hill. This was the first time my boyfriend had met them. Everything was going fine at first. Jill and I were catching up, my boyfriend and Jack were having beers and talking football while my boyfriend manned the barbecue. While we were eating, Jack and Jill brought up that they are looking at rentals in the area. Jill wanted to be closer to her family and her job was one she could do remotely. I was ecstatic to get my best friend back in town. They said Jack was having a hard time finding work though and they needed two incomes to be able to afford a place in our area. Jack graduated with a political science degree. He said he'd applied to some local newspapers and some positions for the city. He also had applications with various campaigns and political groups. My boyfriend chimed in and said if Jack was interested he could work for him. My boyfriend runs a small car detailing company. He has three work vans that he outfitted for car detailing. Basically he drives to people's homes and cleans their cars. He's booked out months in advance. It's actually quite impressive and he makes good money. He offered to train Jack and pay him $24 an hour to start if Jack could commit to at least a year of working for him. Jack kind of scoffed at the offer and told my boyfriend he didn't spend tens of thousands on a degree to clean cars. Which I can understand. But it did come across as rude. My boyfriend said fair enough. But here's where I think my boyfriend took it to the next level. He asked Jack who was paying for the gas for their road trip. Jack didn't answer. He asked Jack who was paying for their food on the trip. Jack didn't answer. He asked him how. They would get approved for a rental if he couldn't verify employment. Jack was visibly getting ticked off. I hinted to my boyfriend he needed to cut it out but he kept going with the questions and eventually Jill interrupted and said it was time for them to leave. This was the first time I'd seen her in a long time and they were supposed to crash at our place that night. Before they left she told me my boyfriend was an a-hole and she wouldn't be coming back if he was there. Boyfriend and I fought all night. I asked him why he couldn't just bite his tongue for the sake of keeping the peace and that everything was going great till that conversation. He told me Jack was pretentious wuss and he was trying to help my friends out by offering him a job. I told him it was a nice gesture but understood why Jack didn't want a blue-collar job making $24 an hour after spending a ton of money on college. He responded by telling me that a blue-collar job is why he's able to pay for this house and all your stuff. I work part-time, but he does cover most of our expenses. This was the first time he's ever thrown that in my face in our relationship. I called him an a-hole. He's been sleeping on the couch. It's been a bad vibe between us. I don't know how to approach the situation. Jill and I have been texting and she said I'm not coming around again unless my boyfriend apologizes to Jack. When I told boyfriend this he said Jack can go flip burgers and F off. I can't leave my boyfriend and I do love him. But I want to be able to hang out with my best friend, especially when she moves back. I don't know what to do. My boyfriend verbally assaulted my best friend's boyfriend. My best friend is now distant and I don't know whose side to take. That night I messaged my best friend Jill and told her that we needed to meet in person, just us, and find a way to make this fall out right. She agreed and told me she had something to tell me, in hindsight I was not prepared for what she told me. We met at a local bar, just the two of us, and once again, I was not expecting things to go the way they did. Originally they were supposed to stay the night at our place the night of the barbecue. When they left after the incident they went to Jill's father's and stepmother's house. They weren't expecting them till the following night. When they asked what happened Jack and Jill told them about the job offer incident. And they didn't get the response they were expecting. Turns out, and I don't know how I didn't know this, my boyfriend has been detailing Jill's father and stepmother's cars once a month since before we were even together. 
They're a well-known real estate team in our area. My boyfriend does their show cars that they use to shovel around prospective buyers when looking at properties. They had nothing but glowing things to say about my boyfriend. Jill said she told her father in private about the way in which Jack refused the job offer and his comment about not spending thousands on college to clean cars. She said her dad laughed in her face and said you know her boyfriend probably makes about as much as I do, if not more right? Her dad told her how my boyfriend does almost everyone's cars in his office and that he's referred him to tons of people that he's sold homes to. When Jill told him that he offered Jack $24 an hour with a year-long commitment he told her that Jack would be a fool not to jump on it and that if he could still get the job they could live with them and save money during that year to put down on the place. He also told her that her and Jack's elitist attitude was troubling and that he raised her better and was disappointed in her. She said she felt like crap about how everything went down and seeing her dad look at her that way made her realize how in the wrong they were. Jill said she was going to talk with Jack when she got home from our meetup and convince him to apologize together to my boyfriend and pray that my boyfriend will still offer Jack the job. I told her I wouldn't hold my breath if I was her and that even I felt like I was on thin ice. That night my boyfriend and I finally talked. I apologized profusely. I told him how wrong I was not to stick up for him. I told him I appreciated him and didn't mean to downplay his job or its importance to us. I told him it was his house and he should never have to listen to anyone disrespect him like that. Especially when he was offering his hospitality and trying to help them. Tears started flowing. As I spoke I realized that I had effed up really badly. Everything kind of became a blur and I started hyperventilating. I was begging him not to leave me and telling him I loved him. He put his arms around me and told me to relax while I bawled in his chest. I hadn't cried like that in a long time. I think the reality that he'd be well justified in kicking me out kinda hit me all at once. After I calmed down we sat down and he explained why he was so upset. He said he felt my reaction showed that I didn't understand how hard he works to provide us the life we have. He said he doesn't think I understand the struggles he endured to get to where he is. He told me that before he met me and his company was just getting off the ground, he basically lived in one of his work vans for six months. He maxed out multiple credit cards and borrowed money from his parents to start everything. He told me that when I said the just clean cars bit. That it really hurt him to hear me downplay his hard work. This hurt me so much to hear. I told him I'm just a stupid. Spoiled girl and I was so sorry. I told him I didn't know about his hardships before meeting me. He'd never talked about them. He said well, now you know. I nodded and told him something like this will never happen again. He slept in the bedroom that night and we had amazing intimacy till the early morning hours. The next morning Jill reached out to my boyfriend on Facebook. She asked if she and Jack could come over and talk. He, to my surprise, said yes. They came over that evening. There was an awkward tension you could almost touch. Jill was the first one to talk. She said that she didn't know my boyfriend did her dad's and stepmom's cars. My boyfriend replied with a yep. With a poop-eating grin. Jill said they had nothing but good things to say about him and that they didn't mean to disrespect him and they really appreciated the offer. She said she felt like he was trying to humiliate Jack and she was just sticking up for her boyfriend. When she said that, my boyfriend briefly shot me a look as if to say like you should have. I felt a little sting. He said he understood, and that he felt like he was being looked down on and was just trying to make a point. But that he took it too far. He actually apologized. This is where things took a wrong turn. Jill looked at Jack and said is there anything you want to say babe? Jack apologized and asked if the offer still stood. Again, to my surprise, my boyfriend said it did if he could commit to a year. Jack said he had two questions. Can he leave if he finds a job in his field and gives 30 days notice? Boyfriend said yes. The next wasn't a question, but more of a demand, and it didn't go well, he said he wouldn't work weekends. Jill looked puzzled and said what? My boyfriend said that wasn't possible. He said the weekends are money makers and working at least Saturdays would be a must. He told Jack on a given Saturday he'd make over $100 in cash tips on top of wages. Jack said he didn't think he could accept the offer then. Jack and Jill started fighting between themselves. They got more and more heated with Jill explaining if they were gonna move then they didn't have a choice and him working Saturdays wouldn't be a big deal and they needed the money. Jack said he needed Saturdays for downtime to job hunt online for jobs in his field. Jill eventually gave up, thanked my boyfriend and said they needed to leave. As they left my boyfriend couldn't help himself and said you know Jill, if you want some work on the side, you can come work for me on Saturdays. I'll pay you cash under the table and you can keep your tips, you'd probably make a killing. She got a big poop-eating grin, turned to Jack, then back to my boyfriend and said you know what? I just might. I really might take you up on that. Thank you for the offer. For some reason I think she was being dead serious. When they were gone my boyfriend turned to me and said I don't think we'll be seeing Jack again. I replied I think he might be right. An hour later Jill texted me and told me she's going to break up with Jack when they get back home and she's gonna move in with her parents. She asked if boyfriend was serious about the offer. All in all, this was eye-opening and I think we're closer now. I tried to make my girlfriend taste like Jolly Ranchers while going down on her and it was the worst mistake of my life. What a way to find out my girlfriend has been cheating on me. So me and my girlfriend Samantha started college in August. 
Sadly, we had to go to different universities, and so she went to Florida State, and I went to Pennsylvania. A few weeks ago, Samantha flew out to Pennsylvania to surprise me with a visit, and I was delighted to see her. The time we spent together was phenomenal, on the second night of her staying I decided to go down on her and absolutely blow her mind. I had done this numerous times before and I always enjoyed doing it. But for some reason, this time, she smelled really horrible, I couldn't make the smell out but it was gut-wrenching, and the taste was even worse. I felt like an autistic person being forced to eat something other than chicken nuggets. Now, I didn't want to offend her by saying this to her, so I did what any reasonable man would do. I put a Jolly Rancher in my mouth to cover up the soul-crushing smell and taste that was running rings around me. Sadly, it did not do much to help as the smell was still emasculating me. Throughout the course of going down on her, I accidentally pushed the Jolly Rancher inside of her womanhood. And so I stuck a finger in to grab it out. I took it out, and put it back in my gob and bit it. Only. It wasn't the Jolly Rancher. It was a nodule of gonorrhea. As in, the blister-like structure that gonorrhea makes, which was the size of a effing Jolly Rancher and I bit it. It was really dark in the room so I did not see it. I freaked out and the sensation and taste made me start vomiting all over the place when it exploded in my mouth. I demanded to know what was going on. Turns out Samantha had cheated on me at a club during the first week of college, and f some random guy and she had no clue what was wrong with her. She noticed a strange smell though but never said anything. I ate the rice from my girlfriend's period sock. It did not go down too well. In hindsight, not the smartest thing to do. So my girlfriend has very painful periods, to combat the cramps that she experiences she uses a rice sock. This is a phenomenon to me and I was in awe when she first told me about it and claimed it actually works. Anyways, she puts on cooked rice in an old sock of her, then heats it up in the microwave to help with cramps whenever she is on her monthly, then puts the sock away when she feels better. One thing to note is that we are extremely poor, eating one meal per day kind of poor. Therefore, she has been using the same sock for a while. We have no spare socks and the tiny amount of money we have is better spent on food than on clean socks, therefore my girlfriend insists on reusing the same sock. The thing is, the sock is easily forgettable because it makes an appearance only once a month then goes back into hibernation. She hasn't replaced the rice or the sock in a long time. Once again, we are poor, we don't have enough money to waste a serving of rice each month for her sock and she understands this, therefore uses the same rice as well, it does the job. So yesterday, my girlfriend and I found ourselves with literally nothing in the pantry, except packets of condiments. That is when I remembered the sock full of rice. My girlfriend flat out refused because she didn't want to eat rice that was constantly marinated for months in a dirty old sock. She also didn't trust that it was safe to consume considering that it's been there for a while. I felt like it was perfectly fine, rice takes a long time to expire. After I finished cooking the rice, my girlfriend was so hungry that she changed her mind so we ate it with packets of sweet and sour sauce. That same night, I was trying to sleep when I got terrible stomach pain. This pain came deep from within, and I proceeded to have the worst diarrhea of my life. I was sweating and shivering on the toilet at the same time, breaking out into cold sweats. I spent the whole night going in and out of the toilet to puke and poop, but for some reason, my girlfriend was not affected. My bipolar sister has made a viral mummy blog by impersonating me and I don't know how to confront her without her breaking down. So my older sister June has been living with me, my husband Daniel, and our baby daughter Lee since before Lee was born. She had to move in with us around three years ago because she lost her job after trying to F her boss and couldn't find new work in her field. One thing to note about her is she has bipolar, but her medications make it very manageable. She hasn't had an episode in years thanks to the help she gets from the meds as well as her therapist. Before moving in with us, she'd been living with her long-term boyfriend but they'd gotten into an argument about her trying to sleep with the boss for the promotion and he ended up kicking her out. She had nowhere to go since we didn't have any family nearby. When that happened, I talked with Daniel and asked if she could stay with us until she got back on her feet. She could help me around the house since I was pregnant at the time. My husband works long hours and didn't like the idea of me being home alone, especially while pregnant, so he agreed saying it was a good idea. We were wary of her bipolar and the potential of her having a breakdown around the baby, but we trusted her to keep it under control, and thankfully she has. June had been very grateful for the place to stay and was a great help around the house. And she has been an even bigger help after Lee was born. I still did the bulk of the child care with Daniel right there to help when he's home. But it's nice to have someone else at home during the day to share the workload with. And Lee loves her Aunt Jeannie. The problem came today when I was looking up matching mommy and baby princess dresses since I was hoping for Lee and I to be matching queen and princess for Halloween this year. Well I got sucked down the mommy blog rabbit hole and spent almost an hour looking through blogs until I saw a familiar kitchen. It was. Familiar because it was my kitchen. I know because I decorated my kitchen myself and it's a rustic country theme and I have three antique copper jello molds my grandma gave me hanging on the wall next to the fridge. Plus I could see the treat bell I'd made for our kitty hanging on the fridge handle. I clicked on the picture and it took me to a mommy blog run by Mommy Jenny, which is my name, but in reality it was run by June. The more I scrolled through the blog the more disturbed I got. She had pictures of herself up in my house like it was hers, she was wearing my clothes. There were pictures of her and Lee all tagged mommy and daughter, and even a couple pictures of her, Lee, and Daniel that I recognized. I'd been in the photos but she'd apparently cropped me out of them. What do I do? How the hell do I even broach this?
Bipolar my sister has made a viral mummy blog by impersonating me and I don't know how to confront her without her breaking down. The last year has been a lot to process. To start, my sister June is no longer living with me and my family. First off, I sat Daniel down the next day and told him everything about what June was doing. I showed him the blog and he was incredibly disturbed by it and upset too. He didn't like how many photos of our baby daughter Lee were up online without our knowledge. He was worried if June was mentally okay because this was nuts to him and I said I wasn't sure but I was worried about her too. We agreed we needed to talk to her ASAP, but we also acknowledged that we need to be careful when broaching the subject as the last thing we needed was her having a breakdown or an episode. So he took Lee to his parents' house to stay the night before coming back home. Then I contacted our parents for a video call and told them about June's blog I found. I felt like they needed to know what was going on. Our mom was shocked but our dad didn't believe it so I sent them a link to the blog. They were quiet while they looked through it, and I talked to them about how Daniel and I were understandably weirded out and concerned for June. Out of them both dad looked the most disappointed while mom just looked stunned. I told them June couldn't stay here anymore because of this but we didn't want her out on the street, and they said she could come stay with them. They wanted to be there on call while we confronted June but I said all of us together would probably make her feel like she was being attacked and increase the risk of an episode, so I said we'd call them afterwards but do the confronting alone. Then after hanging up with them I made sure I had my laptop there half shut with the blog open in case she tried to deny it. And I'd screenshot it and recorded countless pages of the blog in case she tried deleting it to sweep it all under the rug. Which ended up being a good idea. When June sat down she asked what was wrong and I asked her if she had anything she'd like to come clean to us about. She's still my big sister and I love her, so I wanted to give her a chance to own up to this on her own. But sadly she said no, so I told her I found her mommy blog. She was silent before saying she didn't know what I was talking about. So I opened my laptop and showed her the blog. She still tried to deny it and said it wasn't okay that I was blaming her for this when we didn't even know if it was her doing it. She said she'd never even seen this blog before nor ever been to the site it was on. Daniel told her to get her laptop and they'd start typing in the blog URL and if no shortcuts appeared then she was telling the truth, she'd never been to the site. But if one did come up? Well she was lying. She said we were being ridiculous but I insisted she get her laptop and just prove us wrong. If we were wrong then we'd apologize. She hemmed and hawed for a bit before reluctantly getting her laptop. I noticed she was gripping it really tight and after she opened it and signed and I guess she realized she was backed into a corner, so she just broke down into loud sobs. She started babbling out apologies and I asked her why she did this, why even fake being me and starting a blog? I asked if it was for money, and she said no, so I asked her to please explain to me why this was a thing she felt the need to do. She explained that she did it to feel happy and that she started it a little while after moving in with us. She said it wasn't fair that I had it all while she was old and unwanted. I told her she wasn't old or unwanted, we love her and so do our parents and so do the rest of her friends and family. She got angry and said it wasn't the same. And there was no way for me to understand what she's going through because I was everyone's favorite. I didn't know what she was talking about. I said I wasn't. Everyone's favorite and that's when she exploded and said I was a blind a-hole if I didn't see how everyone in our lives always prefers me over her. I could see her slipping into a bipolar episode so I tried my best to mediate and keep her calm. She claimed everyone loved me more and I always got what I wanted no matter what and I'll admit hearing that set me off. I tried staying calm, but sadly failed. I told her that was actually not true, she was the oldest, and if we're being honest she always got what she wanted before me. Especially from our dad. I reminded her that he's bought her three cars over her adult life, a $4,000 laptop when she started college, which he broke, so he bought her another one, and even paid off her first set of student loans for her. Meanwhile he never did any of that for me. I didn't get to attend college because I didn't have the money and didn't want loans because I wasn't sure I'd be able to pay them back on time. The closest I got to what she got was when our dad offered to sell me his old car for cheap and gave me his old laptop after he upgraded with a brand new one. I said I loved her but told her she had to see how delusional she was being if she thought I was somehow the favorite. We got a little heated and argued back and forth so I told her she needed to pack her things because she couldn't stay here anymore and that's when her episode was triggered. That's when she started bawling and begging me not to kick her out onto the streets. I told her she wasn't going onto the streets and she could just go stay with our parents. They live a couple hours away so it's not like she was going to be homeless. She kept crying and said she'd delete the blog if we let her stay. I refused and said she needed to go to therapy, not stay here. While we were talking, her trying to compromise and me rejecting it, she opened the blog and began deleting everything. She kept repeating through tears I'll delete it I'll delete it. I'll get rid of everything and won't post anything else. As if to convince me to take back my decision. I made it clear through all of this that she was not staying here anymore no matter what she did. Once she deleted it she said we were all good now. It's gone. But I told her it didn't matter, she wasn't staying here. That's when she got mad and said but I deleted it. There's no problem now. Like deleting it made it not happen. We told her to get ready because our parents were on their way to pick her up and they knew the situation. That caused her to start really flipping out. She was furious that I told our parents about the blog and said she wouldn't be able to look at our parents now. Things got messy and police were called by a neighbor because of just how loudly she was screaming and because she started trying to lay hands on me. 
My husband Daniel had to restrain her. The cops arrived before our parents did and she almost got taken into custody for being too aggressive and not settling down when the officer told her to calm herself the first time. So we had two cops there while she packed her stuff up. And then our parents arrived and it was just a very tense affair. I told her I loved her as she was leaving but she literally spat at me and stated that she hated me. That hurt a lot. But I tried not to take it to heart. A few months passed and our mom kept me updated on how June was doing. Our parents said she stopped going to therapy and has started spiraling since, they don't know what to do with her. My husband's ex-girlfriend is dying and her final wish is to be with him but she is another country. My husband wants to buy plane tickets. The fact my husband is complying with her wish is making me sick. So my husband Seb and his ex Tanya became best friends after their breakup a couple of years ago due to her infidelity. They were together for five years. They remained in contact even before he met me. I would be lying if I say it never made me feel uncomfortable even once. It did and it still does because Tanya is still in love with my husband and it is so painfully clear. She never denied it and in fact would even call or message me when she couldn't get a hold of Seb. Throughout our relationship, Seb put her first a lot, he took her for lunch, for coffee, for ketchups basically every week, he spent days at her and her parents' house, all of this made me very uncomfortable. Aside from her cancer, she also has some mental health issues, thus my husband would always tell me to be kind and patient with her. Seb claims he is no longer in love with her as she cheated. He swore to me that he will never get back to her and that he only sees her as family. Well, two weeks ago my husband received a call from Tanya to tell him about the sad news that she is terminal. My husband cried with her and told her everything is going to be okay. They were on the phone for maybe 10 hours. Nowadays, they mostly talk via long distance calls or WhatsApp as Seb and I have moved countries because of a great job opportunity for me and Seb, something Tanya greatly detested at the time. After that call, my husband told me everything. To be honest, I felt bad for her and I genuinely felt sad. I asked him what's going to happen now. Seb told me he's going back to Canada to be with her. He told me that her last wish is to be with him. I didn't say anything except what about me? He said if I can't leave my job, then he's going to visit me whenever he gets the chance. I walked out without saying anything. I've been avoiding my husband since the phone call and have been ignoring him whenever he tries to bring up the conversation. Yesterday, I found out he already bought a ticket and is flying back home in three days. My entire life I've been putting others first. I've been very patient and understanding about their weird relationship. I feel sick and confused. I want to call her, yell at her for ruining my marriage, for trying to steal my husband from me. For using her sickness to get what she wants. The love of my life cheated on me with the guy she told me not to worry about but I think I brought it upon myself. I'm devastated. My now ex-girlfriend, Jess, a bimbo, and I were dating since 8th grade. She was one of the most popular and beautiful girls in our school and I used my Irish charm to get with her. I was an early bloomer, was tall and had fluffy hair, not a perm, since middle school. I was very happy as a pig in crap with our relationship back then but once we got to high school it was a whole different story. Since Shadi was so fine, a lot of the upperclassmen would talk to her. I thought seniors hitting on freshmen was a meme, but I was wrong. At first Jess ignored them and their terrible riz, but come sophomore year I could tell she was getting bored of me, as I began to blend in with the normal crowd. I was no longer the tallest or the buffest, and my naturally curly hair looked like everyone else's perm. The juniors and seniors on the football team that are twice my size and look like they could eat me for breakfast, no homo, and had the appearance of eating cement for breakfast. These were the kind of guys that started talking to her. This made me really insecure, as I was not their size nor their stature, on top of that my speech impediment made it really hard for her to take me serious when I told them to back off. What was even worse was that Jess, the attention wh re that she was, started to entertain their flirting more than usual. I knew if I didn't do something she'd end up leaving me, it was a shallow mindset but that's how my bimbo girlfriend and I thought at the time. I decided to get in the gym to try and put on some size, I needed to be jacked too if I was going to continue my relationship. In the gym, I was as consistent as an addict getting a bag, and started taking my diet very seriously, eating high protein and being in a calorie surplus. The first couple months I saw some okay results, though after that I really started to plateau. I was putting on more fat than muscle even though I was going harder in the gym than before. Sure, it looked like I was lifting, but the only thing it looked like I was lifting was my fork to my mouth. I just couldn't do anything to get bigger muscle wise, but your boy was getting fluffy around the edges. What made it even worse yet again, was that I started seeing Jess talk to these upperclassmen in the hallway when I'd meet her after class, and our relationship became more strained after I begged her to please stop talking to them. She told she was just being friendly, but I had my doubts. Though what happened next was the straw that broke the camel's back, you can probably tell I'm white by that. Either way, Jess was over at my house after school one day before my parents came home from work and we started getting intimate, something we had not done in a while. As things progressed we went up to my bedroom and got undressed, and right before we were about to begin I lost my stiffy. To preface this I had always had a hard time getting going and we usually had to do a lot of foreplay but this time I just couldn't get it up. I looked like someone attempting a deadlift PR way out of their range, trying everything in the book, shaking uncontrollably and trying to put my back into it as much as I could, but Ray Barr was just not moving up. I was staying softer than some Play-Doh, the soft kind. After a very awkward couple minutes we both put our clothes back on and I could tell she was frustrated. I apologized profusely and offered to at least go down on her, 
She seemed okay with this idea but called it quits after I spent an hour trying to make her finish with very limited success. After this, we got back to watching our show, but only a few minutes and she said something came up and she had to go. She actually thought I was an idiot and would believe that. Sure I was fat, unattractive and short with an erectile dysfunction, as well as daddy issues and anxiety, but I was no idiot. I knew what she was doing. Right after she left I knew that was going to be a turning point in our relationship but I didn't expect how quickly the effects were going to come, just like me. Later that night I was checking up on Jess's location and saw she was at a house other than her own so I asked her where she was at via text. After a couple hours of no response and her still being at that house I decided to FaceTime her, it rang a couple of times and she eventually picked up. In the background, I saw a football poster and asked her where she was. She said she was at her cousin's, which I thought was a bit suspicious because she had never mentioned she had cousins that lived in the same town as us. Sadly, before I could even ask her about that, I heard a guy's voice in the background, who'd you say you were on the phone with, his thick accent piercing a dagger through my heart. My blood froze as I realized it was the same guy on the football team that she'd talked to after her African American studies class, and right after her eyes widened, she covered her mouth and hung up. In disbelief of what just happened to me I just stared up at the ceiling in shock, silently crying. It's been a week now and I've seen her in school. She is always with that guy, he's so handsome, and my texts and calls don't go through. I'm shattered and don't know what to do. My boyfriend broke my trust and destroyed my life but he claims it was just a prank. I broke his ribs and punctured his lungs because of what he did. I don't even feel bad for what I did. Almost six years ago, I lost my partner suddenly in an accident while he was overseas on a work trip. When I lost him, I cannot describe the pain and the anguish and the emotional hellscape that I found myself in. We planned a life together and in a fraction of a second it was all gone. In the aftermath I completely collapsed as a human. I left my career in healthcare, I couldn't leave my apartment for three months, I lost 40 pounds and was already really skinny, and I just shut down. In short, I was a mess in every single way. With the support of some very persistent friends, community resources, and an amazing therapist, I started to process and move forward. Through intense therapy and temporary psychiatric help, I've been able to heal over the years, though grieving isn't a linear process. Fast forward to around two and a half years ago when I met my current boyfriend. My boyfriend has a foundation of similar values, ideal relationship dynamics, and communication styles to my late partner but has a completely different personality. At this point, I've honestly pictured what the rest of my life would look like with him in it, and he said the same. He was also the most understanding boyfriend when I first told him about my late partner's passing and my grieving journey. If there was a textbook way to handle the situation, he could have written the whole thing. I truly could not have asked for a better boyfriend. That was until yesterday. My boyfriend likes to play pranks on me, and he's even filmed some of them to upload online. It's not a constant thing or frequent enough for me to always be on my toes, and I've always said that I'm prone to weird things happening to me, so I'm never the wiser when I'm being pranked. They're mostly harmless though. As much as I hate being pranked. In the moment, he's never gone too far, he's always checked in on me. I guess I should say that he had never gone too far until yesterday. He texted me in the morning to confirm dinner plans we had that evening, and I replied asking if he needed me to pick up anything on my way home from work. At least twice a month, he cooks us an elaborate dinner. I'm talking coordinated wine pairings, five courses, tasting menus things like that. I plan to FaceTime him at lunch like I always do. Well he didn't answer me at lunch. I sent him a couple more texts after lunch but he never responded, and when I finished work my phone showed he never even read them. I got a little anxious admittedly but pushed it aside. I don't need to hear from him constantly, but a sudden break in our routine felt weird because he always tells me in advance when something is going on or if he's busy. Always. He also always forgets something for the dinners he makes us and asks me to grab something on the way home. Always. Not today though. I drive to his apartment from work and let myself in with the key he gave me. I expected to hear music, smell some dinner, but it was completely silent. I put my stuff down on the hall bench and walked toward the kitchen. I saw grocery bags at the kitchen's entrance, which I thought was weird. As soon as I entered the kitchen, I saw a broken wine glass at the far end of his kitchen island with a few drops of what I thought was red wine until I saw his feet sticking out. I sprinted around the island and he was laying on his side, facing away from me. There was blood everywhere. On the edge of the island, splatters on the wall, and a large pool of blood around his head. I haven't made the sounds that came out of me since I got the call that my late partner passed. My heart was racing so bad that my chest and head hurt. Though I felt like I was in full-blown panic mode, I physically went into autopilot. I work in healthcare again, so I'm glad that my instincts kicked in. He was on his side, so I flipped him flat on his back. From what I gathered trying to take a medical visual inventory of his injuries, it looked like he was just bleeding from his head. He didn't respond to my voice or a quick sternal rub. He wasn't moving at all, and when I put my ear down to his mouth, I wasn't hearing or feeling breathing. He had blood all over his face, so I couldn't tell if his lips were blue or anything like that. I do remember checking for a pulse and I truthfully didn't feel one though in hindsight I can't be sure if I was mentally stable enough to discern one either way, 
so I tilted his head back and put my hands over his chest to start CPR while screaming at my phone for Siri to call 911. I only got two hard and fast compressions and when he miraculously came back from the dead screaming and laughing that he had pranked me. After that, I'm not going to lie, I blacked out a bit. I remember getting lightheaded, my boyfriend shaking me and him apologizing, I remember him calling off 911, and I remember leaving his apartment covered in what I had obviously figured out was fake blood. I did get a call from 911 to confirm basically that my boyfriend had played a prank and no one needed help. Needless to say, since last night I've been a complete mess, I'm angry and I'm devastated. The entire thing keeps playing in my head, and while the logical part of my brain knows that he pranked me and that he's alive, my body hasn't figured it out. Worse, this completely brought up everything surrounding my late partner, and I feel like I have to start my grieving process for him all over again. The anger I feel isn't a revenge type of anger, but an exhausted type of anger. The rage is so strong and intense that it's taken every ounce of energy away to act on any of it. I guess that's a good thing. My boyfriend has tried calling me over 40 times. He sent me too many texts to count. He even came over to try to talk to me that same night, but luckily even though he has a key, I have a deadbolt chain so he wasn't able to get in. My boyfriend's sister called me this morning in tears apologizing on her brother's behalf and told me how sorry he is. She said that if he would have told her about the prank beforehand, she would have chewed him out for even thinking of the idea. Their parents were horrified as well and have said that they are here to support me in whatever way I need. His sister told me that he had come over to her house after I didn't let him into my place and he was having a major anxiety attack with chest pain, racing heartbeat, and trouble breathing. It was so bad that she took him to the ER where they learned that I had fractured a couple of his ribs while attempting to give him what I thought was life-saving CPR and in the process had also punctured a lung. Bully me for 8 years? Enjoy missing half your body. At the tie of this event I was 14 and as vengeful as a mother ever could get. So, when I was 6, a new kid came to my school, we'll call him Chad, and started picking on me, but I didn't really pay too much attention to him as my parents have always taught me to turn the other cheek. Fast forward a couple of years, and I'm 11, turning the other cheek has resulted in this other cheek getting slapped too. Essentially, the picking transformed into straight up bullying. Chad started calling me names, beating me up for being a nerd, being atheist, his family is Christian, stealing from me, and he even hit me in the leg with a metal baseball bat, breaking my fibula and tibia in one blow. It got to the point where the popular kids he had influence on ganged up on me and beat me up every day. This continued until that very day that I got my revenge. We were leaving on a trip to the zoo. I was widely interested in animals, so I was excited. Chad must have seen this, because he made my day a living hell, picking on me the entire time we were at the zoo. The class got to the bears, and Chad came to me and whispered to me, I'd love you being eaten by those things, it would be sweet. Before we continue, I'll say that there was a 15 foot or so gap that separated the bridge we were standing on and the floor where the bears were. The fall was quite long. The thing is, during this trip we were not supervised as a class, for some reason the teachers figured it would be a good idea to let us kids explore the zoo on our own and meet back at the entrance at a designated time. Due to this, me and Chad were on the bridge alone. I backed off and waited for him to be distracted. I saw the opportunity, grabbed him by the legs and dropped him beside a bear, my intention was to scare him not gonna lie. The bear must have been scared, because he started mauling Chad. Two other bears joined. We were evacuated immediately, somehow I did. Not get into trouble right away, but after having camera footage reviews which proved what I did, I was sent to juvie and my parents disowned me. Anyways, I just recently heard that Chad survived, but is missing both his eyes, his nose, his left arm and both his legs. Edit, I just got a text from my friend that Chad actually committed suicide yesterday. I suspected my strange roommate of sneaking into my room and stealing from me. I wish I had never discovered the truth behind it. So to start things off, my roommate is weird, very weird. I share a dorm with him and he has always rubbed me the wrong way. I'm not sure whether it was the comments about me smelling breedable, the weird stares or the fact he smelled bad, but he was very strange. My suspicions of him sneaking into my room started last month. He texted me asking if I was the one making so much noise in my room, and I replied saying I was at a friend's and wouldn't be back until tomorrow afternoon. I came back early next morning however, earlier than I had told him. I was on my computer doing college work and it was 8.30 am I usually keep my door unlocked in this dorm if I am in it, and the weird roommate just strolls into my room. I said, excuse me? very aggressively to him, and he came back with two conflicting statements when pressed about why he strolled into my room. Sorry, I thought I knocked. Followed by. I thought it was my room. First I didn't give you permission to enter if you knocked, also our rooms are opposite ends of a hallway. It made me feel weird, and I told my boyfriend about it, who bought me a Casa webcam. The very next day following installation, this guy goes into my room while I'm at therapy and it's to pet my cats. All right. That's a little weird that you didn't ask beforehand, but that's okay my cats like being petted. It's like a 1 out of 10 on the creepy scale compared to what I thought was happening. You can come into my room to pet my cats. That's fine I guess. Why not just say that when you try to the other day then? Nothing happens for weeks. Until yesterday. Yesterday was a fairly light day and I didn't even have to go to campus, so I just went to the gym. While I'm at the gym, 
I get an activity detected notification. Since the last time I saw him in my room to pet my cats, every activity detected notification has just been one of the furballs on my desk. Nope. It's him entering my room, not even looking all the way around before he sticks his hands into my hamper and digs around for a minute. Then he immediately goes to my clean undies drawer, and when he's done there, he beelines it for my nightstand where I keep very expensive lingerie, as well as all of my adult toys. He very clearly knows where all of my things are. I'm watching this live at the gym and I'm livid. After he leaves my room, I rewatch the clips and notice he put something back into my hamper on entry. He enters the room with folded fabric in his hands, and goes for my hamper, and then when he's done in the hamper there is nothing in his hands anymore. So he's just been borrowing or stealing my underwear. I text him both on Discord and in our roommate chat, no one is permitted in my room when I'm not there, and especially not to raid my used clothing, undie drawer, or adult stuff drawer. He says sorry and immediately leaves the group chat, and then spams me on Discord and text. Messages. I'm sorry, I don't know what's wrong with me it won't happen again, I have a problem. I just told him, don't speak to me, and only text me about bills. Unfortunately, I don't have parents, my boyfriend lives with his parents who would not be down with me living there, and none of my friends have a place I can stay. I am stuck here. I'm also fixed income because grad school, so even if I could afford the monthly, deposits and such wouldn't be covered, and it took me three months to find this place which was the first and only to let me keep both cats. I already bought and installed a lock, despite my apartment complex saying I can't have a lock on my door but screw them, my safety comes first. However, I can't help but feel disgusted about my things being touched. After I got back from the gym yesterday I threw on a bathrobe and never got dressed again. Today when I woke up and thought I'd go to the gym early, I paused at my undies drawer and just couldn't bring myself to put any on. This dude already owes me $400, but I don't even want to wear anything in my undie drawer not knowing what pair has been used by him. My friends say I should go through and catalog all of my things. I just want everything replaced, but considering the cost of some of these things, one of my bras is $600, they think it's unreasonable to ask. I also want to go file a police report, but I don't even know what it would be for. Trespassing? The second I press charges I'm out a roommate, and his room is a neckbeard nest that I'm not going to clean. I don't even know what to do here. I suspected my strange roommate of sneaking into my room and stealing from me. I wish I had never discovered the truth behind it. I just found out that the rest of the footage hadn't loaded. Apparently he was whacking off after he went for the undie drawer, with my goddamn vibrating toy. Goddamn degenerate. I'm currently calling non-emergency to see what actions can be taken and how long I can sit on this, since moving or replacing him as a roommate isn't an option. Edit, after a week and a half of playing phone tag to file a police report, and then sitting in a police substation for 7 hours to file a report, he was eventually arrested for criminal trespassing. This was in April. He was able to shove back pretrial hearings until today, nearly into November. Today he pled guilty to criminal trespassing and will have 12 months of probation. Since it's a felony, he will also lose his collection of firearms. I was able to be released from the dorm since the judge who saw him the morning after his arrest issued a notice to vacate under the explicit supervision of law enforcement. Since I was involved in the order, I was given the option to break the lease I signed without penalty which I enthusiastically agreed to. I paid my other roommate utilities startup fees and utilities for the next three months before I left since he had to backfill two roommates. I also cleaned my own room and the weird roommate's room before I left. He was stealing all sorts of stuff from me and my other roommate, mostly food we never gave him permission to eat, despite him literally only ever door dashing food and making more money than me and other roommate combined, fun fact for those of you who are wondering, didn't he whack off with your stuff? Isn't that intimate assault? Why is there a trespassing charge instead of something intimacy crime related? It turns out that for those crimes there has to be a victim. Since I was never present in the room when he committed those acts and there was no DNA evidence left on any of my things, I was technically not a victim of what he did, which means no intimacy crime. I could have pushed for that charge but the chances of that sticking were nothing. Also, he was sharing pictures of my room on a deep web website. This was a website where you had to upload a face pic to even be a user, and he took a picture of me in my sleep before any of this and used that as a picture. My entitled friend expects me to organize and pay for her entire wedding but is refusing to invite me to it. The entitlement is outrageous. So one of my friends is planning her wedding. Or rather, she expects me to plan her engagement announcement party, bridesmaid announcement luncheon, bachelorette party, the wedding ceremony, and the reception. She also expects me to heavily contribute financially, because she's broke, but can afford a $5,000 dress? She expects me to do all this while not attending the wedding because, and I quote, my fiancé used to have a crush on you and I don't want him to be tempted to run away with you. Can you imagine the embarrassment of being left for you? This was said in a conversation we were having about the wedding and an argument between us erupted right away. I told her entitled waste of oxygen butt off and questioned how she can make demands like that to someone that she clearly doesn't respect. By these demands I was referring to the money as well as all of the planning. She said that I planned one of my aunt's weddings and I both planned and funded a friend's baby shower, 
This was my best friend since elementary school and she has no family willing or able to support her, this was me making it clear that I'd be there for her and her child as a godmother. She's still texting me potential venues right now as if I didn't tell her off and hang up on her 10 minutes ago. Edit, I talked to her fiancé and he's getting off work soon. We're gonna meet up at a mutual friend's place. I already texted her some screenshots and she's trying to see what she can get from Bridezilla. Hopefully whatever is shared will be helpful. Bridezilla allegedly plays her entitlement and dislike of me off as a joke and that's why most of our mutual friends laugh at it. Don't see how that's even remotely funny, but whatever. Gonna meet up in half an hour or so. My entitled friend expects me to organize and pay for her entire wedding but is refusing to invite me to it. So my night and early morning has been spent spamming the friend group chat with screenshots of my entitled friend's delusion and anger. I met up with the Delulu friend's fiancé Ryan and a mutual friend Rachel around 11pm at Rachel's place. I have been friends with Ryan since freshman year of high school. He's someone I care for greatly and we have been great friends throughout our life. He has helped me a lot and I have helped him, however there are no feelings on either end. At Rachel's place, I showed Ryan the entitled friend's text first and told him about the call. The texts I showed were the ones where his fiancé demanded I pay for at least 50% of the entire wedding, as well as plan everything, all while simultaneously insulting my looks in the same sentence. The text also went on to say she is jealous of me because she thinks Ryan has a crush on me. I explained to both him and our mutual friend that everyone laughs when the bridezilla does things like that hurt my feelings and contributes to her thinking it's okay, I'm the go-to friend, old reliable who supposedly never says no. And yeah, I help who I can, but I am not a doormat. Ryan was confused about the crush thing and fixated on that, he didn't want to acknowledge anything else at first. He eventually just cried and Rachel took over by telling him that she's also been texting bridezilla and the way she speaks about me isn't cool nor healthy. Some of her texts from Bridezilla were awful, most being about me getting Baker acted in high school. Rachel also showed Ryan and I a list of female mutuals not allowed to attend or have contact post-wedding because, Ryan called them pretty but I'm the only pretty one in his life. I asked Ryan permission to blow it up, as in if he was okay with me sharing everything in our main circle of friends. Honestly, I don't want to put him in a worse spot, but I already know Bridezilla was getting upset. I wasn't responding to her, her text got extremely nasty and I'm glad I hadn't blocked her yet. He said yes and I, a Samsung user, took the long screenshots and started spamming the group chat with them. No warning, no context, starting with the only text I sent her, no, I won't plan and fund your wedding and be disrespected while doing it. I get that we're not actually friends, but you don't speak to people like that and think they'll do anything for you. I blocked Bridezilla right after this. Rachel hasn't shared her screenshots yet, but things have been interesting. Bridezilla is sending messages through others about me not taking a joke well, but the ones passing it on are saying they're sorry for how they've gone along with that behavior. I've blocked them too, at least temporarily because why are you passing along her texts of what she wants to say to me when I told you I'm done and I don't want anything to do with her anymore? Is that normal friend behavior? I'm seriously asking at this point. Ryan has also apparently sent her a text saying to keep the ring and blocked her. Rachel hasn't blocked her and is on some multi-way call with her, she's apparently a mess and it's all my fault. Boohoo. Don't start crap and there won't be crap. Rachel says she's going to play both ends and not blow things up worse than they are, she genuinely wants to weed out the crap friends and says she's noticed a lot of people are considered friends when they shouldn't be. Update 2, my entitled friend expects me to organize and pay for her entire wedding but is refusing to invite me to it. So, the bridezilla has latched onto the not invited part of her comments and made it seem like that was my issue with her. Her angle is that I'm upset I wasn't invited and that's why I'm sabotaging her and Ryan. She's telling everyone willing to listen that she felt Ryan values me above her, so that's why she initially didn't want me there and that she'll invite me if I talk Ryan out of leaving her and let her pick my outfit? The above, as well as her it's a joke, get over it mindset have revealed far more about those I considered friends and associates than I'm comfortable admitting I ignored to keep mutuals or just genuinely missed. I allowed a lot of toxic behavior around me when I cut my mother off for a lot of those same behaviors. I feel dumb to be honest. There are in fact people I need to cut off. Surprisingly though, it's a small number, 4 of the 15 in our main group. These are people who have admitted to, 1 inviting me to concerts and parties so they have a ride to, asking me to join trips so they had a mom to take care of things they would forget 3, asking me to be a godparent because of how I treat my best friend Kim's kid, paying for trips, buying random gifts, babysitting just to hang out, having a room at my place just for them, 4, setting me up on dates so they'd have a doubles partner, I'm gonna go on a very long tirade about this person. On the room thing because Bridezilla's entitlement didn't just magically poof away. Apparently I'm meant to give that room to her hypothetical kid. Like, take it from my godson and give it to her kids. She thinks that because of how Ryan and I became friends, that means I should value my friendship with him above Kim, thus entitling her hypothetical kids to more. It's such a weird notion to me. The way I met Ryan was through group grief counseling. But I don't think that. Friends have different worths the way she and some others described it. The friends who passed along messages have been unblocked. 
I talked to them and they were sending screenshots because they themselves didn't realize they were allowing her to get away with stuff like that for years and were genuinely sorry. I told them I allowed it too, so I can't really be mad at them at this point. When I've said I didn't like something, these are people that would stop it immediately. I should have said something earlier instead of ignoring it because Bridezilla was their friend and Ryan's girlfriend. I glossed over Ryan telling Bridezilla to keep the ring and blocking her. There was much more said, some of which is very explicit. Ryan essentially going off on the beach. The screenshots Rachel and I shared with the group excluded all the messages Rachel received about Ryan, specifically in regards to his history with being roped and abused by his father when he was young. There were things being shared to Rachel that he confided in Bridezilla about, but not in Rachel or I about. Rachel didn't show me and I didn't ask to be shown either, but that's what made Ryan stop fixating on Bridezilla saying he had a crush and that was why he just cried for most of our meeting. I personally did not see these texts, but Ryan told me that's what they were about and he's unsure what to do beyond cutting things off. Again, he's not good with confrontation yet and he's been working on that. He just knows he can't be with Bridezilla anymore nor can he keep the she's not that bad mindset. He also isn't comfortable nor ready to speak to her directly about what she did. There are aspects where he's going through the realization that, like myself, he cut off an awful parent while allowing himself to be treated the same way by a different person. Rachel bowed out of stirring the pot earlier today when I told her how I felt about what she was doing, but later on she explained her logic and the history behind it when I asked out of curiosity. She was fixated on getting Bridezilla on recording saying these things because she wants Ryan to be able to sue her if he decides that's the route he wants to take. She told me that middle school saw her being outed as a lesbian by a former friend. Bridezilla, who she's known since middle school, had been the only one to stand up for her in their old school when that happened and so Bridezilla doing this to Ryan led to Rachel genuinely wanting to ruin her life in her anger. She stopped, but she's also admitted that she wants to air out all of Bridezilla's business, things that I don't know about and truly don't want to be told about. It's just been hinted at being potentially career-ending for Bridezilla. While I understand her feelings, I'm still not comfortable with her phrasing of things. I'm not cutting her off but I've told her that I don't even think what we did in sharing the screenshots with everyone was the right thing. My loving girlfriend has completely changed because I disregarded a strict boundary she had. She says she's fine but I don't believe her. How can I make it right? My girlfriend and I have been together for over a year and our relationship has been bumpy because of me unfortunately. There was always one boundary she warned me to never cross, but I'm ashamed to say I've messed up. For context as to why I did what I did, I was alone for a decade to focus on finishing school and starting my career, so I never bothered to learn how to be a good partner until I met her. I realized as we started to get serious that I was having a hard time learning emotional skills I should have developed earlier. I could not comfort her emotionally, I would lash out at her over little things, that's what my dad did to my mom, I thought it was normal. I would scold her for mistakes as little as putting not enough milk in my coffee. I was stubborn and mean to her when I shouldn't have been. I would break boundaries behind her back. I'm ashamed to admit there were times where I randomly threatened to leave her, said thoughtless things to her and made many insensitive comments about her in regards to her traumatic past. I outright failed to show up appropriately when she was having serious emergencies. It's something I'm ashamed of. Onto my girlfriend, she is an actual angel. She was widowed when she was 21 and took time before she dated me to heal. When she came into the relationship she was always gentle and understanding of my flaws and failures with her, she never got mad and always wanted to pull me close. She would reassure me that she would fight for us if I wanted her to, but that I could leave if I needed or that if I could not put up with her emotional needs. One of the things I never truly noticed was that she always got me very cute cards for every special occasion, including one she made up. She wrote adorable love notes and would draw and put themed stickers in them. She drew really well-drawn pictures of her and I with notes of love, or list facts she loved about me. I did tell her at one point later on that I wasn't big on the cards but I liked them because they were from her. Well in the summer I finally saw her breakdown. This is when she found out about the boundary I had crossed. You see, my girlfriend was roped and filmed while she was in her early teenage years, and the content of said event was then posted on the deep web. I have always had a habit of watching barely legal adult films, and even without knowing that, she told me that adult films of that kind was not something she could tolerate. I knew this, but I still watched it for months on end. When she found out, she appeared heartbroken. I tried my best to console her, but after a couple days of her seeming down I got annoyed. I felt her emotions lasting that long were unhealthy and told her so. She took it well and now rarely mentions it, but she's acted differently since and then yesterday she gave me no card and it hit me that she's not okay. I feel bad. I didn't realize that I really looked forward to getting these and I don't want her to think I don't care, especially because I would like to move toward proposing to her within the next several months. My husband has recently developed an obsession with stuffed animals and is using them to replace me in all aspects of our life. My husband has gone way too far. I met him seven years ago at college, and we have been happily married for just over seven months now with a great intimacy life. We recently bought our first home and we're talking about having kids. Everyone sees us as the perfect couple. This was until recently. Ever since starting his new job, my husband Phil has been acting strange. He has taken a liking to stuffed animals, in a disturbing way. Phil had been giving me teddy bears for Valentine's Day for the last few years which were stored away when we moved into our house. Last month I went into our bedroom and he had them laid out on the bed, all three of them. He said he wanted to sleep with them. One of the animals is a small panda which he likes the most. 
He named him Kyle. I didn't think much of it then, I just thought it was a bit odd and he was probably joking. A month later and he's ordered countless teddy bears online. We must have about 35 at this stage. He brings all of them downstairs when we have dinner and pretends to feed them whatever we are having. If there is an extra portion and I want it, he will not let me have it, because the teddy bears need to be fed. He also tells me not to be so rude to them when I don't respond to their questions. Last week, I saw him in the bedroom having a full-blown conversation with Kyle and others about politics and the upcoming election next year. One time, we went to go to bed and I shoved the teddy bears off the bed and he screamed, yes screamed, in a completely serious tone, you could have hurt them. The worst part of this all, is that he regularly has intimacy with these teddy bears. He does it about twice a day, and he has cut out a hole in the behind of the teddy bears he uses for this purpose. He sleeps with them in the same bed and never bothered to clean his nut out of the inside of the teddy bear, meaning that. I sleep to the smell of dried up and old nut every night. I've asked him countless of times what's going on and where the F did this strange obsession come from but he says there's nothing strange about it. He just likes them and to stop questioning him about it. The worst part is he has completely stopped talking to me since this strange behavior started, literally refusing to talk to me about anything that is not somehow related to his teddy bears. I'm typing this in bed and my husband is sleeping next to me. Except instead of me, he's cuddling Kyle. My adult son has cut my wife and I out of his life because we have been emotionally abusive parents but I don't see what he means. How could he do this? Yesterday my 25 year old son said he was cutting my wife and I out of his life for what seems to be no reason. He wrote a long letter about how we were emotionally abusive when he was a kid and other stupid stuff like that. I'll admit, my wife and I believe more in tough love, we did not compliment my son on his achievements a whole lot, and I don't think we said I love you a lot, but I think he's overreacting when he said we were emotionally abusive, he said we were never interested in his life, too controlling and never cared about his feelings or interests. He said he was depressed for the majority of his childhood mostly because of us, and wanted to end himself at one point over our apparent neglect. He even said my wife robbed him of his childhood because she would talk too much about her emotional problems with him. But we're a family and we're supposed to talk and be close, so I feel like all of this is a bit selfish from him. My wife and I have had tough lives and we tried to be better parents to him than our parents were to us. We gave him food, shelter and even paid for his university tuition, but now it looks like he's turning on us and being ungrateful. Even if he did feel that badly, he could have said something to us and we would have done something, but I don't understand how he could feel that way because he had quite a privileged life. We were never poor, we went on family vacations, and we had money to spend once in a while. My son also decided he was gay a few months ago and he said the way we reacted to that made him feel like we are apparently not capable of loving and don't want to accept him. Yes, my wife and I are a little bit old-fashioned and we're not big fans of that lifestyle, that's who we are, but we never overreacted about it the way he is now. He just recently finished college and has his own job and apartment, and my wife and I think maybe he is just very overwhelmed with all the freedom and all of this is just a phase. We think that he'll get his bearings eventually and realize the value of true Christian family. My wife and I are heartbroken. We've done nothing but acted in our son's best interest his entire life. We have given him food, a roof over his head, and even paid all of his college tuition. Now he's an adult with his own job and freedom and he's acting up like this and being ungrateful. How do we talk some sense into him so he'll understand everything we've done for him? My wife has been holding a secret grudge for years and is using it to justify her affair. I don't even recognize her anymore. So my wife and I are high school sweethearts. We have been together for 14 years in total and married for 10. Our first major problem arose about 4 years ago, meaning we never had a real fight until 10 years into the relationship. The first problem we faced was pretty major, and it was the total decline of my wife's mental health. She was diagnosed with depression, where she gained weight, neglected her looks, neglected our relationship, stopped pursuing her school online and didn't work at all. In the meantime I was working a full-time job and took on side hustles just to keep us afloat. I kept pushing her, trying to get her out of it because she would keep moving the timeline of starting school by six months and eventually it turned into years. I have to say, the way I did it was quite harsh on my part. I treated supporting her the way I would support my guy friend. I told her to get the F out of bed, to start exercising and to stop being lazy. That's how I approached it. Eventually she started school again, started working out and stopped neglecting herself, all while I still supported us. The intimacy was there but it felt fake on her end, nothing spontaneous, not returning my affection, not ever initiating anything. I was being spoon-fed by forced love basically. I noticed this and asked her what was wrong a lot over this time period. I would never get direct answers and it got me to a point where I thought I was the issue. In addition, due to lack of money, time and energy on my end from working two jobs for so long, I lost all my friends over the years. Fast forward to now. She has graduated and got a job. She's her social self again, making friends and being a flirt with everyone, but that coldness and lack of affection is still there for me. One night we are going back home from a party, and I notice she's drunk and texting a man right in front of me. I ask her who she's texting and she says her sister. For some reason I believe her because I'm driving and just let it be. Another night she gets drunk with her co-workers and comes home super late, being loud and snappy at me. We get in a fight and she becomes really mean, then goes on to brag to me that she likes the affection of other men. This made me really mad and I threatened to lay hands on her, this got her to calm down. The next day I press her to open up to me about what meant by what she said last night. She finally gives in, saying that she outgrew our intimacy life and realized the type of men she likes are not the type that I am. 
She admits that the guy from work has been hitting on her and they've been chatting for a month. She admits that she likes the way he looks and the attention she got but would never physically cheat on me. I said that I felt cheated on, because she got what she didn't get from me from another man. She said that she's not physically attracted to me, which is crazy because she is chubby while I'm tall and fit. She said that I hurt her feelings during the period of her depression when I tried to shake her out of it by being direct and she held a grudge since then, which caused her to cool off on the physical attraction part. She admits that she wanted to leave me but she felt stuck without a job or money or a degree. She broke my heart and I am so sad and mad and confused, but also relieved that at least I know now. I almost moved out, but I was a mess and this is my home so I stayed and now she wants to do therapy to try and save it. I overheard my girlfriend comparing her ex to me. She says she missed being broken in bed by him. My girlfriend and I have been together for three years. A few nights my heart was broken. It was a usual night for us, we watched a movie, did the deed and went to sleep. I thought she crossed the finish line. Well, a few hours later I was woken by her talking really loudly on a group FaceTime call with some of her closest friends. She clearly had a lot to drink in the time between when I went to sleep and now, as she was hammered now, but sober earlier. I tried to just go back to sleep. But my interest was piqued when I overheard her and her girlfriends talking about our intimacy life. My girlfriend said the intimacy was bang average and sometimes she just faked it and let me get mine. I was hurt deeply. Then they all started talking about their best intimate experiences. My girlfriend said her ex gave her the most intense finishes she ever experienced, she said she would cross the finish line so hard she would lose total control of her legs and has passed out on one occasion. His PP was apparently big enough to the point where she felt completely filled, and hit her deep spots. Apparently 3 inches longer than mine. She said she missed being able to finish like that and, she missed being completely destroyed in bed by him. At that point I was near tears. I lay there for another minute trying not to cry so she wouldn't hear me. She eventually hung up, got back in bed she noticed if I was awake, and asked me if I was up. I told her that I just felt the bed move and that woke me up. She then said she loved me and she would see me in the morning. This was about 3 am and I stayed awake that night. I haven't been able to sleep or eat or anything for the last 3 days. I don't know what to do. I've been trying to be better in bed for her since we first got together and 3 years of practice still can't beat raw talent. I've never felt like less of a man. Her ex cheated on her and he dumped her when she found out, she has told me she would have stayed with him. I feel like I'm nothing compared to his memory. I overheard my girlfriend comparing her ex to me. She says she missed being broken in bed by him. I decided the best course of action was to just reject any form of intimacy with her. After the eighth day of me never initiating and rejecting her with no explanation every time she initiated, she, near tears, asked me what was wrong and why I didn't want her anymore. I wasn't fully ready to talk about this yet, so I just told her I haven't been in the mood. She didn't believe me and asked what she was doing wrong. I told her I needed some time to myself and she demanded to know why. Beforehand I had wrote a note for her explaining my feelings because I wasn't sure how to articulate it in the moment when I had to. After endless egging and pleading, finally I caved and showed her the note I had left, detailing how she has hurt me and why I was acting different. I left our bedroom and left her alone to read it. Twenty minutes later she came out of the bedroom crying and tried to hold on to me. I pushed her off of me and she started crying harder. I let her calm down to the point where she could speak coherently. She told me that she didn't think I was awake when saying all of those things, and they were all greatly exaggerated. Firstly she said that she enjoyed being with me, and said she didn't have to fake it very much. She also said that she sometimes had to fake it with her ex too. Next she clarified that his size wasn't as large as she claimed, she said that the ex was only an inch and a half above my size and that there is no possible way that she'd be able to have intimacy with someone as large as she claimed, and she was willing to prove it. I told her I didn't believe her because I have no reason to believe she'll be truthful about any of that stuff anymore. She went silent. I then told her that I couldn't believe that she would tell her friends about how much worse I am than her ex. She still was silent crying. I told her how much it hurt to know that she wasn't even willing to try to help me be better for her. I told her how I felt so unloved now and disrespected, and how I'm unsure if I want to propose to her anymore. She apologized for everything again. She said that her being drunk is no excuse for what she did and won't heal the pain she caused me and she understands that I can't unhear what I heard, but I just had to trust her on this. I told her I'd listen to her at least. She again said she didn't fake it much with me and her ex wasn't that much bigger than me, and that she only lied about that to one of her girlfriends. She said she was too afraid to hurt my feelings so she never wanted to critique our intimacy. I asked why she cared more about the quality of intimacy with her ex and she said she never really critiqued him either. She said that he didn't know what he was doing and just pressed her buttons correctly enough for her to cross the finish line in an intense manner. She said that she really didn't even guide him so she had no idea what he did, and she hasn't even been able to replicate what she felt from going to town on herself. She said that if I was willing to experiment with her, she thought we could figure it out. My last question for her was if she missed her ex. She said that intimacy with him was better, but more enjoyable with me because she felt more emotionally connected to me than him. I asked why she wanted to take him back originally, and she said that she was young and dumb and gave herself to people that didn't deserve her because she was afraid to be alone. She said that she found a great looking guy that cherished her and gave a damn about her emotions in me. As of right now I'm still hurt greatly, talking to her helped a lot, but it'll still take me time to be able to trust her like I did. I overheard my girlfriend comparing her ex to me. She says she missed being broken in bed by him. Over the last two weeks I've been doing some serious thinking. Nothing in my relationship is worse since my girlfriend broke down and explained everything, in fact it all feels better. She's been communicating her needs more, the few times she thinks she isn't going to finish she'll tell me. 
She tells me all the time she thinks I'm the best partner she had, I feel like she loves me more than anything. However, I still just don't feel the same way about her. Everything feels great and nice but hollow. Usually other women don't catch my eye, but now they do. I see beautiful women and want to go up and flirt with them even though I know my girlfriend would be hurt by me feeling this way. It's gotten to the point where I started using dating apps. I've been pretty successful and have had great conversations with great women. I even met up with one of her them and had a great time. We hooked up once and I had a better time than I've ever had with my girlfriend. I mean this woman was no joke, sucked it till I looked like Stephen Hawking. The top tier brain aside, I felt guilty about my actions and decided to confess to my girlfriend three nights ago. She was upset to the point of tears. She asked me if I had feelings for her, I said it was just a hookup. I lied to her, I really care about the other woman and want to see her again, even if we don't have sex. My girlfriend, believing my lies, said she could forgive me but thought we needed to go to relationship counseling, and for some reason I agreed. I kept thinking that there was no point and that we shouldn't go, but I was willing to try to repair our relationship. Two nights ago I made the decision that I didn't want to continue our relationship. She took it extremely hard. She was an inconsolable mess, she yelled screamed and cried, even hit me. She said that all guys are the same and that she gave me three years of her. Life. She said it was that effing wh re, s fault and she wanted to go after her and stalk her, try to track her down, but I assured her that it wasn't her fault, and that I am over our relationship. She took that very hard too. I'm going to be looking for my own place soon, so I'll be without her in a few weeks. Honestly I feel amazing, and like I'm about to start out a new chapter in my life. My teenage brother-in-law keeps violating me in my own home. My husband is defending him. Should I fear for my safety? So my husband and I have been married for two years. His parents are going through an ugly divorce where the dad is laying hands on the mother for cheating, and due to this situation at home, my husband's brother, 17M, has moved in with us until he starts college. My husband loves his brother, treats him like a little kid, and is overprotective of him. His brother can do no wrong in my husband's eyes essentially. Personally, I find the brother-in-law's behavior obnoxious and we are having too many arguments over this. He's been with us for only a month and I can't stand it. It started off with him making messes and throwing away the leftovers. Since I do most of the cooking and cleaning, it was increasing my workload. My husband's list of chores have not increased by his presence so he was dismissive of my complaints. Since my husband wasn't saying anything, I tried telling my brother-in-law to pick up after himself. He retaliated by telling me to remember who the F he's talking to slapping my butt. Literally any time I tell him to do something, whether that is sweep, wash dishes or hoover, he hits my butt very hard and laughs. My husband treats it as if he's just playing around, as if it is no big deal. I have told my husband I am not okay with it, and he tells me to lighten up as he is just a kid. Not only are the brother-in-laws very disrespectful, but it's also really painful and has left a bruise on three occasions. After that, the brother-in-law started randomly picking me up and carrying me around the house. I am a little over 5 foot and 120 pounds, and he's a tall stocky guy. I hate him doing this, but my husband just thinks he's goofing around and trying to be friends with me. I worked from home and the other day when it was just my brother-in-law and me in the house, he picked me up and ran with me to my bedroom and threw me on the bed. He stood over me and held my hands down, then licked his lips while looking at me. It really scared me and I genuinely thought I was about to be a victim, but he just laughed at me and left. I talked to my husband, who thinks I am being dramatic by being scared by this. I feel like his behavior is escalating, but my husband tells me to act like the adult and not blow up over a kid's playfulness. My 15-year-old daughter was assaulted by a 70-year-old at church. My father thinks I'm going too far by reporting it. Do I go no contact? My husband and I have a 15-year-old daughter Stella who we love dearly. My husband and I want her to have some type of involvement in the community so twice a month Stella is in ushers with my dad at our local Catholic church. This consists of her holding doors open for people coming to church, passing out the baskets for the offertory and dismissing pews to get up and in line for communion. This past Saturday was her day to usher, my parents picked her up and took her to church and dinner. When they got home my husband and I were at a Halloween party, but Stella texted to tell me they were home and watching a movie and asked me to send her some pictures of everyone's costumes. The next day, Stella tells me that she doesn't want to usher anymore. She said as she was holding one of the doors open an old man named Joseph, who is apparently very active in the church, walked up to her and told her to follow him. He directed her to the main doors of the church to greet people. He held her hand the whole time, asked her how old she was and if she had a boyfriend, told her she is so pretty but she should smile more. Then he demanded that she smile at everyone coming into the church, told her that he would be her boyfriend and asked her if she loved him. She said she was very uncomfortable but couldn't get anyone's attention to help her. He then made her sit with him during mass and tried to kiss her on the lips throughout it. After Stella told me all of this, I immediately called my mom to ask her what happened because I hadn't heard anything from her, my dad or Stella about this until right then. She said that Stella did tell my dad that she was uncomfortable and he told her she didn't have to usher and she could go sit with my mom for mass. My mom told me she was not made aware of everything that had happened. All she knew was that. Stella was uncomfortable around the man. So to the meat of the story. My brother came over last night to see my husband for a little bit and while he and my husband were in the garage having a drink, my parents dropped by unannounced. 
I hadn't spoken to my dad since I had learned everything that had happened at church a few days prior. So after greeting my parents I asked my dad if Joseph serves in an official capacity at church and my dad said no. I then asked my dad if he was going to talk to the head priest to make him aware of the situation and he said no because he felt Joseph's actions were only natural around a developed girl. I was disgusted but tried to keep my cool. I argued that the priest should be made aware because we don't know if this is a pattern of behavior, if he has dementia or something other illness that causes him to not be in complete control of his actions or what. I just wanted the priest to be made aware so he could keep an eye out. My father argued back that Joseph is just a nice old man who got out of line because in this day you can't be nice without it being taken the wrong way. Cue the head explosion. I told him that sweeping this behavior under the rug by just asking this old man for an apology and not saying anything else about it makes it possible for Joseph to behave this way with another girl. My father continued to argue his point and said that if he did what I was asking, the church would just prevent him from doing what he likes to do at church. I then very loudly told my dad that if being a creep is what he enjoys doing, then maybe the church should prevent him from doing that and told my parents they needed to leave. As my dad was walking out he said sarcastically, I'm sorry I don't want to crucify the poor old man. I effing lost it. I yelled at my father that I was sorry that he cared more about some old man's feelings than his own granddaughters. My brother then decided to get in on the show and started saying I was just being vengeful and wanted to vilify the old man and preclude him from a public space and that what happened wasn't that big of a deal, while standing three feet from Stella. I was so mad at this point I was crying and shaking. I told my brother that he likes to act like he's the smartest person in the room but he's a lazy piece of crap who drowns himself in conspiracy theory bullcrap because he feels it justifies his laziness. I told him he was a loser and he needed to get out of my house. My dad immediately went into damage control mode and apologized for making me feel like I was making an unreasonable request or like I was personally going after some guy I've never even met. He said he would talk to the priest and my mom, who was on my side completely, said that they would always do whatever they had to do to keep their grandchildren safe. I couldn't even look at my dad. I just asked them to leave and said goodbye to my mom. I went back out to the garage where my husband was and explained everything that had happened because he was expecting my brother and I to come back out. He wasn't involved in the conversation because initially I was just going to try and get them out of the house as quickly as possible but then when everything started I went into fight mode and didn't even think about getting my husband. He is also 100% behind me and feels that my dad and brother are both in the wrong but he's letting me take the lead on this since it's my family but will absolutely be there for any other conversations we have on the subject. My 15-year-old daughter was assaulted by a 70-year-old at church. My father thinks I'm going too far by reporting it. I arranged a meeting with the priest at noon and texted my father that whether he was coming or not, the priest would be informed of what Joseph did to my daughter Stella. When I got to the meeting, which I recorded on my phone, my father started it by telling the priest that at mass last Saturday, Joseph was a little too friendly and made Stella very uncomfortable. I interjected and said that that is not all that happened. I explained everything that Stella had told me, from asking her if she had a boyfriend, to making him hold her hand, forcing her to sit next to him and even attempting to kiss her when nobody was looking. The priest was absolutely appalled. Apparently there have been issues with him before, but nothing like this. Joseph has tried telling parishioners that if you're not a part of the Knights of Columbus then you aren't a good enough Catholic, he was told emphatically that he cannot say things like that. He was also asked not to come back to volunteer at the soup kitchen because of how he was bullying the homeless people into becoming Catholic and refusing to serve them unless they praised Jesus. The priest said it is clear to him that Joseph has some psychological problems but there has never been any complaints about him like this. My father tried to say that at some point in Joseph's life, it may have been normal to speak like that to women, my mother, the priest and I all looked at him and said no, it has never been okay for an old man to speak like that or to behave that way with any woman regardless of the age. The priest asked what I was seeking, I told him that I wanted to ensure the safety of all the young women at the parish and ensure that no other girl would be put in the position that Stella was in. I also told him that perhaps he should be barred from volunteering in any capacity at the church from this. Point on. The priest said he would be reaching out to the head of the safe environment program and then the diocese to put some new safeguards in place to make sure that this doesn't happen to anyone else. My mother then said that my father would be speaking with Joseph and I immediately interrupted her to say no, my husband and I will be speaking to Joseph. I gave the priest my business card and asked him to update me after he speaks with Joseph and with the safe environment head to let me know how they will be addressing this and to set up a meeting with me, my husband and Joseph. When we left the meeting, I told my parents, specifically my father, that what he did in minimizing this situation is exactly why so many women don't report things like this and it was nothing short of harassment of a minor. I told my father that he can still think Joseph is a nice old man but that I would never be able to look at him the same way again and I don't know if I can trust him with my kids. That was the gut punch he needed because despite this new side of my father I'm seeing, he's always been a wonderful grandfather to all my kids. He owes Stella an apology but she doesn't want one, she emphatically said she just wants to put this behind her and doesn't want to talk about it anymore. As far as my brother goes, I got a non-apology apology from him via text this morning. It shouldn't go without saying, I'm sorry for getting involved and I wish I hadn't interjected myself in the situation. It's not my place and I support whatever you want to do, regardless of whether I agree or disagree with your decision. I haven't responded because I will go off on him again. 
I think I'm just going to let my husband deal with him. My best friend ended up dating the guy I liked with my permission. She exposed herself and all of her lies years later. Sarah and I have been best friends since middle school. When we moved to high school I started developing feelings for one of our mutual friends named Oliver. He was my crush and I had really strong feelings, but I had a massive fear of rejection, and so I asked Sarah to ask him if he likes me or not while we were at lunch in school. I remember waiting patiently and panicking, when Sarah came back she looked disappointed and told me that Oliver said he only sees me as a friend, but what she said next shocked me. She said that Oliver confessed his feelings towards her. However, she didn't give him an answer because she didn't want to hurt me. I won't lie, my heart broke at that moment but I thought to myself, this is my friend, I don't have to get in her way so I told her it's fine and I will get over it. I knew she kind of liked him too, just not as much nor for as long as I did. She smiled and hugged, for some reason I had a bad feeling in my stomach. I came home that day and cried myself to sleep. I felt jealous and envious of them but I never dared to do anything. My heart would break every time I saw them together, holding hands and kissing, it's fine I thought. I learned to move on and on our senior year, one of our mutual friends, Mike, asked me out and confessed to me that he liked me. By that time I had completely gotten over Oliver so I said yes to going on a date with Mike. After many dates I felt as if I had fallen in love with Mike, so I was really happy when he asked me to be his girlfriend. I never loved anyone the way I loved Mike. I'm happy that things turned the way they are, because today Mike is my husband and the father of my soon-to-be-born daughter. After our high school graduation, I stopped connecting with Sarah because each of us were busy with our lives, we simply did not have time to talk as we went to different universities. Sarah randomly messaged me through Instagram recently and started talking about how she missed the way things were, she also congratulated me about the pregnancy. We started talking about our lives. To be honest, I felt bad for her, she was complaining that Oliver no longer pays attention to her or takes her out on dates. They've been together for so long and he still hasn't proposed to her. Hearing that, I arranged a dinner for the four of us, hopefully Oliver lights up after seeing his old friends. The dinner went smoothly, we were having a good time until Sarah started joking out of nowhere, she made a lot of jokes about how she played her part as Cupid and now I'm married to Mike. I didn't really understand her joke until she told me that she actually lied to me about Oliver asking her out. Apparently, Oliver had a crush on me originally, and not her, however Sarah twisted the story on Oliver originally and over time did everything she could to make him fall for her. It turns out she really wanted to be with Oliver, so much so that she lied to me and him to make that happen. She had had a few drinks by this point and I believe that's why she started saying all of this. After hearing all of that, my heart dropped and I could see Oliver's face changing, that was my first time seeing someone's face turn literally red, he looked Sarah dead in the eye and screamed, are you effing kidding me? Then proceeded to storm out, Sarum despite being tispy, ran after him so me and Mike just stared at each other in disbelief. The next day Sarah called me crying about how sorry she was and complaining that Oliver left her. She also mentioned that Oliver said a lot of hurtful things to her, including being useless and a rebound. Long story short, Oliver only started dating her to get closer to me but after Sarah and I stopped speaking for a while, he just stayed because he didn't want to start over with someone else. Listening to Eminem in the shower literally almost caused my death. So I was singing along to the entirety of Eminem's album The Eminem Show in the shower yesterday morning. Well, my vigorous rapping and spitting the verses triggered an asthma attack. The asthma attack prompted me to exit the shower. Exiting the shower ended with me slipping and falling on my face. At that point I was barely conscious, but managed to pick up my phone and call my roommate for help. My roommate found me, a black man unclothed on the floor, struggling to breathe with white America playing in the background, ironic. Q roommate retrieving my inhaler. The inhaler failed to do the job after multiple attempts. My condition worsened. The ambulance was called. Roommate awkwardly helped me into my clothes. Paramedics showed up and put me on a nebulizer. Nebulizer helped me breathe, but little did I know the worst was yet to come. Paramedics said I had a fever and transported me to hospital. Hospital flagged me as a potential David case. Got placed in isolation, got treated for my fever and tested for the virus. Speaking of the test, never again do I want those long ah swabs shoved up my nose again, it was so damn deep it practically tickled my brain. The doctor conducted a thorough checkup. I winced when said doctor pressed on my stomach. Doctor narrowed his eyes and asked what the color of my poop was. I said kinda dark but you know, not outer space dark. Doctor said hmm, before proceeding to spread my cheeks and jam his dry finger into my back door with no forewarning. For the record, that finger was thick AF and it happened to be the first time ever something entered my back door. I got discharged with a laundry list of prescribed medications and advised to self-isolate until I received my test results. As of today, the thought of singing has become nothing more than a source of nightmare fuel, and the feeling of having my back door broken into by a thick and calloused finger is. Yet to disappear. My boyfriend's sisters are invading our private life. My boyfriend sees nothing wrong with it and is encouraging their behavior. So my boyfriend and I have been together since high school, we met when I was 15 and he was 17, we hit it off massively and have always been each other's best friend. He had a strained relationship with his family, divorced mom and dad. Dad had a family with a new and much younger woman, mom was single and focused on him. When he was 19, his mom remarried and the new guy had two daughters he brought into the relationship. 
my boyfriend has taken to his stepsisters and is an all-around amazing older brother. But that's where the biggest issue takes place. The girls were around 13 and 10 when they came into the picture, and my boyfriend would be there for them through anything. It quickly went from us having two date nights a week, to one date night and one group babysitting session. I was fine with it for the first year, but after I graduated high school, and started going to community college, I wanted more private time. My boyfriend still lived at home though and I lived with my parents. If he came over to my place, we'd be able to get private time and space. My parents are cool with it, but the issue is, he never wanted to leave his sisters alone. His stepdad and mom would constantly skip town or go on trips or go visit friends and boyfriend would always offer to babysit. He said he was always wanting siblings who loved him, and now he does kinda deal. Well, this has been going on for years. I had asked my boyfriend if we could go on a trip for our seven-year anniversary. Originally our plan was for him and I to take a week-long Disney trip paid for by my parents, amazing right? Well, we ended up having this conversation three weeks before the trip. My stepdad is saying the girls gotta go with us if I'm going to go. What? That's crazy he's not paying for it and neither are you. He can't withhold you from going. He's having a hard time and says if I go for a week he's going to relocate my stuff from the house, mom's agreeing with him. Well fine, you can come live with us. I don't really think that's fair to my sisters and mom. Can I pay for them to go with us? No. I didn't say anything else. He got mad at me, and I explained straight up, that I'm sick of his sisters always being in our life. I understand he's excited to have loving siblings, and that he loves them very much. But he isn't their parent. He isn't in charge of them, and the fact that his mom instantly was okay with parentifying him from the get-go and shoving the girls off on him was a huge nasty red flag. He left mad with me. He apparently told the girls, and now the older stepsister who is 18 is blowing up my phone talking about how I'm trying to isolate him from his family and I need to learn to F off when it comes to them? That I can't control how much time he spends with his family and that I shouldn't tell them they can't go if they can afford it? The younger stepsister who is 15 sent me a text about how she's sorry that she did anything to make me hate them? I did not say I hate them. My boyfriend is acting like my issue was with them. When my issue is with us not having a good private life together. I told both of them, copy-pasting the message from one sister to the other, I have no ill feelings with either of you, I just wish I could spend private time with my boyfriend, who is also your brother that you live with, without you two always being there. I would love to plan a vacation with all of us at some point, but this was a vacation that was for me and your brother. Neither have responded to me. I sent a text to my boyfriend after it all saying, hey I just need you to know that I don't hate your sisters, I love them. But I need us time and I can't continue this relationship if you can't learn how to prioritize me as much as you prioritize them. He hasn't responded. Their stepdad called my dad and basically told him off for being picky with how he chooses to spend his money. My dad didn't like that one at all, they were buds in the past but a few years ago stepdad insulted my dad's wife and dad hasn't wanted to talk to him since then. Dad. Told him to go F himself and the boyfriend better beg to be allowed to step foot in my house after this. Nobody is responding to me, and I'm just losing it. My boyfriend's sisters are invading our private life. My boyfriend sees nothing wrong with it and is encouraging their behavior. After my boyfriend's stepsisters accused me of not loving them and told me to F off, a lot has happened. My boyfriend finally contacted me. He came to my house, not texted or called. He begged my father for forgiveness for his stepfather's actions. He started crying, my dad hugged him and brought him inside. I was ticked and I started screaming at him. My dad told me to let him speak. My boyfriend basically admitted that his stepdad was a piece of crap, and that he abused his daughters. They'd go to their mothers, but she is equally as bad. He witnessed them having hands laid on them by their father when they first came into the picture. Stepdad never tried with him, because he was too old and fit and my boyfriend would have floored him if he tried. There have been a few physical altercations between them. The sisters see my boyfriend as their only safe space. And both of them wrote me handwritten apologies, wasn't anything fancy, but my boyfriend knows me well enough that a text won't do anything for her, if you're sorry, write it out or tell her face to face. My boyfriend told me that the friendships and personal situations going on involving his life, while we were growing up, were his business in his eyes. Everything that was hurting him, everything that hurt our friends. He was always the one people called on because he wouldn't tell and that it wasn't just a I don't want to tell you kind of way, it was a this is there in my lives, and there is an inability to vocalize how much things can hurt, or knowing something is wrong and telling someone else only to know they'll be more upset for you than you're upset for you, sucks. He knew if I ever found out about the abuse, I'd have told my dad. He said this in front of my dad, and my dad said it was understandable? Because, you take the girl's father away from them, and unless your mother is willing to adopt them both, you'd lose the girls entirely. Dad seemed to get it before I got it. Convo lasted a few hours, my boyfriend asked me if I could forgive him, I told him only if things changed somehow. I asked how I could help, he said I couldn't. He asked to speak to my father in private, they did. Then they left for a bit. The girls and my boyfriend have been staying at my house since they got back. Police officers have been by a few times, apparently my dad is protecting the kids now and my boyfriend is going to start a case against their father. 
My dad is acting as a voice of support and reason, my dad has some sway around here and so people listen to him. My boyfriend's asleep in my bed right now, the first time he's been allowed to sleep in in forever. His sisters are asleep on an air mattress in the living room. Both did end up apologizing to me too. The Disneyland bit was because they were scared to be left home alone for a week without my boyfriend there. Nothing more, they were downright fearful to be alone with their father and my boyfriend's mom. Apparently she's been abusing them too, without my boyfriend knowing. They told the cops last night. How did you get back at your narcissistic ex? I tricked her into thinking she had a shot with me again and then dumped her SS. I met my ex-girlfriend Katie during our freshman year of college, and I swore she was my one and only. I was considered the fatty in our friend group, and our friends would often make fat jokes on my behalf, saying things such as, don't eat the table too, or, I bet the ground shakes when you walk. They even called me Fat Al, which was weird, considering my name was Kevin. Katie usually didn't say anything to these comments. In fact, she defended me a few times. She'd tell them they were teenage dirtbags and to watch when they're 40 and have a beer belly. I thought she was my knight in shining armor or whatever the female term for that is. I asked her out because I thought she actually wanted me and she said yes. That was the worst mistake I'd ever made. She made me absolutely miserable throughout our whole relationship. She'd constantly remind me I was beneath her because I was fatter than her. She would pull up celebrities like The Rock and say how she wished I could have looked like them instead. I always felt like I was competing with someone else who didn't exist. One day, she just stopped texting me back. I was destroyed. I would see her in school hallways, and she just would look the opposite way. I absolutely hated myself during this time because I knew that she didn't love me because I was too fat for her. When I was telling my brother about all of this, he told me to use my fitness pal and start getting skinny for her. I gave it a shot and started counting my calories and looking for healthy meals on the app. After consistently using the app for 7 months, I found myself becoming the skinny guy she wanted. But by this point, I hated her. I looked back on my fat self and realized I was better looking than what she gave me credit for. So when I started posting thirst traps of myself, I made sure she was seeing it. And slowly but surely, she'd start liking my stories and reacting to them. I just liked the comments, and slowly, she started texting me. I entertained her, telling her how much I missed her and that she was the best I've ever had. I'm sure she got a rush out of that. Then, one day, I just stopped texting back. I wish you guys saw her reaction. She started spamming me, telling me I'd regret ignoring her. I don't regret it to this day. An entitled elderly woman ruined my lunch in the park because my appearance was scaring people away. Being homeless sucks. To start, I have found a job and I am working my way out of homelessness, I'm hopeful. For context, I usually go around town on my off time from work, going through parks, talking to other homeless people, shooting videos, getting their stories, and posting about various events such as abandoned camps or evicted camps. I was out most of the day doing that and I started to get hungry. I was in one of the forest parks around my city, in one of the parking lots by a rock. I put my very large bag on the ground, got out my cooking pot and my portable stove, and popped open a can of beefaroni. I set up and started to cook. I was there for maybe 5 minutes. Things were starting to get warm when this woman walked over to me and just started yammering that I couldn't be doing that here. I stood up, and she's pointing her finger, saying, you can't be doing that here. I told her I was just trying to make something to eat. In fairness, at the moment I didn't look fantastic. I was wearing an old hoodie with stains, besides I'm black. I'm sure that to her, an elderly white woman wearing an expensive looking jacket, I, a black homeless man with a stained hoodie, look like the scum of society. Little does she realize that she is the scum of society. Anyway, back to the story. She told me that people like myself make this area dangerous. Honestly I'm not a danger. I'm just a regular dude down on his luck. She called for me to leave, and I said, hey I'm just trying to make myself lunch. Step off. I'm not doing anything wrong. She kicked my beefaroni over and I wanted to blow up. I wanted to throw words around, but I bit my tongue and said, fine lady, screw off I'm leaving. Thank you for ruining my only lunch. She walked away smugly like he had just won the Richard Head of the Year award. Now, people might wonder why I didn't do more, and honestly, I'm homeless. I can't. If I start up a scene, if I fight back or argue I lose. The police are pretty brutal against us homeless, even if we're in the right. My supposedly racist family insulted my wife during our wedding to the point of tears but I'm not sure whose side to take. My wife Tanya is from Bangladesh whereas me and my whole family are white. The disaster of the wedding started with my birthday just two months beforehand. Tanya wanted to throw a party for me at this karaoke bar, a really thoughtful idea. Well, I wanted to invite this group of extended family that I spent a lot of time with as a teenager and was very close with. Tanya did not have such a family-centric and fun childhood, so my thinking was that I could introduce her to them and maybe we could start hanging out again like old times. At the party I had a great time. It was pretty much what I wanted it to be. I saw Tanya talking with the women and I was catching up with my old buddies. When we got home though, I found out that Tanya did not have such a fun experience. She said that my oldest cousin, Marissa, was not really talking to her at all and seemed to actively avoid communicating. I thought this was odd and unfortunate but ultimately I chalked it up to nerves and meeting someone new. I suggested that we hang out again to clear up any misunderstanding but Tanya would not have it. She started claiming Marissa is racist, and I could not blame her because people in my family have been racist in the past. Not to her directly, but I have told her about some comments my grandparents have made, and how interracial couples haven't really happened in my family, and this extended group of family are known for throwing slurs around in the name of a joke. It has been tricky to say the least. 
I wanted to be on Tanya's side with this but I just did not see enough evidence in this specific case, hence wanting to hang out with only her and her husband. I was deemed as unsupportive and just as racist by Tanya. I decided to drop it as the wedding was coming up and nerves were coming into play. Invitations were already sent out weeks before my birthday. And this whole group of 10 people were on it. They came with their two toddlers. Tanya did not initially want to allow young children, but I persuaded her against it at the time invitations were sent out because I have always seen toddlers at weddings and generally they are fun to have around. Well, Marissa's kid starts making noise and yelling in the middle of Tanya's vows. Tanya is visibly flustered and kind of rushes through them. I was giving her a look like it's okay sweetie relax, but it all happened so fast. Dinner was served and we were dancing before I could blink. I went to the bathroom at some point and on the way back I got distracted by my friends for probably 10 minutes when Marissa joined with her baby. That took me out of the flow of the conversation enough to realize my newly wed wife was sitting in the reception room glaring at me. I absolutely agree that I should not have let myself get distracted for even a second. This was our special day and every moment is supposed to be shared together. However, what happened next was even more awful. Tanya stormed past me to the dressing room where I followed her and shut the door. She took her ring off, chunked it to the floor and started crying. I apologized for getting distracted but wanted to get back out there so we didn't miss any more dancing. We started talking and Tanya revealed to her that Marissa called her dig-suiting and god-awful names during the wedding, it was like she wasn't even trying to hide her racism. She stated that Marissa was dropping hints of it during the birthday party, but went scorched earth during the wedding. I tried to hug Tanya but she was inconsolable. It felt like almost an hour later when another buddy of mine knocked on the door to tell us he was heading out. That forced us to go out and say bye. The rest of the wedding improved greatly after that, but I did avoid interacting with Marissa for the rest of it. Still, it feels like a nasty scar. I cannot help but feel. That this really did not have to go this way, and none of this would have happened if she had trusted me in the first place after my birthday and allowed me to talk to Marissa about it. I have a lot of empathy for her because she has had a tough time with female friends taking the spotlight from her in her childhood, but now I don't know what to do. This whole thing feels irreversible and is now a moot point. Should I still try to persuade her it was a misunderstanding from the beginning, or move on and live a life separate from this part of my family? Former teenage dirtbags, how did you get better? I removed myself from society and became better than all of you normies. When I was 17, I was absolutely awful. I'd yell at my mom, never do any chores, I'd even have the audacity to scream curses at my mother. I'd take a whole bunch of hits on my grass pen every single day, to the point that my teacher started to notice my smell. I didn't have any friends, and I didn't really try to have any. I'd just post on TikTok all day. I had about 300,000 followers, and I thought I was the poop because I had so many. That was until someone knocked me into reality, they broke my cell phone. I had no contact with everyday life after that. The friends I thought I had all left me. I was left just to be a loner with no life. Every time I took a hit out of my pen, I felt my life draining from me. Even though my dog hates me, his buggy eyes would stare at me while I touched myself. That's when I decided I needed to go back to society. When I got my new phone, instead of yelling at my mom because it was an iPhone 11 instead of an iPhone 14, I thanked her and said that she could have just gotten me an iPhone 6. I downloaded TikTok again and I felt my life force training again. Every time I posted it on TikTok after that, I would have people telling me to touch grass and that I needed to put screen time on my phone so that I would never touch a phone again. Instead of calling them social justice warriors like I usually would, I checked my settings app, and I looked for screen time like they said. Unlimited my time on TikTok for only 3 hours a day. Then I downloaded a planner app that reminded me when to work out, when to do my homework, and when to play video games. After I started doing that, I noticed a huge change in my behavior. I started talking to people that I usually wouldn't in class. The popular kids that I used to hate didn't seem so weird anymore. People actually started to smile at me when I walked in the hallways instead of grimacing at me because I had weird skull makeup on. I felt like a changed man. Now, teachers love me. I'm that goody two-shoes that everyone talks about. I only have one hour a day on TikTok now, and I still have a massive audience. But now my audience is full of gym brothers and wholesome Christian YouTubers. I like it better that way, now I can get into Yale with no problem. I called my insecure daughter average looking and now she is cold and distant. I thought it was the right thing to do at the time. So I have a very insecure 14-year-old daughter who has a depressingly unhealthy obsession with her looks. She often avoids mirrors and pictures because her mood instantly drains when she sees herself. She refuses to get in any family photos because she hates how she looks. She constantly asks her father and me if we think she's pretty and we always tell her the same thing, that she's a beautiful girl inside and that's all that matters. I tell her that she is very pretty to me, but also try emphasizing to her that there is more to life than exterior beauty. One important detail to note is that my daughter's vanity is not only becoming exhausting to those around her, but I fear it's causing her to slowly lose herself. I know that one day she will deeply regretting not getting in family pictures or having been recorded in her teenage years, as she'll want to look back on memories, and only then will she realize how immature she was. So yesterday, I decided to sit her down to chat with her about this, to discuss what's bothering her, and to see if she's willing to visit a therapist about her insecurities. She told me she didn't want to talk about it, but as her mother of course, I'm going to be worried about her, so I insisted until she gave in. She finally agreed. A few minutes into this conversation, she asked exactly this, Mom, I want you to be completely honest with me. That means no sugarcoating. The kids at my school think I'm ugly and say I look like Squidward because I have a big nose. Do you really think I'm beautiful, or are you just lying? 
I'm an honest person, so I gave her the most honest answer I had. I told her she was bang average looking, like most people in the world are, and that it's not a bad thing to have an average appearance. She immediately got up and left without saying a word and just went into her room for the rest of the night. Today, she has been cold and distant, and I think I upset her, which wasn't my intention at all. My plus-sized roommate is deeply in love with me. But there's one big reason I can't be with her. How do I let her down gently? So my roommate first moved in with me about seven months ago. I had just gotten a place and she knew me from a previous job, so I figured it'd be a convenient fit for both of us. For the first month or so all was well. Then as the months went on, I noticed she wanted to spend more and more time with me. Asking me to go with me when I took my dog for a walk, wanting to watch movies with me, etc. I figured she was lonely and just needed a friend. But about two months ago she started being more overt in her affection, giving me extended hugs, putting her head on my shoulder while we were watching something, cooking meals for me and so on. I'm now panicking. Why? For one simple but terrible reason, I have a micro PP, and she is a very large woman who is a self-proclaimed size queen. Her weight is not my issue, I've always found larger women more attractive, more to play with, as I've always said. Regardless, she has said many times that she trusts me completely, and so we have had very frank discussions about her intimate life. She enjoys large, thick PPs, and says her most intense finishes come from getting railed till kingdom come. She essentially needs someone to be in so deep King Arthur could not pull out. She's tried to ask me about my own intimate life, but I've always deflected the question and said I'm a very private person. The truth is that I have no intimate life. When stiffer than a statue, my PP is a little over two inches long. Needless to say, I've avoided dating and intimacy for my entire life because I know the vast majority of women would reject me. Until now. I've been avoiding her for about a week and she's starting to notice. The thing is, reciprocating her affection is out of the question, even though I do like her back. We are incompatible, and I have zero interest in any sort of open relationship. Also, if possible, I would like to avoid telling her the true reason for me rejecting her. When you have a micro ding dong you need to avoid letting anyone know about it due to the severe social stigma attached to having one. I would also like to avoid kicking her out if possible. My apartment is very close to her job and she's said many times that she's saved a lot of money and gas because she can just bike or walk to work. Plus she's been a great roommate and I have no good reason to do that. What really sucks about all of this is that I would ask her out in a heartbeat if I was even 4 inches. We have compatible personalities, many shared interests, and she is drop dead gorgeous, not to everyone, but to me. But alas, I'm part of the 0.6% of men that were cursed to be laughed at and rejected. My abusive mother has been making my life hell ever since she came back. I plan to surprise her by sending her back to her home country. My mother needs to go. So my husband and I got married in the US in September and have been living in his house there since. As for my parents, they live in Japan, but my god-awful mother has been staying with my husband and I since the wedding. For context on the monster which is my mother, she has always been a very controlling person throughout my life. She's always had high expectations from me, very hypercritical of every aspect of my life, forced me into ballet as a child and essentially admonished me for not having the idealistic slender body of a ballerina. She tried starving me when I was young to make me slimmer in order to be a ballerina, and blamed me for years for being fat. Fat, referring to the fact that my hip structure was wide, she was literally calling me fat because of the shape of my hip bones. She would not let me play in the sun or join sports. She would not let me cut my hair. I could not hang out with friends after school. Extra tutoring extracurriculars and strict routines. If I upset her in any way, she would smack me on the palms of my hands until they were raw. I could have a fever and be at home from school and she would still come into my room and sit on my bed to make me study. Even if I was delirious I had to stay conscious, participate and provide the right answers. I had a rough upbringing to say the least. I've largely addressed most of these things as I've grown up and independent of her. But a few things remain as ongoing struggles, she is incredibly nosy and still tries to critique my life and all of my decisions. My husband is Japanese slash American. When she first saw a photo of him she was swooning but as soon as I told her his background. She had a problem about his race. She said such horrible things, some of which still echo in my mind today. I have a better relationship with my dad, but my dad is very submissive when it comes to my mom. My husband is the only person who can control my mom. He is very assertive and blunt. He has an intimidating aura and is unfortunately the only person who can put her in her place. To find her way around this, now my mom waits until he is out of the house to come for me. Ever since she's been living here, I feel like prey in my own home. She's been snooping around the house and did a lot of it while we were gone on our honeymoon. We have a detached garage next to the house. My husband uses the main floor garage, and upstairs he converted it into an art studio for me. My mom has gone through my studio and looked through all my journals and sketchbooks. She has gone through our closet, my clothes my lingerie, personal items, and most recently my adult stuffed drawer which my husband and I use. I basically have a drawer in our closet in which I keep all that stuff. We put a lock on it for obvious reasons. She started degrading me about it, I was so upset I was streaming with tears. It was only when I threatened to tell my husband did she admit it took her several days but she eventually found the key. When she does these invasions of privacy, 
she won't admit to them but I'll know she has seen something private of mine that she doesn't like because she will not so subtly hint her disapproval. And then she will poke me over and over again to force me to play a twisted guessing game with her. It is nauseating and painful. I feel so guilty about it but I look forward to having space from her again. I am counting down the days. When I see other people and their closeness to their moms I can't relate. I feel really sad about that. Tonight she was getting physical after having too much wine. While yelling at me about my decision to take a break from work. Luckily my husband came home early. I ran and got behind him for cover. She kept trying to reach around him to grab me. She was not listening to his calm voice. So he had to raise his voice on her and that's when she stopped suddenly and just, went to her room. When she acts like that I feel so anxious. I was holding my partner's shirt in my fist so tightly I didn't realize my nails were digging into his skin. I want to send her back to her home country, but I don't know if I have the patience needed to go through with that as she will have a lot to say about it. My abusive mother has been making my life hell ever since she came back. I plan to surprise her by sending her back to her home country. The last few days have been a lot. Ever since she went up to her room when my husband yelled at her for laying hands on me, she essentially went on a hunger strike, and was refusing to eat until my husband and I apologized to her. My husband's motto was basically, let the beach starve, but I couldn't do that. I had to force him to fake an apology and he did, and that's when she started eating again. She has not gotten any better though. Recently, she has been obsessed with the guest room closet. It is a large walk-in closet, as this guest room is actually the main floor master. When we put her up in this room I had explained to my mother the reason there is shelving on only one side of this closet, is because we explicitly requested this from the designer during the finishing. We wanted space to neatly store some seasonal items and sports gear. With this simple explanation, I thought the subject had been closed. Yesterday I came home from a run wearing headphones. I went upstairs to my bathroom. I was about to start my shower, but shut the water off because I kept hearing this strange drilling sound below me. When it wouldn't stop I wrapped a towel around myself and went downstairs, calling out for my mother. There was no response. I followed the sound and ran into two men standing around in the hall area that connects to that guest room. They stared back half smiling, half dumb boyfriend downed I was so shocked I just froze. My mom appeared behind me, which gave me another scare and I almost screamed. She said, oh my god, put some clothes on, stupid girl. I was speechless crimson and embarrassed, I got myself out of there. I finished my shower got dressed, by which time the men had all left. I confronted my mother. Turns out that without asking me or my husband, who is conveniently away, she found these random men. Online, Ho are not even certified or work for an established company, invited him into our home, and had shelves put in. Something which I told her not to do. I tried to tell her that she can't do that, but she was laying into my verbally when I protested, playing the victim until I felt so bad for her that I apologized. I feel humiliated and disturbed at what I can only assume is a twisted power move. I have to pay for this service, because my mother claims she does not have the money, but also it is your house. She gave access to our home to people from Telegram, who could have robbed the place after she so graciously told them it is just the two of us women currently living here, but more often just me, as, in her words, my awful husband is frequently away. I have been having a hard time falling asleep at night because I'm worrying about getting robbed or worse. I live in a secluded area, on an acreage surrounded by woods. Absolutely surrounded. I can't even see my neighbors. Since my husband had warned her to keep her behavior in check, I feel like it is absolutely fair to send her back to Japan early. But I am also scared to send her because then I'll be alone, as my husband is away for work. Speaking of my husband, I contacted him and he said he will book her a first-class ticket with someone to collect her from the plane and escort her. That she will be comfortable. He wants me to stand my ground. He assures me I'll be safe. He can monitor the home from our security system, brief me on some scenarios and things like that. A part of me wants to keep her here so I won't be alone. She and I are currently not speaking to each other, her decision ironically. Update 2, my abusive mother has been making my life hell ever since she came back. I plan to surprise her by sending her back to her home country. So, I booked her the plane ticket and told her about it. To say poop went down is an understatement. So my mom's flight was at 2 a.m. I packed her belongings the night before, while she was having a migraine, also known as sipping wine and gossiping on the phone. I placed her suitcases in my vehicle. I informed her of my decision in the morning. Leading up to it, I discussed her behavior since the wedding, listing all the incidents and her lack of remorse or willingness to respect us in our home. I reminded her of the warning my husband had given her only a few days ago. And that as a result of her actions, I will be following through with his warning in his absence. She will be going home. She smiled the whole time while I was talking. I asked her mom, do you understand? She said she understands that I am a weakling and a coward who is blindly carrying out my husband's bidding. She also made a point to be extra cruel by describing my husband as having dirty blood, and a few other names relating to the fact that he is part American. I clarified to her that this decision is mine. My husband is not here. She gave a rude laugh and I explained her flight information. We'll see she said. 
I don't think it hit her that this was really happening until later that evening when I started to pack up the remaining few things. She tried to fight with me to undo the packing. She slapped me many times but I continued, literally while she was slapping me, I dragged the stuff to the vehicle while the verbal and physical barrage went on. I have a few scratches from the swipes of her nails. One of them is on my face. She then tried to pull my hair as I was going up the stairs. I could have fallen backward but she didn't get a good grip of it. I shouted at her that if she doesn't stop, I will call the police. I don't care anymore. I will embarrass her by slandering her in my personal life any chance I get. I dialed 911 on my phone and showed her. She called me an insufferable beach, and also threw an SLT because somehow that's fitting. But she left me alone after that. I had a friend of my husband come and escort us to the airport. He is a stone-faced ex-Navy SEAL so she did not try anything funny in the car. He also drove me back and it helped a lot. When he showed up things calmed down significantly because my mom behaved in a stranger's presence. Smiling curtly and everything. I tried to give her a hug at the airport and she walked away making a vague threat about how her death will be on my conscience. We never hug unless it's for photos anyway so maybe it was too much. So, she's gone. I have an extremely bad headache today, from all the stress and tension that had built up. Here are some beauty tips that I wish I knew during my teenage years. Sugar is actually what causes acne. Blood sugar spikes lead to inflammation such as acne. I've never had a sweet tooth, but sometimes when I ate some candy or other sweets, I would notice that pimples would appear on my face really suddenly. I knew it was the sugar because I don't get pimples often, but I instantly got a pepperoni face after eating sugary things. I tested this out even further by cutting sugar out of my diet for just one week and I actually lost weight, my face had never been cleaner, and I slept so much better. Really, just one week can improve your life so much so I definitely recommend cutting out sugar for as long as you can. Another tip I learned over the years is that it is possible to look pretty without makeup. I used to be very insecure about my bare face and I never knew why. My face was pretty mediocre and the lack of pimples really should have helped my confidence, but no. It took me going to college to realize that my eyebrows were the problem. I went to get them threaded one day and I looked like a completely different person. There are so many eyebrow shapes that you really have to experiment to see what suits your face best. My eyebrows weren't even and I had a faint unibrow that messed up my entire look. I heard this one too many times growing up, but always wear sunscreen. I promise it really does make a difference. I ignored the advice and didn't bother with it, but when I finally tried it, I saw such a clear difference in my skin. In your 20s, you start to see the signs of aging and I certainly did not want to look 40 when I was only 22. When lathering face soap on your face, always use your ring and pinky fingers because they're not going to put any pressure on your skin. Your cheeks are really sensitive so you have to be mindful of putting minimal pressure on that area. I actually didn't learn this tip until I was a senior in high school, but you're only supposed to put conditioner on the ends of your hair. I always put it on my entire head because I loved how soft my hair felt afterwards, but conditioner actually damages your roots. The opposite can be said for shampoo, you're not supposed to shampoo the ends of your hair, only the roots. A problem I faced in middle school was biting my nails. I loved biting my nails because it was a form of relief, but it's actually so embarrassing to be doing that in public. I was caught biting my nails once and I pictured what I looked like from the other person's perspective and I felt grossed out. Because, here I was munching on my nails, getting saliva all over my fingers, but what really made me quit was knowing all the bacteria my fingernails collect. To know that I was putting all of that bacteria in my mouth made me want to scarf up my lunch because eu. Just think about that next time you go bite your nails. And I saved the best for last, but washing your hair and putting conditioner on before getting in a pool can actually protect your hair. This is because when you shower before getting in the pool, your hair and skin soak up that fresh water, making them less likely to soak up the pool water and its damaging chemicals. So definitely try that out before you go swimming. I want a boyfriend but I ghost every guy that shows interest in me. Please help. I like men, I really do, and I have had boyfriends in the past but they never last. My longest relationship has been a month. Can you believe that? I've had four boyfriends and they can't even last two months. I'm addicted to romance books, romance shows, and romance movies. I really just want a love like the one shown there. I know it can never really be exactly like that, but I want something similar. A month ago, I met a guy and I thought he was so right for me. He was friendly sweet, and cute but I cannot tell you one thing that this man likes because I never got to know him. We rarely texted and if we did, the conversation was over after 5 minutes. I always took too long to reply to his messages and I never went out of my way to text him first. These are clearly signs that I was uninterested right? Well if that was the case, then why did I feel a swarm of butterflies in my stomach when I saw him at his work a week later? I was so excited to talk to him, but because he was with a customer the entire time I was there I didn't get to speak to him. That really bummed me out. Another week later, we made plans to go out. It was going to be our first date, but I cancelled at the last minute because I was too scared to go out with him. It's been two weeks and we haven't talked since. I can already see that this relationship is going nowhere, but I really thought we were going to end up being boyfriend and girlfriend. I don't know what happened, 
but I do know I have commitment issues. This doesn't stop me from yearning for a relationship, but it does stop me from getting into a relationship. All I want is to love a person and feel that love being reciprocated. In my head, dating feels so easy and romantic, but when the opportunity to date a guy presents itself, I always pretend the guy doesn't exist and move on with my life. This has been a habit of mine ever since I started dating. And I want to stop acting like this. It's so unfair to the guys I show interest in and then ghost them. It's not right and I hate that I do it, but when I think about dating that person, I feel anxious and scared rather than feeling excitement and love. That's not even the half of it. I started liking somebody else and again, I'm picturing what we could be, making up false scenarios before I go to bed, overthinking every single interaction we have, and wanting to be loved by him. But I know the second he shows interest in me, I'm going to run off being scared. Which really sucks because he makes me happy and I want to make him as happy as he makes me. We're actually friends so I'm terrified that my feelings will ruin our friendship. I'm even more scared of us dating, breaking up, and then never being able to hang out with our friends because yes, we do have mutual friends. Do I just give up on love entirely and adopt a bunch of cats or try to work out a way to solve these commitment issues of mine? When have you completely misread a girl's signal? I thought she was taking me to the bathroom to have intimacy. I was very wrong. When I was in college I was at a house party and met this girl. We played Pong together and kept winning. We were having a blast and ended the night with no one beating us. I thought she was pretty cute so I gestured her over to the couch to drink and talk a bit more. We drank and talked, drank and talked, then started kissing, tongues and all. I could tell she was feeling me, or at least I thought. She then asked me to come to the bathroom with her, I said of course. So she took me by the hand and led me away. I went in first and she shut the door behind us and locked it. Certain things were about to go to the next level. But to my surprise she unzipped her pants and sat down on the toilet. I just assumed she had to pee real quick so I looked away. Then she grunted. I heard a fart. Then a plop. I legitimately jumped after realizing what happened, unlocked the door and ran. Never saw her again. I waited a table of two seven-year-olds on a date, it was the cutest thing I've ever seen. I work at a fancy restaurant and during my shift tonight, the hostess came up to me informing me I was assigned to two tables. One table was two mothers and the other was their two kids on a date. She told me they wanted to be at a different table so their parents wouldn't embarrass them, but their parents wanted to be nearby to supervise it and cover the check. I went to the parents' table first to make sure we were all on the same page, and they told me the kids could order whatever they want, I then turned to go to the kids, it was homecoming in my town, so I assumed it was going to be some high schoolers, but I walked up to these two seven-year-old kids just sitting at a high top. They had kids' menus, and were kicking their feet and giggling away. I asked if I could get them something to drink. The little boy was like after her. I asked if I could get any appetizers started for them, and the boy ordered mussels. When I asked them how they were enjoying it, the girl told me she had never had mussels before in her whole life, so me and the boy convinced her to try them and she loved them. And he was just beaming. I went to the parents' table and told them their kids are incredibly mature and so cute, and they told me the two were the same age, and have always lived on the same street. So they have grown up together, and have always had this crush on each other. They both got chicken tenders and fries for their dinners. And they ordered our dessert special to share, a seasonal creme brulee, to finish off the evening. They captured everyone's hearts so much that, with parental approval, my manager gave them half glasses of a zero-proof champagne to toast with, with little strawberries on the glasses. They complimented my service, ate every bit of everything, drank all of the sparkling grape juice, conversed the whole time, and giggled their cute little butts off. I got talking with one of the moms as they were cashing out. How you would think having a crush on each. Other would make them shy, but the conversation was literally non-stop. It was the best thing I've seen in my 10 years of service. Teachers, what's the best smart-ass response from a student you've heard? I'm a 12th grade English teacher and one year I had this kid who was a little bit on the spectrum and a stereotypical mean girl in the same class. Ava, the mean girl, would always try to have everyone's attention on her in class, always making comments such as, "Oh, uh, this class is way too early and can we just watch a movie in class today please? She would also make fun of Conrad, the kid on the spectrum, to get laughs from other boys in the class. She would specifically make fun of Conrad's hair as he had this massive afro. One day at the end of the school year I decided for the class we'd look through the yearbook because we didn't have any more assignments for the rest of the year. I had it presented on the smartboard and as we were looking through it we got to the senior superlative section of the yearbook. As we were going through them we got to the award for the craziest hair and the winner was Conrad. He sat right in the front of the class and was getting all excited for winning, then Ava who sat right behind him, threw an eraser onto his hair and it landed right atop his afro without Conrad noticing. The whole class started snickering and I could tell Ava was proud of herself. I told her to please remove it and she begrudgingly said, oh fine. I flipped to the next award and it was Ava as most school spirited, our school mascot is the Eagles, so as soon as I flipped to the page Conrad said, yeah because her legs are always spread eagle. Am I in the wrong for being unable to forgive my husband after what he did on our wedding day? My husband and I have been married for nearly three months now but I am still traumatized over what he did on our wedding day. I spent at least two nights and a week awake all night crying because of this. We had a very intimate wedding where only family was invited. I come from a very big family so there were at least 50 people from my side and my husband's family. For context, we are both from a South Asian background and I was not accepted by my husband's mother because I'm older than him, and she wanted him to marry someone much younger. For two years we both struggled to get her to accept because my parents refused to give me away to a family that disapproved of me. 
Well, my husband and I had countless chats about him being a mummy's boy, because till date he has been unable to clearly tell her that I do not want to live with my in-laws, as his parents want us to live with them even though we have our own house. My husband would deny it every time I bring the topic up, and I said to him if he can't make his own decisions as a man I cannot marry you. Every single time he would brush it off by saying we have our own house so he doesn't need to answer to his mother. Back to the wedding day, we had a small ceremony in a hall where we were pronounced husband and wife. Afterwards my husband's family came back to my house to complete rest of the ceremonies. His mom said we will not be able to stay for more than an hour, as we are visiting some friends today so we need to go soon. I called my husband outside and told him my family has spent over 3,000 pounds on decorations and my cousins, aunties slash uncles were up all night decorating, and that it's our wedding day so you can't just leave like that. He said okay to me just to shut my mouth basically. We cut the cake and it was time to take photographs. His mom had tears in her eyes and the rest of his family were just quiet. Their mood was very down, then my husband goes to me, is it all done, can we go? I got so hurt by this and I said to him you are leaving our wedding ceremony to go sit at someone else's house? He made excuses like my brother can't drive late in the night, we're already running late etc. I went inside and I started bawling my eyes out. Him, his mom and their family left to go to their friend's house, and my family followed me inside. I was so embarrassed. My cousins aunties and uncles all gathered around me wiping my tears. Even though it's been so long I still haven't been able to forgive him, am I in the wrong? What was your airplane from hell story? I almost unalived myself because of this flight. I am an extremely light sleeper. Someone could whisper on the other side of a room I am sleeping in, and I'd wake up looking like a demon from hell. Ever since I moved in with my boyfriend one year ago, I haven't gotten a single night of uninterrupted sleep. I'm okay with this because bad sleep is just a part of being human for me, but things moved to another level this year when my boyfriend took me on our one-year anniversary vacation, to Prague. I was super excited to go but, lo and behold, our flight got cancelled at the very last second so my boyfriend and I had to wait for the next one. Unfortunately, the next one was at 3 in the morning. Due to the constant stream of noise and airport announcements, I wasn't able to get a wink of sleep. When we finally boarded the airplane, I was ready to curl up against my boyfriend and sleep for a week straight. Unfortunately, due to us getting added to the flight at the last minute, we were separated. My boyfriend was in the middle of the plane while I was towards the front with a window seat. He gave me the window seat to make up for the crappy start to our vacation, but I have never hated a seat more. Nothing could have prepared me for the people around me. Somehow the spawn of the devil itself had made its way to the seat directly behind me. Whenever I relaxed a little, there would be a harsh and sudden kick. Whenever I forgot about the kick, there would be another kick. Frustration eventually won out and I turned around to complain to this child's parents, but there were no adults at all seated behind me. Just two other young boys, probably this devil's brothers, who looked extremely unimpressed with me for trying to tattle. Yes, the kicking got worse after that. Then, the guy next to me chose this nine-hour flight to break up with his girlfriend. She bawled her eyes out for so long she literally cried herself to sleep, but then I still couldn't sleep because the guy next to me felt bad and kept talking to me to justify why he broke up with her. From what he said, Samantha really did deserve it. But I just wanted to sleep, and this dude was not taking the hint. Later, I discovered that the plane was also all out of vegetarian options, so I couldn't even eat anything to feel better. I was starting to feel nauseous. My boyfriend and I met up outside the bathroom just for a quick pick-me-up, but when he saw me, he told me to wait. Apparently, my boyfriend was seated next to this nice old lady that he'd been holding a conversation with for hours already. He had told her about my sleep issues and she said she had some secret magic strips that could help me out. So, my boyfriend went back to the lady and picked up the magic strips, apparently they were elevate sleep strips, they were literally called insomnia killers, and he gave them to me. I'll be honest, I did not expect them to work. The strip tasted like a raspberry mint and I felt like I was just having a snack. The sleep strip finished dissolving in my mouth super quick and I was even planning on asking my boyfriend to try to get a second so the effect would be stronger, but poop, I didn't even have time to ask. The world became heavy within minutes and everything started to quiet down. I realized that even the kid kicking my chair felt less annoying because the strip had unlocked some sort of god tier ignore everything mode. I remember that the couple next to me started arguing about who would get to keep the dog, which I was actually pretty interested in from the opening lines, but I never figured out who won the argument because I slept like a rock and didn't wake up until hours and hours later. That's right. 9 hours in a plane, uninterrupted. It actually ended up being one of the most restful and rejuvenating sleeps of my life. My boyfriend was the one who woke me up because I'd even slept through people unboarding, but it wasn't like waking up from a plane at all, I felt rested and good. Then, my boyfriend did the thing that made me fall for him even more, he showed me that he had extra sleep strips for me to use over the next few nights, a gift from his lady friend. Apparently, he kept walking up and down the plane all to check in on me and realized that the insomnia killer strips had worked, which was crazy because I'm a light sleeper and no sleep trick from counting sheep to melatonin pills, has ever worked. So now that we finally had something that could help me sleep deeper, he got me some extra sleep strips to help me through the next nights and ordered two more boxes, one for Prague and one for home. I love him so much. 
I haven't struggled with falling asleep ever since then. Even in Prague where the beds are less comfortable. And by the way, my boyfriend ended up using that vacation to propose to me, though I did not sleep that night, if you know what I mean. When has someone challenged you at something you are an expert at without them knowing it? One day after work I was at the gym and I saw this very fit older African American guy biking on a stationary bike. There was also this guy who was wandering around, not really working out just talking to everybody, mostly girls, offering advice and chit-chatting. It seemed like a lot of girls were getting annoyed at him and trying to avoid him. But anyways he goes up to this guy on the bike and I happened to overhear their conversation. It went something like this, annoying guy, damn, you're pretty fit for an older dude, what are you training for? Biking guy, ultra triathlon in a few weeks, which is a 6.2 mile swim, a 261.4 mile bike and a 52.4 mile run, annoying guy seems impressed and jokingly asks will you win BG, probably AG, haha, always got to believe in yourself right. BG, well I've won my last three ultra triathlons and the closest person was 20 miles behind me, so yeah, I believe in myself AG, yeah alright, good luck BG, why don't you get back to work pal. The annoying guy kind of grunted, and walked away to get back to disturbing other gym girls. I ended up looking at the sign-up sheet for the gym to check the guy's name out and sure enough he had multiple records for ultra triathlons. But on top of that he's completed multiple ultra marathons, which are 100 mile races, is an ex-Navy SEAL, and had the record for the most pull-ups done in 24 hours. This guy was an insane athlete just biking casually at a gym in San Francisco. My the a-hole for asking my wife to help with the kids? My wife, Lisa, and I both 30s have three kids under five. I work full-time while Lisa is a stay-at-home mom with an Etsy shop where she makes and sells jewelry. A while back I received a nice bonus and after a bit of discussion, it was decided I'd use my bonus for myself. I managed to stay within budget but I booked myself a two-week vacation to Hawaii. Of course this meant Lisa had the kids at home full-time while I was gone. When I returned, Lisa was exhausted and I initially agreed to take the kids for the afternoon on Saturday so she could have some time to herself and unwind. My cousin ended up inviting us to a barbecue the same day and my cousin is one of my best friends and I knew other childhood friends would be there. Lisa wasn't sure about going but I told her everyone would be happy to see her and the kids, plus I'd watch them so she can relax and have a drink or two. The day of the barbecue, the kids were out of control, crying, screaming, fighting, not listening or following direction. It was impossible to have a conversation or catch up with my cousin or friends. I repeatedly walked over to Lisa to ask her to give me a hand with the kids, each time she declined and said I agreed to watch them and this is her downtime. After another hour of chaos, I ended up yelling across the yard, for once, can you please get off your fucking ass and help me with our kids? Just once is all I'm asking for. Lisa stomped over to me and started whisper yelling that I was breaking my promise to let her have time to relax, she didn't want to be here and feels I basically made her go. I tried explaining that these are people I don't see very often and to please not make a scene. Unfortunately a few people overheard us and we caught a few comments about Lisa being a lazy mom who only wanted to pawn the kids off on me slash she's taking advantage of me. Lisa burst into tears and yelled at the people standing nearby that made the comments for them to all go to hell, told me to basically fuck myself. Took the car and left. She returned a few hours later to pick up me and the kids. We didn't speak to each other on the drive home. Later that night, I tried talking to her that the kids were having a rough day and I just needed her help for a bit so I could finish a few conversations and I would have taken them right back. Lisa objected that wasn't fair as she had the kids alone for two weeks while I was in Hawaii. She also said that's not what upset her the most, it was how I phrased what I said and how I let people insult her and didn't immediately jump to her defense. I told Lisa that those people don't know her like I do and have no idea how hard she works to take care of the kids, our house, and run her Etsy shop, nor did I have time to react before she ended up leaving. Am I the a-hole? Doctors, what's your most awkward experience with someone of the opposite gender? I'm a nurse practitioner, and one day at the hospital the attending doctor tells me to go examine a patient, her chief complaint being that she was beaten up by her boyfriend. So I go into the waiting room to see a tall very attractive blonde sitting there crying. I sat down next to her patting her on her back and comforting her. After she calmed down a bit I do the usual background check and explain to her that I have to examine her from top to bottom in order to document all of the injuries. She sniffles and says okay, so I proceeded with my examination. I first documented all of her visible injuries, and all was going well. That was until I had to look under her clothes to examine. This part is always a little awkward but I really didn't expect what happened next. I started from top to bottom looking around her chest area, okay. Then her back, okay. Still all good after looking at her abdomen. Then as I pulled down her pants, bam. Penis. I did not see it coming at all as she had breasts and everything. I think my shocked expression for a split second caught her off guard, as she says, oh my god, I'm so sorry. I forgot to tell you, I'm transsexual. And all I'm thinking is yeah, I figured out. My husband wanted to open up our marriage, so I started dating his boss, now he wants to close it. Let me just start by saying that I didn't mean to start dating his boss, it all happened accidentally. My husband and I have been married for almost 8 years now, we have always had a healthy marriage and a great intimacy life, or so I thought. It came completely out of the blue when my husband sat me down a couple months ago and said that he was feeling unsatisfied with our physical connection, and he needed something more to be able to feel fulfilled. I was so confused, we are intimate a couple times a week and he never gave any indication that he was feeling unhappy in the bedroom. I was feeling hurt before he even dropped the bomb on me that he wanted to open up our marriage. 
I felt so small and unwanted as he rambled on about wanting to experience more freedom but he assured me that he loved me and he wanted to stay together. I asked him why I wasn't enough for him, and if there was anything I could change to make him happier in the bedroom or in our marriage in general. But all he said was that it had more to do with his masculinity than me. This didn't make me feel better, but I love him and we had already been together for so long. So we lunched tea, I agreed and we decided to be open from that day on. Our only terms was that we had to disclose to the other when we would start seeing other people. The first couple weeks were excruciating, he immediately started seeing a woman from his office and I would just stay at home and cry myself to sleep while I pictured him out with a younger, more attractive woman. I was devastated for a while and I honestly had zero interest in dating anyone other than my husband. But after five months of him dating his one girlfriend, and spending most nights with her instead of at home with me, I decided that I deserved to experience some freedom as well. I made a Tinder account one night while he was out with his girlfriend. I was surprised when I got over 100 matches on the very first night. No one was really catching my attention until matched with this one, very handsome older man. He seemed very successful and he was a gorgeous silver fox. I ended up messaging him and we went out a couple of days later. I remember the feeling of waiting for him at the bar, it felt nice to have romantic butterflies for the first time in almost a decade. The date went amazingly and we continued seeing each other and eventually slept together. It was one of the most thrilling, erotic nights of my life. I hate to say it but he was a much more talented lover than my husband, I guess because he was older and had more experience. Anyway, I told my husband about my boyfriend and it honestly seemed like he didn't believe me. He literally patted me on the head and said aw, good for you honey before heading out the door to spend the night with his girlfriend. Anyway, things got messy in a way I could have never anticipated. I knew this situation was already sort of rocky, but now I truly feel like I'm living inside a soap opera. Yesterday my boyfriend texted me asking if he had left a manila folder in my car the last time we saw each other. I found the folder and he asked if I could drop it off at his job. I was off that day and I figured they were important work documents, so I gathered the folder and a little snack and he sent me his location so I could come drop it off. You can imagine how stunned I was when I followed the address and it took me to my husband's place of work. I had no idea that he and my husband worked together, all I knew was that he was the head of whatever company he worked for, and he held the highest position in his office. He never spoke much about his work and we just liked to relax when we hung out together. Well, I walked into the office feeling awkward about possibly seeing my husband. Well, I walked to my boyfriend's office and he came out to take the folder from me, he thanked me and gave me a little kiss before going back into his office. When I turned around, of course, my husband happened to be walking by at that exact moment. He had obviously seen his boss kiss me and realized that he had been my boyfriend all along. His mouth made a perfect O shape and there was hurt creeping into his eyes. I felt sort of embarrassed at that moment even though I had done nothing wrong, so I just said hi to my husband quickly and left the office. When my husband finally got home, he broke down in tears and asked how I could do this to him. I reminded him that this entire situation was his idea in the first place, that's when my husband said that he was willing to close the marriage if it meant I would stop seeing his boss. The thing is, I have real feelings for my boyfriend, and I feel like my husband is being controlling and unfair. I find myself doubting my entire marriage and I think I might end up having to choose between the two of them. My husband wanted to open up our marriage, so I started dating his boss, now he wants to close it. Dash the last time I posted, my husband had just found out about his boss and me dating. After my husband saw his boss kiss me at his place of work, he put the pieces together, and it made him upset enough to ask me to close our marriage back up. I was so torn, I felt bad to see my husband hurting, but he had left me in a place of hurt for so long after asking for this arrangement in the first place. I admit I was tempted by the things my husband said in the conversation where he asked to close our relationship again. He just kept saying over and over that he would be better and committed. He kept saying I was the only thing he needed in the world, and he had been blind to that before. These were all words I had been waiting and wishing to hear for so long. Yet hearing them now, I felt nothing but, pity for my husband. I still loved him, we had been together for almost 10 years, and what I felt for him was incredibly strong after being life partners for this long. But I still love myself more, and as I said in my initial post, I had strong feelings for my boyfriend already. I told my husband that I loved him, but I had a say in this relationship too, and I didn't want to close our marriage back up. He was a mess at this answer, at one point, he got on his knees to beg me to reconsider, but I stood firm. I wouldn't hurt myself again to prioritize my husband's feelings. For the next couple of months, my husband went through a disorienting array of behaviors towards me. For the first few months, he was incredibly loving and attentive to me. He was cooking for us every night and insisted we have dinner almost every night together at home. He bought me flowers every day for two months and tried to initiate intimacy literally every single night these are all things he's never really done for me before, so I was surprised and happy with all these changes. Although it did. Seem sort of, preformative of him, to only start being a good husband now in an effort to win me back for himself. If he did love me, where had this treatment been before? He still seemed sad on the nights when I left him to go see my boyfriend, and I, I noticed he was seeing his own girlfriend less and less. Anyway, I was feeling conflicted, 
but my boyfriend and I's relationship continued to blossom as we learned more about each other and kept spending time together. About a month ago, my boyfriend had taken me on a very luxurious and intimate date. He reserved an entire restaurant for us and then arranged a helicopter ride for us after dinner. It was such a beautiful and romantic night and we had an amazing time together. There was no special occasion, and when I asked him why he had done all this, he said he just wanted to show me how much he appreciated his time with me, and I deserved to be treated like the catch that I am. Before I left my boyfriend's house the next morning, I broke down crying while venting to him, saying that I wished my situation could be less complicated and that I was sorry if he felt like our relationship was unconventional because I was still a married woman. My boyfriend just listened and helped me as I cried. He held me and stroked my hair and said he didn't care about my husband, he was just grateful for any time he got to spend with me, and that I was a blessing in his life, and he was just happy he got to meet a wonderful woman like me. Then he got up to make me my favorite flavor of tea, he had found out my favorite brand of tea a month ago and kept it stocked at his apartment since then. When he handed me the tea, he looked into my eyes and asked if it could be his turn to be honest with me. That's when he told me that he had never met anyone like me and that he had fallen in love with me. As soon as he said that, something just felt so right in my body and mind. I said it back to him, and we cried happy tears together. We didn't worry about anything else at that moment, we just enjoyed the vulnerability, nothing could ruin that pure moment for us. Or so I thought, but I still don't regret telling him the truth about my feelings, I do love him, but I wish it hadn't, T resulted in the mess that it did. After my boyfriend returned to work after this date, I guess he had started telling some of his co-workers about how well his relationship had been going, and it must have gotten back to my husband. My husband didn't react well, and I almost dropped my phone when he called me the other day from the police station. That's when I found out that my husband had attacked my boyfriend at their place of work. Apparently, he had overheard some people talking about how his boss had been bragging about his partner, and it had sent him over the edge. He sounded like such a jealous child on the phone, he had entered his boss's office in a jealous rage and tried to punch him straight in the face. When my boyfriend deflected, my husband picked up a coffee mug and smashed it across his head. The cops had arrested him in front of his entire office, and I assumed my boyfriend had gone to the hospital for a head wound. My husband spoke on the phone with so much hate and bitterness, and during that call, I realized the same, good man I had once married was long gone, and the last bit of love I had for him wilted inside my chest. He spoke about himself as if he were a victim instead of an unhinged criminal who had attacked another man for his own ignorant reasons. He said that he just couldn't stand his boss keeping us apart, and he had just gotten so angry after hearing that he was talking about me as if I was his wife instead, I said nothing on the phone, I just thought about the choices I faced. I could go bail my husband out of the police station, or I could go visit my boyfriend in the hospital. My husband wanted to open up our marriage, so I started dating his boss, now he wants to close it, that it didn't take me long after my husband called from the police station to make my decision. I hung up my phone, sat down, and stared at myself in the mirror for a while, thinking about what I should do. I looked into the mirror, trying to see myself as my husband did, then trying to see myself as my boyfriend did. I realized my husband loved me for the things I could do for him, for the ways which I had served him during our marriage. He never loved me for my personality or my accomplishments. On the other hand, after we told each other we loved each other for the first time, my boyfriend listed the specific things he loved about my personality. My boyfriend would hold my face in his hands every time I saw him, and thank me for my time and for my existence. I started to cry when I realized my boyfriend had been giving me the love I had been searching for my entire life, he made me feel more wanted and beautiful than my husband had ever made me feel in almost 10 years of marriage. I cried harder when I realized that I was watching the death of my old life. My husband had been slipping through my fingers for so long, but I hadn't been ready to let him go until this very moment. This was an intense moment of clarity for me, and even though I knew the decision was life-changing, I decided to go visit my boyfriend in the hospital instead of bailing out my husband. When I got to the hospital and saw my boyfriend with a large bandage across his head, I cried and apologized to him for his injury being my fault. He reassured me that this was my husband's fault and there was no way either of us could have predicted he would fly off the handle like that. I immediately told him I was leaving my husband, that I could never stay with someone so violent who had hurt him like this. At this point, my boyfriend and I had been dating for about nine months, but when I thought about leaving my husband, I thought more about my own life than my boyfriend and I's relationship. Even if I didn't feel this strongly about my boyfriend, I would have always left my husband for attacking another man and making a scene like this at his job. If I learned anything from the past year, it was that I only needed myself, and that I deserved to feel valued and cherished in any relationship. I went home with my boyfriend that night and cared for his injury. The next day, I got right to looking for divorce lawyers. I knew my husband's family would be bailing him out soon, so I returned to our house and packed all my essentials before reserving a hotel room for the next week. I ended up barely staying in the hotel room since my boyfriend insisted that I would be more comfortable at his place. I wanted to be there for him as he healed, and things just felt so right with my boyfriend, so I ended up staying at his place after leaving my husband. I never left, and the last time I spoke with my husband directly was the day he called me from the police station. He tried to contact me after getting bailed out, even blowing up my phone when he got home and found half my stuff gone. But I didn't care, 
his mistakes meant nothing to me now, and a month after he was arrested, he was served with divorce papers. I could not believe my ears after I learned that my ex-husband had returned to his old job to confront my boyfriend in the parking lot on the day he was served with divorce papers. Luckily my boyfriend was able to defend himself against my unathletic ex, and he was arrested again. Apparently, the police had found a knife on him, and he had been screaming at my boyfriend for ruining his life. I was so scared for my boyfriend when I heard about this, he could have easily been seriously injured, and I thanked God for sparing him. Yet I wasn't shocked that my boyfriend had been able to defend himself against my husband. Though he is older than my husband, he is much more fit and agile. At this point, the court granted us both restraining orders against him, and all this evidence made our divorce speedy. The next thing I knew, my ex-husband was serving jail time, while I was selling out house and splitting the profit between us. Even though everything that happened was so stressful and traumatic, after a couple of months, things slowed down, and I found myself enjoying a peaceful life with my boyfriend. He welcomed me into his specious penthouse apartment with open arms. He had told me he didn't expect me to give him all my time after my marriage had just ended, but he loved having me around and told me I never had to leave. Every day when he came home from work, he would give me a deep kiss and a tight hug and tell me how much he loved coming home to me. It's been about a year since my divorce was finalized, and I have started thinking seriously about my future with my boyfriend, he has spent every day that he's known me and treated me like a goddess, and I'm so grateful that we found each other despite everything. He has told me that he would love to make me his wife one day, but only when I'm ready, he always prioritizes my feelings, and I can't believe I accepted anything less than this true love for so long in my life. I surprised my girlfriend with Taylor Swift tickets, she wanted to bring her friend instead. Me and my girlfriend, have been dating for three years now. My girlfriend is a huge Taylor Swift fan and was really excited when she found out Taylor would be performing at MetLife Stadium, right near us. So I decided to surprise her with Taylor's concert tickets, knowing she really wanted to go. I called in sick the day the tickets dropped, and waited in the Ticketmaster queue for two hours. Finally when it opened up, I bought two seats, for $400 each, one for her and one for me. When she came back from work that night I surprised her with the tickets, and she was ecstatic. However, when I said I was really excited as well, she got very confused, as she thought the two tickets were for her and her best friend, who is also a big Taylor Swift fan. I was very disappointed since I believed that this was an experience we could do together and it would be something we would remember for the rest of our lives. Though she said that her best friend was a really big Taylor Swift fan and would enjoy it more than me. So I just told her she should go with whoever she wants to go with more, and to not go with me just because it was what I had planned. After hearing this my girlfriend immediately called her friend and told her that they were going to the Taylor Swift concert together. While my girlfriend and her friend went together and both had a great time I felt betrayed since she chose her over me. While I know my girlfriend's best friend is a much bigger Taylor Swift fan than me, I was still excited to go since I've never been to a concert before, and I like to listen to some of Taylor Swift's songs. Should I have done things differently and not given up my ticket so willingly? Women, what's the most embarrassing thing you've done during intimacy? Not exactly during intimacy, but I accidentally shit the bed in front of my boyfriend. Important context, I have a chronic stomach wound which pops up whenever I'm really stressed. The relationship was very new so we were both still quite shy, we had just gotten comfortable enough farting in front of each other though, and often made a joke out of it. About a month into our relationship I had to go to the hospital with my stomach wound, I was there for a week and he was super supportive the whole time. When I finally got home from the hospital my body was so weak, I wasn't allowed to drink or eat anything the whole week because of the test they had to make. Therefore my body had pretty much shut down, nothing had come in, so nothing came out. I got prescribed some laxatives that I took, never having taken them before I didn't know what to expect but what proceeded was definitely not it. We were laying in bed, I was on my side looking at my phone, and he was half sitting up in bed playing RuneScape on his laptop in front of me, just chilling. I could feel a fart coming, so I looked up into his eyes with a smirk face expression and said, I'm shitting. I meant to say I'm farting but the words came out wrong, and so did something else. The moment I said it, everything came out, still with a smirk facial expression looking him right in the eyes. You could hear a wet bubbly sound, and I instantly knew what had happened. My smile faded and my face turned to horror, my hand flew down to stop the flow but it was too late. Boyfriend jumped up and ran to the toilet to bring me paper, he helped me clean up while just laughing hysterically, I was so embarrassed that I couldn't even say anything. Later when we sat and talked he told me that it was the most intimidating thing he had ever experienced, the way I looked right into his eyes, he had never felt so dominated in his life. Needless to say we got very quickly comfortable with intimate things like that after this. What is your most shameful climax? Super atrony 13 year old in the early 90s, I didn't have a phone so had no access to adult films. We lived in a two-story house and the neighbor behind us was in a one-story house. Single mother with two kids, boy and girl. The boy and I became friends and I met his mom a couple times. What they didn't know was that I kept spying on them. They had no blinds or curtains in the kitchen, dining room and bathroom. The bathroom windows were frosted, but you could make out shapes. And it was obvious when mom was in there because of her height and figure. So, seeing the bathroom light come on and seeing her figure disrobe was an instant hard-on for a 13-year-old. One Saturday night I go to my room, I lay down and spy on the house. My buddy said that he and his sister were going to their dad's for the weekend so their mom will be alone. In my horny mind, 
I thought this would be a weekend of her walking around naked. So far disappointed. I spy in the dim dining room some action. I watch what I think is some aggressive effing in the dining room. I start beating my shit, I think it is about time the neighbor mom gets some action, and about time that I can watch it. Keep in mind that I have not yet actually seen adult films, and not actually seen anyone have intimacy. So, it should be of no surprise to learn that what I had seen wasn't the MILF getting plowed on her dining room table but a house plant being blown around by a fan. Her kids went away because it was warm and her AC went out, so they turned on fans in the house. I had jacked off and climaxed to a house plant. What's the saddest thing you have ever witnessed? In first grade first my daughter was being bullied on the bus by some a-hole kids. At the time her class had a project where they grew a small plant in her class that they would present to their mothers for Mother's Day. She told me about it but asked me to keep it a secret from mom. I agreed. Every day she would come home and tell me when the plant sprouted and she was so excited as it grew and grew. As Mother's Day rolled around she would ask me over and over again if I thought mom would love it. I always reassured her that yes her mom would absolutely love it because she has worked so hard to take care of it and help it grow, just like she had done with you. Mother's Day rolls around and even I'm excited to see the plant. I happened to be home from work that day and she comes home looking extremely sad. I asked her what was wrong and I could tell she was on the verge of tears. She reached out her small hand and held out half of a broke styrofoam cup with some dirt in it. The cup had been crushed and half of the words I love you mommy were written on what was left of it. The dam broke as she said happy Mother's Day mama and she crumped to the ground bawling. My daughter, so proud of her plant, decided to show the other kids on her way home the gift she was going to give her mom. A boy promptly snatched it out of her hand and threw it to the ground. Everyone laughed as he stomped on it and then grabbed the plant and threw it out the window. She was six years old, and it killed me to see her realize how cruel people could be for the first time. My girlfriend made me want to marry her by turning me into a morning person. So I, 21M, moved in with my girlfriend, 20F, of two years about three months ago. Now I am in no way a morning person, and dread waking up any time earlier than 12 to 1 if I can help it. My girlfriend, R, and I both work 9 to 5 MF. I like having the same schedule as her but I hated waking up at 7 to 8 every day, so before I moved in with her I normally spent my weekend sleeping until 2 to 3. My girlfriend is also not a morning person and has had a hard time waking up in the morning most of her life until she started working at her current job. She still hates it but she says it's easier than it used to be. The first week after I moved in she would wake up after about 3 alarms where it would take me about 7 or 8 snoozes to wake up, but by the time I woke up she had already showered and made coffee. Then the weekend rolls around and Saturday morning R gets up at around 10 and I was half awake for long enough to check my phone before going back to sleep. I woke up again around 11 because Mother Nature was calling and heard her singing. Because I was still asleep she was singing quietly so she wouldn't wake me. I came out of the room and saw her playing Minecraft with one earbud in and the house smelled like coffee. She just looked up, smiled, said good morning and then went back to playing. Next morning same thing, I was more conscious this time because I recognized her voice in my sleep and was semi-awake. Uber drivers, what is the wildest pickup you've ever done? On this one night, I received a very strange request for a ride. The request came in, and everything seemed normal. He was three miles away, according to his request. As I'm driving to the pickup location, I get a phone call. It's my passenger. Basically he says. Hey man, I'm not actually at that location. I just had to put that so someone could come get me. I'm too far away from any other drivers, so the app made me put my location in your city, closer to other drivers. Come pick me up at my drop-off location. This is okay with me, because I'm getting paid to go pick him up. To my surprise, he lives over an hour away. Score, this is about to be easy money. About an hour and a half passes, and I roll up to a small little house in a decent area. I text my passenger. Hey man, this is your driver. I'm outside. Cool, I'll be out in a second. Out walks a guy, 23 years old. Really handsome guy, he could have been a model. Thick brown hair, scruffy facial hair, nice smile, everything. Charismatic and outgoing as well. He has an open bottle of liquor in one hand, and Sprite in the other as he walks to my car. Knowing this is against the law, I'm hesitant to let him in my car. But, I drove over an hour to pick this guy up, so I wasn't about to turn him away because of his drink. He asks me if we can run into an ATM really quickly. I obliged, so I got to the ATM. He gets $10 cash. He gets back in the car, and takes a swig of his liquor, the bottle three quarters full at this point. I ask him where he wants me to take him tonight. Atlanta. It's not a great part of town that we're going in, but just trust me man, it's all going to be okay. I promise. I'm a calm man, don't worry about that. We hit the road. Atlanta is two hours away from where we are at this point. It's a long ride, so we begin talking. I learned a lot about him. He's drunk. He drinks every day, so his drunken state is actually incredibly coherent. He's really smart. Former UGA student. Wanted to be a doctor. Dropped out of school. He's now homeless. Addicted to drugs. Low self-esteem, doesn't know what to do with his life. He is a self-proclaimed F up. I find all of this to be interesting. I tend to be decent with people who are troubled in life, so I do what I can to try to talk to this kid. I want to help him. I want to relate to him. To get through to him. He clearly has his hands full with life. I ask him, what's your favorite thing in the world to do? Like, you have 24 hours to do this one thing. What do you do? Heroin. Okay, let's spin the wheel again. Not quite the answer I was looking for. I like heroin. 
Video games too. But mainly heroin. Do you think you have a problem? Not really. I've been to rehab twice before. But I've never done it for myself. I only went because other people made me. I see. I get a feel for this guy. He continues drinking his bottle. I'm going to get arrested if I get pulled over with this guy drinking this bottle in my car. F it. Let's keep driving. I've come this far with him, why not? Pull over. I have to pee. Bruh can you wait like 10 minutes? I'm not about to stop on the highway for you to pee. Let me get to a gas station. Alright but hurry. We're laughing at this point. He's drunk but still coherent, and I'm driving 90 on the highway so this guy won't pee in my car. Having a good time, enjoying each other's company. Right before I get to the gas station, he accidentally spills his sprite in my, new, car. This is where I began to see firsthand his low self-esteem. When he spilled his sprite, he started cursing himself. Talking about how he always Fs everything up. About how he can never do anything right. He makes things worse for everyone. I assure him that he's okay. I tell him I'll clean it when we get to the gas station. We arrived. I tell him to go to the bathroom. I clean the spilled drink. No harm no foul. No big deal. When he comes out, I. Tell him everything is okay, and the car is as good as new. He's still a little upset, but he gets over it. Back on the road to Atlanta. We talk about politics, religion, and some other things. He passes out in my front seat from his liquor. He tells me to wake him up when we get to Atlanta. Alright brother, we're here. Now where? This is where things get interesting. And I mean interesting. He navigates me to a ghetto, run-down, dark apartment. There are cops at every corner in this city, and I'm not exaggerating. Just to give you an idea of how bad this part of town is, he tells me, I'm going to run inside. I'll be out in three minutes. Please, do not leave me here. Please. I'm begging you. I know it's scary here, but please don't leave me in this part of town. After this, you can leave me wherever you want. But please don't leave me here. I have no idea what we're doing at this terrible place, but I found myself here at 4 AM with this guy. He gets out of my car, and runs to the third story of the apartment. Two minutes goes by, and he's right back out of my car. All right man, we can go now. What the hell was that about man? I had to buy my drugs. Ready? What did you buy? Heroin. I just drove this guy two hours to a crack house. I'm gonna effing die tonight. I'm gonna die. We pull out of the dark parking lot. I'm just back into the main street, and he tells me to pull over to the side of the road. I oblige. He gets out, runs into the woods, and comes back with a bag. He grabbed his needles. This kid is now sitting in my front seat with heroin. He takes off his shoe and sock. Ties his shoelaces around his ankle. He inserts the needle into his foot. This man is using heroin while I'm driving my car. At any second, he could stab me with this needle, drug me, and kill me. I am going to get effing thrown in prison with this guy. I'm transporting drugs. Wow. F it. I've gone this far with this kid. I'm not backing out now. I've gotta do something. I'm gonna. Help this kid. How much did you just buy? Ten dollars worth. Why? Listen man. You've got a problem. You just spent $175 in rides to get to Atlanta, for ten dollars worth of drugs. Do you see the problem here? He stays silent. The heroin kicks in almost immediately. He's drowsy as hell, incoherent at this point, trying to stay awake. He injected more than he realized, and his heart is slowing. He assures me he's not going to die. Yeah, uh, please don't die. That'd be great if you didn't die right now. He lets out a little laugh. He's about to pass out, but he tells me to take him to a gas station. I took him to the one he requested. He gets out of my car, and stumbles into the woods at the gas station. I am watching his every move, seeing if he is going to rob this gas station, or whatever it is he is doing. He starts digging in the ground. Like a dog who is making a hole. He's digging for about three solid minutes, then he makes his way back to my car. He found his crack that he had his last week, when he thought the cops were following him. He then buys vinegar at the gas station. He then dilutes his crack rock in the vinegar, and starts shooting up crack into his foot in my car. Take me to the hospital. I need to go to rehab. Seriously? Yes. You're right. I'm addicted. When you told me how much I spent on the ride to buy my drugs, that was a wake-up call. At this point, he's on the verge of tears. And so am I. I took him to the hospital. On the way there, he starts crying. You've been a better friend to me than anyone I've ever known. Why? I don't get it. There must be a reason that you were the one who was sent to pick me up tonight. It's a sign. I don't know who you are, but you've been a better friend to me tonight than I've ever had in my life. Why are you helping me? I'm a F up. You should have left me hours ago. I'm crying while driving this guy. I don't know why I do these things man. I just care about you. I want you to get better. Thanks. Nobody. Has ever cared. We got to rehab at the hospital. I walk in to check this guy in. He stays in the car. I tell the receptionist what's going on. I'm an Uber driver. There is a guy in my car right now who is strung out on crack and heroin. He needs to go to rehab. Whoa, what's going on? Let me come see what's going on. The receptionist follows me to my car. Along with the effing policeman, who was sitting next to him at the front desk. The cop is a huge dick at this point. He tells my passenger to get out of my car and put his hands up. After searching him, he tells him to gather his paraphernalia, needles and whatnot, and he takes him inside. Officer tells me to follow. He is interrogating the kid, just relentlessly questioning him, and the kid is crying. He keeps saying, I don't want to go back to jail. I just want help. I don't want to do this anymore. 
I step in and pretty much tell the officer to chill out, and quit intimidating the guy. The officer then pulls me aside and threatens to arrest me. He backs off the kid, and starts interrogating me. Telling me that I'm just as guilty as he is, and that I should be in prison right now. During his interrogation with me, the passenger says that I know nothing. I'm just an Uber driver. After my passenger mentions that, the officer tells me to get the hell out of there. I left. Am I the a-hole for telling my husband I'm worried he might be attracted to our daughter? A couple of hours ago my husband and I were watching TV and I was nursing our three-month-old daughter. He said that he wonders what it will be like when she is older. How he will feel when they sleep together in the same bed and cuddle together. He said he was worried that it might be weird. He asked me what it was like with my father and whether I cuddled with him or slept in bed with him. So I told him what it was like when I was a child. He's mentioned once or twice in the past that he's afraid he'll find her attractive because she looks just like me. I had this conversation in mind when we spoke earlier and I must have made a funny face after we talked because he asked me what I was thinking. I told him honestly that I was worried that he might actually find her attractive in the future. And to clarify I told him that for me there is a difference between finding someone beautiful and being attracted to someone just so we are on the same page. Because he did use the word attractive in the past. This whole thing turned into a huge fight. He said that I effed up big time, that I traumatized him by saying that and he will always think about this conversation when he will kiss or hold her and that I should have kept those worries to myself. He said that he is disappointed that I thought that he might want to do something to her, which I never said. He also said that even if he's going to think that she's attractive that these are normal feelings and that everyone has them. He even told me that when he was a kid that he felt some type of way about his mother and that one day our daughter is going to feel the same way about him. He said that my father probably felt the same way about me or had some kind of thoughts about me. He said he would never ever do something with our daughter and he was really mad at me. I apologized and then he went to bed. I can't shake this feeling of disgust and anxiousness. I'm in bed with my daughter right now and all I want to do is hold her and never let go. He's also told me twice that if she has his mother's genes she's going to have massive boobs. And that she's probably going to have a big butt. Am I the a-hole for making him feel like he's wrong in the head? There are some unethical life hacks. Give fake money to homeless people. They will thank you for it, but also when they get arrested and taken to jail, it'll reduce the number of homeless people in your area. If you live near a US military base, it's a really good time to install Tinder. Military girlfriends slash wives are freaking as f and their spouses are about to be deployed for at least a year. Start making those inroads now. If you're stuck on an annoying call, put your phone on airplane mode instead of just hanging up. The other person will see call failed instead of call ended. Save business cards of people you don't like. If you ever hit a parked car accidentally, just write sorry on the back and leave it on the windshield. Buy the cheapest tickets available for a sporting event. Once inside, check Ticketmaster and StubHub for better seats that didn't sell and go sit there. Look up your building's washer slash dryer model on eBay and order a key for it. I haven't paid for laundry in years and it cost me $8. Sleep like a baby knowing you're not paying for on-site laundry. If the person sitting in front of you on a flight reclines their seat all the way back and leaves you with no room, turn on the air con above you to full blast and point it at the top of their head. In your last year of college lose your student ID and get a new one. The exp date will reset and you can get another 4 years of discounts. If you're initiating a divorce, secretly arrange consultations with all the best divorce attorneys in your area before choosing one and filing. Once they have met with you, even briefly, they are considered biased and will have to recuse themselves from representing your spouse. If you need to lie about something, include an embarrassing unnecessary detail. After all, why would you intentionally lie to make yourself look bad? If a relative keeps asking you about having kids, lie that the wife is pregnant. A few months later, tell them there was a miscarriage so they'll feel uncomfortable bringing up the subject again. If you have a significant unexplained employment gap that is hurting your resume claim that you were providing full-time end-of-life care for a grandparent, or other older relative. If you decide to adopt kids, tell them that if anyone makes fun of them for being adopted, they should say at least I was wanted. You were probably a mistake and your parents didn't have the heart to tell you. Make your edibles in the shape of dog treats and take them anywhere you want. If a drug dog finds them, his handler will just think he's being a silly boy. If you plan on going to prison, learn to cut hair. Barbers are greatly appreciated by other inmates and you'll likely be spared when it comes to prison violence. When I don't want to get caught plagiarizing off of Wikipedia I translate the article to French then Hindi then back to English and chip off grammatical errors and get praised for my hard work. If you're driving next to a cop with drugs in your car and are trying to act normal, pick your nose. Your body language shows you aren't concerned with anyone around you. The last thing you'd ever do if you were paranoid about a cop next to you is pick your nose. Having an affair? Change your lover's contact name in your phone too. Scam likely, so your primary partner won't question why you're getting so many calls. When you give someone a gift card as a gift, write down the card number and code. Then after a year or two, check the balance and if they hadn't used it yet, just use it yourself. They obviously won't know or care. Learn how to read braille and create a cheat slash answer sheet for a test and put it in your hoodie pocket. You can feel the answers with your fingers without looking away from your test. If you ever get caught sleeping at your desk at work then say they told me at the blood bank that this would happen when asked for a reason. If you blew a dead wasp to the palm of your hand, you can hit your boss on the back of the head as hard as you like and act like you saved him. If you come across a dating profile begging for money, send them a request for the same amount instead of a gift. Many times they're too careless to read and will automatically accept it because they assume another desperate guy is sending cash. Don't want to do homework study guides? 
Ask a classmate to split the work and that you will do the first half then ask a different classmate and say the same thing but you will do the bottom half. Wait for them to give you their parts and put them together. Watching my best friends have intimacy made me reevaluate my own life. I've been best friends with Jay since we were kids. We've been inseparable since we met. I love this guy so much. I'm an only child so I see him as my brother. I'd take a bullet for him, and he says he feels the same way about me. Don't be weird. We're just friends. There's nothing wrong with two grown men being best friends and expressing their emotions. Anyway, here's some context. I've always been more of ladies man. I'm much more outgoing. Never been super interested in anything serious. No one hurt me, I just never cared too much. I'm not a scumbag or anything, I just want to have fun. Jay is the opposite in every way. He's always been really shy and introverted. He's great. Funny, stable, probably the most thoughtful guy, and not bad looking. He's just so insecure. He's my boy. I've always hyped him up, but you know, it's who he is. Plus, he had one girlfriend that really broke his heart. He hadn't been the same since. A year or so ago, he met E. He fell for this girl hard. It was easy to see why, she's drop dead gorgeous and really cool. He was too scared to make a move for a long time. Long story short, they're living together. I'm really happy for him. She's perfect for him, fun, outgoing. She brings out the good stuff in him. So, this is the part you've been waiting for. I was supposed to come over to his place to hang. I was running errands but finished earlier. I went over to his place about 45 minutes early. I knocked and he didn't answer, but I knew he was home. The spare key wasn't in its normal spot so I walked around back. He has a big sliding door that leads into his kitchen. It's always unlocked. I saw them immediately. They were going at it on the countertop. I feel totally guilty for noticing but she had an incredible body. I was shocked. Like, deer in the headlights. I was going to leave but I couldn't stop watching. I didn't mean to be a fucking creep. I swear. It was just like something out of a rom-com. They were so passionate. I still can't get over. The way she was looking at him. They were so into each other. Don't get me wrong, I've had good sex. But I don't think I've ever experienced something like that. It kind of made my heart hurt. I don't know how else to say it. It made me realize that I want someone to love me that way. I've never felt lonely before. I've never once thought I would be the kind of guy that wanted a wife. But now, I kind of do. I want what they have. Cops, what's the most insane thing you found during a house search? I was a fresh officer with dreams being a hero. I get dispatched to a call of a family fight. Not wife-husband, but brother-sister. The female was reporting the male had attacked her. I arrived and located a female and male. The male I knew from prior contacts. I detained him in handcuffs and quickly smelled the strong odor of pepper spray. I found out that after the male knocked off the females we she pepper sprayed him. I knew there were different types of pepper spray, like gel. I'm walking around the house taking photos for my investigation and accessing the property damage. I noticed that in his room the odor from the pepper spray was extremely strong and made my eyes instantly water with a decent amount of stinging sensation. The fumes made it incredibly hard to breath and left me without the ability to breath at points, requiring that I leave the room to get fresh air. I find a brownish gel substance all over the walls in the shape of handprints. I photograph it and determine that it was the pepper gel that male suspect was wiping off of his face onto the wall. I found it odd that it was all over the walls and covered the room. I though this chick dusted him with the entire can of pepper gel. After some investigation I took the mail to jail. I responded to the same house several days after for an unrelated medical issue. There were more family members at the house and the mail was still in custody. I was having a conversation with the family as the hero firefighters were saving the day. I inquired if they had fully cleaned up the pepper spray from the mail's room. They gave me a strange look and told me there was none in there. I told them about the gel that was on the wall. I then sat there in horror as they explained to me this man had been, for years, coming on his walls and playing with it. And the gel was in fact old comb and the fumes were the pungent smell of this man's comb room. My boyfriend has started demanding me to do the dishes after he started listening to masculinity content online. My boyfriend and I have been dating for two years now and we recently moved in together. We're both seniors in college, he's a business major and I major in biology. Everything in our relationship had been going great up until recently. He would often buy me gifts, we would have date nights once a week, and he was really sweet overall. However, this has changed with the new content he started watching and listening to. At first I thought it was fine, I would see him watching these masculinity videos that were mainly talking about discipline and hard work, they mentioned some things that I'm not too fond of, specifically about women, but his attitude didn't change at all, so I didn't really mind. If anything, it seemed like what he was watching motivated him to go to the gym more. Though, the first sign of him changing was about a week ago when I asked if I could accompany him to the gym, he firmly told me I cannot as physical stress is something only a man should go through. I honestly thought this was really uncharacteristic for him as he's never really said anything like that before. I didn't push back, or really think about it too much at all, but the next incident is what has really stuck with me. We were both in our living room area, I was doing homework and he was lying on the couch, listening to one of his go-to podcasts. As he's just lying there, he yells over to me make sure to do the dishes, they're piling up in the sink, I said back, could you do them, I'm doing homework right now. A pretty reasonable response I thought, though from how he reacted, he obviously didn't think so. He stands up and says I'm not doing them, that's a woman's job. I was confused and said back, what do you mean? 
He goes, well, it's my job to protect and provide for you, and it's your job to do the household work. I was genuinely surprised at this point, a little context, we split the rent, and both drive around in my car, that I bought with money from a summer. Job. Anyways, I told him, I'll do them once I finish my homework, to which he just replies, good. I don't like being confrontational which is why I didn't say anything in the moment, but I feel like he started to make a change for the worse because of the content he's been consuming and I want to mention it to him before it gets worse. He's also stopped being as kind overall and we haven't had a date night in a couple weeks. What should I do? I found out the girl I hooked up with had a husband, so I left a sticky note under the toilet seat. This is one of the worst situations I've ever found myself in. I feel awful for what I've done and hope that the guy whose wife I hooked up with finds my note. I was out at the local bar by myself last Friday. I work construction and was there after a long day, so I still had some gear on me, this is important later. I wasn't really expecting to do anything, just hoping to unwind a bit, but there was this attractive girl who kept making eye contact with me throughout the night, so I decided to go up to her. She was pretty nice and wholesome, or so I thought, and I was enjoying myself throughout our conversation. I bought us a few drinks and she started to get more touchy as the night went on. I wasn't really in the mood for anything, but she actually suggested we go back to her place, and being a man, I wasn't going to miss an opportunity like that, so I said sure. I called an Uber back to her place, and in the ride home she continued to be touchy and we started making out. When we got to her place she poured up some wine, we conversed a bit longer, then things progressed quickly to her bedroom. Being quite intoxicated and now in the mood, I didn't see a certain picture on her dresser, that I'd live on to regret not noticing. We got busy in her bed and she seemed to really be into it. Afterwards, I was getting dressed and ready to head home when I saw something peculiar on her dresser, I had to rub my eyes to make sure I was seeing this correctly but it was the girl I had just had intimacy with in a wedding gown leaning on what looked like her husband. I was shocked and looked back at the girl to make sure she wasn't watching me, she wasn't so I looked at more of the pictures to clarify, and sure enough, there was another one of her kissing the same guy in another picture on a wedding altar, who I now confirmed to be her husband. My heart sunk to my stomach. I knew I had to do something, and in a split second, I remembered I still had some gear on me from work and decided to grab a sticky note from my pack, leave a note on it, and put it under their toilet seat hoping her husband would find it. I essentially said that I'm so sorry, but your wife just cheated on you with me, I thought I should let you know, I hope this reaches you, again, so sorry. After I putting it under the toilet seat I quickly grabbed my stuff and left. Husband's perspective, I found a note from the man who my wife cheated on me with, I'm now divorcing her. I'm heartbroken because of what I just found, but at the same time very grateful for the clever and honorable man she decided to cheat on me with. I came back from a business trip a couple days ago and at first everything was great, except for one thing that was a little suspicious. My wife was doting on me like crazy, she was going out of her way to cook every meal for me and was overall treating me very well. I found this a bit suspicious, but wasn't going to complain, as she told me she just really missed me. I would later figure out this wasn't the case. Like I said my wife was treating me very well, our intimacy life included, which is what ultimately led me to find the note. We were having intimacy one night and she was putting high effort into it, which I again found suspicious as she didn't usually do the things she was doing, even after times we had been separated for longer. After we were done, I went into the bathroom right next to our bed, that only she usually uses, to take a leak. And like I said, what I found truly left me heartbroken. As I lifted the seat to pee I saw a sticky note with writing on it underneath the seat, I thought this was strange and peeled it off to read it. As I did, I began to tear up, as it was from a man explaining that my wife had just cheated on me with him, and how he was very sorry. I couldn't believe what I had just found, my body was shaking as the realization sunk in. It came together as to why she had been treating me so well, she felt guilty about what she had done. I confronted her about it, of course, she initially denied it but when I told her the guy left a note under her toilet seat explaining what happened she just became quiet. I really thought this was going to be the woman I was going to spend the rest of my life with. It hurt so much. Tears were running down my face as I packed up all my stuff and told her, I'm divorcing her. She began to cry and beg for forgiveness, wanting me to give her another chance, but as I saw it, what she did was unforgivable. I recently moved out and have gotten over the initial shock, I wanted to post this to see if this reaches the guy who wrote it. If it does, I really appreciate it brother, you did the right thing. Edit, for those of you telling me the guy also made a post about the situation, I saw it, and we've DM'd each other. Psychologists, who is that one patient you are genuinely terrified of? When I used to work in a psych ward we had this 6 feet 5 inches jacked, ex-MMA heavyweight fighter. He was detained in ones which is the ward for those who have been legally determined to be unfit and are not allowed to leave. Real nice guy when medicated but when in psychosis, he was not someone you'd want to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with. We would sometimes have to call police to help us deal with him. One officer would arrive, take a look at him and go nope and call for backup. So one day I was guarding the entrance to ones. He was doing fairly okay so he wasn't confined to his room and was allowed to walk around the supervised communal space. He puts down his magazine, goes into his room and then walks out naked. Dude walks up to me, stands about an inch away and looks down at me. I mean way down as I'm only 5 feet 3 inches. He tells me he's leaving and I asked if he would like some shoes or a gown. He says no, he's leaving and I better step aside so I did. You better believe I stepped the F aside and let him walk out. I followed him at a safe distance through the psych ward and out into the parking lot while on the call with the cops. I can't leave the ground so once he was off hospital property, I could only inform the police to which way he was running which was down into a heavily populated downtown core. Not even 15 minutes later, he comes back and walks back into the lobby of the ward and asks for me. He wants shoes after all. Not a robe, but shoes. 
so I bring him shoes to prevent him from getting violent and off he goes again as I repeat the process, following him to the edge of the grounds and calling the cops, who eventually bring him back and put him into his secure room. However once he is in there, they are not allowed to restrain past a certain point. So the whole security team assembles, which is me and about five men. They decide I'm to hold a leg as I'm small and legs are easier to restrain. So we go into the room in a triangle formation with me as the last to enter. He must have. Missed me when I came in the door, because he started screaming that I was a shapeshifter and freaking out. It took us about 30 minutes of restraining him before he was medicated enough to calm down. My grandpa rizzed up his babysitter and had intimacy with her. My grandpa was staying with my parents but they figured it best to hire the regular sitter to watch my younger siblings overnight since they didn't think my grandpa was up to the task and they were attending a wedding a couple hours away and made plans to spend the night in a hotel nearby. They had set up a nanny cam in a couple room, my siblings bedroom, the master bedroom, living room and kitchen. All motion activated. They normally wouldn't bother looking through the footage if everything seemed fine upon returning home and their master bedroom cam had never been triggered before. When they returned they noticed that the cam in the master bedroom had been triggered so they decide to take a look, cut to footage of my grandpa and the sitter both naked aggressively making out from the entrance of the room staggering while intertwined towards the bed and then about 20 minutes of banging on my parents' bed. The sitter was about 20 years old and my grandpa was around 70 at the time. My dad called me immediately after he saw the footage laughing his ass off, and I could hear my mom crying in the background completely mortified from what she had just witnessed and shouting at my dad to throw out the sheets and kick out grandpa. My mom called the sitter to confront her and she just apologized and said there was connection or some shit to that matter. When she asked my grandpa what he was thinking he just said at my age you must seize every opportunity. I wish there was audio for the build up, I lay awake at night sometimes just wondering what kind of game my grandpa was spitting to get in that sitter's pants. I found something nasty in my daughter's closet, and I don't know how to react. A little context on who my daughter is, she's popular in school, plays on the varsity soccer team as a junior, and was top of her class last year. Today while cleaning the house I smelled something putrid coming from my daughter's room so I decided to investigate it. The smell was coming from her closet and when I opened the door and saw what the smell was coming from, I found something that completely mystified me, a sheltered white dad in his 40s. In my daughter's closet, hidden behind her clothes, was an absolutely disgusting mason jar with a tow truck mater figurine in it, which is a character from the movie Cars, her favorite movie as a kid, covered in what appeared to be two years of menstrual blood and used tampons. But that's not even the worst of it. Behind the jar was a poster made up of drawings of mater, and get this, another female tow truck who I assumed to be my daughter. In the depictions of both tow trucks, my daughter and mater, had ultra-realistic human genitalia drawn on them, and they were. You know whating. I was flabbergasted. I knew this was a popular thing on sites like 4chan but I never expected my daughter of all people to have something like this. Me and my boys would oogle over pictures of Jessica Rabbit from Space Jam back in the day. But I didn't think the popular girls would be into that type of stuff too, and to this extent. Let me know if everyone is really into this type of thing, but I get the sense this is unusual. I'm afraid of talking to my wife about this, as we're a fundamentalist Catholic family, and I don't want her to go searching for an exorcism for something that might just be normal harmless teen stuff. She's coming back from school soon and I'm pretty sure she'll realize I've been snooping around. Please give this clueless old head dad some pointers. Is this common among this new generation of young? Edit, not sure why people are saying this copypasta is going to go crazy, I'd appreciate it if you guys could give me some serious advice. What's a quote that's permanently changed your outlook on life? In World War II a Jewish prisoner wrote if there is a God, he will have to beg my forgiveness. Just because you lost me as a friend doesn't mean you gained me as an enemy. I still want to see you eat, just not at my table. A janitor in NASA during the space race was asked by JFK what he's doing? He said, I'm helping put a man on the moon. Do you listen or just wait to speak? History is a set of lies agreed upon. Napoleon. And we may never know if he's right or not. We will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. Martin Luther King Jr. I do not know with what weapons World War III will be fought, but World War IV will be fought with sticks and stones. Albert Einstein. Forgive others, not because they deserve forgiveness, but because you deserve peace. Jonathan Lockwood Huey. The master has failed more times than the beginner has even tried. Stephen McCraney. Stalin at his first wife's funeral. This creature softened my heart of stone. She died and with her died my last warm feelings for humanity. Smooth seas don't make skilled sailors. I reminded myself of this whenever I faced any difficulty in my life. Compare yourself to who you were yesterday, not who someone else is today. Sucking at something is the first step to being sort of good at something. Jake the dog. In high school, I was taking a driver's ed class. My instructor once said, you don't always have to hit the brakes, sometimes just let off the gas. I've used this in so many instances in life. Long time ago I was meeting two women on the sidewalk and just as we passed each other I heard this one sentence from one of them. You don't notice your progress in life because you are always raising the bar. Let go or be dragged is an old Zen proverb I heard at a meditation class. Really changed the way I let myself worry about things. My therapist once told me that living in the future is anxiety, living in the past is depression. Only good way is to live in the present moment. You might be the sweetest peach on the tree, but some people just don't like peaches. This helped me get over my lifelong desire to be liked by everyone and allowed me to focus on becoming someone I actually liked. How do you unclench a tightly clenched fist? Do you apply just as much force? No, you just relax. That's how you let things go. From a dear friend who was suffering from extreme pain. At the end of the game, the king and the pawn go back in the same box. Don't set yourself on fire to keep others warm. 
This helped a lot with my guilt and burgeoning martyr complex. Suffer the pain of discipline, or suffer the pain of regret. The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. Students, what's your best read the note to the class story? This is the time that ruined what seems to be my only chance at ever getting a girlfriend. In sixth grade history class I was just chillin' when the teacher yells hey in my direction. I was really startled and looked around me to see this guy trying to hand me a note. The teacher stormed down the aisle and said to the guy behind me, oh you wanna pass notes huh? Why don't you read it to the whole class? Everyone listened while he read out the note, and he says, do you wanna be my boyfriend? I like the way your booty moves when you walk, and I think you're pretty cute. Everyone in the class started dying laughing, and being flustered I was like, what da hell, I ain't gay bro. And the he says back, not chill, I didn't write that, it came from Tasha, who I had a small crush on at the time. Everyone was now ooing at us, Tasha and I were both extremely embarrassed. For the rest of class it was really awkward and we would both sneak looks at each other, so I decided I was going to go up to her after class to tell her I liked her too. When class ended I went up to her locker to tell her, and she goes, yeah I wrote it, but I don't really like you like that anymore. I was like, oh, okay, and walked away. In my head I was like damn, that narc teacher just ruined my one chance at love, because truth be told, I liked the way her booty moved when she walked too. It would have been a perfect love story. My girlfriend met my wife today, I couldn't be happier. I, 32M, am a widow. My wife passed away from pancreatic cancer five years ago. She was forced to leave behind our two kids, R, 10M, and H, 7M. My wife was the absolute light of my life. We were high school sweethearts, went to the same college, and got married after graduation. We were inseparable. Every day I fell more in love with her, it was like my heart was living outside my body. When she passed, the amount of pain I was in was indescribable. I prayed to go to sleep and not wake up just so I could see her one last time. I contemplated meeting her, but every time I was ready, my kids would look at me. They had her face, her personality, her DNA, I couldn't leave them behind. They were all I had left of her. It took years before I was able to function normally again. I even quit my job and lived off of savings and her life insurance for about a year. I was half the dad I used to be and only a fraction of my former self. Two years after her passing, I decided enough was enough and I kicked myself into gear. I found a job in a different city, packed my kids up, and we moved. Life was hard, but I kept chugging along and eventually I found some joy. A year after moving, I took a business trip to NY where I met my current girlfriend, L. While I acknowledged there was chemistry, I told her I was already married and she understood. However, a few months later I had to go back to NY where we met up again. I let my guard down for the first time around her. Before I knew it, she was transferring to my work branch and moving to my city. I fell in love with her and asked her out a year ago next month. My kids adore her and though she reminded them she will never take their mom's place, they lovingly call her mama L. Today was the anniversary of my wife's passing, an extremely hard day for all of us. This morning I walked into the living room to find Elle and my kids waiting for me. The kids were dressed in their church clothes with goofy smiles on their faces and bouquets. In hand. Apparently, Elle came up with the idea of a picnic at my wife's grave, an idea that the boys loved as they enjoy going to see their mom. While I was sleeping they prepared food and flowers, then insisted on wearing their best clothes. I'll admit that I cried at the sight of them. I don't know how I got this lucky twice in a row. I wanted my wife to meet this amazing woman, so I asked Elle to come along and she did. The day that I dread every year turned out to be a humbling reminder of the reason why I stayed on this planet. To my lovely wife, you can never be replaced, but takes care of the family like you would, and I think you'd be glad she's here to do so. Thank you for sending her to me. What is the most NSFW event that you were a part of in high school? I was a photographer in high school, back then I was real thin, awkward, and overall geeky. I got asked to photograph a day in the life of our girls' swim team. Like most high schools our school had football fever and all of the other teams had to fight for spaces in the yearbook. So I was determined to get good photos for them, so I showed up to their practice, and later state tournament. They won the tournament and I was asked to join them at their victory party, which was at someone's house with their own hot tub and pool. When I arrived most of the team was already drunk, and there was not an adult in sight. There were also a lot of the team's boyfriends there, and more than once they asked me to join them naked in the hot tub. I declined, as I wanted to focus on getting good pictures, but people were effing freely in the pool and hot tub, which made my job to get acceptable photos quite difficult. At one point, there was one of the team's captains chugging a beer while riding her boyfriend in cowboy, and the entire team was cheering her on. Everyone was begging me to take photos but I refused as I was horrified in shock. There were also some guys that weren't boyfriends of the team members that got really handsy with me and I did my best to avoid them. I picked a time when everyone was distracted and ran out of there. I remember crying in my bed later that night because I was so stressed and it was nothing like what I expected. It was like showing a little innocent girl a pee row. The only photo from that event that made the yearbook was one where I had to crop out a beer keg, and everyone's body was below the waterline so you couldn't tell they were naked. My husband's best bride sexualized our daughter at her sweet 16, and my husband continues to defend him, please help. Me and my husband never have any big problems, we have two children, 17 and 16, and any fights we do have are over them. Which is what this was. We have a pool and we had a large amount of people here this weekend to celebrate my daughter's sweet 16. Most of the guests were teenage girls slash boys, but family and friends of me and my husband's came too. 
One of these friends was my husband's best friend, 45, and girlfriend, 32. We will call him H. I've never been too extremely fond of him or the age gap between him and his girlfriend. But alas our children do consider and call him their uncle. I'm also close enough to his girlfriend to consider her a close friend. Since all my daughter's friends were all having big sweet 16 parties she wanted one too. So the pool was all decorated and so was the inside and outside. And for her request she was the only one at the party in a red bathing suit so she would stand out. The party was going great until I was in the laundry room grabbing stuff when I overheard H talking in the room over. Most likely on his phone. He was saying how my daughter was hotter than the girls he'd known as a teen, and he kind of wished she was turning 18 not 16. That any boy who effed her would be doing a service to God and she looked too good in that red bathing suit. I stopped, not immediately jumping to action, I was confused. This is a man my children grew up with, who babysitted them, stayed many nights over at our house, talking about my daughter in a way no one should talk about a child. I marched outside and dragged my husband into the house to the room H was in. I'll admit, I yelled and told H he wasn't allowed in my house or around any of our family again, especially our daughter, and to leave immediately, before telling my husband anything. H got red in the face and cussed at me and my husband for eavesdropping. I screamed at H to tell my husband what he was saying in my house about my daughter. H got even more mad before storming. Out and leaving in his girlfriend's car, without his girlfriend. My husband was getting irritated and demanded to know what happened, so I took a second to calm down before telling him. He told me we would deal with it later and just let our daughter have a great rest of the party. I agreed and we rejoined that party, even though we got a few looks. H's girlfriend came up to me towards the end asking why H was spamming her phone telling her that I was a b-word, jerk, basically all the derogatory terms you can think, even going as far to say I was a immoral woman just like my immoral daughter. I was extremely appalled and dragged her over to my husband who gave me an exasperated look. He told me to let it die for just a bit and he will talk to H after the party. That was yesterday afternoon and my husband just recently came home after meeting up with H and staying the night. He said I was overreacting, that H wasn't even talking about our daughter, that I shouldn't have acted the way I did all day and I was connecting dots that weren't supposed to be connected. I was upset and told him how he mentioned her red bathing suit, which again, she was the only one wearing at the party, and even if it wasn't our daughter he was talking about, he's still talking about a 16-year-old in an inappropriate way. We argued for a long time before eventually he left again, saying he was going to drive to blow off steam. Now I'm in the bathroom shaking and crying. How am I supposed to just sit back and allow this creep near any of my children? I love my husband and I think he's just been blinded by his loyalty to his friend. Coming out soon. My husband's best friend sexualized our daughter at her sweet 16, and my husband continues to defend him. Please help. After my husband's best friend, H, said that my 16-year-old daughter looked attractive in her red bathing suit, he left embarrassed after I confronted him. My husband talked to H and told me that I was overreacting because H wasn't even talking about our daughter, even though I heard him. My husband took a drive to blow off steam and still isn't back. I have a suspicion he might be out with H because I called H's girlfriend, S, to tell her everything. She told me he left that morning and hasn't been home since. I'm going to swing by her apartment and she's going to stay over here for a few nights because she said she can't stand to see H as much as I can. I've told my eldest son and he acted the way my husband should have. He's angry and ready to hop in the car and find both H and my husband. I feel bad involving him but I wanted to give him context to ask if H has ever done anything to him. I told them to be completely honest and that anything he might have done is never their fault. My eldest son told me that H never did anything to him, he noticed some behavior which was always strange but he blamed it on just being weird. So here are my plans. H isn't going to be allowed near my kids. Ever. This is a fine line if I decide to stay with my husband and if he tries to cross it. Then he will be the next one to go. I'm also going to get a restraining order on H just in case. I'm going to tell my husband he isn't allowed home or allowed to talk to my kids. This is until I also talk to my daughter about H, and me and him have a talk in a public space with a friend there to mediate. Anything he needs until then can be brought to him by his sister. Me and S are going to go through my husband's stuff and whatever she can grab from her in H's apartment. We're looking for any CP or things that are suspicious. We're going to do all of this either tomorrow or the next day, I'll keep you all updated. Coming out soon. I got the biggest ICK while we watched a movie on the first date. I don't think I've ever been in a more painful or cringier social situation before. By far the worst date I've ever been on. This guy from my college who I thought was attractive asked me out a couple weeks ago. We had talked a bit in class, but I wanted to get to know him better so I said sure. We went out to dinner at a ramen place and things were going fine. He kept raving about horror movies and how he really liked them, but always gets scared when the jump scares and scary parts happen. I thought this was pretty strange for someone who was raving about horror movies, but I didn't think too much of it. After dinner, we walked back to his place and it was more of the same, he kept talking about the horror movie that we were going to watch, and how he knew when the jump scares were but didn't want to watch them. It was a really weird attempt at being cute I guess, which was definitely a turn off, but this wasn't close to the worst of it. When we eventually got to his place and started watching the movie there were no issues up until right before the scary part that he had been talking about. He legitimately dragged this 5-minute scene into 45 minutes by constantly rewinding right before we got to the part he was scared of. He put on a whole production of, Oh no, it's coming up I'm scared and no, 
I don't want to. This is terrifying. The worst part about it was him grabbing onto my arm and hiding under a blanket when we eventually got to the scary part. I kind of laughed it off after the first couple times he rewinded, but I didn't even know how to react after 45 minutes of him doing that shit. I think he got the signal when I was completely stone-faced after he grabbed onto my arm and hid under the blanket like a toddler. After the most painful hour of my life the movie ended and I quickly got out of there. Have been avoiding him around campus ever since. My husband's best friend sexualized our daughter at her sweet 16, and my husband continues to defend him, please help. A lot has happened today. I'm not getting a divorce with my husband at the moment. Though, if anything sketchy happens or something I see that crosses a line that notion may change. So today I had a very long talk with my daughter. I told her what happened, thought I spared a few details and simply said that H had been saying inappropriate things. I told her that whatever happens going forward, it's not her fault. It's the child lover mind of someone we trusted. I asked her if he, or anyone, had done anything to any of her, and if they had, that I wouldn't be angry at her, and would be proud she spoke up. My daughter said he would sometimes get too close, put his arm around her shoulders, but nothing that ever made her alarm bells go off in her head. I reiterated to her that she was not to blame for what happened and it's all on H. We hugged and I held her as she cried for a bit. Then around lunchtime my husband came home, I never did go through with telling him to stay away, and he was basically sobbing at my feet outside our front door. He told me he was so confused and angry about what happened, that he was convinced his best friend wasn't like that. That he had been drinking last night after he left and fell into a bit of self-hatred. He wasn't with H though, but he had been texting with him that night. I asked him why he never stood up for me and my daughter, why he stayed the night with H. He said I was making a scene at our daughter's birthday party and didn't want to ruin the day for her, and he stayed the night because it was too late anyways by the time he stopped talking with H. I hate this apology though, it felt fake, like he was minimizing my pain and maximizing his. I'm not sure. He went silent when he saw S at the house though, I told him that she was staying a few nights. I didn't give him much of an explanation. Later when I started to make dinner he came up behind me and hugged me. I pushed him back, told him that I didn't want any physical touch. With him anytime soon. He got angry, telling me that it was over now that he apologized and promised to stand up for us in the future. I told him that he has to make up for what he did in the past first, that he needs to talk with our daughter. He went to go sulk somewhere and I haven't really seen much of him since. Thank you to everyone who's given me advice and for the misogynists who keep telling me to take a step back and breathe, that my husband is being logical and I am being emotional, scroll up three paragraphs to where he was blubbering on our doorstep. What was something you saw that you were definitely not supposed to see? My babysitter accidentally showed me her intimacy tape. When I was 12 or so I had a babysitter that would come for a couple hours after school before my parents came back from work. She was a family friend and a sophomore in college I believe, she was really cute and I had mini crush on her at the time. Anyways, it was the start of the school year and she had just come back from a trip she took with her boyfriend to Paris. I remember her enthusiastically telling me all about it, saying how much fun she had. We were sitting on a couch in my living room and she started showing me a bunch of pictures from the trip on her phone, the cathedral, Eiffel Tower, museums and whatnot. As she was scrolling through she got to this video that was kind of like a montage of her and her boyfriend doing activities together. There was a scene of her holding her boyfriend's hand walking back into their hotel room, then it cut to a scene of her lying on her hotel bed completely naked, legs spread, telling her boyfriend to come get it. She jumped out of her seat, tried to cover my eyes and told me to never tell anyone. I remember being a combination of shocked, envious, and turned on. She then told me to never tell anyone what I saw, but not going to lie Lily if you see this, that was the main topic of me and my boys lunch table conversation the next day at middle school. I stopped my husband from taking his own life, he thinks I never knew his plans. My husband and I are 28 and have 3 kids. We've been together since high school and he's the only boyfriend I've ever had. He's always had low self-esteem. I do too, but not like he does. One day we got new phones. Maybe 7 years ago, I found out I can read his texts. He can see mine too, but he didn't know about it. This happened for like another 2 years. For his birthday and Christmas, I'd snoop around his texts and see if there's something he was talking about that he wanted. One day around November, I was being nosy to see what I can get him for Christmas. I was pregnant with our second child at the time. I saw he was texting someone, something suspicious, saying, where can we meet? And I thought this was with another girl. I read them more and I found out he was buying drugs. My husband and I don't even drink, so I freaked out. I wondered about how long this was going in for, if I even knew my own husband anymore. Turns out he was buying something that doesn't get you high but kills you. I looked around everywhere. I tore a room apart and didn't find anything. I went through the search history and all his emails on his phone when he was asleep that night and found out he was making arrangements for a specific date. Three months after I was due. He was looking at life insurance, which we have had since. I'm a stay-at-home mom. He was even looking up how much tea costs to be cremated. Once he got home. The first thing I did was sneak his phone and text that guy and say, I'm no longer interested. If someone else tells you otherwise, it means someone else has my phone and delete that guy's number. I didn't want him know I was snooping, but the thought of my husband not being around tore me. I remember being sick to my stomach and bawling in our room just thinking of the idea of not having him around. I love him more than life in itself. I would die for him and not even have two. Think about it. My husband is my entire world. That day on, I made sure he knew that, even if it meant embarrassing myself. I started bringing him flowers at work almost every day. When he would come through the door, I would screech with excitement and give him a hug and a smooch and tell him I missed him so much. 
and I couldn't stop thinking about him all day when I was out with him, how beautiful and handsome he was when he was around my friends, I'd say, look at my husband. He's so beautiful. I'd call him at work and ask how much longer until he's home. I got him to start going to therapy too. One night I woke him up because I was freaking out and couldn't sleep. I told him I had a nightmare. I said, I had a dream. He passed away. He said, why is that a bad thing? And I told him how he's my entire world, and other than our son and our other on the way, he's all I live for. He said, but things would be better if I was out of your hair. And I said, no, they wouldn't. If you left me, it would literally ruin my life. He said, not if you're financially well off. You'll be much better off. And I said, I could have all the money in the world. It would mean nothing if I didn't have you. I'd much rather be homeless but still have you as my husband than be filthy rich and you'd be gone. And he said, are you serious? And I said, 100%. I'd sleep under a bridge if it meant I still got to sleep next to you. He said, I didn't know you felt that way. And I said, I really do. I asked if I could go with him to therapy. He said yes. I told his therapist I think he has depression, and he admitted he might. He got a prescription, and it seemed to help him a whole lot. Even though it's been five years, I still do all those nice things for him, like call him handsome and bring him flowers. I don't ever want him to second guess for a second that he's my sunshine. What's the scariest thing in the entire world? Rabies. Let me paint you a picture. You go camping, and at midday you decide to take a nap in a nice little hammock. While sleeping, a tiny brown bat decides to bite in your sleep. His teeth are tiny. Hardly enough to even break the skin, but he does manage to give you the equivalent of a tiny scrape that goes completely unnoticed. You wake up, none the wiser. If you notice anything at the bite site at all, you assume you just lightly scraped it on something. The bomb has been lit, and your nervous system is the wick. The disease will multiply along your nervous system, doing virtually no damage, and completely undetectable. You literally have no symptoms. It may be four days, it may be a year, but the camping trip is most likely long forgotten. Then one day you get a slight headache. At this point, you're already dead. There is no cure. There's no treatment. It has a 100% on a live rate. So what does that look like? Your headache turns into a fever, and a general feeling of being unwell. You're fidgety. Uncomfortable and scared. As the virus that has taken its time getting into your brain finds a vast network of nerve endings, it begins to rapidly reproduce, starting at the base of your brain. Where your pons is located. This is the part of the brain that controls communication between the rest of the brain and body, as well as sleep cycles. Next you become anxious. You still think you have only a mild fever, but suddenly you find yourself becoming scared, even horrified, and it doesn't occur to you that you don't know why. This is because the disease is chewing up your amygdala. As your cerebellum becomes hot with the virus, you begin to lose muscle coordination and balance. You think maybe it's a good idea to go to the doctor now, but assuming a doctor is smart enough to even run the tests necessary in the few days you have left on the planet, odds are they'll only be able to tell your loved ones what you died of later. You're twitchy, shaking and scared. You have the normal fear of not knowing what's going on, but with the virus really effing the amygdala this is amplified a hundredfold. It's around this time the hydrophobia starts. You're terribly thirsty, you just want water. But you can't drink. Every time you do, your throat clamps shut and you vomit. This has become a legitimate, active fear of water. You're thirsty, but looking at a glass of water begins to make you gag and shy back in fear. The contradiction is hard for your hot brain to see at this point. By now, the doctors will have to put you on IVs to keep you hydrated, but even that's futile. You were dead the second you had a headache. You begin hearing things, or not hearing at all as your thalamus goes. You taste sounds, you see smells, everything starts feeling like the most horrifying substance trip anyone has ever been on. With your hippocampus long under attack, you're having trouble remembering things, especially family. You're alone, hallucinating and thirsty, confused and undeniably terrified. Everything scares the literal crap out of you at this point. These strange people in lab coats. These strange people standing around your bed crying, who keep trying to get you to drink something and crying. And it's only been about a week since that little headache that you've completely forgotten. Time means nothing to you anymore. Funny enough, you now know how the bat felt when he bit you. Eventually, you slip into the dumb phase. Your brain has started the process of shutting down. Too much of it has been turned to liquid virus. Your face droops. You drool. You're unaware of what's around you. A sudden noise or light might startle you, but for the most part, all you can do is just stare at the ground. You haven't really slept for about 72 hours. Then you die. Always. Parents, why did you not let that friend over at your house? My daughter is not allowed to stay at V's house and V can only come to hours during the day but never overnight. We allowed her to stay the night there one time last year and the stories that came back from a single night were completely unacceptable. Here are a few, the dad has a room that no one is allowed to go in, not even the mom. When he is going into it or coming out of it he knocks on the door and everyone has to look in the other direction. The windows of that room are even blocked out with black trash bags. V said she has seen the inside of the room before and there is just a couch, a TV and an Xbox One. I don't care. My daughter is never going to go there. The dad also apparently has lots of friends that visited all through the night. Most friends never actually came into the house. None of them knocked on the front door. The dad would either get a message or just know they were there and hang out with them for a little while by their back door. In the morning, before I picked my daughter up, she and V were outside playing with the dogs. My daughter is well-mannered and when V's dad asked her if she had put her breakfast plate away she answered yes, sir. 
Well, apparently, what he heard was yes, sergeant and it royally pissed him off. He started screaming at V that her friends are disrespectful and that my daughter wasn't allowed back in his house. He then referred to himself in third person as sergeant for the rest of the day and I am told it was until way after my daughter was gone. V told my daughter at school that it had all been straightened out and her dad felt bad about the misunderstanding and wants her to come stay the night again and will take them four-wheeler riding in the woods as an apology. 1. They don't have four-wheelers so how is this even possible too, no effing way is my daughter going out in the woods with this guy. If you are wondering, no he did not let my daughter back. In the house. V had to pack up her things for her, which her dad watched her do to make sure she wasn't taking anything of theirs. When I got there, they were sitting outside. I had no idea why nor did I think anything of it till I got the previously mentioned story. Also, what was packed up for my daughter as her stuff was not all of her stuff and we had to make a run to the store later for a toothbrush and her shampoo. She also didn't get any of her dirty clothes back and V insisted at school that she couldn't find anything else of my daughter's at their house. Hmm. V would not fit in my daughter's clothes nor would her mother sew my daughter's new size zero jeans, small shirt, small exercise bra and panties somehow just vanished. The mom also did not speak the whole night. She just watched TV and would get up to get something for her husband or make him dinner but she didn't speak to V or my daughter and she also did not make them dinner. They had some popcorn and made their own breakfast in the morning. These girls were 16 at the time. I wish my daughter would have called me to say things were a bit odd. I would have come to get her sooner. Since this incident, we now have a code message because she said she didn't know what to say even if she did call me. So now if something is amiss and she is uncomfortable she is to call or message me asking when her next orthodontist appointment is. It lets me think of the reason she has to be picked up and she does not have to feel awkward or in any way disrespectful. I have also told her it is perfectly acceptable to just say she wants to go home, but I also understand where that can escalate an already bad situation. She can't stay the night at our house because when V stayed at our house, her dad would call her randomly, even at 4 a.m. She missed the call once around 12.30 a.m. and immediately called him back. He was already in his car driving to our house to get her because she didn't answer and I had to listen to a teenager talk her own dad out of a screaming rage. It was disgusting and I am not going to have that around my daughter. My man baby brother is finally facing the music. My 31-year-old brother, in his time on earth has not had to lift a finger to keep any of his needs met. He dropped out of college after less than half a semester because he could not bother rolling out of bed before noon to take the car our parents got him to class. He's worked a combination of two and a half months in his entire life. He lost his first job at a Dairy Queen because he swore at a mother over the drive through speakers, and lost his second because he got caught stealing from the till of a family-owned restaurant. He has spent the last eight years rolling out of bed at 2 p.m. to do nothing but play video games and troll Discord servers to find someone just as pathetic as him to hang out with. It does not help that he's an annoying, violent, self-centered brat who would push my parents in front of a bus for the thrill of the dopamine hit. My parents always tried their best with us. They gave us everything we ever needed in life and then some. They have always been more than understanding to all of their children. For me and my two siblings who are worth something, it leads to incredible performances in academia, well-paying jobs, and an amazing start to our adult lives. I wish I could commend them for the 75% success rate. But, they have allowed the man-baby to sit in his cradle and make demands for 31 years too long. And now, they find themselves with an overgrown toddler who sits in the attic playing Valorant all day while cursing my mom out when she dares to ask him to clean up the rotting garbage he spreads across his room. Last year, dad had a stroke. He is now at a point where he needs 24-hour care from a professional. My mother is burned out. She retired when dad had the stroke to take care of him, and it's done more damage to their relationship than 33 years of marriage could ever do. It does not help that they are perpetually harassed by the child demanding his dinner be delivered to him while he screams at teenagers over the internet. Me, all my human siblings, and my parents have been talking for months now about solutions. At the beginning of the month, we decided dad is going to a care center. Mom will sell the house to move to a 55-plus community close to dad, and the man baby will hopefully find a box with an internet connection. Mom and dad have always protected him, but my guess is the stroke finally woke them up to the reality of the situation. Yeah, it sucks, and they are to blame for allowing him to get to this point. But, there comes a time to cut your losses and admit you messed up and move on. It's a shame all of the man baby's siblings, including myself, hate his guts. None of us care what happens to him, and it's interesting to say that out loud now that I think about it. I got the privilege to be there yesterday when he got the news. Mom's going to be moving in with sis till the house sells, dad's going to the care center next week, and movers will be clearing the place out starting pretty much now. He has a month, the eviction process is already rolling. The non-emergency line already knows that his temperamental and violent behind has been served and is ready to respond if he does something stupid. Oh, and our firefighter neighbor will be over in only a few minutes if he needs his ass put in gear on short notice. It was wonderful. His meltdown was legendary. He actually stomped his feet and screamed that it's not fair. Said he was going to sue us all, screamed in an elderly man's face saying he wants to kick his ass. He demanded to know what we were going to do to help him find a place to live, how much money we were going to give him to make sure he didn't end up on the streets, and asked what he's supposed to do about the fact he was saving his money to buy a new graphics card. He somehow still does not understand exactly what he is now facing. He's now not talking to mom or dad, he's locked himself in his room since last night and only comes out to use the restroom and take food from. The pantry that will not be filling itself anymore. It's great as my brother is staying there and working remotely to make sure he does not try anything, and to update me and my sister on the man-baby's tantrum. I'm looking forward to next month. It will be the best reality television show I've seen in a while.
I have an intimate relationship with my childhood bully's mother and it's effing awesome. I'm 24 and male for context. As a young teen he used to gang up with his friends and bully me for literally no reason. Well we eventually grew up and school ended but honestly the bullying still fs with me. About two months ago I recognized his mom at a bar. She's one of those young and hot moms and I'm not the shy loser I used to be. She doesn't know who I am or what her son did. She was single and we hit it off and she came to my place that night and I piped her like it was our wedding night. Even years later I effing hate her son so much and dogging his mom has been incredible and even though I did this initially purely for revenge she's actually a wonderful person and I want to see where this goes and hopefully at least be able to be civil with him. She told me she has a son about my age early on which I know obviously and this week she asked since we've been together for a couple months and are serious if I wanted to meet him this weekend. I said sure. We're having dinner Saturday night and I'm equally excited and nervous. I feel bad that this started as petty revenge because she deserves better than that but the fact is her son's a effing loser. I grew up, I got in better shape, I have a decent job and make good money while he still lives with his mommy and doesn't work. Well he's going to be in for a big surprise this weekend. She mentioned he was already uncomfortable that her new boyfriend is his age but oh man is he in for a world of hurt. Especially when I eventually become his stepdad, move into that house and tell him he needs to either get a job or get out. As his stepdad I won't let him be a burden to his mother anymore and when he hears how vocal his mom is during intimacy he's going to want to move out anyway unless he enjoys hearing me breed his mother every night. This weekend is going to be great. I can't wait to see the look on his face. I have an intimate relationship with my childhood bully's mother and it's effing awesome. So we had lunch to meet her son yesterday. Oh boy. Well I went to her place while he was there for the first time. He knew she was seeing someone younger and didn't like it and my girlfriend told me it might be awkward but she didn't know the half of it as she also doesn't know he used to bully me in high school. So right as I walked in I saw him. He looked like shit. Fat, balding and pasty. He looked like he spent the last 12 years smoking pot and jerking off in his mom's basement which he has. Well the moment he saw me I could tell he recognized me. I reached out for a handshake and said, hey bully nice to meet you. Well he didn't react well and started referring to me by my nickname he gave me in high school and I told him oh it is you. Small world sorry I honestly didn't recognize you at first. I gave his mom a big kiss as a greeting and he exclaimed what the hell. His mom got upset and told him to get it together and stop being rude. She was surprised and said you two went to school together? I said yeah small world. She asked if we were friends and I said not really, I honestly didn't know the bully that well. He was sitting there fuming and actually got up to leave in the middle of lunch. I did small things like put an arm around his mom or a hand on her thigh just to fuck with him which it clearly did. We had sex that night in her bed and I made sure to shake the headboard so he could hear. I didn't see him the next day though but my girlfriend apologized to me for how rude he was and I said it's okay I know he's clearly had a hard time since high school and seeing someone from that time of his life doing so well would be hard for anyone. Maybe I'll take him out for a beer or something and try to get him out of the house and bond with him a bit. Which she liked. This is gonna be fun guys.